Memoirs of a Physician By Alexander Dumas Introductory Near the source of the sites, on the left bank of the Rhine, some leagues from the imperial city of Worms, there begins a range of mountains. The scattered and rugged summits of which disappear northward like a herd of wild buffaloes vanishing in a mist. These mountains, which from their lofty summits overlook an almost desert region, and seem but to form an attendant train to one which is their chief, have each a peculiar figure, and each bears a name indicating some tradition connected with it. One is the king's chair, another the wild rose stone, this the falcon's rock, that the serpent's crest. The highest of all, which raises to the clouds its granite top, girt with a crown of ruins, is Mont Tonnerre. When evening deepens the shadows of the lofty oaks, when the last rays of the sun die away on the peaks of this family of giants. We might imagine that silence descended from these sublime heights to the plain, that an invisible hand unfolded from their declivities the dark blue veil through which we see the stars. To wrap it over the world wearied with the toil and the noise of the day. Waking gives place to sleep, and all the tenants of earth and air repose. Even then is not heard the stream of the sights, pursuing its mysterious course by the fir trees on its banks, stopping not by day or night, for it must hurry on to the Rhine, which to it is eternity. The sands of its current are so smooth, its reeds so flexible, its rocks so richly clothed with moss, that not one of its waves murmurs, from Morsheim, where it rises, to Freewenheim, where it finishes its course. A little above its source, between Albesheim and Kirchheim Poland, a road, winding deep between two rugged walls of rock, leads to Danenfels. Beyond Danenfels the road becomes a path. It narrows, is lost, and the eye seeks in vain anything on which to rest, except the slopes of Mont Tonnerre, whose lightning-blasted summit is hidden by a belt of trees impenetrable to the eye. In fact, once under those, trees, leafy as the oaks of Dodona of old, the traveller may, in open day, continue his way unseen by any one on the plain below. Were his horse hung with more bells than any mule in Spain, not a sound would be heard. Were his trappings of gold and jewels like those of an emperor, not a ray from them would pierce through the foliage, so powerful is the density of the forest in extinguishing sound, and its darkness in dimming the brightest colors. Even at the present day, when our highest mountains have become mere observatories for everyday tourists, on whose lips the most fearful of the legends of poetry call up a smile of doubt. Even now this solitude has its terrors. A few miserable-looking houses, outposts of neighboring villages, appear here and there, but at a distance from the magic belt, to show that man is to be found in that region. Their inhabitants are millers, who carry their flour to Rockenhausen or Alzi, or shepherds, who herd their flocks around the mountain, they and their dogs trembling often to hear some enormous fir tree fall with age. Crashing in the unknown depths of the forest. All the fireside tales of the country are gloomy, and that path which is lost beyond Danenfels, among the heath and firs of the mountains, has not always, they say, led good Christians to a safe shelter. Perhaps there yet may live one of those country people who has heard his father or his grandfather tell what we are now about to relate. On the 6th of May, 1770, at that hour when the waters of the great river are tinged with a pale rose color, that is to say, when the inhabitants of the Ringen see the setting sun sink behind the spire of Strasbourg Cathedral, which divides it into two hemispheres of fire, a man, who came from Mayence, having passed through Alzi and Kirchheim Poland, appeared beyond the village of Danenfels. He followed the path so long as the path was visible, then, when all trace of a vanished, dismounting from his horse, he fastened its bridle to the first fir tree of the pathless forest. The animal neighed uneasily, and the wood seemed to start at a sound so unusual. Gently, gently, Jared. Twelve leagues are enough for you, hero you must wait my return. The traveller tried to peer into the recesses of the forest, but in vain, he could only see masses of dark shadows relieved upon shadows yet darker. Turning then to his horse, whose Arab name declared his race and swiftness, he took his head between his hands, approached his lips to the smoking nostrils of the animal, and said. Farewell, my good horse. Farewell, if it be fated that we meet not again. As he said these words he looked quickly around as if he feared they might have been overheard, 
or as if he desired it. The horse shook his silky mane, pawed and neighed, as he would in the desert on the approach of the lion. The traveller stroked down his head with a smile which seemed to say, Thou art not wrong, Jared, there is danger here. Then, having decided beforehand, no doubt, not to oppose force against this danger, the unknown adventurer drew from his saddlebow two richly mounted pistols, took out their balls, and sprinkled the powder on the ground. This done, he put them back in their place. Then he unbuckled a sword with a steel handle, wrapped the belt of it round it, and put all together under the saddle, so that the pommel of the sword was towards the horse's shoulder. After these formalities, the traveller shook off the dust from his boots, took off his gloves, felt in his pockets, and having found a pair of small scissors and a penknife with a tortoise shell handle. He threw first the one and then the other over his shoulder, without looking where they fell. That done, he again stroked Jared, breathed deeply, as if to expand his chest, feeling that his strength was about to be taxed and sought a pathway among the trees. He found none, and at last entered the forest at a venture. It is time that we should give our readers some idea of the traveller's appearance, as he is destined to play an important part in our history. He was a man apparently of thirty or two and thirty years of age, of middle height, but admirably made, and his every movement exhibited a fine combination of strength and flexibility of limb. He was dressed in a travelling coat of black velvet, with gold buttons, under which appeared an embroidered waistcoat f tight-fitting breeches of leather, and polished boots, on limbs which might have served as a model for a sculptor. Completed his costume. As to his face, whose rapid change of expression bespoke him of a southern race, there were in it both tact and power of character. His eye, which could express every feeling, seemed to read the soul of any one on whom it rested. His complexion, naturally dark, had been rendered darker by exposure to a warmer sun than ours. His mouth, large, but well formed, showed a fine set of teeth, the whiteness of which was heightened by contrast with the darkness of his skin. His foot was long, but finely formed, and his hand small, but sinewy. Scarcely had he advanced two steps among the dark fir trees when he heard the quick tramp of hoofs in the direction where he had left his horse. His first movement was to turn back, but he stopped himself, however, he could not resist the wish to know the fate of Jared, he raised himself on tiptoe and glanced through an opening. Jared had disappeared, guided by an invisible hand which had untied his bridle. A slight frown contracted the brow of the unknown, yet something like a smile curled his chiseled lips. Then he went on his way toward the center of the forest. For a few steps further the twilight aided him, then it left him, and in darkness so thick, that seeing no longer where to place his foot, he stopped. I got on very well to Danenfels, for from Mayence to Danenfels there is a road, said he, aloud, and from Danenfels to the dark heath, because there is a path, and from the dark heath hither, though there is neither road nor path. Because I could see where I was going, but now I must stop, I see nothing. Scarcely had he pronounced these words, in a dialect half French, half Sicilian, when a light appeared about fifty paces from the traveller. Thanks, said he, now as the light moves I shall follow. The light moved steadily on, with a gliding motion, as we sometimes see a light move over the stage of a theatre. The traveller might have gone about a hundred steps further, when he thought he felt a breathing at his ear. He started. Turn not, said a voice on the right, or thou art dead. Good, replied the immovable traveller. Speak not, said a voice on the left, or thou art dead. The traveller bowed without speaking. But if thou art afraid, said a third voice which, like that of Hamlet's father, seemed to come from the bowels of the earth, turn back, that will declare that thou abandonest thy scheme, and thou shalt be permitted to go. The traveller made a gesture of dissent with his hand, and went on. The night was so dark and the forest so thick that he could not advance without occasionally stumbling and his progress was slow. For nearly an hour the flame moved on, and he followed without hearing a murmur, and without showing a symptom of fear. All at once it disappeared. The traveller was out of the forest. He raised his eyes, and in the dark blue sky saw some twinkling stars. He continued to advance in the direction of the place where the light had disappeared, 
and soon saw arise before him a ruin, the spectre, as it were, of some ancient castle. Next, his foot struck against some of its fragments. Then something cold passed his temples and sealed up his eyes, and he saw not even the shadows of outward objects. A bandage of wet linen bound his head. This was only what he expected, no doubt, as he made no effort to remove it. He only silently stretched out his hand like a blind man imploring a guide. His gesture was understood. A cold, dry, bony hand grasped the fingers of the traveller. He knew that it was the hand of a skeleton, but if that hand had been endowed with sensation it would have felt that his did not tremble. Then the traveller felt himself rapidly drawn on for about a hundred paces. Suddenly the hand released its grasp, the bandage fell from his eyes, he stopped, he was on the summit of Mont Tonnerre. 2. He who is. In the midst of a glade formed by larches, bare with age, rose one of those feudal castles which the Crusaders, on their return from the Holy Land, scattered over Europe. The gateways and arches had been finely sculptured, and in their niches were statues, but these lay broken at the foot of the walls, and creeping plants and wildflowers now filled their places. The traveller, on opening his eyes, found himself before the damp and mossy steps of the principal entrance, on the first of these steps stood the phantom by whose bony hand he had been led thither. A long shroud wrapped, it from head to foot, and the eyeless sockets darted flame. Its fleshless hand pointed to the interior of the ruins, as the termination of the traveller's journey. This interior was a hall, the lower part of which was but half seen, but from its vaults, heaped with ruins, flickered a dim and mysterious light. The traveller bowed in assent. The phantom mounted slowly step by step to the hall, and plunged into the ruins. The unknown followed calmly and slowly up the eleven steps which this spectre had trodden, and entered also. With the noise of a clashing wall of brass the great gate of the portal closed behind him. At the entrance of a circular hall, lighted by three lamps, which cast a greenish light, the phantom stopped. The traveller, ten steps farther back, stopped in his turn. Open thine eyes, said the phantom. I see, replied the unknown. The phantom then drew, with a proud gesture, a two-edged sword from beneath his shroud, and struck it against a column of bronze. A hollow, metallic groan responded to his blow. Then all around the hall arose stone seats, and numerous phantoms, like the first, appeared. Each was armed with a two-edged sword, and each took his place on a seat, and seen by the pale green light of the three lamps, they might have been taken, so cold and motionless were they, for statues on their pedestals. And these human statues came out in strange relief on the black tapestry of the walls. Some seats were placed in advance of the others, on which sat six spectres who seemed like chiefs, one seat was vacant. He who sat on the middle seat arose. Brethren, how many are present, he asked, turning to the assembly. Three hundred, replied the phantoms, with one voice. It thundered through the hall, and died away among the funereal hangings on the walls. Three hundred, replied the president, and each speaks for ten thousand companions. Three hundred swords, which are equal to three million of poniards. Then he turned to the traveller. What dost thou wish, he asked. To see the light, replied the other. The paths which lead to the mountain of fire are rugged and difficult. Fearest thou not? I fear nothing. One step forward, and you cannot return. Reflect. I stop not till I reach the goal. Wilt thou swear? Dictate the oath. The president raised his hand, and, with a slow and solemn voice, pronounced these words. In the name of the crucified Son, swear to break ale bonds of nature which unite thee to father, mother, brother, sister, wife, relation, friend, mistress, king, benefactor, and to any being whatever to whom thou hast promised faith, obedience, gratitude, or service. The traveller, with a firm voice, repeated these words, and then the president dictated the second part of the oath. From this moment thou art free from the pretended oath thou hast taken to thy country and its laws. Swear thou to reveal to the new head whom thou acknowledgest all that thou hast seen or done, read or guessed, 
and henceforward to search out and penetrate into that which may not openly present itself to thine eyes. The president stopped. The unknown repeated the words. Honor and respect the aqua tafana, as a prompt, sure, and necessary means of ridding the world by the death or idiocy of those who would degrade the truth, or tear it from us. An echo could not have been more exact than the unknown in repeating the words of the president. Flee from Spain, flee from Naples, flee from every accursed land, flee from the temptation of revealing aught that thou shalt now see and hear. Lightning is not more quick to strike than will be the invisible and inevitable knife, wherever thou mayest be, shouldst thou fail in thy secrecy. Spite of the threat conveyed in these last words, no trace of emotion was seen on the face of the unknown, he pronounced the end of the oath with a voice at calm as at the beginning. And now, continued the president, put on his forehead the sacred band. Two phantoms approached the unknown, he bowed his head, one of them bound round at a crimson ribbon covered with silver characters, placed alternately with the figure of Our Lady of Loretto, the other tied it behind, just at the nape of the neck. Then they left his side. What wouldst thou ask? inquired the president. Three things. Name them. The hand of iron, the sword of fire, the scales of adamant. Why the hand of iron? To stifle tyranny. Why the sword of fire? To banish the impure from the earth. And why the scales of adamant? To weigh the destinies of humanity. Canst thou withstand the necessary trials? Courage is prepared for all trials. The proofs. The proofs, cried many voices. Turn, said the president. The unknown obeyed, and found himself face to face with a man pale as death, bound and gagged. What sayest thou, asked the president. A malefactor or a victim? A traitor. One who took the oath as thou hast done, and then revealed the secrets of our order. A criminal, then. Yes. What penalty has he incurred? Death. The three hundred phantoms repeated, Death. And, in spite of all his efforts, the condemned was dragged into a darker part of the hall. The traveller saw him struggle with his executioners, he heard his choking voice, a dagger glimmered for an instant, a blow was struck, and a dead and heavy sound announced a body falling on the earthy floor. Justice is done. Said the unknown, turning to the ghastly assembly, who, from beneath their shrouds, had devoured the sight with greedy looks. Then, said the president, thou dost approve what has been done. Yes, if he who has fallen was really guilty. Thou wilt drink to the death of every man who, like him, would betray our secrets. I will. Whatever be the draft. Whatever be the draft. Bring the cup, said the president. One of the two executioners brought the unknown a red, tepid liquor in a human skull. He took this frightful cup, raised it above his head, saying. I drink to the death of every man who shall betray the secrets of this holy society. Then, bringing it to his lips, he drained it to the last drop, and returned it calmly to him who had presented it. A murmur of surprise ran through the assembly, and the phantoms seemed to look at each other through their half-open shrouds. Good, said the president. The pistol. A phantom drew near the president, holding in one hand a pistol, and in the other a ball and a charge of powder. Thou promisest passive obedience to our orders. Yes. Even if this obedience be put to the proof against thyself. He who enters here is no longer his own, he belongs to all. Then thou obeyest whatever order be given thee. I obey. This instant. This instant. No pause. No pause. Take this pistol, load it. The unknown took the pistol and loaded it, all the dread assembly looking on the operation in a silence only broken by the sighs of the wind among the arches of the ruin. The pistol is loaded, said the unknown. Art thou sure? asked the president. A smile passed over the lips of the traveller, as he tried the pistol, showing that it was loaded. The president bowed in token of being satisfied. Yes, said he, it is loaded. What am I to do with it? Cock it. The unknown cocked the pistol, 
and its click was distinctly heard in the intervals of silence in the dialogue. Now put it to thy forehead, said the president. He obeyed unhesitatingly. The silence seemed to deepen over the assembly, and the lamps to turn pale. These were real phantoms, for not a breath was then heard. Fire, said the president. The cock was heard to snap, the flint flashed, but the powder in the pan alone took fire, and no report accompanied its quick flame. A shout of admiration burst from every breast, and the president involuntarily extended his hand to the unknown. But two proofs were not sufficient to satisfy all, and some voices shouted. The dagger. The dagger. You demand that, also, said the president. Yes, the dagger. The dagger, replied the voices. Bring the dagger, said the president. It is useless, said the unknown, making a disdainful movement with his head. Useless, cried the assembly. Yes, useless, he replied, with a voice which drowned every other, useless. You lose time, and it is precious. What mean you? Asked the president. I tell you I know your secrets, that these proofs of yours are but child's play, unworthy of men. I tell you that I know the body which lies there is not dead, that I have not drunk blood. That by a spring, the charge fell into the butt at the moment I cocked the pistol. Such things may frighten cowards. Rise, pretended corpse, thou hast no terrors for the brave. Another shout made the vaults ring. Thou knowest our mysteries, then, said the president. Thou art one of the illuminated or a traitor. Who art thou, demanded the three hundred voices. And, on the instant, twenty swords, in the hands of the nearest phantoms, were pointed with a motion as precise as if directed by a military signal, at the bosom of the unknown. He smiled, shook the thick curls of his hair, which, unpowdered, were only retained by the ribbon which had been bound round his head, and said, calmly, I am he who is. Then he turned his eyes slowly around the living wall which hemmed him in, and gradually sword after sword sunk before him. Thou hast spoken rashly, said the president. Doubtless thou knowest not the import of thy words. The stranger shook his head and smiled. I have spoken the truth. Whence comest thou? I come whence comes the light. But we have learned that thou comest from Sweden. I might come from Sweden, and yet from the east. Then we know thee not. Who art thou? Who am I? I, ye shall know more. Ye pretend not to understand me, but first I will tell you who you are. The phantom started, and the clang of their swords was heard, as they grasped them in their right hands and raised them to the level of the stranger's breast. First, said he, thou who questionest me, who believest thyself a god, and who art but the forerunner of one, thou who representest Sweden, I shall name thee that the rest may know I can also name them. Swedenborg, how comes it thy familiars told thee not that he whom thou waitedst for was on the road? They did declare it to me, replied the president, putting aside a fold of his shroud, in order to see him better who spoke, and, in doing so, contrary to all the habits of the association. He showed a white beard and the venerable face of a man of eighty. Good, replied the stranger. On thy left is the representative of England or of old Caledonia. I grant you, my lord, if the blood of your grandfather flows in your veins, England's extinguished light may be rekindled. The sword sunk, anger gave place to astonishment. Ah, captain, said the unknown, addressing one on the left of the president, in what port waits thy good ship? A noble frigate of Providence. Its name augurs well for America. Then, turning towards him on the right. Look, prophet of Zurich, thou hast carried physiognomy almost to divination, read the lines on my face, and acknowledge my mission. He to whom he spoke recoiled. Come, said he, turning to another, descendant of Pelago, we must drive the Moors a second time from Spain, an easy task if the Castilians yet retain the sword of the Cid. The fifth chief remained so still, so motionless, that the voice of the unknown seemed to have turned him to stone. And to me, said the sixth, hast thou not to say to me? I, replied the traveller, turning on him a look which read his heart, 
what Jesus said to Judas, but not yet. The chief turned paler than his shroud, and a murmur running through the assembly seemed to demand the cause of this singular accusation. Thou forgettest the representative of France, said the president. He is not here, replied the stranger, haughtily, and that thou knowest well, since his seat is vacant. Learn, then, that snares make him smile who sees in darkness. Who acts in spite of the elements, and who lives in spite of death. Thou art young, replied the president, and thou speakest as if from divine authority. Reflect. Boldness overcomes only the weak or the ignorant. A disdainful smile played over the lips of the stranger. You are all weak, since you have no power over me, you are all ignorant, since you know not who I am. Boldness, then, alone might overcome you, but why should one all-powerful so overcome? Give us the proof of your boasted power, said the president. Who convoked you, asked the unknown, becoming the interrogator, instead of the interrogated. The Grand Assembly. And not without a cause hast thou, pointing to the president, Connick from Sweden, thou, and he turned from one to another of the five chiefs, as he spoke, thou from London, thou from New York, thou from Zurich, thou from Madrid. Thou from Warsaw, and you all, looking round the assembly, from the four winds of heaven, to meet in the sanctuary of the dreaded faith. No, replied the president, not without cause, for we came to meet him who has founded in the East a mysterious faith, joining two worlds in one belief, entwining mankind with the bonds of brotherhood. Is there any sign by which you shall know him? Yes, said the president, and an angel has revealed it to me. You alone know it? I alone. You have revealed it to none. To none. Name it. The president hesitated. Name it. The hour is come. He will bear on his breast a diamond star, and on it three letters, the signification of which is only known to himself. Declare the letters. L. P. D. The stranger rapidly threw open his coat and vest, and on his fine holland shirt shone like a flaming star the diamond and the three letters, formed of rubies. It is he, cried the president. He whom we await, asked the chiefs. The great copt, murmured the three hundred voices. Now, cried the stranger, triumphantly, do you believe me when I say, I am he that is? Yes, said the phantoms, prostrating themselves before him. Speak, muster, said the president, speak, we shall obey. 3. L. P. D. There was silence for some moments, during which the unknown seemed to collect his thoughts, then he began. Sirs, ye but weary your arms with your swords, lay them aside and lend an attentive ear. For you shall learn much from the few words which I am about to utter. All were profoundly attentive. The sources of great rivers are sacred, therefore unknown. Like the Nile, the Ganges, the Amazon, I know to what I tend, not whence I come. All that I can reveal is, that when the eyes of my spirit first opened to comprehend external things, I was in Medina, the holy city, playing in the gardens of the Mufti Salaam. He was a venerable man, kind as a father to me, yet not my father. For though he looked on me with love, he spoke to me with respect. Thrice a day he left me, and then came another old man, whose name I may pronounce with gratitude, yet with fear. He was called Althotas, and him the seven great spirits had taught all that the angels know, in order to comprehend God. He was my tutor, my master, my friend, a friend to be venerated indeed, for his age was double that of most among you. His solemn tone, his majestic deportment, deeply impressed the assembly, they seemed trembling with anxiety to hear more. He continued. When I reached my fifteenth year I was initiated into the mysteries of nature. I knew botany, not as one of your learned men who has acquired only the knowledge of the plants of his own corner of the world, to me were known the sixty thousand families of plants of the whole earth. My master, pressing his hands on my forehead, made a ray of celestial light descend on my soul. Then could I perceive beneath the seas the wondrous vegetations which are tossed by the waves, in the giant branches of which are cradled monsters unknown to the eye of man. All tongues, living and dead, I knew. 
I could speak every language spoken from the Dardanelles to the Straits of Magellan. I could read the dark hieroglyphics on those granite books, the pyramids. From Sankaniathan to Socrates, from Moses to Jerome, from Zoroaster to Agrippa, all human knowledge was mine. Medicine I studied, not only in Hippocrates, in Galen, and in Averroes, but in that great teacher, nature. I penetrated the secrets of the Copts and the Druzes. I gathered up the seeds of destruction and of scarcity. When the simum or the hurricane swept over my head, I threw to it one of those seeds which its breath bore on, carrying death or life to whomsoever, I had condemned or blessed. In the midst of these studies I reached my twentieth year. Then my master sought me one day in a grove, to which I had retired from the heat of the day. His face was at the same moment grave and smiling. He held a little vial in his hand. Akarat, said he, I have told thee that nothing is born, nothing dies in the world, that the cradle and the coffin are twins, that man wants only to see into past existences to be equal to the gods. And that when that power shall be acquired by him, he will be as immortal as they. Behold! I have found the beverage which will dispel his darkness, thinking that I had found that which destroys death. Akarat, I drank of it yesterday, see, the vial is not full, drink thou the rest today. I had entire confidence in my venerable master, yet my hand trembled as it touched the vial which he offered me, as Adams might have done when Eve presented him with the apple. Drink, said he, smiling. I drank. Then he placed his hands on my head, as he always did when he would make light penetrate to my soul. Sleep, said he. Immediately I slept, and I dreamed that I was lying on a pile of sandalwood and aloes. An angel, passing by on the behests of the highest from the east to the west, touched the pile with the tip of his wing and it kindled into flame. Yet I, far from being afraid, far from dreading the fire, lay voluptuously in the midst of it, like the phoenix, drawing in new life from the source of all life. Then my material frame vanished away, my soul only remained. It preserved the form of my body, but transparent, impalpable, it was lighter than the atmosphere in which we live, and it rose above it. Then, like Pythagoras, who remembered that in a former state he had been at the siege of Troy, I remembered the past. I had experienced thirty-two existences, and I recalled them all. I saw ages pass before me like a train of aged men in procession. I beheld myself under the different names which I had borne from the day of my first birth to that of my last death. You know, brethren, and it is an essential article of our faith, that souls, those countless emanations of the Deity, fill the air, and are formed into numerous hierarchies, descending from the sublime to the base. And the man who, at the moment of his birth, inhales one of those pre-existing souls, gives it up at his death, that it may enter on a new course of transformations. He said this in a tone so expressive of conviction, and his look had something so sublime, that the assembly interrupted him by a murmur of admiration. When I awoke, continued the illuminated, I felt that I was more than man, that I was almost divine. Then I resolved to dedicate not only my present existence, but all my future ones, to the happiness of man. The next day, as if he had guessed my thoughts, Althoda said to me, My son, twenty years ago thy mother expired in giving birth to thee. Since that time, invincible obstacles have prevented thy illustrious father revealing himself to thee. We shall travel, we shall meet thy father, he will embrace thee, but thou wilt not know him. Thus in me, as in one of the elect, all was mysterious, past, present, future. I bid adieu to the Mufti Salaam, who blessed me and loaded me with presents, and we joined a caravan going to Suez. Pardon me, sirs, if I give way for a moment to emotion, as I recall that one day a venerable man embraced me. A strange thrill ran through me as I felt his heart beat against mine. He was the Sharif of Mecca, a great and illustrious prince, who had seen a hundred battles, and at the raising of his hand three millions of men bent their heads before him. Althotas turned away to hide his feelings, perhaps not to betray a secret, and we continued our road. We went into the heart of Asia, we ascended the Tigris. We visited Palmyra, Damascus, Smyrna, Constantinople, Vienna, 
Berlin, Dresden, Moscow, Stockholm, Petersburg, New York, Buenos Aires, the Cape of Good Hope, and Aden. Then, being near the point at which we had set out, we proceeded into Abyssinia, descended the Nile, sailed to Rhodes, and lastly to Malta. Before landing, a vessel came out to meet us, bringing two knights of the order. They saluted me and embraced Althotas, and conducted us in a sort of triumph to the palace of the Grand Master, Pinto. Now, you will ask me, sirs, how it came that the Mussulman Akarat was received with honor by those who have vowed the extermination of the infidels. Althotas, a Catholic, and himself a knight of Malta, had always spoken to me of one only God omnipotent, universal, who, by the aid of angels, his ministers, made the world a harmonious whole, and to this whole he gave the great name of Cosmos. I was then not a Mussulman, but a Theosophist. My journeyings ended. But in truth all that I had seen had awakened in me no astonishment, because for me there was nothing new under the sun, and in my preceding thirty-two existences I had visited the cities before, through which I lately passed. All that struck me was some change in their inhabitants. Now I would hover over events and watch the progress of man. I saw that all minds tend onward, and that this tendency leads to liberty. I saw that prophets had been raised up from time to time to aid the wavering advances of the human race, and that men, half blind from their cradle, make but one step towards the light in a century. Centuries are the days of nations. Then, said I to myself, so much has not been revealed to me that it should remain buried in my soul. In vain does the mountain contain veins of gold, in vain does the ocean hide its pearls, for the persevering miner penetrates to the bowels of the mountains, the diver descends to the depths of the ocean, but better than the mountain or the ocean. Let me be like the sun, shedding blessings on the whole earth. You understand, then, that it is not to go through some Masonic ceremonies I have come from the East. I have come to say to you, brethren, take the wings and the eyes of the eagle, rise above the world, and cast your eyes over its kingdoms. Nations form but one vast body. Men, though born at different periods, in different ranks, arrive all in turn at that goal to reach which they were created. They are continually advancing, though seemingly stationary, and if they appear to retreat a step from time to time, it is but to collect strength for a bound which shall carry them over some obstacle in their way. France is the advance guard of nations. Put a torch in her hand, and though it kindle a wide-spreading flame, it will be salutary, for it will enlighten the world. The representative of France is not here, it may be that he has recoiled at the task imposed on him. Well, then, we must have a man who will not shrink from it, I will go to France. You are in France, said the President. Yes. The most important post I take myself, the most perilous work shall be mine. You know what passes in France, then, inquired the President. The stranger smiled. I know, for I myself have prepared all. An old king, weak, vicious, yet not so old, not so weak, not so vicious as the monarchy which he represents, sits on the throne of France. He has but a few years to live. Events must be prepared to succeed his death. France is the keystone of the arch, let but this stone be unfixed, and the monarchical edifice will fall. I, the day that Europe's most arrogant sovereigns shall hear that there is no longer a king in France, bewildered, they will of themselves rush into the abyss left by the destruction of the throne of St. Louis. Here, he on the right of the president spoke, and his German accent announced that he was a Swiss. Most venerated master, hast thou, then, calculated all, he asked. All, replied the great Copt. Your pardon if I say more. But on our mountains, in our valleys, by our lakes, our words are free as the winds and the waters. Let me say, then, that a great event is on the eve of arriving, and that to it the French monarchy may owe its regeneration. I have seen, great master, a daughter of Maria Theresa traveling in state toward France, to unite the blood of seventeen emperors with that of the successor of the sixty-one kings of France, and the people rejoiced blindly as they do when their chains are slackened, or when they bow beneath a gilded yoke. I would infer, then, that the crisis is not yet come. 
all turned to him who so calmly and boldly had spoken to their master. Speak on, brother, said the great Copt, if thy advice be good, it shall be followed. We are chosen of heaven, and we may not sacrifice the interests of a world to wounded pride. The deputy from Switzerland continued, amidst deep silence. My studies have convinced me of one truth, that the physiognomy of men reveals to the eye which knows how to read it their virtues and their vices. We may see a composed look or a smile, for these caused by muscular movements are in their power, but the great type of character is still imprinted legibly on the countenance, declaring what passes in the heart. The tiger can caress, can give a kindly look, but his low forehead, his projecting face, his great occiput, declare him tiger still. The dog growls, shows his teeth, but his honest eye, his intelligent face, declare him still the friend of man. God has imprinted on each creature's face its name and nature. I have seen the young girl who is to reign in France, on her forehead I read the pride, the courage, the tenderness of the German maiden. I have seen the young man who is to be her husband, calmness, Christian meekness, and a high regard for the rights of others, characterize him. Now, France remembering no wrongs, and forgetting no benefits, since a Charlemagne, a Louis, and a Henry have been sufficient to preserve on the throne twenty base and cruel kings. France who hopes on, despairs never, will she not adore a young, lovely, kindly queen, a patient, gentle, economical king? And this, too, after the disastrous reign of Louis the Fifteenth, After his hateful orgies, his mean revenges, his pompadours and dewberry. Will not France bless her youthful sovereigns, who will bring to her as their dowry peace with Europe? Marie Antoinette now crosses the frontier. The altar and the nuptial bed are prepared at Versailles. Is this the time to begin in France your work of regeneration? Pardon if I have dared to submit these thoughts to you whose wisdom is infallible. At these words, he whom the great Copt had addressed as the Apostle of Zurich, bowed as he received the applause of the assembly, and waited a reply. He did not wait long. If you read Physiognomy, illustrious brethren, I read the future. Marie Antoinette is proud, she will interfere in the coming struggle, and will perish in it. Louis Augustus is mild, he will why, aid to it, and will perish with her, but each will fall through opposite defects of character. Now they esteem each other, but short will be their love, in a year they will feel mutual contempt. Why, then, deliberate, brethren, to discover whence comes the light? It is revealed to me. I come from the east, led, like the shepherds, by a star, which foretells a second regeneration of mankind. Tomorrow I begin my work. Give me dash twenty years for it, that will be enough, if we are united and firm. Twenty years, murmured several voices. The time is long. The great copt turned to those who thus betrayed impatience. Yes, said he, it is long to those who think that a principle is destroyed as a man is killed with the dagger of Jacques Clement or the knife of Damien's. Fools! The knife kills the man, but, like the pruning hook, it lops a branch that the other branches may take its place. In the stead of the murdered king rises up a Louis the Thirteenth, a stupid tyrant, a Louis the Fourteenth, a cunning despot, a Louis the Fifteenth, an idol whose path is wet with tears of blood, like the monstrous deities of India, crushing with changeless smile women and children who cast garlands before their chariot wheels. And you think twenty years too long to efface the name of king from the hearts of thirty millions of men who but lately offer to God their children's lives to purchase that of Louis the Fifteenth. And you think it an easy task to make France hate her lilies, which, bright as the stars of heaven, grateful as the odors of flowers, have borne light, charity, victory, to the ends of the world. Try, try, brethren. I give you, not twenty years, I give you a century. You, scattered, trembling, unknown each to the other, known only to me, who only can sum up your divided worth, and tell its value, to me, who alone can unite you in one fraternal chain, I tell you, philosophers, political economists, theorists. That in twenty years those thoughts which you whisper in your families, which you will write with uneasy eye in the solitude of your old somber towers, which you tell one another with the dagger in your hands. 
that you may strike the traitor who would repeat them in tones louder than your own, I tell you that these thoughts shall be proclaimed aloud in the streets, printed in the open face of day, spread through Europe by peaceful emissaries. Or by the bayonets of five hundred thousand soldiers, battling for liberty, with your principles inscribed on their standards. You, who tremble at the name of the Tower of London, you, who shrink at that of the Inquisition, hear me, me, who am about to dare the Bastille. I tell you that we shall see those dreaded prisons in ruins, and your wives and children shall dance on their ashes. But that cannot be until, not the monarch, but the monarchy, is dead, until religious domination is despised, until social inferiority is extinguished, until aristocratic castes and unjust division of lands are no more. I ask twenty years to destroy an old world, and make a new one, twenty years, twenty seconds of eternity, and you say it is too long. The silence of admiration and of assent followed the words of this dark prophet. He had obtained the sympathy of the representatives of the hopes of Europe who surrounded him. The great Copt enjoyed for some minutes his triumph. Then, feeling that it was complete, he went on. Now, brethren, now that I am going to devote myself to our cause, to beard the lion in his den, to risk my life for the freedom of mankind, now. What will you do for that to which you say you are ready to give up life, liberty, and fortune? This is what I am here to demand. A deeper silence fell on the assembly than when he last ceased to speak, it seemed as if the motionless phantoms around him were absorbed in a fateful thought, which, when expressed, should take twenty thrones. The six chiefs conversed for a moment apart, and then returned to the president. The president spoke. In the name of Sweden, I offer for the overthrow of the throne of Vesa the miners who established it, and one hundred thousand crowns. The great Copt made an entry in his tablets. Another on the left spoke. I, sent by Scotland and Ireland, can promise nothing from England, our firm opponent, but from poor Scotland, from poor Ireland, I shall bring three thousand men and three thousand crowns yearly. He wrote again. And you? Said he, turning to one whose vigorous frame and restless spirit seemed wearied by his phantom robe, and who replied. I represent America, whose stones, whose trees, whose waters, whose every drop of blood are vowed to rebellion. Whilst we have gold we will give it, while we have blood we will shed it, let us but be free first. Though now divided, marked, and disunited, we are the links of a gigantic chain, and could some mighty hand join two of them, the rest will unite themselves. Begin, then, O, oh, great master, with us. If thou wouldst rid France of royalty, free us from a foreign yoke first. It shall be so, replied the master, you shall first be free, and France shall help you. Wait, brother, but I promise thou shalt not wait long. Then he turned to the Swiss deputy, who replied to his look. I can promise nothing. Our republic has been long the ally of the French monarchy, to which it sold its blood at Marignan and Pavia. Its sons are faithful, they will give that for which they have been paid, for the first time, I am ashamed of their fidelity. So, but we shall conquer without them, and in spite of them. And you, representative of Spain? I am poor. I can only offer three thousand of my brothers, with a contribution of a thousand reals yearly. Our Spaniards are indolent, they sleep on a bed of pain provided they sleep, they care not. Good. And you, said he to another. I represent Russia and Poland. My people are either discontented nobles or wretched serfs. The serf, who owns not even his life, can offer nothing, but three thousand nobles have promised twenty Louis Dior's each annually. Then all the representatives in turn declared what those from whom they came would give for the great cause. Some were deputies from small kingdoms, some from large principalities, some from impoverished states, but all declared that they would add something to what had been offered. Their promises were written on the tablets of the great Copt, and they were bound by an oath to keep them. Now, said he, you have seen and recognized the Michels of our watchword, let it be placed on your hearts, and in them. For we, the sovereign lord of the East and West, have decreed the downfall of the lily. Hear it, then, brethren, Lilia Pedibus de True. 
Loud was their shout at this explanation of the mysterious letters, so loud that the gorges of the mountains re-echoed to it. And now, retire, said the master, when silence had succeeded, retire by those subterranean passages which lead to the quarries of Mont Tonnerre. Disperse before the rising of the sun. You shall see me once more, and it will be on the day of our triumph. Go. His words were followed by a Masonic sign, understood only by the six heads of the assembly, so that they remained around him when the rest had disappeared. Swedenborg, said he, thou art truly inspired. God thanks thee by me for thy efforts in his cause. I shall give thee an address to which thou shalt send the promised money to France. The president bowed, and departed, full of astonishment at that intelligence which had discovered his name. I grant thee, Fairfax, continued the master, thou art worthy of thy great ancestor. Remember me to Washington when next thou writest to him. Fairfax bowed, and followed Swedenborg. Come, Paul Jones, said the Copt, thou spokest bravely, thou shalt be the hero of America. Let her be ready at the first signal. The American thrilled in every nerve, as if the breath of some divine being had passed over him, and retired also. And now, as to thee, Lavater, abjure thy theories, it is the time for action. Study no longer what man is, but what he may be. Go. Woe to thy countrymen if they rise against us, for our people will devour in its wrath as the wrath of God devours. The trembling Swiss bowed and departed. Here, Ziminish, he went on, addressing the Spaniard, Thou art zealous, but distrustful. Thy country sleeps, but it is because none awakes her. Go. Castile is still the country of the Cid. The last of the six was advancing, but by a gesture the copt forbid him. Sigh effort of Russia, before a month thou wilt betray our cause, but in a month thou shalt be no more. The Russian envoy fell on his knees, but a threatening movement of the master made him rise, and with tottering steps he also departed. And now this singular man, whom we have introduced as the hero of our drama, left alone, looked around the empty, silent hall, buttoned up his black velvet coat. Fixed his hat firmly on his head touched the spring of the great bronze gate which had closed behind him, and sallied out into the defile of the mountain. Though he had neither guide nor light, he went on rapidly, as if led by an invisible hand. Having passed the thick belt of trees, he looked for his horse, but not seeing him, he listened, and soon thought he heard a distant neighing. He whistled with a peculiar modulation, and in a moment Jared could be seen coming forward like a faithful and obedient dog. The traveller sprang to the saddle, and quickly disappeared in the darkness, which spread over the heath extending from Mont Tonnerre to Danenfels. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. I, The Storm Eight days after the scene just related, about five in the evening, a carriage with four horses and two postilions, left Pontemousin, a small town between Nancy and Metz. It had taken fresh horses at an inn, in spite of the recommendation of an attentive hostess who was on the lookout for belated travellers, and continued on its road to Paris. Its four horses had scarcely turned the corner of the street, when a score of children and half a score of gossips, who had watched the progress of their being put to, returned to their respective dwellings with gestures and exclamations expressive in some of great mirth, in others of great astonishment. All this was because nothing like that carriage had for fifty years passed the bridge which good King Stanislaus threw across the Moselle to facilitate the intercourse of his little kingdom with France. We do not accept even those curious vehicles of Alsace, which bring from Fallsburg to our fairs two-headed wonders, dancing bears, and the wandering tribes of harlequins, and gypsies. In fact, without being either a child or a curious old gossip, surprise might have arrested one's steps on seeing this primitive machine, on four massive wheels. Roll by with such velocity that everyone exclaimed. What a strange way of traveling post! As our readers, fortunately for them, did not see it pass, 
we shall describe it. First, then, the principal carriage, we say principal, because in front it was a sort of cabriolet, the principal carriage was painted light blue, and bore on its panels a baronial scroll, surmounting a J and a B entwined. Two windows, large windows, with white muslin curtains, gave it light, only these windows, invisible to the profane vulgar, looked frontwise into the cabriolet. A grating covered them through which one might speak to the inhabitants of the carriage. This carriage, which was eight feet long, had no light but from the windows, and no air but from a ventilator on the top. And then, to complete its oddity, a chimney rising about a foot above the roof offered to the passers-by the pleasant sight of a cloud of smoke lengthening into a bluish trail behind it. At the present day we should only have thought it a new invention combining the power of steam with that of horses. This would have seemed so much the more probable that the carriage, preceded, as we have said, by four horses and two postilions, was followed by one horse, fastened to it by his bridle. His small head, slender legs, narrow chest, and silky mane and tail bespoke him of Arab race. He was ready saddled, which indicated that one of the travellers shut up in this Noah's Ark sometimes enjoyed the pleasure of riding beside the carriage. At Pontemousin the postillion who left had received, besides the pay for the horses, a double gratuity, presented by a strong but white hand, slipped through the leather curtains of the cabriolet, which shaded it as imperviously as the muslin ones did the carriage. Many thanks, my lord, said the astonished postillion, quickly taking off his cap and bowing low. A sonorous voice replied in German for at Nancy German is still understood though no longer spoken, schnell. Schneller, which means fast. Faster. Postilions understand nearly all languages, above all, when accompanied by the sound of certain metals, of which F.T. is said they are rather fond. So the two new postilions did their utmost to keep to a gallop, but after efforts which did more honor to their arms than to the powers of their horses, wearied out, they fell into a trot. Getting on at the rate of two and a half or three leagues an hour. Toward seven they changed at St. Mihiel, the same hand passed through the curtain's payment for the last stage, and the same voice uttered a similar injunction. There is no doubt the strange vehicle excited there the same curiosity as at Pontemousin, for as night was fast approaching, its appearance was still more fantastic. Beyond the steep. Mihiel there is a steep hill, and travelers must be satisfied to let the horses walk. It took half an hour to proceed a quarter of a league. On the top the postilions stopped a moment to breathe their horses, and the travellers in the carriage, by withdrawing the curtains, might have gazed on a wide prospect, had not the mists of evening begun to veil it slightly. The weather had been clear and warm until three in the afternoon, toward evening, however, it became oppressive. A great white cloud from the south seemed as if intentionally to follow the carriage, threatening to overtake it before it reached Barlodouk, where the postilions resolved at all risks to pass the night. The road, shut in between the hill and a rugged declivity, descended to a valley, in which was seen the winding muse, and was so steep that it was dangerous to allow the horses to do anything but walk, which prudent plan the postilions adopted. The cloud advanced, and as it brooded over and almost touched the ground, continually extended its limits by drawing the vapors arising from the soil. So was it observed an ill-boding whiteness to overwhelm the bluish clouds which seemed to take up their station to windward, like ships preparing for an engagement. Soon, with the rapidity of the flood tide, it spread until it hid the last rays of the sun. A dim gray light struggled through upon the scene, and although no breeze swept along, the leaves shivered, and put on the dark tinge which they assume in the deepening twilight succeeding sunset. Suddenly a flash illuminated the cloud, the heavens burst into sheets of flame, and the startled eye might penetrate the immeasurable depths of the firmament. At the same moment the thunder rolled from tree to tree, shaking the earth, and hurrying on the vast cloud like a maddened steed. On went the carriage, sending forth its smoke, now changed in color by the changes of the atmosphere. In the meantime, the heavens grew darker and darker, but a purple light appeared from the carriage, as if the person within, careless of the storm, had lighted a lamp and went on with some work which he had to accomplish. The vehicle was now on a level part of the mountain, and when about to begin the descent, 
a peal of thunder more violent than the first rent the clouds, and the rain fell at first in large drops, then thick and smarting. Like arrows darted from the heavens. The postillion seemed to consult together, and then stopped. Well, cried the voice which had before spoken, but now in excellent French. What the devil are you doing? We were consulting whether we should go on, replied the postillions. I think you ought to ask me, not one another. On with you. The postillions obeyed, for there was that in the voice which forbade all thought of disobedience, and the carriage began to descend. Good. Said the voice, and the leather curtains, which had been half opened, fell between the traveller and the postillions. But the road had become so slippery from the torrents of rain, that the horses stopped of themselves. Sir, said the leading postillion, it is impossible to go any further. Why? asked the voice within. Because the horses only slip, they cannot get on, they will fall. How far are we from the next place where we change? A good way, sir, for leagues. Well, postillion, put silver shoes on your horses, and they will get on, and as he said this the stranger opened the curtain and held out four crowns. Many thanks. Said the postillion, receiving them in his broad hand, and slipping them into his great boot. The gentleman spoke, I think, said the other postillion, who had heard the sound of money, and did not wish to be excluded from so interesting a conversation. Yes, the gentleman says we must push on. Have you anything to say against that, my friend? asked the traveller, in a kind voice, but with a firmness that showed he would brook no contradiction. Why, as to myself, I have nothing to say, but the horses won't stir. What is the use of your spurs, then? I have buried them in the sides of the poor jades, and if it has made them move a step, may heaven. He had not time to finish his oath, for a frightful peal of thunder interrupted him. This is no weather for Christians to be out in, said the honest fellow. See, sir, see. The carriage is going of itself, in five minutes it will go fast enough, Jesus dying. There we go. And in fact, the heavy machine, pressing on the horses, they lost their footing. It then made a progressive movement, and, according to the mathematical increase of forces, its velocity augmented till, with the rapidity of an arrow, it was visibly nearing the edge of a precipice. It was not now only the voice of the traveller which was heard, his head was seen thrust out of the cabriolet. Stupid fellow, cried he, will you kill us? To the left. The leaders to the left. Ah, monsieur, I wish from my heart I saw you on the left, replied the frightened postillion, vainly trying to recover the reins. Joseph, cried a female voice, now first heard, Joseph. Help. Help. Oh, holy virgin! Indeed, danger so terrible and so imminent might well call forth that ejaculation. The carriage, impelled by its own weight, neared the precipice, already one of the leaders appeared suspended over it. Three revolutions of the wheel, and horses, carriage and postillions would all have been precipitated, crushed and mangled, to its base, when the traveller, springing from the cabriolet on the pole, seized the postillion by the collar lifted him like a child, flung him two paces from him, leaped into the saddle, and, gathering up the reins, called to the second postillion. To the left, rascal, or I will blow out thy brains. The command acted like magic. By an extraordinary effort the postillion gave an impulse to the carriage, brought it to the middle of the road, on which it began to roll on rapidly, with a noise that contended with that of the thunder. Gallop! cried the traveller, gallop. If you slacken your speed, I will run you through the body, and your horses, too. The postillion felt that this was no vain menace, he redoubled his efforts, and the carriage descended with frightful speed. As it thus passed in the night, with its fearful noise, its flaming chimney, and its stifled cries from within, it might have been taken for some infernal chariot drawn by phantom horses and pursued by a hurricane. But if the travellers escaped from one danger, they met another. The cloud which had hung over the valley was as rapid as the horses. From time to time, as a flash rent the darkness, the traveller raised his head, and then, by its gleam, anxiety, perhaps fear, 
might have been seen on his face, for dissimulation was not wanted then, God only saw him. Just as the carriage had reached level ground, and was only carried on by its own impetus, the cloud burst with an awful explosion. A violet flame, changing to green and then to white, wrapped the horses, the hind ones reared, snuffling the sulfurous air, the leaders, as if the ground had given way beneath their feet, fell flat. But almost instantly the horse upon which the postillion was mounted regained his feet, and finding his traces snapped by the shock, he carried off his rider, who disappeared in the darkness, while the carriage, after proceeding ten yards farther, was stopped by encountering the dead body of the lightning-stricken horse. All this was accomplished by piercing shrieks from the female in the vehicle. There was a moment of strange confusion, in which no one knew whether he was dead or living. The traveller felt himself all over to assure himself of his own identity. He was safe and sound, but the woman had fainted. Although he suspected this from the silence which had succeeded to her shrieks, it was not to her that his first cares were directed. Scarcely had he lighted on the ground, when he hastened to the back of the vehicle. There was the beautiful Arabian horse of which we have spoken, terrified, rigid, with every hair rising as if life were in it. He tugged violently at his fastening, shaking the door to the handle of which he was secured. His eye was fixed, the foam was on his nostrils, but after vain efforts to break away, he had remained, horror-stricken by the tempest. And, when his master whistled to him in his usual manner, and put out his hand to caress him, he bounded aside, neighing, as if he did not know him. I, always that devil of a horse, muttered a broken voice from the carriage. Curse him, he has broken my wall. Then, with double emphasis, this voice cried, in Arabic. Be still, demon. Do not be angry with Jared, master, said the traveller, loosing the horse, which he now tied to one of the hind wheels. He has been frightened that is all, and indeed, one might well have been frightened at less. Saying this, he opened the carriage door, let down the step, entered, and closed the door after him. 2. Althotas. The traveller found himself face to face with an old man with grey eyes, a hooked nose, and trembling but busy hands. He was half buried in a great chair, and turned, with his right hand, the leaves of a manuscript on parchment, called La Chiave del Gabinetto, in his left he held a silver skimming dish. His attitude, his occupation, his face, motionless and deeply wrinkled, alive only, as it were, in the eyes and mouth, may seem strange to the reader, but they were certainly very familiar to the traveller. For he scarcely cast a look on the old man, nor on all that surrounded him, and yet it was worth the trouble. Three walls, so the old man called the sides of the carriage, were covered by shelves filled with books. These walls shut in his chair, his usual and principal seat, while above the books had been planned for his convenience several articles for holding vials, decanters, and boxes set in wooden cases as earthen and glassware are secured at sea. He could thus reach anything without assistance, for his chair was on wheels, and with the aid of a spring he could raise it and lower it to any height necessary to attain what he wanted. The room, for so we must call it, was eight feet long, six wide, and six high. Opposite the door was a little furnace with its shade, bellows, and tongs. At that moment there boiled in a crucible a mixture which sent out by the chimney the mysterious smoke of which we have spoken, and which excited so much surprise in old and young who saw the carriage pass. Besides the vials, boxes, books, and papers strewed around, copper pincers were seen and pieces of charcoal which had been dipped in various liquids. There was also a large vase half full of water, and from the roof, hung by threads, were bundles of herbs, some apparently gathered the night before, others a hundred years ago. A keen odor prevailed in this laboratory which in one less strange would have been called a perfume. As the traveller entered, the old man wheeled his chair with wonderful ease to the furnace, and was about to skim the mixture in the crucible attentively, nay, almost respectfully, but disturbed by the appearance of the other, he grumbled. Drew over his ears his cap of velvet, once black, and from under which a few locks of silver hair peeped out. Then he sharply pulled from beneath one of the wheels of his chair the skirt of his long silk robe, a robe now nothing but a shapeless, colorless, ragged, covering. 
The old man appeared to be in a very bad humor, and grumbled as he went on with his operation. Afraid, the accursed animal. Afraid of what? He has shaken the wall, moved the furnace, spilled a quart of my elixir in the fire. Akarat, in heaven's name, get rid of that brute in the first desert we come to. In the first place, said the other, smiling, we shall come to no deserts, we are in France. Secondly, I should not like to leave to his fate a horse worth a thousand Louis Dior's, or, rather, a horse above all price, for he is of the race of Alboric. A thousand Louis Dior's. I will give you them, or what is equal to them. That horse has cost me more than a million, to say nothing of the time, the life, he has robbed me of. What has he done, poor Jared? What has he done? The elixir was boiling, not a drop escaping, true, neither Zoroaster or Paracelsus says that none must escape, but Bori recommends it. Well, dear master, in a few moments more the elixir will boil again. Boil? See. There is a curse on it, the fire is going out. I know not what is falling down the chimney. I know what is falling, said the disciple, laughing, water. Water? Water? Then the elixir is ruined. The operation must be begun again, as if I had time to lose. Heaven and earth, cried the old man, raising his hands in despair. Water? What kind of water, Akarat? Pure water, master, rain from the sky. Have you not seen that it rained? How should I see anything when I am working? Water? You see, Akarat, how this troubles my poor brain. For six months, nay, for a year, I have been asking you for a funnel for my chimney. You never think of anything, yet, what have you to do, you who are young? Thanks to your neglect, it is now the rain, now the wind, which ruins all my operations, and yet, by Jupiter. I have no time to lose. You know it, the day decreed is near. And if I am not ready for that day, if I have not found the elixir of life, farewell to the philosopher. Farewell to the wise Althotas. My hundredth year begins on the fifteenth of July, at eleven at night, and from this time to that my elixir must attain perfection. But it is going on famously, dear master. Yes, I have made some trials by absorption. My left arm, nearly paralyzed, has regained its power, then, only eating, as I do, once in two or three days, and taking a spoonful of my elixir, though yet imperfect, I have more time, and am assisted on by hope. Oh, when I think that I want but one plant, but one leaf of a plant, to perfect my elixir, and that we have perhaps passed by that plant a hundred, five hundred, a thousand times. Perhaps our horses have trodden it, our wheels crushed it, Akarat, that very plant of which Pliny speaks, and which no sage has yet found or discovered, for nothing is lost. But say, Akarat, you must ask its name from Lorenza in one of her trances. Fear not, master, I will ask her. Meantime, said the philosopher, with a deep sigh, my elixir remains imperfect, and three times fifteen days will be necessary to reach the point at which I was today. Have a care, Akarat, your loss will be as great as mine if I die, and my work incomplete. But what voice is that? Does the carriage move? No, master, you hear thunder. Thunder? Yes, we have nearly all been killed by a thunderbolt. But my silk coat protected me. Now, see to what your childish freaks expose me, Akarat. To die by a thunderbolt, to be stupidly killed by an electric fire that I would myself bring down from heaven, if I had time, to boil my pot, this is not only exposing me to accidents which the malice or awkwardness of men bring on us. But to those which come from heaven, and which may be easily prevented. Your pardon, master, I do not understand. What, did I not explain to you my system of points, my paper kite conductor? When I have found my elixir, I shall tell it you again, but now, you see, I have not time. And you believe one may master the thunderbolt of heaven? Certainly, not only master it, but conduct it where you choose. And when I have passed my second half-century, when I shall have but calmly to await a third, 
I shall put a steel bridle on a thunderbolt, and guide it as easily as you do Jared. Meantime, put a funnel on my chimney, I beg you. I shall. Rest easy. I shall, always the future, as if we could both look forward to the future. Oh, I shall never be understood, cried the philosopher, writhing in his chair, and tossing his arms in despair. Be calm. He tells me to be calm, and in three months, if I have not completed my elixir, all will be over. But so that I pass my second half century, that I recover my powers of motion, I shall meet no one who says, I shall do, I shall then myself exclaim, I have done. Do you hope to say that, with regard to our great work? Yes. Were I but as sure of, oh, heavens! Discovering the elixir as I am of making the diamond. Then you are sure of that? It is certain, since I have already made some. Made some? Yes, look. Where? On your right, in the little glass vase. The traveller anxiously seized the little crystal cup, to the bottom and sides of which adhered an almost impalpable powder. Diamond dust? cried the young man. Yes, diamond dust, but in the middle of it. Yes, yes, a brilliant of the size of a millet seed. The size is nothing. We shall attain to the union of the dust, and make the grain of millet seed a grain of hemp seed, and of the grain of hemp seed a pea. But first, my dear Akarat, put a funnel on my chimney, and a conductor on the carriage, that the rain may not descend through my chimney, and that the lightning may go and sport itself elsewhere. Yes, yes, doubt it not. Be calm. Again, again, this eternal, be calm. You make me swear. Youth, mad youth. Presumptuous youth, cried the old man, with a laugh of scorn, which showed all his toothless gums, and made his eyes sink deeper in their hollow sockets. Master, said Akarat, your fire is going out, your crucible cooling. But what is in the crucible? Look into it. The young man obeyed, uncovered the crucible, and found in it a heap of vitrified charcoal, about the size of a small seed. A diamond, cried he, then, after a slight examination of it, yes, but stained, incomplete, valueless. Because the fire was put out, because there is no funnel on the chimney. Let me look at it again, master, said the young man, turning in his hand the diamond, which sometimes shot forth brilliant rays and sometimes was dull. Good. Pardon me and take some food. It is unnecessary. I took my spoonful of elixir two hours ago. You are mistaken, dear master, it was at six in the morning that you took it. Well, and what o'clock is it now? Half past eight in the evening. Heaven and earth. Another day passed. Gone forever. But the days are shorter than they were, there are not twenty-four hours in them now. If you will not eat, sleep at least for some minutes. Well, yes, I will sleep two hours, yes, just two hours. Look at your watch, and in two hours awake me. I promise to do so. Dost thou know, dear Akarat, said the old man, in a caressing tone, when I sleep, I always fear it will be for eternity, so in two hours you will wake me. Will you not? Promise it, swear it. I swear it, master. In two hours. In two hours. Just then, something like the trampling of a horse was heard, and then a shout which indicated alarm and surprise. What does that mean? cried the traveller. And hurriedly opening the carriage door, he leaped out. 3. Florenza Feliciani. We shall now inform the reader what passed outside, while the philosopher and the traveller were conversing inside the carriage. At the noise of the thunderbolt, which struck down two of the horses, and caused the other two to rear so frightfully, the lady in the cabriolet, as we have said, had fainted. She remained for some minutes motionless. Then, as fear alone had caused her to swoon, by slow degrees her consciousness returned. Ah, heaven, she exclaimed, abandoned here, helpless, with no human creature to take pity on me. Madam, replied a timid voice, I am here, if I can be of any service to you. At the sound of this voice, which seemed close to her ear, 
the young lady rose, put her head out between the leather curtains, and found herself face to face with a young man, who was standing on the step of the cabriolet. It was you who spoke, sir, said she. Yes, madam, answered the young man. And you offered me your services? Yes. But first, tell me what has happened. The thunderbolt, which fell almost on your carriage, broke the traces of the front horses, and one of them ran off with the postillion. The lady looked uneasily around. And he who rode the hinder horses, she asked. He has just got into the carriage, madam. Has he not been injured? Not in the least. Are you sure? He leaped from his horse, at least, like a man all safe and sound. Heaven be praised, and the young lady breathed more freely. But who are you, sir, who are here so opportunely to offer me assistance? Madam, overtaken by the storm, I was down in that hollow, which is merely the entrance to a quarry, when all at once I heard a carriage coming with alarming speed. I at first supposed the horses had run off, but soon saw that they were managed by a powerful hand. Then the thunderbolt fell with a tremendous explosion, and I thought for an instant that all was over with me. Indeed, on recovering, all that I have related seemed but a dream. Then you are not sure that the gentleman entered the carriage? Oh, yes, madam, I had quite recovered and distinctly saw him enter. Make yourself certain, I entreat you, that he is in the carriage. But how? Listen, if he be there, you will hear two voices. The young man jumped down from the step, and approached the door of the carriage. Yes, madam, said he, returning to her, he is there. The young lady, by a movement of her head, seemed to say, it is well, but she remained for some time as if plunged in deep reverie. During this time the young man had leisure to examine her appearance. She was about three or four and twenty years of age, a brunette in complexion, but of that rich brown which is more beautiful than the most delicate tint of the rose. Her fine blue eyes, raised to heaven, from which she seemed to ask counsel, shone like two stars, and her black hair, which she wore without powder, notwithstanding the fashion of the day, fell in jetty curls on her neck. All at once she roused herself, as if she had decided on her part. Sir, said she, where are we now? On the road from Strasbourg to Paris, madam. On what part of the road? Two leagues from Pierrefit. What is Pierrefit? A village. And after Pierrefit what is the next stage? Barleduc. Is it a town? Yes, madam. A large one. About four or five thousand inhabitants. Is there any crossroad by which one could get more directly to Barleduc? No, madam, at least, I know of none. Heck Cato, murmured she, falling back in the cabriolet. The young man waited, expecting to be questioned further, but as she kept silence, he moved a step or two away. This roused her, for, leaning out again, she called, hurriedly. Monsieur. The young man returned. I am here, madam, said he, approaching her. One question, if you please. Speak, madam. There was a horse behind the carriage. Yes, madam. Is he there still? No, madam, the person who got into the carriage untied him and fastened him to the wheel. Nothing, then, has injured the horse. I think not. He is a valuable animal, and I should like to be sure that he is safe, but how can I reach him through this mud? I can bring the horse here, said the young man. Oh, yes, do so, I pray, I shall be forever grateful to you. The young man approached the horse, who tossed his head and neighed. Do not be afraid, said the female, he is as gentle as a lamb, then, in a low voice, she murmured, Jared. Jared. The animal evidently knew the voice to be that of his mistress, for he snorted and stretched out his intelligent head toward the cabriolet. During this time the young man was untying him, but the horse no sooner felt his bridle in unpractised hands than at one bound he was free and twenty paces from the carriage. Jared, repeated the young woman, in her most caressing tones, Jared. Here, here. The Arabian tossed his head, snuffed the air, 
and came toward the cabriolet, pawing as if in time to some musical air. The lady leaned out. Come, Jared, come, said she. And the obedient animal advanced toward the hand which she held out to caress him. Then, with her slender hand, she seized him by the mane, and sprang as lightly into the saddle as the goblin in the German ballads, who leaps behind unwary travellers, and holds on by their belts. The young man hurried towards her, but she waved him off imperiously. Hearken, said she, though young, or rather, because you are young, you ought to be humane. Do not oppose my flight. I leave a man whom I love. But my religion is still dearer to me. That man will destroy my soul if I stay with him longer, he is an atheist and a necromancer. God has warned him by his thunders, may he profit by the warning. Tell him what I have said, and receive my blessing for what you have done for me, farewell. At that word, light as a vapor, she disappeared, borne away by the aerial Jared. The young man, seeing her flee, could not prevent a cry of astonishment escaping his lips. It was this cry which startled the traveller in the carriage. 4. Gilbert. The cry had, as we have said, aroused the traveller. He leaped out, shut the door carefully after him, and looked uneasily around. The first object which he beheld was the young man standing there in alarm. The lightning, which flashed incessantly, enabled him to examine him from head to foot, a practice which seemed habitual with the traveller when any unknown person or thing met his eye. He was a youth sixteen or seventeen years old, little, thin, and muscular. His black eyes, which he fixed boldly on any object which attracted his attention, wanted mildness, but had a certain kind of beauty. His nose, small and turned up, his thin lip and projecting cheekbones, betokened cunning and circumspection, and the strong curve of his chin announced firmness. Did you shout just now? asked the traveller. Yes, sir. And why? Because, he stopped short. Because, repeated the traveller. Sir, there was a lady in the cabriolet. Yes. And the eyes of Bolsamo darted on the carriage, as if they could have penetrated its sides. There was a horse tied to the wheel. Yes, where the devil is he? Sir, the lady has fled on the horse. The traveller, without uttering a word, sprung to the cabriolet, undrew the curtains, and a flash of lightning showed him it was empty. Sang do Christ, shouted he, loud almost as the thunder which pealed at that moment. Then he looked round, as if for some means of recovering the fugitives, but soon felt that it was vain. To try to overtake Jared, he muttered, with a common horse, would be to hunt the gazelle with the tortoise. But I shall know where she is, unless. He felt hurriedly in the pocket of his vest, and drew from it a little case, opened it, and took out of a folded paper a curl of black hair. At the sight of it the traveller's face lost its anxious expression, and his manner became calm, at least, in appearance. Well, said he, wiping the perspiration from his forehead, well and did she say nothing on leaving? Oh, yes, sir. What did she say? That she quitted you, not through hatred, but fear, that she is a good Christian, and that you, hesitated. And that I? I know not how to tell it. Pardieu. Tell it. That you are an atheist and an infidel, that God has given you a last warning by the storm, that she understood that warning, and conjures you not to be deaf to it. A smile of contempt curled the lip of the traveller. And this was all she said? Yes, this was all. Well, let us speak of something else, and all trace of disquietude passed away from the traveller's countenance. The young man remarked all these emotions reflected on his face, with a curiosity indicating no deficiency on his side of powers of observation. And now, said the traveller, what is your name, my young friend? Gilbert. Sir. Gilbert. That is merely a baptismal name. It is the name of our family. Well, my dear Gilbert, Providence has sent you to my aid. I shall be happy if I can oblige you, sir. Thank you. At your age one is obliging for the mere pleasure of the thing, but what I am going to ask is only a trifle, merely if you can direct me to a shelter for the night. 
Why, in the first place, there is that rock under which I was sheltering just now. Yes, said the traveler, but I should like something more like a house, where I could have a good supper and a good bed. That would be very difficult to find. Are we, then, so far from the next village? From Pierrefit? It is called Pierrefit, then? Yes, sir, it is about a league and a half off. A league and a half. Let us see. Surely there is some habitation nearer. There is the Chateau of Taverny, about three hundred paces from this. Well, then. What, sir? And the young man opened his eyes in astonishment. Why did you not say so at once? The Chateau of Taverny is not an hotel. Is it inhabited? Yes. By whom? Why, by the Baron de Taverny, of course. What is this Baron de Taverny? He is father of Mademoiselle Andre, sir. Very pleasing intelligence, indeed. But I mean what sort of a man is he? An old nobleman, sir, of sixty or sixty-five years of age, he once was rich, they say. I, and poor now. That is the history of all those old barons. Well, show me the way to this baron's abode. To the baron de Taverny's, he asked, in alarm. Then you refuse? No, sir, but. Well. He will not receive you. He will not receive a gentleman in need of shelter. Is he a bear, your baron? Dame. Said the young man, with an expression which said plainly, not much unlike one. Never mind, I'll run the risk. Remember, I do not advise it. Bah, said the traveller, bear as he is, he won't eat me. No. But he may shut the door in your face. Then I'll break it open, so, if you refuse to be my guide. I don't refuse, sir. Show me the way, then. Willingly, sir. The traveller leaped into the cabriolet and brought from it a little lantern. The young man hoped, as it was not lighted, that he should be obliged to open the carriage and that then its interior would be disclosed. But the traveller did nothing of the kind, he put the lantern into Gilbert's hand. What shall I do with it, sir? It will light you on the way, whilst I lead the horses. But it is not lighted. I am going to light it. Oh, you have a fire in the carriage? And in my pocket, replied the traveller. But in this rain the tinder won't kindle. Open the lantern, said the traveller, smiling. Gilbert obeyed. Hold your hat over my hands. Gilbert obeyed, regarding with curiosity what followed, for he knew no other means of procuring a light than with a flint and tinder. The traveller took from his pocket a very small silver case, drew from it a match, which, he rubbed in some sort of inflammable paste, and it kindled instantly, with a slight crackling. Gilbert started. The traveller smiled at his surprise, which was natural enough at that time, when phosphorus was only known to a few chemists, who kept the secret for their own advantage. The candle and the lantern being lighted by the match, he put up the little case. The young man followed his movements with greedy eyes, it was evident he would have given a great deal for such a treasure. Now that we have light, lead on. Follow, now, then, sir, and Gilbert advanced, while his companion, taking the horse by the bit, drugged him after. The weather was now not so bad, the rain had ceased, and the thunder was only heard muttering at a distance. The traveller seemed to wish for more conversation. You know this baron, then, my good fellow? Certainly, sir, since I have lived in his house from my infancy. A relation? No, sir. Your guardian? No. Your master? The young man started, and coloured with anger at the word master. I am not a servant, sir, said he. Well, but you are surely something or other. I am the son of an old tenant of the baron, my mother nursed Mademoiselle Andre. I understand, being the young lady's foster brother, for I presume she is young, you live at free quarters in the house. She is sixteen, sir. Now, in the traveller's last words there was something like two questions, but Gilbert avoided any reply to that which concerned himself. 
The traveler seemed to observe this, and gave his interrogations another turn. How did you happen to be out during such weather? I was under a rock near the road. What were you doing there? I was reading. You were reading? Yes. What were you reading? Le Contrat Social by Rousseau. The traveler looked at the young man with surprise. Did you get that book in the Baron's library? No, sir, I bought it. Where, at Barleduc? No, sir, from a peddler. They roam this way now and then, and bring us some tolerably good books. Who told you Le Contrat Social was a good book? I soon found that out, as I read it. Have you read bad books, then, that you know the difference so well? Yes. What do you call bad books? Why, Lo Sofa, Tanzai, and Sadarn and books of that description. But where the deuce did you get such books? In the Baron's library. And how does the Baron get new novels in this den of his? They are sent to him from Paris. So this poor Baron spends his money on that sort of trash. No, they are given him. Given him? By whom? By one of his friends, a great nobleman. A great nobleman? Do you know his name? The Duke de Richelieu. What, the Marshal? Yes, the Marshal. I take it for granted he does not leave such books in Mademoiselle André's way. Indeed, sir, he leaves them in everybody's way. Is Mademoiselle André of your opinion, asked the traveller, with a sly smile, that they are bad? She does not read them, sir, replied Gilbert, drilly. The traveller was silent for a minute, this character, a singular mixture of shame and boldness, of good and evil, interested him in spite of himself. And why did you read those books when you knew they were bad? Because I did not know when I began them. But you soon found it out. Yes. And nevertheless you went on. Yes. But why? They taught me things I did not know before. And, look Conrad Social. It teaches me things that I have guessed. How so? Why, that men are brothers, that societies in which they are serfs or slaves are ill-constituted, that one day we shall all be equal. Oh, ho, said the traveller. There was a short silence. So, my good fellow, continued the traveller, in a low voice, you wish to be instructed? Yes, sir, that is my most ardent wish. And what do you wish to learn? Everything. For what purpose? To raise myself in the world. And how high would you rise? Gilbert hesitated. No doubt he had his mind made up on that point, but it was evidently a secret, and he would not reveal it. As high as man can rise, he replied. Well, have you studied anything? Nothing. How can I study, not being rich, and living at Taverny? Then you know nothing of mathematics? No. Nor of natural philosophy? No. Nor of chemist? No. I know only how to read and write, but I shall know all those things. When? Some day or other. But how? I don't know yet. Strange creature, muttered the traveller. And then, murmured Gilbert, speaking to himself. Well. Then. Nothing. They had now proceeded for about a quarter of an hour, the rain had ceased, and the earth sent up those odoriferous exhalations which in spring follow a great storm. Gilbert seemed reflecting, all at once he said. Sir, do you know the cause of storms? Certainly. You really do? Yes. You know the cause of the thunderbolt? The traveller smiled. It is the meeting of two streams of the electric fluid, one from the clouds, the other from the earth. Gilbert sighed. I do not understand that, said he. Perhaps the traveller would have explained the matter more clearly, but just then a light appeared through the trees. Ah! What is that? asked the stranger. It is Taverny. We have reached it, then. Yes. This is the gate of the back entrance. Open it. And do you think the gate of Taverny, 
sir, can be opened with a push. Is it a fortified place, then? Knock. Gilbert approached the gate, and timidly gave one knock. Pardieu. They will never hear that. Knock loudly. Nothing, indeed, indicated that Gilbert's knock had been heard, all was silent. You must take the responsibility upon yourself, sir, then, said Gilbert. Don't be troubled about that. Gilbert hesitated no longer, left the knocker, and pulled a string which made a bell sound so loud one might have heard it a mile off. Ma foi. If your baron does not hear that, said the traveller, he must be deaf. Hark! I hear Mahone barking. Mahone. That is no doubt a compliment from your baron to his friend, the Duc de Richelieu. I don't know what you mean, sir. Mahone was the last place taken by the marshal. Oh, sir, I told you I know nothing, and Gilbert sighed again. These sighs revealed to the stranger some hidden ambition, some secret cause of pain. A step was heard. Here is someone at last, said the stranger. It is Master La Brie, said Gilbert. The gate opened, but La Brie, taken by surprise at seeing the stranger and the carriage, when he expected no one but Gilbert, would have shut it again. Excuse me, my friend. But I have come here purposely, and you must not shut the door in my face. But, sir, I must tell the baron that an unexpected visitor. Never mind I shall run the risk of his looking a little cross at me, but he shall not turn me out, I can tell you, until I have got warmed, dried, and fed. They say you have good wine in this part of the country. Do you happen to know? La Brie, instead of replying, was going to make further resistance, but it was in vain. The traveller pushed in, and Gilbert closed the gate after him, the two horses and carriage being in the avenue. La Brie, seeing himself vanquished, proceeded as quickly as his old limbs would permit, toward the house, to announce his own defeat, shouting with all his strength, Nicole Legay, Nicole Legay. Who is this Nicole? asked the stranger, calmly making his way to the house. Nicole Legay, sir, replied Gilbert, with symptoms of some inward emotion. Yes, she whom Master La Brie is calling. Mademoiselle André's waiting maid, sir. In the meantime, in answer to the calls of La Brie, a light appeared under the trees, borne by a beautiful young girl. What do you want, La Brie? What is all this fuss? asked she. Quick, Nicole, cried the quivering voice of the old man, run and tell the baron a strange gentleman is come to ask shelter. Nicole did not wait to be told twice, but flew off toward the chateau so quickly that in a moment she was out of sight. As to La Brie, having thus satisfied himself that the baron should not be taken by surprise, he stopped and took breath. The message soon produced an effect. A sharp, commanding voice was heard from the house, repeating, with an accent by no means indicating a wish to be hospitable, a strange gentleman. Who is he? People don't come in that way without sending up their names. Is it the baron himself, asked he who was the cause of all the disturbance? Oh, yes, sir, replied the poor frightened old man, you hear what he says. He asks my name, I think. Yes. I forgot to ask it, sir. Say the Baron Joseph Balsamo. Our titles being the same, he will, perhaps, not be so angry. La Brie, a little emboldened by the rank of the stranger, announced him as he requested. Well, grumbled the voice from the house, since he is there, he must come in. Here, sir, this way, this way. The stranger advanced quickly. But just as he reached the foot of the stone steps leading up to the door, he turned to see whether Gilbert was there or not. Gilbert had disappeared. V. The Baron de Taverny. Although M. some degree forewarned by Gilbert of the poverty of the Baron de Taverny, the person who bad caused himself to be announced as the Baron Joseph Balsamo could not help being surprised at the miserable appearance of the abode, called by Gilbert, with emphasis, a chateau. The house was built in the form of an oblong square of one story in height, with a square tower at each corner. Its irregular appearance had, however, something pleasing and picturesque, 
seen by the pale light of the moon, shining out from between the huge masses of the clouds left by the storm. There were six windows in the low building, and two in each tower, that is, one window in each of its stories. A broad flight of steps led up to the hall door, but they were so broken and rugged that they seemed rather a sort of precipice than a staircase. Such was the dwelling, on the threshold of which the stranger was received by the Baron de Taverny, in his dressing gown, and holding a candlestick in his hand. The Baron was a little old man of from sixty to sixty-five years of age, with a keen eye and a high, retreating forehead. He wore an old wig, which from frequent accidents with the candles on the mantelpiece had lost all the curls which the rats, which frequented his wardrobe, had left it. He held in his hand a napkin of very dubious whiteness, which indicated that he had been disturbed when going to sit down to supper. In his malicious countenance, which slightly resembled that of Voltaire, two expressions struggled for mastery, politeness required a smile for his guest, but vexation returned it to a rather decided atrabilious sneer. And thus lighted as he was by the candle in his hand, the flickering of which disturbed his features, the Baron de Taverny could not well be called anything but a very ugly nobleman. Sir, said he, may I know to what fortunate circumstance I owe the pleasure of seeing you? Simply, sir, to the storm, which frightened my horses and caused them very nearly to destroy my carriage. One of my postilions was thrown from his horse, the other galloped off with his, and I know not what I should have done, had I not met a young man who conducted me to your chateau, assuring me that your hospitality was well known. The baron raised his light to endeavor to discover the unlucky wight who had, by this piece of information, been the cause of the unwelcome visit. Bolsamo also looked around for his guide, but he had retired. And do you know the name of the young man who pointed out my chateau, asked the baron de Taverny, as if he wanted to return him thanks. Gilbert, I think, is his name. Ha! Gilbert. I scarcely thought him fit even for that, an idle dog, a philosopher, you must know, sir. The threatening tone in which these epithets were uttered showed that there was little sympathy between the lord and his vassal. However, sir, said the baron, after a moment's silence, as expressive as his words, will you be good enough to enter? Allow me first, sir, to see after my carriage, which contains some very valuable articles. La Brie! cried the baron, La Brie! Get some assistance, and put the gentleman's carriage under the shed in the yard, there are still some laths of a roof there. I can't answer for your horses, however, getting a good feed, but as they are not yours, but the postmaster's, you need not care very much. In truth, sir, said the traveller, beginning to get impatient, I fear that I am giving you quite too much trouble. Not at all, sir, not at all, no trouble to me, but you will be rather poorly lodged, I warn you. Sir, I assure you I feel exceedingly grateful. Pray do not deceive yourself as to what we can do for you, said the baron, raising his candle so as to throw its rays in the direction where Bolsamo was assisting La Brie to wheel his carriage under the shed. And elevating his voice in proportion as his guest retreated. Pray do not deceive yourself. Taverny is a dull abode, a wretched place. The traveller was too busy to reply. He chose the best covered part of the shed to shelter the carriage, and having pointed it out to La Brie, slipped a Louis d'Or into his hand, and returned to the baron. La Brie put the Louis in his pocket, supposing it only a crown, and thanking heaven for his good fortune. Heaven forbid I should think ill of your chateau as you speak of it, said Bolsamo, bowing to the baron, who, as the only proof of the truth of his assertion, shook his head, and led the guest through a wide antechamber. Grumbling as he proceeded. Oh, all very good. But I know what I am saying, I know, unfortunately, my own means, and I assure you they are very limited. If you are a Frenchman, sir, but your German accent shows you are not, and yet your name is Italian, but that is no matter, if you are a Frenchman. I repeat the name of Taverny may recall some recollections of splendor, it was once called Taverny the Rich. Bolsamo expected a sigh at this conclusion, but there was none. Philosophy, thought he. This way, this way, cried the baron, opening the dining room door. Hola! Maitre Labrie! 
Wait at supper now as if you were yourself a hundred footmen in one. La Brie bustled about in obedience to this command. I have no servant but this, sir, said Taverny, he is a very bad one, but I have not the means of getting a better. The fool has been with me twenty years without getting a penny of wages. I feed him about as well as he waits on me. He is an ass, you see. Balsamo continued to study this character. No heart, thought he. Yet, perhaps all this is merely affectation. The baron shut the door of the dining room, and then, as he held his light high above Inn's head, the traveller saw distinctly its size and its furniture. It was a large, low hall which had formerly been the principal apartment of a small farmhouse, raised by its owner to the rank of a chateau. It was so scantily furnished, that, at the first glance, it appeared empty. Straw chairs, with carved back some engravings from the battle pieces of Lebrun, framed in black varnished wood, and a large oak cupboard, dark with age and smoke, were all its ornaments. In the middle stood a little round table on which was a dish of partridges and cabbage. The wine was in a stone jar, and the plate, unpolished, worn, and battered, consisted of three covers, one tankard, and one salt cellar, but this last article was very massive, exquisitely chaste, and looked like a diamond among worthless pebbles. There, sir, there said the baron, offering a seat to his guest, whose scrutinizing look on all around did not escape him. Oh, you are looking at my salt cellar. You admire it. Good taste, and very polite, too, for you fix on the only thing here worth looking at. I assure you, sir, I am particularly obliged. But, no, I forget, I have one other valuable commodity, my daughter. Mademoiselle André, said Balsamo. Faith, yes, Mademoiselle André, said the host, surprised that his guest was so well informed. I shall present you to her. André, André. Come hither, child, don't be afraid. I am not afraid, father, answered a sweet and clear voice. And a tall and beautiful girl entered the room, in a manner perfectly unembarrassed, and yet quite free from forwardness. Joseph Balsamo, though, as we have seen, perfectly master of himself, could not prevent an involuntary bow at sight of all powerful beauty like hers. André de Taverny seemed indeed sent to adorn and brighten all around her. She had dark, auburn hair, of a rather lighter shade at her temples and neck, black eyes, clear, with dilated pupils, and a steady and majestic look like that of an eagle, yet the mildness of that look was inexpressible. Her small mouth, formed like Apollo's bow, was brilliant as coral, her tapering hands were antique in form, as were her arms, and dazzlingly fair. Her figure, flexible and firm, was like that of the statue of some pagan goddess to which a miracle had given life. Her foot might bear a comparison with that of the huntress Diana, and it seemed only by a miracle that it could support the weight of her body. Her dress was of the simplest fashion, yet suited her so well that it seemed as if one from the wardrobe of a queen would not have been so elegant or so rich. All these details were perceived by Bosamo in the first glance, as the young lady passed from the door to the table. On his side, the baron had not lost a single impression produced on the mind of his guest by the rare union of perfections in his daughter. You were right, whispered Balsamo. Turning to his host, Mademoiselle André is perfection. Do not flatter poor André, said the baron, carelessly. She has just returned home from her convent, and she will believe all you say, not that I am afraid of her coquetry, on the contrary, the dear child is not enough of a coquette, but, like a good father. I am cultivating in her that first and most important quality for a woman. André looked down and blushed, although she tried to avoid listening, she could not but overhear her father's words. Did they tell Mademoiselle that at the convent? asked Joseph Balsamo, laughing. And was that precept part of the instructions of the nuns? Sir, replied the baron, I have my own way of thinking on particular subjects, as you may see. This was so self-evident that Balsamo merely bowed in assent. No, continued he. I do not imitate those fathers who say to their daughters, Be prudes, be rigid, be blind, think of nothing but honor, delicacy, devotion. 
fools. It is as if the fathers of the knights of old had sent those champions into the lists, after having taken off all their armor, to fight an adversary armed cap a pie. Pardieu. That is not the way I shall bring up my daughter Andre, though she be brought up in this miserable den. Although Bolsamo perfectly agreed with the baron as to the propriety of this last epithet, yet he deemed it polite to contradict it. Oh, all very well, resumed the old man, but I know the place, I tell you, yet, though now so far from the son of Versailles, my daughter shall know the world which I formerly knew so well myself. And if she enter it, it shall be with an arsenal of weapons forged by my experience and my recollections. But I must confess, sir, the convent has ruined all my plans. As if that was what I wanted, my daughter was the first boarder who really practiced the precepts there taught, and followed the letter of the gospel. Corblin. Was not that being prettily served? Mademoiselle is an angel. Replied Bosamo, and in truth, sir, what you say does not surprise me. Andre bowed her thanks for this compliment, and sat down in obedience to a look from her father. Be seated, Baron, said the host, and if you are hungry, eat. What a horrible ragout that fool Labri has given us. Partridges. Do you call that horrible, said the guest, smiling. You slander your supper. Partridges in May. Are they from your own estates? My estates. It is long since I had one. My respectable father left me some land, indeed, but it was eaten and digested long enough ago. Oh, heaven be praised. I have not an inch of ground. That good-for-nothing Gilbert, who can only read and dream, must have stolen a gun, powder, and shot from some one or other, and he kills birds, poaching on the estates of my neighbors. He will be caught and sent to the galley some day, and certainly I shall not interfere, it will be a good riddance, but André likes game, so I am obliged to overlook Monsieur Gilbert's freaks. Bolsamo watched André's lovely face, as this was said, but not a change, not the slightest blush disturbed it. He was seated at table between her and the baron, and she helped him, without appearing in the least annoyed at the scantiness of the repast, to a portion of the dish procured by Gilbert and cooked by La Brie, and so heartily abused by the baron. During this time poor La Brie, who heard all the eulogiums passed on himself and Gilbert, handed the plates with a deprecating air, which became quite triumphant at each word, of praise the guest bestowed on his cookery. He has not even salted this abominable ragout, cried the baron, after he had devoured two wings of a partridge, which his daughter had placed before him on a tempting layer of cabbage, André, passed the salt cellar to the baron Bolsamo. André obeyed, extending her arm with exquisite grace. Ah, you are admiring the salt cellar again, said the host. No, sir, you are wrong this time, replied Bolsamo, I was admiring mademoiselle's hand. Ah! Very good, indeed, a perfect Richelieu. But since you have the salt cellar in your hand, examine it, it was made for the regent by the goldsmith Lucas. It represents the loves of the satyrs and bacantes, a little free, but pretty. Bolsamo saw that the little figures so admirably executed were something worse than free, and he could not but admire the unconsciousness with which André had offered him the salt cellar. But as if the baron had determined to put to the proof that innocence which carries with it such a charm, he began to point out in detail the beauties of his favorite piece of plate, in spite of all Balsamo's efforts to change the conversation. Come, eat, baron, said Taverny, for I warn you there is no other dish. Perhaps you are expecting the roast and other removes, if so, great will be your disappointment. Pardon me, sir, said André, in her usual calm manner. But if Nicole has rightly understood me, we shall have another dish. I have given her the recipe for one. The recipe? You have given a recipe to your maid? The femme de chamber turned cook. It only requires one step more, turn cook yourself, I beg you. Did the Duchess de Chateauroux or the Marchioness de Pompadour ever cook for the king? On the contrary, it was he who dressed omelettes for them. Jour de Dieu. Have I lived to see women cooking in my house? Baron, excuse my daughter, I beseech you. But, father, we must eat, said André, 
quietly. Well, Legay, added she in a louder tone, is it done? Yes, mademoiselle, replied the maid, bringing in a dish of a very tempting odor. I know one, at least, who will not eat of that dish, said the baron, furious, and breaking his plate as he spoke. Perhaps you will eat some, sir. Said André, coldly, then turning to her father, you know, sir, we have now only seven plates of that set which my mother left me, and so saying, she proceeded to carve the smoking viands which Mli. Legay, the pretty waiting maid, had just placed on the table. 6. André de Taverny The searching intellect of Bolsamo found ample food for study in each detail of the strange and isolated life led by this family in a corner of Lorraine. The salt cellar alone revealed to him one phase of the baron's character, or, rather, his character in all its bearings. He called up all his penetration, therefore, as he scrutinized the features of André, while she handed him that salt cellar. At length, whether moved by curiosity or some deeper feeling, Bosamo gazed on André so fixedly, that two or three times, in less than ten minutes, the eyes of the young girl met his. At first she bore his look without confusion, but its intensity became by degrees so great that a feverish impatience, which made the blood mount to her cheeks, took possession of her. Then, feeling that this look had something supernatural in its power. She tried to brave it, and, in her turn, she gazed at the baron with her large, limpid, dilated eyes. But this time again she was obliged to yield. And, filled with the magnetic fluid which flowed in streams from his flaming orbs, her eyelids weighed down, sunk timidly, no longer to be raised but with hesitation. While this silent struggle went on between the young girl and the mysterious traveller, the baron grumbled, laughed, and found fault, and swore like a true country gentleman, and pinched La Brie whenever he was within his reach. Feeling that he must vent his spleen on someone. He was going to do the same to Nicole, when his eyes, for the first time, no doubt, rested on the hands of the young waiting maid. The baron was an adorer of fine hands, all his youthful follies might be attributed to the power of a fine hand over him. Only see, cried he, what pretty fingers this little rogue has, how the nail tapers. It would bend over the tip, a great beauty, if washing bottles and cutting wood did not wear down the horn, for it is horn you have at the ends of your fingers, Mademoiselle Nicole. Not accustomed to compliments from her master, Nicole looked at him with half a smile, in which there was more astonishment than gratification. Yes, yes, said the baron, who saw what passed in the mind of the young flirt, turn away, play the coquette, I beg of you. But I must inform you, my dear guest, that Mademoiselle Nicole Legay, this young lady here present, is not a prude like her mistress, and is not at all afraid of a compliment. Bolsamo turned quickly toward the baron's daughter and saw an expression of supreme disdain on her handsome features. Then, thinking it right to adapt his expression to hers, he looked haughtily away, at which André seemed pleased, and regarded him with less sternness, or, rather, with less uneasiness, than before. Would you think, sir, continued the baron, chucking Nicole under the chin, would you think that this damsel had been in a convent with my daughter, and is really what one might call educated? Oh, Mademoiselle Nicole would not quit her mistress for a moment. There is a devotedness in her which would greatly delight the philosophers who maintain that these creatures have souls. Sir, said André, displeased, it is not devotedness which prevents Nicole from leaving me, it is because I order her to remain. Bolsamo raised his eyes to Nicole, to see the effect of these contemptuous words, and he observed, from her compressed lips, that she was not insensible to the humiliations to which her position of domestic exposed her. But the emotion was transitory, for, in turning away to hide it, her eyes rested with interest on a window of the room which looked into the courtyard. Everything roused the curiosity of Bolsamo, and, as he followed her eyes, he thought he saw what interested her the face of a man at the window. In truth, thought he, every one has a mystery in this house, and I hope soon to know Mademoiselle André's. I have found out the Baron's, and I guess what Nicole's is. While thus communing with himself, the Baron observed his absence of mind. You are in a reverie, my dear guest, said he. Well, it is infectious here, it attacks every one. 
Let me reckon, first, Mademoiselle de Taverny falls into reveries, then Mademoiselle Nicole does the same. Then the good-for-nothing fellow who shot the partridges is in a perpetual reverie, and very likely the partridges were in a reverie, when he shot them. Gilbert, asked Bolsamo. Yes. Oh, a philosopher, like Monsieur Labrie here. But excuse me. Perhaps you are a friend of theirs. If so, I warn you you will be none of mine. No, sir, I am neither for them nor against them, replied Bolsamo. I know nothing of them. Ventrebleu. So much the better. They are wretches as mischievous as they are ugly, the monarchy will be ruined by their opinions, no one laughs now, they read, they read, and what, I pray you. Sentiments like this, under a monarchical government it is difficult for a people to be virtuous. Or this, monarchy is an institution invented for the corruption of the morals of men, and the purpose of enslaving them. Or else this, if the power of kings comes from God, it comes as diseases and other scourges of the human race come from him. You call that improving, I hope. A virtuous people. Now, I ask you, of what use would they be? Everything has gone wrong since the king spoke to Voltaire, and read Diderot. At this moment Balsamo thought he saw the pale face which he had seen before, again appear at the window, but it vanished when he looked in that direction. Is Mademoiselle a philosopher? asked Balsamo, turning to André, with a smile. I don't even know what philosophy is, replied André. I like what is serious. Ha! Mademoiselle! cried the Baron, then, in my opinion, nothing is more serious than good living, like that, I pray you. But Mademoiselle does not hate life, I presume, said Balsamo. That depends on circumstances, replied André. What a stupid phrase! exclaimed the Baron. Would you believe it, sir, my son once made me, word for word, a similar reply. You have a son, then, sir. Oh, mon dain. Sir, yes. I have that misfortune. The Chevalier de Taverny, lieutenant in the bodyguard of the Dauphin, a most excellent young man. And the Baron uttered these four words as if he would have crushed each letter in them. I congratulate you, sir, said Bosamo, with a bow. Oh, yes, another philosopher, sir. Upon the honor of a gentleman, it is sickening. Did he not speak to me the other day about giving the Negroes their freedom? And what about sugar? Asked I, for I like my coffee very sweet, and so does Louis the Fifteenth, sir, replied he, is it not better to go without sugar than to make a whole race suffer? A race of monkeys said I, and I think it was saying a great deal in their praise. Well, what do you think he said next? Ma foi. There must be something in the air to turn people's heads. He replied to me, that all men were brothers. I the brother of a Hottentot. Oh, that was going rather far. Hey! What do you think of that? I am in great luck with my two children, am I not? No one will say that I shall be truly represented in my descendants. The sister is an angel, the brother an apostle. Drink, sir, drink. The wine is detestable. I think it exquisite, said Bolsamo, still looking at André. Then you are a philosopher. Take care or I shall order my daughter to preach you a sermon. But no, philosophers have no religion. Still, religion was a very convenient thing, one believed in God and the king, and all was settled. Now people believe in neither one nor the other, they must know so much, read so much. I prefer never doubting. In my time, our only study was to amuse ourselves, to play at pharaoh and dice, and to fence, we ruined duchesses, and were ruined by opera dancers, that was ray history to a tittle. The whole of Taverny went to the opera. It is the only thing I regret, for a ruined man is not worth the name of man. You think me old, don't you? Well, it is because I am ruined, and live in this den, because my wig is shabby, and my coat a relic of antiquity. But look at my friend the marshal, with his coats of the newest cut, and his well-curled wig, and his ten thousand a year. 
He looks young, fresh, and gay, and yet he is ten years older than I, sir, ten years, I assure you. You speak of Monsieur de Richelieu? Yes, the same. The Duke? Why, faith, not the Cardinal, I think, I do not go quite so far back. Besides, the Cardinal never did what his nephew did, he did not last so long. I am surprised that, with such powerful friends at court, you should have left it. Oh, a temporary retreat. I shall return to it some day or other, and the old baron cast a singular look on his daughter. Bolsamo did not allow it to pass unnoticed. But, said he, the marshal might at least advance your son. My son. He hates him. Hates the son of his friend. He is quite right. And do you say so, sir? Pardieu. I tell you he is a philosopher, he abhors him. And Philip returns him the compliment, said André, with perfect calmness. Remove these things, Legay. The young girl, roused from her fixed contemplation of the window, hastened to obey. Ah, said the baron, sighing, one used to sit after supper till two in the morning, we had what was fit to eat then, and when the eating was over, we drank. But how drink this stuff when we are not occupied in eating? Legay, bring a flask of maraschino, if there be one. Do so, said André, for the maid seemed to wait for her orders before obeying those of the baron. The baron threw himself back in his chair, shut his eyes, and sighed with a grotesque sort of melancholy. You were speaking of the Marshal de Richelieu, said Bolsamo, who appeared not inclined to let the conversation drop. Yes, said Taverny, I was speaking of him, and he hummed an air as melancholy as his sighs. If he hate your son, and if he be right to hate him because he is a philosopher, he must retain all his friendship for you, since you are not one. Philosopher. No, heaven be praised. You must surely have claims on the administration. You have served the king. Fifteen years. I was the marshal's aide de camp we served together in the campaign of Mahon. Our friendship is of long standing, let me see, it began at the siege of Philipsburg, that was in the year 1742 or 43. So, said Bosamo, you were at the siege of Philipsburg? I was there myself. The old man sat upright in his chair, and stared at the stranger. Excuse me, but what is your age, my respected guest? Oh, I am not old, said Bolsamo, holding out his glass to be filled with maraschino by the fair hand of André. The baron interpreted the stranger's answer in his own way, and concluded that Bolsamo had some reason for concealing his age. Sir, said he, allow me to say that you do not appeal to be old enough to have served at Philipsburg, that siege took place twenty-eight years ago, and on seemed to be about thirty. Oh, anybody might be taken for thirty. Pardieu, then, I wish I could, it's just thirty years since I was that age. Mlle André gazed with increasing and irresistible curiosity on the stranger, for every word revealed him in a new light. You astonish me, sir, said the baron. Unless you are all this time mistaken in the name, and are thinking of some other town than Philipsburg. I should say you were not more than thirty, would not you, André, say the same? Yes, indeed, replied she, trying to bear the powerful eye of their guest, but this time again in vain. No, no, said the latter. I mean what I say, I mean the famous siege of Philipsburg, at which the Duke de Richelieu killed his cousin, the Prince de Lixen, in a duel. The affair took place as they were returning from the trenches, on the high road. He ran his sword right through his body. I passed just as he expired in the arms of the Prince de Dubutz. He was seated against the side of a ditch when Richelieu was coolly wiping his sword. On my honor, you amaze me, sir, said the baron. It occurred precisely as you say. You have heard the affair described, asked Bolsamo, coolly. I was there. I had the honor of being second to the marshal, he was not marshal then, but that is no matter. Let me think, said Bolsamo, turning and gazing firmly on him. Were you not then a captain? Precisely. You were in the Queen's Regiment of Light Horse, which was cut to pieces at Fontenoy. 
Perhaps you were at Fontenoy, too? Asked the Baron, endeavoring to jest. No, replied Bolsamo, I was dead at that time. The Baron stared, Andre started, Nicole crossed herself. But to return to what we were saying. You wore the uniform of the light horse, I remember perfectly, at that time, I saw you as I passed, you were holding your own and the marshal's horse while they fought. I went up to you and asked you about the duel, you gave me the details. I. Yes, you, pardieu. I recognize you now, you bore the title of Chevalier, they called you the little Chevalier. Mordu, cried the Baron, all amazed. Excuse me that I did not sooner recognize you, but thirty years change a man. Let us drink the Marshal's health, my dear Baron. He raised his glass, and drained it to the last drop. You saw me there, cried the Baron. Impossible. I saw you, said Bolsamo. On the high road? On the high road. Holding the horses. Holding the horses. While the duel was going on. As the prince was expiring, I said. Then you are fifty. I am old enough to have seen what I tell you. The baron threw himself back in his chair, but in so ridiculous a pet that Nicole could not help laughing. Andre, instead of laughing, seemed to be in a reverie, her eyes open, and fixed on those of Bolsamo. He appeared now to have attained his object. Suddenly rising, he sent from his flaming eyeball two or three lightning flashes full on her. She started, as if from an electric shock. Her arm stiffened, her neck bent, she smiled, yet as if involuntarily on the stranger, then closed her eyes. Do you also, mademoiselle, believe I speak falsely when I say that I was present at the siege of Philipsburg? No, sir, I believe you, she articulated, making a violent effort. Then it is I who am only a dotard, said the baron, the gentleman no doubt has come back from the other world. Nicole gazed on him with horror. Who knows? replied Bolsamo, in so solemn a tone that he was yet more horrified. Well, then, baron, resumed the old man, to have done with jesting, are you really more than thirty? You do not look more. Sir, said Bolsamo, would you believe me if I told you a very incredible thing? I do not promise that, said the baron, looking knowing, while Andre listened with eager attention. I am very incredulous, I must candidly warn you. What use is there, then, in putting a question, when you will not listen to my reply? Well, I will believe you. There. Are you satisfied? Then, sir, I have only to repeat what I have told you, and to add that I knew you personally at the siege of Philipsburg. Then you must have been a child. Undoubtedly. Four or five years old at most. No, I was forty-one. The baron burst into a loud fit of laughter, which Nicole re-echoed. I told you you would not believe me, said Bolsamo, gravely. But how is it possible to believe that? At least, give me some proofs. That is easy. I was forty-one then, but I do not say that I was the man I am. Oh, cried the baron, this is going back to paganism. Was there not a philosopher, for those wretches flourished in every century, was there not a Greek philosopher who would not eat beans because he pretended they had had souls, as my son says Negroes have, who was he? What the deuce was his name? Pythagoras, said André. Yes, Pythagoras, the Jesuits taught me that. Father Pori made me compose Latin verses on it, with little Eruit. I remember they thought mine much the best. Pythagoras? Yes. Well, how do you know that I am not Pythagoras, replied Bolsamo, quietly. I do not deny that you may be Pythagoras, but Pythagoras was not at the siege of Philipsburg, at least, I did not see him there. No. But you saw the Viscount Jean de Barros, who was in the Black Musketeers. Yes, I knew him well, but he was no philosopher, although he did hate beans, and never eat them when he could help it. Well, do you recollect the day after the duel, Desperos was in the trenches with you? Yes, perfectly well. For you know the black musketeers and the light horse always mounted guard together every seven days. 
True enough. What next? That very evening the grape shot fell like hail, and Des Barrows was dull, he asked you for a pinch of snuff, and you offered him your gold box. On which was the likeness of a female. Exactly. I see her now. She was fair, was she not? Mordu, cried the baron, terrified, you are right. Well, then. Well, then, continued Bolsamo, as he was taking that pinch of snuff, a ball carried off his head, just in the same way that Marshal Barracks was carried away formerly. Alas! Yes! I remember, said the baron. Poor Desperos! And now, sir, you see I must have seen and known you at the siege of Philipsburg, since I was that very Desperos. The baron fell back once more in his chair, almost stupefied at these words, but recovering, he cried. Why, this is sorcery, magic. A hundred years ago you would have been burned, my dear guest. Upon my honor, I think I can smell a sort of corpse-like odor. Sir, said Bolsamo, no true sorcerer or magician has ever yet been burned, it is fools who have anything to do with the faggot. But a truce to this conversation, Mademoiselle de Taverny is asleep, it seems that metaphysics and the occult sciences have few attractions for her. In fact, André, overcome by an unknown, irresistible power, felt her head sink on her breast, like a flower whose cups bends under its weight of dew. At the last words of Bosamo, she made an effort to shake off the influence, that, like a subtle fluid, stole upon her. She shook her head, arose, seemed about to fall, but, supported by Nicole, left the dining room. At the same moment, the face which had been looking in at the window, and which Bolsamo had long ago recognized as Gilbert's, also disappeared. An instant after, he heard André begin to play with vigor on her harpsichord. He had followed her with his eye as she left the room, and could not help exclaiming triumphantly, as she disappeared, I may say, like Archimedes, Eureka. Archimedes. Who was he? asked the baron. A good sort of a fellow, a savant whom I knew 2150 years ago, said Bolsamo. 7. Eureka. Whether this piece of extravagance was too much for the baron, whether he had not heard it, or whether, having heard it, he thought it best to get rid of this strange guest, we know not, but he made no reply to it. But when the sound of André's harpsichord proved that she was engaged in the next apartment, he offered to procure Bolsamo the means of proceeding to the nearest town. I have an old horse who, though on his last legs, will carry you so far, and you would at least procure good lodgings, there is, indeed, a room and a bed at Taverny. But my ideas of hospitality are rather peculiar, good or none, is my motto. Then you wish to send me away, said Bolsamo, hiding his vexation under a smile. That is treating me like an intruder. No, indeed, it is treating you like a friend, my dear guest, lodging you here would be really treating you as an enemy. I say this in all conscience, but with great regret, for I am delighted with your society. Then, pray, do not force me to rise when I am tired, to get on horseback when I would rather stretch my limbs and bed. Do not represent your hospitable resources as worse than they are, if you would not have me believe that I have been so unfortunate as to incur your dislike. Oh, said the baron, since you view the matter in that light, you shall stay. Then, looking round for La Brie, who was in a corner, he cried, Come hither, you old rascal. La Brie advanced a few steps, timidly. Ventrebleu. Come hither, I say. Is the red room fit to accommodate a gentleman, think you? Oh, certainly, sir, replied the old servant, you know it is occupied by Monsieur Philip, when he comes to Taverny. It may do very well for a poor devil of a lieutenant who comes to pass a month with a ruined father, and at the same time very unfit for a rich nobleman who travels post with four horses. I assure you, said Bosamo, I shall be perfectly content with it. The baron grinned, as if he would have said, I know better. Then he added, aloud, La Brie, show the stranger, to the red room, since he is determined to be cured of all wish to return to Taverny. Well, you have decided to stay, I suppose, said he, turning to Bosamo. Yes, if you permit it. 
Stay. There are still other means. Means for what? To avoid having to make the journey on horseback. What journey? To Barloduk. Bolsamo waited quietly to hear this new plan developed. You were brought here by post horses, were you not? Yes, unless Satan brought me. I at first almost suspected he did, for you do not seem to be on bad terms with him. You do me infinitely more honor than I deserve. Well, the horses that brought your carriage could not take it away. No. There are only two horses left of the four, and the carriage is heavy. Besides, post horses must rest. Ha! Another reason. You are determined, I see, to remain. Because I wish to see you again tomorrow, and express my gratitude to you for your hospitality. That you could easily repay. How? Since you are on such good terms with his satanic majesty, beg him to permit me to discover the philosopher's stone. Why, Monsieur Le Baron, if you really wish for it. The philosopher's stone? Parbleu! If I really wish for it. In that case, you must apply to another individual than the devil. To whom, then? To me. As I heard Corneille say about a hundred years ago, when he was reciting to me a part of one of his comedies. Ha! La Brie, you old rascal! cried the baron, who began to find the conversation rather dangerous at such an hour, and with such a man, try and find a wax candle and light the gentleman to his room. La Brie hastened to obey, and during this search, almost as dubious in its result as that for the philosopher's stone, he desired Nicole to precede him upstairs and near the bedroom. Nicole being gone, André was delighted to find herself alone. She felt as if she required to reflect. The Baron bid Bolsamo good night and retired to bed. Bolsamo looked at his watch, for he remembered the promise he had made to Althotas, a promise now impossible to fulfill, the two hours having expired. He asked La Brie if the carriage was still in the place he had pointed out. La Brie replied that unless it would move away of itself, it must be there. He then asked what had become of Gilbert. La Brie assured him that the lazy fellow was no doubt in bed two hours ago. Then, after having studied the topography of the passage which led to the Red Room, Bolsamo went out to waken Althotas. The Baron de Taverny had not spoken falsely respecting the discomfort of this apartment, it was as poorly furnished as all the other rooms of the chateau. An oaken bed with a faded green damask coverlet, and hangings of the same material looped up above it. An oaken table with twisted legs, a huge stone chimney piece of the time of Louis XIII. To which in winter a fire might impart some appearance of comfort, but which now, wanting that, wanting all ornaments and utensils, wanting wood, and stuffed with old newspapers, only made the place look still more dreary. Such was the apartment of which Bolsamo was for one night to be the fortunate possessor. We must add that there were two chairs and a wardrobe painted of a grey colour. Whilst La Brie was endeavouring to give a habitable appearance to the room which Nicole had aired before retiring to her own apartment, Bolsamo had wakened Althotas and returned to the house. When he reached André's door he stopped to listen. From the moment André left the dining room she felt that she had escaped from the mysterious influence which the stranger exercised over her, and to rouse herself completely from its power, she continued to play on her harpsichord. Its sound reached Bolsamo through the closed door, and, as we have said, he stopped to listen. After a minute or two he made several gestures with a sweeping circular motion which might have been mistaken for a species of conjuration, since André, struck again by the same sensation she had previously experienced, ceased to play. Let her arms fall immovable by her side, and turned toward the door with a slow, stiff motion, as if she were obeying a command against her own free will. Bolsamo smiled in the dark, as if he saw through the door. No doubt this was all he wanted, for he stretched out Bis' left hand, and having found the balustrade of the staircase, which was deep and broad, he ascended to the red room. In proportion as he increased his distance, André, with the same slow, rigid motion, returned to her harpsichord, and when Bolsamo reached the highest stair he heard her resume the first notes of the air which he had interrupted. Having entered his chamber, 
he dismissed La Brie. La Brie was evidently a good servant, accustomed to obey on the instant, but now, after moving a few steps toward the door, he stopped. Well, said Bolsamo. La Brie slipped his hand into his waistcoat pocket and seemed feeling for something in its silent depths, but he did not reply. Have you anything to say to me, my friend? inquired Bolsamo, approaching him. La Brie made a great effort over himself, and pulled his hand out of his pocket. I merely wish to say, sir, that you made a mistake this evening. Did I? said Bolsamo. How so? You meant to give me a crown, and you gave me a Louis d'Or. And he opened his hand and disclosed to view the new shining piece. Bolsamo looked at the old servant with an expression of admiration which indicated he had not the highest opinion of men as far as probity was concerned. And honest. Said he, as Hamlet says, and, feeling in his own pocket, he drew out a second Louis d'Or, which he laid beside the first in Labrie's hand. Labrie's joy at this munificence could not be described. For twenty years he had not once seen gold, and in order to convince him that he was really the happy possessor of such a treasure, Bolsamo had to put the money with his own hand into Labrie's pocket. He bowed to the ground, and was retiring without turning his back on the stranger, when the latter stopped him. At what hour does the family usually rise in the morning? asked he. Monsieur de Taverny rises late, but Mademoiselle de Taverny is always up at a very early hour. At what hour? About six o'clock. Who sleeps above this room? I do, sir. And below? No one, the vestibule is under this. Thank you, my friend. Now you may go. Good night, sir. Good night, but, by the by, see that my carriage be safe. You may depend on me, sir. If you hear any noise, or see any light, do not be alarmed. I have an old lame servant in it, who travels with me everywhere. Tell Monsieur Gilbert not to interfere with him, and tell him also, if you please, not to go out tomorrow morning until I have spoken to him. Can you remember all this? Oh, certainly, but are you going to leave us so soon, sir? I am not quite sure, said Bolsamo, with a smile, yet, strictly speaking, I ought to be at Barleduc tomorrow evening. La Brie sighed resignedly, gave a last glance at the bed, and taking up the candle, went toward the fireplace to give a little warmth to the great damp room by setting fire to the papers, as he had no wood. No, never mind, said Bolsamo, preventing him, leave the old papers. If I do not sleep, I can amuse myself by reading them. La Brie bowed and retired. Bolsamo listened until the steps of the old servant had died away on the stairs, and until he heard them overhead. Then he went to the window. In the opposite tower there was a light in the window of a garret, the curtains of which were but half closed. It was Legay's room. She was thoughtfully unfastening her gown and handkerchief, and from time to time she opened her window and leaned out to see into the courtyard. Bolsamo looked at her with more attention than he had chosen to bestow on her during supper. What a singular resemblance, he murmured to himself. At this moment the light in the garret was extinguished, although its occupant was not yet in bed. Bolsamo leaned against the wall, listening anxiously. The notes of the harpsichord still sounded in his ears. He assured himself that its harmony alone awoke the midnight silence around. Then opening the door which La Brie had shut, he cautiously descended the stairs, and gently pushed open the door of the saloon. André heard nothing, her white hands continued to wander over the old yellow keys of the instrument. Opposite her was a mirror set in an old carved frame, the gilding of which had changed to a dull grey. The air she played was melancholy, or, rather, she played merely harmonies instead of an air. No doubt it was all extempore. And she was thus reproducing in music her early recollections, or indulging in the dreams of her imagination. Perhaps her spirit, saddened by her residence at Taverny, had left the chateau to wander in the large shady gardens of the convent of the Annonciades at Nancy, ringing with the merry voices of troops of happy boarders. Whether such were her dreams or not, her vague gaze seemed to lose itself in the sombre mirror before her, 
which reflected only indistinctly the different objects in the vast apartment, dimly lighted by the single candle placid on the harpsichord. Sometimes she suddenly ceased. It was when she recalled the strange vision of the evening, and her unaccountable impressions, but before her thoughts had time to take any precise form, her heart beat, she felt a thrill run through her limbs. And she started as though a living being had come into contact with her. All at once, as she tried to account for these feelings, they returned. She felt a thrill as if from an electric shock. Her eye became fixed, her floating thoughts became embodied, as it were, and she perceived something move over the dim mirror. The door of the saloon had opened noiselessly, and in the doorway a shadow appeared. She shuddered, her fingers wandered involuntarily over the keys, yet nothing could be more easily accounted for than the appearance of the figure. Might it not be her father, or Nicole, or La Brie, who, before retiring, had returned to the apartment upon some household errand? La Brie's visits of that kind were frequent, and on these occasions, the faithful creature never made a sound. But, no, the eyes of her soul showed her that the being whom she did not see was none of those we have named. The shadow drew nearer, becoming more distinct in the mirror. And when within the circle of the light afforded by the candle the stranger was seen, his dress of black velvet increasing the ghastly pallor of his face, he had for some mysterious reason laid aside the silk one which he wore at supper. 1. She would have turned and screamed, but Balsamo extended his arms, and she remained motionless. She made another effort. Sir, said she, am the name of heaven, what do you want? He smiled, the glass reflected his smile, and she watched it with eager gaze, but he did not reply. She tried once more to rise, but could not. An irresistible power, a paralyzing feeling, which was not without a pleasurable sensation attending it, fixed her to her chair, while her eye never left the magic mirror. This new sensation alarmed her, for she felt that she was altogether in the power of the unknown. She made another almost supernatural effort to call for aid, but Balsamo extended both his hands above her head, and no sound escaped her lips. She continued dumb, her bosom loaded with a stupefying heat which ascended slowly in invading billows to her brain. She had no longer strength or will, her head sank on her shoulder. At this moment Balsamo thought he heard a slight noise. He turned, the face of the man he had seen before was at the window. He frowned, and, strange to say, the frown was reflected on the young girl's face. Then, turning again to André, he drew down his hands, which he had hitherto held above her head, then he raised them again gently, again drew them down, and continued thus to overwhelm her with column upon column of the electric fluid. Sleep. Dot. Said he. She still struggled against his power. Sleep, he repeated, in a voice of command. Sleep, it is my will. Then all her faculties yielded to that all-powerful will. She leaned her elbow on the harpsichord, dropped her head on her hand, and slept. Bolsamo now, without turning his face from her, left the room, closed the door, and went up to his own chamber. Scarcely had he retired and the face once more appeared at the window. It was Gilbert's. 8. Attraction Gilbert, whose menial position in the Chateau de Taverny caused him to be excluded from the saloon, watched all evening those whose rank permitted them that privilege. During supper he saw Balsamo's looks and gestures. He remarked André's attention to him, the Baron's unusual affability, and the respectful eagerness of Labrie. When the party rose from table, he hid in a clump of shrubs, lest Nicole, in closing the shutters, or in going to her own room, might see him, and put an end to his espionage. Nicole had, indeed, made her round to secure all for the night, but one of the shutters of the saloon she was forced to leave open, the half-unfixed hinge of which would not permit it to close. Gilbert knew that such was the case, so he remained out certain that he could continue his watchings when Legay was gone. His watchings, have we said? What reason had Gilbert to watch? Having been brought up at Taverny, did he not know it perfectly, as well as the habits of the family? The reason was, that on that evening he had other motives than those which usually actuated him, he not only watched, but waited. 
When Nicole quitted the saloon, leaving Andre there, after having slowly closed the doors and shutters, she walked for a few minutes up and down in front of the house, as if she expected someone. Then she looked furtively on all sides, peeped into the saloon, waited a little longer, and at length made up her mind to go to bed. Gilbert, motionless, bending down close to the trunk of a tree, and scarcely venturing to breathe, saw every movement and gesture of Nicole. And, when she had disappeared, and when he saw a light in the windows of her apartment, he stole again on tiptoe to the window, leaned forward, and continued, although scarcely knowing why, with eager eyes, to devour André. Who was sitting at her harpsichord in a listless attitude. Just then Joseph Bolsamo entered the saloon. Gilbert started, and every faculty was strained to enable him to comprehend the scene which we have just described. He thought that Bolsamo complimented André on her musical talent, that she replied with her usual coldness, that, with a smile, he repeated his praise, and that then she stopped to reply, and to dismiss him for the night. He admired the grace with which the stranger retired backward, but he had in reality understood nothing of the scene, as it had all passed in silence. He had heard no words, he had seen the lips and hands of the pair before him move, and, close observer as he was, he discovered no mystery in what appeared to pass so naturally. Bosamo gone, Gilbert remained no longer in an attitude of observation, but apparently lost in observation of André, so beautiful in her careless attitude, but soon, to his amazement, he discovered that she was asleep. He remained for some moments longer in the same position, to be certain that such was the case. Then, when he was quite convinced, he clasped his forehead with both hands, like one who feared for his senses in the flood of thoughts and sensations which poured on his brain. Oh, said he, wildly, her hand. That my lips might only touch her hand. Gilbert, Gilbert, rouse thee. I will do it. As he spoke, he rushed into the anteroom, and reached the door of the saloon, which, as when Bolsamo entered, opened without noise. But scarcely was it open, scarcely did he find the young girl before him without anything separating them, than he felt all the importance of the step he had taken. He, the son of a farmer and a peasant woman, he, the timid young man, who, in his lowness dared hardly raise his eyes to his haughty mistress, he was going to press to his lips the hem of the robe or the tip of the finger of this sleeping majesty. Who, if she awoke, would, with a look, crush him to the dust. At this idea all that had intoxicated him and made him bold vanished, he stopped, and clung to the doorpost, for he trembled and felt as if he should fall. But André's meditation or sleep, for Gilbert could not yet decide whether she slept or was only buried in thought, was so deep that he in no way disturbed her, yet one might have heard the beating of his heart which he tried in vain to still. He remained a minute gazing on her, she stirred not, she was so beautiful with her head gently bent forward on her hand, her long, unpowdered hair falling on her shoulders, that the flame which fear for a moment had extinguished rekindled. His madness returned, he must at least touch something touched by her, he made a step toward her. The floor creaked under his unsteady footstep, a cold moisture stood on his forehead, but she seemed to have heard nothing. She sleeps. He murmured. Oh, joy. She sleeps. But before he advanced three steps farther, he stopped again. It was the unusual brightness of the candle which alarmed him now, for it had burned down in the socket, and gave, as is usual, a larger flame just before it expired. But not a sound, not a breath in the house. La Brie had retired to bed, and no doubt to sleep, and the light in Nicole's chamber was extinguished. Urag, said he, and he advanced anew. Strange, the floor creaked again, but André stirred not, and Gilbert himself could scarcely avoid being frightened by this mysterious repose. She sleeps. Repeated he again, with that varying resolution peculiar to the lover and the coward, and he who is not master of his heart is always a coward. She sleeps, oh, heaven! Oh! Heaven! In the midst of all these feverish altercations of fear and hope, he still advanced, and at last found himself within two paces of André. Then he felt as if fascinated, he would have fled, were flight possible. 
But once within the circle of attraction, of which she was the center, he felt himself rooted to the spot, and, conquered, subdued, he fell on both his knees. André remained motionless as a statue. Gilbert took the hem of her dress in both hands, and kissed it, then he looked up slowly, breathlessly, his eyes met hers, which were wide open, yet she saw him not. Gilbert no longer knew what to think, he was overwhelmed with astonishment. For a moment the horrible idea that she was dead flashed across his mind, he seized her hand, it was warm, and the pulse beat softly, but this hand remained unresisting in his. Then, bewildered by having touched it, he imagined that she saw, that she felt, that she had discovered his maddening passion, poor, blinded heart. That she expected his visit, that her silence indicated consent, her immovability favor. He raised her hand to his lips, and imprinted on it a long and burning kiss. Immediately a shudder ran through her frame, and Gilbert felt that she repelled him. I am lost, he murmured, relinquishing her hand, and throwing himself upon the floor. André rose as if moved by a spring, and not once casting her eyes to the floor, on which Gilbert lay, overcome by shame and fear, without even strength to ask a pardon, which he knew would not be granted, her head erect, her neck rigid. And with a painful and constrained step, she moved toward the door. She passed on like one drawn by a secret spell to some unseen goal, and in passing she touched Gilbert's shoulder. He raised himself on one hand, turned slowly, and followed her with eyes full of amazement. She opened the door, passed into the anteroom, and reached the foot of the stairs. Pale and trembling, Gilbert dragged himself after her on his knees. Oh, thought he, she is so indignant that she would not herself deign to show her anger. She is going to the baron to relate my shameful infatuation, and I shall be turned out like a disgraced lackey. The thought that he should be dismissed, that he should no longer see her who was his light, his life, his soul, gave him courage. He arose and hurried after her. Oh, pardon, mademoiselle, in the name of heaven, pardon, murmured he. André appeared not to have heard him, passed on, but did not enter her father's apartment. Gilbert breathed more freely. She advanced toward the staircase, and began to ascend. Great heaven, murmured he, where can she be going? That is the way to the red room which the stranger occupies, and to La Brief's loft. It may be to call him, yet she would ring, she must be going, oh impossible, impossible, and he wrung his hands with rage at the thought that she was going into Balsamo's apartment. She stopped before the door. A cold perspiration trickled down Gilbert's forehead, he grasped the iron of the balustrade that he might not fall, for he had continued to follow her, and all that he saw and all that he fancied filled him with horror. Balsamo's door was half open. André did not knock, but pushed it wider, and entered the room. The light within fell on her noble features, and was reflected with a golden luster from her large open eyes. Gilbert could see the stranger standing in the middle of the chamber with his eyes fixed, his brow contracted, and one hand extended with a commanding gesture. This was all, the door was shut again. Gilbert felt his strength abandon him. He put his hand to his head, and fell heavily on the cold stone of the upper step of the stairs, but with his eyes turned on the accursed door, which entombed his past dreams, his present happiness, his future hopes. 9. Clairvoyance Bolsamo advanced to meet the young lady, who moved toward him in a direct line, rigid in her movement as the bronze statue of Don Juan. However strange her coming might seem to any other than Bolsamo, he appeared in no degree surprised at it. I commanded you to sleep, said he. Do you sleep? She sighed, but did not answer. Bolsamo drew nearer her, imparting to her still more of the electric fluid. It is my will that you speak, he said. She started. Have you heard my command? André assented by a gesture. Then why do you not speak? She put her hand to her throat, as if to indicate that she could not articulate. Well, sit down, said Balsamo. He took her by the hand which Gilbert had so lately kissed without her being conscious, and his touch gave her that shudder which she had then exhibited. But which had been caused by the electric fluid descending on her at that moment from the room above. 
Led by him, she made three steps backward and sat down in an armchair. Do you see? he asked. Her eyes dilated as she tried to take in all the rays of light in the apartment. I do not mean to ask if you see with your eyes, do you see inwardly? And, drawing from under his embroidered coat a little rod of steel, he touched her heaving breast, she bounded as if a dart of flame had pierced her and entered her heart, and then her eyes closed. And now you begin to see, he said. She bowed in assent. And you will soon speak. Yes, replied André, but at the same moment she put her hand to her head in a manner expressive of great suffering. What is the matter? asked Bosamo. I am in pain. Wherefore? Because you force me to see and speak. He made several movements over her head, as if to lessen the influence of the electricity. Do you suffer now? Not so much. Well, then, look where you are. Her eyes remained closed, but her face expressed great surprise. I am in the red chamber, she murmured. With whom? With you, continued she, shuddering. What is the matter? I am afraid, I am ashamed. Of what? Are we not united by sympathy? Yes, certainly. And you know that I have caused you to come here with a pure intention. True, true, said she. That I respect you as a sister. I know it, indeed. And her face grew calm, then again was troubled. You do not tell me all, you do not pardon me entirely. Because I see that though you would not wrong me, you would another, perhaps. Possibly, he muttered, but look not at that. He added, in an authoritative tone. Her face resumed its usual expression. Are all asleep in the house? I do not know. Then look and see. Where shall I look? Let me see. First, in your father's room. What is he doing? He is in bed. Asleep? No, he is reading. What is he reading? One of those bad books which he wishes me to read. And you will not read them? No, said she, with an expression of the greatest scorn on her features. Well, we are safe, then. Look in Nicole's room. There is no light in her room. But you do not want light to see. Not if you command me. See. It is my will. Ah, uh, I see. What? She is half undressed, she is opening her door softly, she is going downstairs. So. Where is she going? She stops at the courtyard gate, she waits behind it, she watches. Bolsamo smiled. Is she watching to see whether you are out? No. Well, that is the principal matter, for when a young lady is free from her father's in her waiting maid's eye, she has nothing to fear, unless. No. You are replying to my thought. I see it. Then you have no lover. I? asked she, disdainfully. Yes, you might be in love, young people do not leave their convents to be shut up. They give liberty to their hearts when their persons are set free. Andre shook her head. My heart is free, she said, sadly, and such an expression of candor and virgin modesty lighted her features that Bolsamo exclaimed, with rapture. A lily. A true pupil. A clairvoyant, and he clasped his hands with joy and gratitude. Then, turning again to André, but if you do not love, you may be loved, said he. I do not know, replied she, softly. What, you do not know, he cried, imperiously. When I question, I expect a proper answer. And he touched her bosom again with the steel rod. She started, but without evincing so much pain as before. Yes, I see, said she, but be gentle, or you will kill me. What do you see? Oh, but no. It cannot be, said she. What, then, do you see? A young man who, ever since my leaving the convent, has followed me, watched me, brooded on me, yet always secretly. Who is the young man? I do not see his face. I see his coat, it is like that of a workman. 
Where is he? At the foot of the stairs. He seems in sorrow, he weeps. Why can you not see his face? It is hidden in his hands. Look through his hands. She made an effort, then exclaimed, No, it is impossible, Gilbert. Why impossible? He. He dare not love me, cried she, with a lofty expression of disdain. Bolsamo smiled like one who knows mankind, and who is aware that there is no distance the heart will not overleap, were there an abyss between it and its object. And what is he doing at the foot of the staircase? Stay. He removes his hands from his face, he seizes the balustrade, he rises, he ascends. Ascends where? Up here. But no matter, he dare not come in. Why not? Because he is afraid, said she, with a smile of contempt. But he will listen. Yes, for he is now putting his ear to the door. That annoys you. Yes, he may hear what I say. And would he use it against her whom he loves? Yes, in a moment of passion or jealousy, in such a moment he would be capable of anything. Then let us get rid of him, said Bolsamo, and he walked noisily to the door. Gilbert's hour to be courageous was not yet come, for at the noise, fearing to be caught, he jumped astride on the balustrade, and slid down noiselessly to the bottom of the staircase. André uttered a stifled cry. Look no more in that direction, said Bolsamo, returning toward her, the loves of the vulgar are of no importance. Speak to me of the Baron of Taverny, will you? I will answer what you choose, said she, sighing. The Baron is very poor, is he not? Very poor. Too poor to allow you any amusement. Oh, yes. You are heartily tired of Taverny. Heartily. You are ambitious, perhaps. No. You love your father. Yes, said the young girl, with hesitation. Yet I thought this evening your filial love was not very apparent, said Bolsamo, smiling. I am vexed at him for having wasted my mother's fortune, so that poor Maison Rouge has to pass his time in garrison, and cannot worthily support the dignity of our family. Who is this Maison Rouge? My brother Philip. Why do you call him Maison Rouge? It is, or rather, it was the name of one of our castles, and the eldest of the family bears it until the death of the chief, then he is called Taverny. You love your brother, then? Oh, dearly, clearly. More than any one in the world. More than any one in the world. Why do you love him so warmly, and your father so coldly? Because he has a noble heart. He would die for me. And your father? She was silent. Doubtless Bolsamo thought it better not to force her against her will on this point, and perhaps, also, he already knew as much of the baron as he wished. And where is the Chevalier Maison Rouge at this moment? Where is Philip? Yes. In the garrison at Strasbourg. Do you see him there? Where? At Strasbourg. I do not see him. Do you know that town? No. I know it. Let us visit it together, will you? Yes, with pleasure. Now. Is he at the theater? No. Is he at the coffee house in the square with the other officers? No. Has he gone back to his apartment? I wish that you should look for him there. I see nothing. I think he is not at Strasbourg. Do you know the road from thence? No. I know it, follow me. Is he at Savern? No. Is he at Sarbrook? No. Is he at Nancy? Stay, stay. The young girl seemed collecting all her powers, her heart beat, her bosom heaved. I see him. I see him. Dear Philip, what joy! What is he doing? Dear Philip, continued André, her eyes sparkling with joy. Where is he? On horseback, riding through a town I know well. What town? Nancy. Nancy. Where I was at the convent. Are you sure that it is he? 
Oh, yes, the torches around show his face. Torches, said Bosamo, with surprise. Why, are there torches? He is on horseback, at the door of a magnificent carriage, richly gilt. Ah, cried Bosamo, who appeared to comprehend this, who is in the carriage? A young lady. Oh, how majestic she is! How graceful! How beautiful! Strange, I almost fancy I have seen her before, no, it is Nicole's features which resemble hers. Nicole resembles the young lady who is so beautiful and so majestic. Yes, yes, but as a jasmine may be said to resemble a lily. Let us see what is passing at Nancy at this moment. The young lady bends forward, and makes a sign to Philip to approach, he obeys, and takes off his hat respectfully. Can you hear what they say? I am listening, said Andre, impressing silence on Bolsamo by a gesture. I hear, I hear. Murmured she. What, does the young lady say? She orders him with a sweet smile to hasten the pace of the horses. She says she will require her escort to be ready at six in the morning, as she wishes to stop on the road. To stop? Where? My brother is just asking her. Heavens! She wishes to stop at Taverny to see my father. Such a great princess at our poor house. What shall we do, without plate, almost without linen? Do not be uneasy, that will be provided for. Oh, thanks, thanks, and the young girl, who had half risen from her seat, sunk back with a heavy sigh, completely exhausted. Bolsamo immediately approached her, and by some magnetic passes in an opposite direction, changed the course of the electric fluid. A calm sleep then stole over her lovely frame, which had bent down exhausted, her head sinking on her palpitating bosom. Recover thy strength, said Bolsamo, gazing at her with a stern delight. I shall soon require thy light again. Oh, science, continued he, with the rapture of exalted faith, thou alone never deceivest us. To thee, then, man ought to sacrifice every feeling. This young girl is beautiful, pure as an angel, and he who made beauty and innocence knows how dear they ought to be to us. But let the creature perish, how pure, how perfect, how beautiful soever she be, if I can but make her speak the words of truth. Let all the delights of the world, love, passion, rapture, exist no longer for me, if I can only, with a firm step, advance on the path of light and science. And now, young girl, now that my will has given thee strength, awake, or, rather, sink again in the sleep which reveals all things. Speak again, but now it is for me that thou must speak. He spread his hands over her head, and forced her to sit up by breathing upon her. Seeing her ready and submissive, he took from his pocketbook a curl of jet black hair, which he put into Andre's hand. See, he commanded. Again. Said she, with anguish. Oh, no, let me rest. It is too painful, and just now I felt so happy. See, replied Bolsamo, pitilessly, touching her again with the steel rod. She wrung her hands, struggling to evade the tyranny of the experimenter. The foam was on her lips, as formerly it gathered on those of the pythoness on her sacred tripod. I see. I see, cried she, with the despair of a subdued will. What do you see? A woman. Ah, exclaimed Bolsamo, with wild joy, science is not, then, a useless word like virtue. Mesmer is greater than Brutus. Describe the woman, that I may know you really see her whom I would have you see. She is a brunette, tall, with blue eyes, jet black hair, and sinewy arms. What is she doing? She gallops, she flies forward, carried by a splendid horse reeking with sweat and foam. In what direction? There, there. Said the young girl, pointing to the west. On the highway? Yes. Toward Chalins. Yes. Good, said Bolsamo, she takes the road which I shall take, she goes to Paris as I do. I shall find her there. Now rest, said he, and he took from André's hand the curl of hair. Her arms fell powerless by her side. 
Now, return to your harpsichord. Andre arose and made a step toward the door, but overcome by inexpressible fatigue, her limbs refused to support her. She staggered. Renew your strength and walk, said Bosamo, enveloping her anew with magnetic passes. And she, like the generous steed that braces very nerve to fulfill his master's will, unjust though it be walked erect. Bolsamo opened the door, and, still sleeping, she descended the stairs. Ex Nicole Legay. While the scene of interrogation was passing in Balsamo's chamber, Gilbert remained under the railings at the foot of the staircase in a state of indescribable torture. Not daring to ascend again to listen at the door of the red chamber, he fell into despair, and this despair was increased tenfold by the feeling of his weakness and his inferiority. Balsamo was only a man, for Gilbert, being a profound thinker, a philosopher in embryo, had small faith in sorcerers, but then this man was strong, and he was weak, this man was courageous, and Gilbert was not so yet. Twenty times he arose, determined to beard the stranger, and twenty times his trembling limbs bent under him, and he sunk on his knees. Then the thought struck him that he would get a ladder used by La Brie, who was at the same time cook, butler, and gardener, for nailing the jasmine and honeysuckle against the walls, and by propping it against the balcony of the apartment. Be enabled to mount to the window, and witness what he so ardently desired to discover. He passed stealthily into the courtyard, ran to the spot where the ladder lay, but as he was stooping to take it up, he thought he heard a noise in the direction of the house, and he turned. He was almost certain that in the obscurity he saw a human form enter the dark frame of the open door, but moving so quickly and so noiselessly that it appeared rather a specter than a living being. He let the ladder fall, and, his heart beating audibly, hastened back toward the chateau. Some minds are constitutionally superstitious, and these are generally the most exalted and the richest in fancy. They admit the fabulous more readily than the rational, because what is natural is too common for them, impelled as they are towards the impossible, or at least the ideal. Such spirits delight in the darkness of the forest, the depths of which they people with phantoms or genii. The ancients, who were poets in all things, saw these fantastic beings in open day. But as their sun, warmer and brighter than ours, forbade the fancy to bring forth spectres and demons, they filled the forest with smiling dryads and wood nymphs. Gilbert, born in a gloomier clime, imagined he saw a spirit. This time, in spite of his incredulity, he recalled the words of the woman who had fled from Bosamo, and the idea flashed across his mind that the sorcerer might have summoned up some evil spirit to do his bad behests. But Gilbert had always, after a first impression, a second not more encouraging, for it was the result of reflection. His recalled all the arguments of powerful minds against the belief in the return of spirits to this world, and thinking of the article, Spectre, in the Philosophical Dictionary, restored his courage. But it was only to give him another apprehension better founded and more alarming. If he had indeed seen any one, it must have been a real individual deeply interested in watching him. Fear suggested M. de Taverny, his conscience whispered another name. He looked up to Nicole's apartment, her candle was out, not a ray of light was visible, not a whisper, not a movement, not a light in all the house, except in the stranger's room. He looked, he listened. Then, seeing nothing, hearing nothing, he took up the ladder again, convinced that he had been deceived, and that this vision had been the result of a suspension of his observing faculties, rather than of their exercise. Just as he was about to place his ladder, Balsamo's door opened and then shut. At this sound he hurried in, and saw André glide out and descend the stairs without noise and without a light, as if guided and supported by a supernatural power. Having reached the landing place, she passed by where he had now concealed himself, in the shade, her dress touching him as she passed, and continued her way. The Baron was asleep, La Brie in bed, Nicole in the other turret, Balsamo's door closed, he could not be surprised by any one. He made a violent effort and followed her, adapting his step to hers, and keeping at a distance from her. She passed through the anteroom into the saloon, but although she left the door open, he stopped just before he reached it. Should he enter? He hesitated, then resolved. 
but just as his foot was on the threshold, an arm was stretched out in the darkness, and he was firmly grasped. Gilbert turned, his heart panting as if it would burst his bosom. So I have caught you at last. Whispered an angry voice, close at his ear. Deny now, if you can, that you have meetings, that you are in love with her. Gilbert had not strength to shake himself loose from the gripe which detained him, yet it was only that of a young girl. It was simply the hand of Nicole Legay that held him. What do you mean, whispered he, impatiently. Oh, I am to speak it out, then, and Nicole raised her voice nearly to the loudest pitch. No, for God's sake, be quiet. Replied Gilbert, between his closed teeth, and dragging her away from the door. Well, come with me, then. This was what Gilbert wanted, for by going away with her, he took her away from André. He followed Nicole, who led the way into the courtyard, shutting the door behind her when he had passed. But, said Gilbert, Mademoiselle will be reading to her apartment. She will call you to help her to undress, and you will not be in the house. Do you think I care for that now? Let her call or not, I must speak to you. You might put off until tomorrow what you have got to say, Nicole. You know Mademoiselle André is strict. Yes, I would advise her to be strict, particularly with me. Tomorrow, Nicole, promise. You promise. I know what your fine promises are. This very day you promised to meet me near Maison Rouge. Where were you? Why, in the very opposite direction, since you brought the traveller hither. Your promises, indeed. I believe them just as I did those of our confessor at the Annunciates, who swore to keep secret what we confessed, and then told all our sins to the abbess. But, Nicole, you will be dismissed if you are seen. And you, will you not be dismissed for being in love with my young lady? Do you think the baron too generous for that? He could surely have no motive for dismissing me, said Gilbert, endeavouring to defend himself. Oh, none in the world. The baron, perhaps, allows you to pay your addresses to his daughter. I really did not know he was quite so great a philosopher. Gilbert might easily have proved to Nicole, by relating what he had just witnessed, that if he was to blame, at least André was not privy to his misconduct. And incredible as her visit to the stranger's apartment would have appeared, Nicole, thanks to the good opinion women have of one another, would have believed him. But deeper reflection arrested the words on his lips. André's secret was one that might serve him, as it placed her completely in his power, and as he loved André infinitely more than he feared Nicole, he was silent on the singular events he had just witnessed. Well, said he, since you insist on having an explanation let us understand each other. Oh, that is easily done. But you are right, this is a bad place for it, let us go to my room. To your room? Impossible. Why so? We might be surprised. Indeed. And who would surprise us? Mademoiselle. True, she might be jealous about her sweet youth. Unfortunately for her since her secret is discovered, I am not afraid of her. Mademoiselle André jealous of Nicole. What an honor! And the forced laugh of the young girl frightened Gilbert more than any invective or menace could possibly have done. It is not Mademoiselle of whom I am afraid, said he, I am only anxious on your own account, Nicole. Oh! Most anxious, no doubt. But you are going to my room for no bad purpose, and you have often told me where there was no bad intention there should be no shame. Philosophers are Jesuits sometimes, and our confessor at the Annunciades told me all that before you. Come, come. No more false reasons I come to my room. I am resolved you shall. Nicole, said he, grinding his teeth. Well, what more, pray? Take care, and he raised his hand. Oh, I am not afraid. You struck me once, but you were jealous then, at that time you loved me and I allowed you to strike me, but I shall not now. No, no, no. For you no longer love me, and it is I who am jealous now. But what will you do, cried Gilbert, grasping her wrist. I shall scream, and Mademoiselle will hear me. 
I advise you to let go your hold of me. Gilbert dropped her hand, then seizing the ladder and dragging it cautiously after him, he placed it against the wall of the turret, so that it reached nearly to Nicole's window. See how things turn in this world, said she, maliciously. The ladder which was to assist you to climb to Mademoiselle's apartment must merely serve you to descend from my humble attic. Very flattering for me, is it not? Nicole, perceiving the advantage she had gained, declared her triumph with that precipitate eagerness which women, unless indeed those of very superior minds, often exhibit, a victory which is often too dearly purchased. Gilbert, who felt himself in a false position, was silent, and followed the young girl, reserving all his powers for the approaching contest. In the first place, however, like a prudent general he satisfied himself on two points. The first was, in passing, before the window, that Mli, the taverny was still in the saloon, and the second, on reaching Nicole's chamber, that in case of necessity, he could reach the latter without much risk of breaking his neck. And thus allow himself to slide to the ground. Nicole's room was as simple in its furniture as the rest of the house. It was a loft, the walls of which were covered with a drab and green paper. A wooden bed, and a large geranium placed near the window, were its whole furniture and decorations, except a large bonnet box, given her by Andre, which served both for table and wardrobe. And Mole sat down on the edge of the bed, Gilbert on a corner of the box. She had had time to calm down while ascending the stairs, and now, completely mistress of herself, she felt strong in having justice on her side. Gilbert, on the contrary, was agitated, and could not recover his coolness, his anger had increased as hers decreased. So, said she, you are in love with Mademoiselle, and you have attempted to deceive me? Who told you I was in love with Mademoiselle? Dame! Were you not going to a rendezvous with her? How do you know that I had a rendezvous with her? How do I know? Why, there was no one else to go to but the sorcerer. Well, I might have been going to him, I am ambitious. Say envious. It is the same word taken in a bad sense. Don't let us dispute about words, you love me no longer. Yes, I do, I love you still. Then why do you avoid me? Because you quarrel with me whenever I meet you. That is because you always avoid me. You know I am shy, that I love solitude. Yes, and you seek solitude, ladder in hand. Gilbert was beaten on his first move. Come, come. Be frank if you can, Gilbert, and confess that you no longer love me, or that you love two women at once. Well, and if I did, what would you say? I should say it was monstrous. No, no that there was an error somewhere. In your heart. No, in our social state. You know there are nations where every man is allowed seven or eight wives. They are not Christians, said Nicole, pettishly. They are philosophers, said Gilbert, with dignity. So, master philosopher, you would wish me to take a second lover, as you have done. I would not be unjust and tyrannical, I should not wish to repress the impulses of your heart. Freedom, blessed freedom, respects free will. If you change your love, Nicole, I shall not force you to a fidelity which, in my opinion, is unnatural. Ah, I see plainly you no longer love me. Gilbert was great in argument, not that he was skillful in logic, but he was an adept in paradox and, however little he knew, he still knew more than Nicole. She had read only what amused her, he what taught him a little also, and, as they talked, he regained his presence of mind while Nicole began to lose hers. Has the great philosopher any memory? asked Nicole, with an ironical smile. Sometimes, replied Gilbert. Then you have not forgotten, perhaps, what you said to me five months ago when I came with Mademoiselle from the Annunciades. I have forgotten, tell it me. You said, I am poor. It was the day we were reading among the old ruins. Well, go on. You trembled very much that day. Very likely, I am naturally timid, but I do all I can to correct that fault, and some others also. So that when you have corrected all your faults, said Nicole, laughing, you will be perfect. 
I shall be strong, wisdom gives strength. Where did you read that, pray? Never mind, return to what you were saying. Nicole felt that she was losing ground every minute. Well, you said Tome, I am poor, no one loves me, yet there is something here, and you pressed your hand on your heart. No, Nicole. If I pressed my hand anywhere when I said that, it must have been on my forehead. The heart is merely a forcing pump, which drives the blood to the extremities of the body. Read the article, Heart in the Philosophical Dictionary. And Gilbert drew himself up proudly. Humble before Balsamo, he gave himself the airs of a prince before Nicole. You are right, Gilbert, it must have been your head which you struck. Well, striking your forehead, you said, I am treated here worse than a dog, indeed, Mahone is in a happier condition than I, I replied that they were wrong not to love you, that if you had been my brother, I should have loved you also. I think, however, I said that from my heart, not from my head, but perhaps I am wrong, for I never read the philosophical dictionary. You ought to read it, Nicole. Then you threw your arms round me. You said, you are an orphan. I am one, too. Let us love each other as if we were brother and sister, no, better than if we were, for if we were, we should be forbidden to love as I wish we should, then you kissed me. Very possibly. Did you think then as you spoke? Oh, yes, one generally thinks what one says at the time one says it. So that now. Now I am five months older than I was. I have learned things of which I knew nothing then, and I look forward to things which I do not yet know. I think differently now. You are a deceiver, a hypocrite, a liar, exclaimed she, furiously. No more than a traveler, should he make two different answers to the same question, if you asked him in a valley what he thought of the prospect, and again when he had got to the top of a mountain which before had closed his view. So, then, you will not marry me? I never said I would marry you, said Gilbert, contemptuously. And yet, cried the exasperated girl, I think Nicole Legay fully the equal of Sebastian Gilbert. All human beings are equal. But nature or education makes certain faculties greater in one man than another, and according as these faculties are more or less developed, men differ from one another. So that your faculties being more developed than mine, you are raised above me? Quite correct, you do not reason yet, Nicole, but you understand. Yes, yes, I understand, cried Nicole, with redoubled passion. What do you understand? That you are a bad man. It is possible. Many are born with bad inclinations. Rousseau himself had such, but he corrected them, I shall do the same. Oh, heavens, cried Nicole, how could I ever love such a man? You did not love me, Nicole, replied Gilbert, coldly. I pleased you, that was all. You had just come from Nancy, where you had only seen students whom you laughed at or soldiers who frightened you. So you took a fancy to me, and for a mouth or two we enjoyed our dream of love. But should we, therefore, be tied together, to be eternally miserable? You see, Nicole, if we bound ourselves for our lives in a moment of happiness, we should give up our free will, and that would be absurd. Is that philosophy? asked Nicole. I think so, replied Gilbert. Then there is nothing sacred in the eyes of philosophers. Oh, yes, reason is. Yet I think you once said something about being faithful to the choice of the heart. You recollect your theory on marriages. On unions, Nicole, for I shall never marry. You will never marry. No, I shall be a learned man, a philosopher. Science requires perfect freedom of the mind, and philosophy that of the body. Monsieur Gilbert, said she, you are a wretch, and whatever I am, I am at least better than you. Now, said Gilbert, rising, we are only losing time, you in abusing me, and I in listening to you, let us end. You love me because you took pleasure in loving. Well? Well, there is no reason in the world that I should make myself unhappy because you did a thing which gave you gratification. Fool! She exclaimed, you think you can confound my common sense, and you pretend not to fear me. Fear you? 
Why, Nicole, jealousy is turning your brain. Jealousy, she cried, stamping her foot, and why should I be jealous? Is there a prettier girl in the province than I? If I had but as white a hand as Mademoiselle, and I shall have some day when I do no more hard work. You are my first lover, it is true, but you are not the first man who has paid court to me. Gilbert, Gilbert, do not force me to seek revenge on you, do not make me leave the narrow path in which a last remembrance of my mother, and the regular repetition of my prayers, have kept him oh. Gilbert, if you do, you may have to reproach yourself with bringing many evils on yourself and others. All in good time, said Gilbert. So now that you have got to the summit of your dignity, Nicole, I am perfectly satisfied on one point. And what may that be, inquired the girl. Simply that if I consent now to marry you. What then? Why, that you would refuse me. Nicole paused, her clenched hands and gnashing teeth showing the workings of her mind. You are right. She exclaimed, at length. Yes, I also begin to ascend the mountain of which you spoke. I see a wider prospect before me. The wife of a learned man, a philosopher. No, I am destined for something greater than that. Mount your ladder, and don't break your neck, though I begin to think it would be a blessing for many persons if you would, perhaps even a blessing for yourself. She turned her back on him. Gilbert, stood a moment wavering and irresolute. For Nicole, excited by anger and jealousy, was truly beautiful. But he had resolved to break with her, Nicole could blast at once his love and his ambition. His decision was made. In a few seconds, Nicole, hearing no sound, looked behind her. She was alone in the apartment. Gone, she murmured, and Mademoiselle, oh, I shall know tomorrow whether she loves him or not. She went to the window and looked out, all was dark, every light extinguished. She stole on tiptoe to her lady's door and listened. She is in bed, she sleeps soundly, said she, but tomorrow I shall know all. 11. Waiting Maid and Mistress The calmness with which Nicole returned to her room was not affected. Young, strong, full of an uncultivated self-confidence, she was blessed with that faculty so important for those who would govern where they love, the faculty of forgetting. And she could sleep after she had arranged with the little malicious sprites that dwelt in her heart her plan of vengeance. Mlee, the taverny appeared to her even more guilty than Gilbert. This aristocratic girl, rigid in her prejudices, elevated in her pride, who at their convent would descend to familiarity with none below the daughters of marquises, this statue, outwardly so cold. But yet with feeling in its marble bosom, this statue, warming to life for a rural Pygmalion like Gilbert, became contemptible in her estimation. For Nicole felt that Gilbert was her inferior in everything but a little reading, and thought that she had condescended very much when she, the waiting maid of the daughter of a ruined baron, put herself on a level with the son of a poor peasant. What, then, could she think of her mistress, if she really returned Gilbert's love? She calculated that, in relating what she had seen to the baron, she should fall into a great error. First, because he would only laugh at the affair, box Gilbert's ears, and turn him out of doors, next, because it would deprive her of her power over Gilbert and André. What pleasure she should have, she, the waiting maid, in seeing them turn pale or red as her eye fell on them. This idea flattered her pride and soothed her vindictive spirit, and, at this idea, her reflection ceased, she slept. It was day when she awoke, fresh, light-hearted, and her mind prepared for everything. She took her usual time to dress, that is, an hour. She looked at herself in the piece of broken glass which served as her mirror. Her eyes appeared to her more brilliant than ever, her lips had not lost their brightness nor their roundness, her teeth were perfect, her neck, which she took particular care to hide from the sun, was white as a lily. Seeing herself so handsome, she began to think she could easily make her young lady jealous. Thus armed personally and mentally, she opened André's door, as she was authorized to do whenever, at seven o'clock, her mistress had. Not rung for her. When Nicole entered the room she stopped in amazement. Pale, her beautiful hair damp with perspiration, 
Andre lay on her bed in a heavy sleep, in which she sometimes writhed as if in pain. She was still in the dress which she had worn the day before. Her breathing was hurried, and now and then a low groan escaped her lips. Nicole looked at her for a minute, then shook her head, for she acknowledged to herself that there could be no beauty which could contest the palm with Andre's. She went to the window and opened the shutters. A stream of light poured in, and made Mli, the tavernie's violet-veined eyelids quiver. She awoke, tried to rise, but felt, at the same time, such great weakness and such excessive pain, that she fell back on her pillow with a cry of suffering. Oh! Mademoiselle, what is the matter? asked Nicole. Is it late? said Andre, rubbing her eyes. Very late, madam, much later than your usual hour for rising. I do not know what is the matter with me, Nicole, said she, looking around her, I feel so oppressed, so ill. Nicole fixed her eyes on her mistress before replying, It is the commencement of a cold that you have caught, madam, last night. Last night, replied Andre, surprised, then, looking at her disordered dress, have I really lain down without undressing? How could that be? If Mademoiselle would reflect. I don't recollect anything about it, replied Andrea leaning her head on her hand. What has happened? Am I going mad? She sat up on the bed, and looked round for the second time, all bewildered. Then, after reflecting, oh. Yes, I remember I was very much tired, very much exhausted yesterday, it was the storm, no doubt, then I fell asleep, on the music stool at my harpsichord, but, after that, I remember nothing. I must have come up to my room half asleep, and thrown myself on my bed without strength to undress. You should have called me, mademoiselle, said Nicole, mademoiselle knows that I am always ready to wait on her. I either did not think of it, or had not the strength to do it. Hypocrite! muttered Nicole to herself, then she added. But mademoiselle must have stayed very late at her harpsichord, then, for before she came up to her room, hearing a noise, I went down, she stopped. Hoping to discover in André something like agitation, a blush, perhaps. No, André was calm, and her countenance, that clear mirror of her soul, was undisturbed. I went down, repeated Nicole. Well? Well, madam, you were not at your harpsichord. André looked up, but there was only surprise to be read in her lovely eyes. Very strange, said she. It is quite true, however. You say I was not in the saloon, but I never left it for a moment till I came to bed. Mademoiselle will pardon me for contradicting her. But where was I, then? Mademoiselle must know that better than I, said Nicole, shrugging her shoulders. You must be wrong, Nicole, said André, mildly. I only remember feeling cold and stiff, and having great difficulty in walking. Oh, but when I saw Mademoiselle, she walked very well, said Nicole, almost with a sneer. You saw me walk. Yes, indeed, madam. But just now you said I was not in the saloon. It was not in the saloon I saw Mademoiselle. Where, then? In the vestibule, near the staircase. I. Yes. I think I ought to know Mademoiselle when I see her, said Nicole, with an affected laugh. I am certain, however, said André, with great simplicity, after she had again tried to recall the events of the night, that I did not stir out of the saloon. I am, however, quite as certain that I saw Mademoiselle in the vestibule. I thought, indeed, she had just come in from a walk in the garden. It was a beautiful night, after the storm, and it is very pleasant to walk out when the air is so cool, and when the flowers smell so sweet, is it not, mademoiselle? Oh, but you know I dare not walk out at night. I am too timid. Mademoiselle might have someone with her, and then she would not be afraid. And whom, pray, could I have with me? Asked André, without the least suspicion that she was undergoing a cross-examination. Nicole was afraid to proceed further in her investigation. André's coolness she thought the height of dissimulation. But she judged it best to give the conversation another turn. 
Mademoiselle was saying that she felt in pain. Yes, indeed, I feel in great pain, and so weak, so low. I did nothing yesterday but what I do every day, yet I am so tired, perhaps I am going to be ill. It may be some sorrow which causes that feeling of weariness, I have felt it myself. Oh, you have sorrows, have you, Nicole? This was said with a disdainful carelessness, which gave Nicole courage to speak more plainly. Oh, yes, madam, she replied, yes, I have. André got slowly out of bed, and, while proceeding to undress, that she might dress again, she said. Well, let me hear them. Indeed, I have just come to tell Mademoiselle, she stopped. To tell what? You look frightened, Nicole. I look frightened, and Mademoiselle looks tired, so, doubtless, we are both suffering. This piece of familiarity displeased André. She frowned slightly, exclaiming, Oh! The intonation of her voice might have made Nicole reflect, but she was not to be daunted. Since Mademoiselle wishes me to speak, I shall do so. Well, go on. I wish to get married, madam. Oh! Is that what you are thinking of? Why, you are not seventeen yet. Mademoiselle is only sixteen, and yet does she not sometimes think of marrying? What reason have you to suppose so? Asked André, severely. Nicole was just opening her mouth to say something impertinent, but she knew that that would cut short the conversation, which she had no desire should end yet. I beg Mademoiselle's pardon. I cannot certainly know her thoughts, I am but a country girl, I follow nature. That is a strange expression. Is it not natural for a woman to love, and to wish to be loved? Perhaps so. Well? Well, I am in love. And the person you love loves you? I think so, madam, then, reflecting that this reply was not decided enough under the circumstances, she added, indeed, I am sure of it. You are not wasting your time at Taverny, from your own account, Mademoiselle Nicole. One must think of the future, madam, you area lady, and doubtless some rich relation will leave you a fortune. I must do the best I can for myself. All this appeared natural enough, and forgetting Nicole's little piece of impertinence, André's goodness of heart began to resume the ascendancy. Very true, said she, but I should like to know who is your choice. Ah, you do know him, madam, said Nicole, fixing her eyes on André. I know him. Yes, very well. Who is it, then? Do not keep me in suspense. I am afraid Mademoiselle will be displeased. I displeased? Yes, Mademoiselle. Then it is some improper person whom you have chosen? I do not say that, Madam. Then tell it without fear. It is the duty of masters to take an interest in the welfare of their dependents who perform their duties satisfactorily, and you know I am satisfied with you. You are very kind, madam. Well, tell me quickly, and finish lacing me. Nicole collected all her firmness, and all her powers of penetration, as she said. Well, madam, it is Gilbert whom I have chosen. To her great surprise, André betrayed no emotion of any kind. She only said. What, little Gilbert, my nurse's son? Yes, madam, the same. And he loves you. Now was the decisive moment. He has told me so twenty times. Well, marry him, replied André, calmly. I see nothing to prevent it. You have no relations, he is an orphan, you are each of you free from control. Certainly, stammered Nicole, quite amazed at the matter ending so differently from what she had expected. Mademoiselle gives her permission, then. My full permission, only you are both very young yet. We shall live longer together. And you have neither one nor other any money. We shall work. What can he work at? He is good for nothing. This dissimulation was too much for Nicole. She could not contain herself. Mademoiselle must allow me to say, that speaking so of poor Gilbert is treating him very ill. It is treating him as he deserves, he is a lazy fellow. 
Oh, mademoiselle, he reads a great deal, he wishes so to be well informed. He will not work. For mademoiselle he does all that he can. For me. Mademoiselle must know that, when she ordered him to procure game for her every day, and he does so. I ordered him. Yes, and he often goes twenty miles for it. Indeed. I confess I never thought about it. About the game? Asked Nicole, sarcastically. What does that witticism mean? Asked Andre, getting a little impatient, for she felt irritable and unwell. I have no wit, madam, wit is for great ladies. I am a poor girl, and tell things plainly as they are, replied Nicole, and mademoiselle is unjust to Gilbert, who is so very attentive to all her wishes. He only does his duty as a servant, if it be so. But Gilbert is not a servant, madam. He receives no wages. He is the son of an old tenant, he is kept, he is fed, and he does nothing in return. But why defend so warmly this lad, when he was not attacked? Oh, I knew very well that Mademoiselle would not attack him. More words that I do not understand. Mademoiselle will not understand. Enough. Explain this moment what you mean. Mademoiselle must certainly have no difficulty to know what I mean. I know nothing, and I shall not take the trouble of finding out, you ask my consent to your marriage. Yes, and I would beg of you, Mademoiselle, not to be angry with Gilbert for loving me. What can it matter to me whether he loves you or does not love you? You are really very tiresome. Perhaps Mademoiselle has said the same to Gilbert. I. Do lever speak to your Gilbert. You are crazy, I think. If Mademoiselle does not speak to him now, it is not very long since she did speak. André turned on her a look of ineffable scorn. You have been trying for an hour to let me hear some specimen of your impertinence. Say it at once, I command you. But, began Nicole, a little alarmed. You say I have spoken to Gilbert. Yes, madam, I say so. A thought flashed across André's mind, but it was so absurd that she burst into a fit of laughter. Heaven forgive me, she exclaimed. I do believe the pool girl is jealous. Be not uneasy, Legay, I know so little of your Gilbert, that I do not even know the color of his eyes. And André felt quite prepared to pardon what she now thought not impertinence, but mere folly. But Nicole did not want to be pardoned, because she looked on herself as the injured person. It is not the way to know their color to look at them by night, said she. Did you speak? asked André now beginning to understand, but scarcely willing to allow herself to entertain the thought. I said that if Mademoiselle only speaks to Gilbert at night, she will not see very well what his features are. Take care, said André, turning pale, and explain instantly what you mean. That is easily done. Last night I saw. Be silent. Someone calls me. In fact, a voice just then called from the court in front of the house. Andre. Andre. It is the Baron, madam, said Nicolo, with the strange gentleman. Go down, and say that I cannot appear, that I am indisposed, and then return and let me know the end of this extraordinary history of yours. Andre. Cried her father again, it is merely the Baron Bolsamo, who wishes to bid you good morning and inquire after your health. Go, I tell you, said she to Nicole and she pointed to the door with the gesture of a queen. But when Nicole was gone, André felt a strange sensation, she had resolved not to appear, yet she was impelled by an irresistible power to the window left open by her waiting maid. She saw Bolsamo below. He bowed, at the same time fixing his eyes steadily on her. She trembled, and held by the window to prevent herself from falling. Good morning, sir, said she, in reply to his salutation. And just as she pronounced the words, Nicole, whom she had sent to say she should not appear, advanced toward the gentleman, looking with open mouth at this instance of caprice at her mistress. André had scarcely spoken, when she sunk, deprived of strength, on a chair. Bolsamo still continued to gaze on her. 12. The Morning. 
The traveler had risen early in order to look after his carriage and inquire how Elthotas had got on. No one was up at that hour in the castle but Gilbert, who followed with his eyes every movement of the stranger. But he could discover little, as Bosamo closed the carriage door too carefully for his inquisitive looks to penetrate its mystery. Seeing the baron's abode by the clear light of a sunny morning. Bolsamo was struck by the different impression it made on him from what it had done the preceding night. In fact the little white and red chateau, for it was built of stone and brick made a pretty picture, surrounded as it was by a grove of sycamores and laburnums of a large size. The flowers of which hung on the roof of the low building and girt the towers with a crown of gold. In front of the court there was a small piece of water surrounded by a broad border of turf and a hedge of acacias, on which the eye rested with pleasure, confined as the view was on this side by the tall chestnut and ash trees of the avenue. Bosamo turned along a broad walk on the left, and had scarcely advanced twenty paces when he found himself in the midst of a thick shrubbery of maples, palms, and lindens, among which the roses and syringas. Steeped by the rain of the preceding night, sent forth a delicious perfume. Through the hedge of privet which bordered the walk peeped jasmine and honeysuckle, and in the distance could be seen a long alley lined with pink hawthorn and wild roses, leading to a wood. Bolsamo at last arrived at the extremity of the domain. Here, on a slight elevation, stood the massive ruins of an ancient castle, one of the towers of which was still standing almost uninjured, and clothed from its base to its summit with luxuriant shoots of the ivy and wild vine. Viewed from this point, the domain of Taverny, though but seven or eight acres in extent, wanted neither dignity nor elegance. After having spent about an hour in examining the ruins, Bosamo was returning toward the house, when he saw the baron leave it by a side door, his slight frame buried in an Indian flower dressing gown and proceed to prune and arrange his little parterre. He hastened to meet him, and now having still further sounded the poverty of his host. His politeness was more decided in its expression than it had been the night before. Allow me, sir, said he, to offer you my excuses for the trouble I have given you, and, at the same time, my respectful thanks for your hospitality. I should not have ventured to come down before knowing that you were up, but the view of Taverny from my window was so charming that I could not resist my desire to revisit those imposing ruins, and to see your beautiful garden. The ruins, said the baron, after having politely wished the stranger good morning, the ruins, sir, are fine, indeed the only thing that is fine at Taverny. It was a large castle. Yes, it was mine, or, rather, my ancestors. They called it Maison Rouge, which name has long been joined to Taverny, indeed, our barony is Maison Rouge, but, my dear guest, let us not talk of things no longer in being. Bolsamo bowed his submission. Allow me, rather, to make my excuses to you for your poor accommodation here. I told you beforehand what my house was. I have been delighted with it. A dog kennel. A dog kennel, sir. A very favorite place with the rats, since the foxes, lizards, and adders drove them from the other castle. Ah, pardieu. Sir, you who are a sorcerer, or something very near it, you ought certainly to raise up, with a stroke of your wand, the old castle in its glory again, above all, not forgetting the two thousand acres which formerly surrounded it. I'll wager, however, that instead of thinking of doing me such a service, you have been so polite as to go to sleep in an execrable bed. Oh, sir. No, no, don't attempt to say anything in its favor. It's an execrable bed, it is my son's. You must permit me to say that such as the bed is, it appeared to me excellent. I cannot but feel ashamed of having intruded on you, and I am deeply indebted for the kindness with which you have received me. It would give me sincere pleasure to make a return, if it were in my power. Well, there is an opportunity, replied the old man, with a mocking smile, and pointing to La Brie who was coming with a glass of water on a splendid plate of Dresden china, just turn this into Burgundy, Chamberton, or any other good wine. And you will do me a most essential service. Bolsamo smiled, the old man took the smile for a refusal, and at one draft swallowed the water presented to him. An excellent specific, said Bolsamo. 
Water is highest among the elements, for the Holy Spirit was born on it before the creation of the world. Nothing can resist its action, it penetrates stone, and we may yet discover that the diamond can be dissolved by it. I shall be dissolved by it, I fear, replied the baron. Will you pledge me? The water has some advantages over my wine, it is in capital order, and it is not yet exhausted. It is not like my maraschino. If you had ordered a glass for me as well as for yourself, I might have been able to use it for your advantage. Good. Explain that for me. Is it not still time? Then tell your servant to bring me a glass of very pure water. La Brie, do you hear, you old rascal? La Brie hastened to obey. How, said the baron, turning to his guest, does the glass of water which I drink every morning contain any properties, any secrets which are unknown to me? Have I for ten years been making chemical experiments as Monsieur Jourdain made prose, without being aware of it? I do not know what you have been doing, but you shall see what I can do. Thank you, my good fellow, said Balsamo, taking the glass from La Brie, who had brought it with marvelous rapidity. He held the glass on a level with his eyes, and seemed to interrogate the water which it contained. In the sunshine the little beads on its surface were bright as diamonds, and streaked with violet color. Oh, the deuce, cried the baron, laughing. Can anything beautiful be seen in a glass of water? Yes, baron. Today, at least, something very beautiful. And Bosamo appeared doubly attentive in his occupation, the baron, in spite of himself, looking a little serious, and La Brie gazing with open mouth at what was going on. What do you see, pray? I am bursting with impatience to know. A good estate for me. A new Maison Rouge to set me on foot again. I see something which induces me to beg you to be on the alert. I. Am I going to be attacked? No. But this morning you will receive a visit. Then, you have yourself ordered someone to meet you here. That was wrong, sir, very wrong. There may be no partridges this morning, remember that. I speak seriously, my dear Baron, and what I say is most important, someone is at this moment on the way to Taverny. Someone? What sort of a visitor, tell me, pray. For I must confess, you must have perceived it from the rather sour reception I gave you, that everyone annoys me who comes here. So, what sort of visitor? Be precise, my dear sorcerer, if possible, be precise in your description. I can very easily tell all you wish, and Bosamo again raised the glass to his searching eye. Well, do you see anything? I see everything distinctly. Speak, oh, speak, Sister Anne. I see a lady of great consequence coming. Bah! Indeed, coming without being invited? She has invited herself, your son brings her. Philip brings her. Yes, himself. The baron laughed heartily. She is brought by my son. The great lady brought by my son. Yes, baron. You know my son, then. I never saw him in my life. And my son at this moment is. Is about a mile off. My dear sir, he is in garrison at Strasbourg, and unless he has deserted, which he has not, I can swear, he is bringing nobody hither. He is bringing a great lady hither, a very exalted personage. Ah, hold. There is one thing I ought to tell you, you had better keep out of sight that little rogue with the horn at her finger ends. Nicole Legay. Why, pray? Because her features resemble those of the lady who is coming. A great lady resemble Nicole. That is absurd. Why so? I bought a slave once, who resembled Cleopatra so much that there was some idea of sending her to born to pass for that queen in Octavius's triumph. Ah, I another attack of your malady. You must surely see, my dear Baron, that this matter cannot concern me, I only speak for your own good. But why should Nicole's resemblance to the great lady offend her? Suppose you were the King of France, which I am far from wishing, or the Dauphin, which I wish still less, should you be flattered, on entering a house, 
to find among the servants one whose face was a counterpart of your august visage. Oh, the devil! That would be a sad dilemma. So, then, you think. I think that the most high and mighty lady who is coming would not be pleased to see her living image in a short petticoat and cotton handkerchief. Oh, well, said the baron, still laughing, we must see about it, but, after all, my dear baron, what delights me most in this affair is, that my son is coming, that dear Philip. Without giving us a note of warning. And he laughed louder than before. So you are pleased with my prediction, said Bolsamo, gravely. I am glad of it, but, in your place, I should set about giving some orders. Really? Yes. I shall think of it, my dear guest, I shall think of it. You have very little time. And you are serious, then? No one could be more serious. If you wish to receive the great personage, who does you the honor of visiting you, properly, you have not a minute to lose. The baron shook his head. You still doubt? asked Bolsamo. I warn you, you have to do with a most confirmed skeptic. And just then he turned to call his daughter, in order to communicate his guest's prediction to her, as we have before related. We have seen how the young girl replied to her father's invitation, and how Balsamo's gaze had drawn her, as if by fascination, to the window. Nicole stood looking with amazement at Labri, who was making signs to her, and trying to understand what had been said. I am dreadfully hard of belief, repeated the baron, and unless I saw. Then, since you must see, look there, said Balsamo, pointing to the avenue, where a horseman appeared galloping toward them. Ha! cried the baron, there indeed is. Monsieur Philip, said Nicole standing on tiptoe. My young master, exclaimed La Brie, joyfully. My brother, my brother, cried André, stretching out her arms at the window. Is it your son, my dear baron, asked Bosamo, in a careless tone. Yes, pardieu, it is, exclaimed he, stupefied with astonishment. This is but the beginning, said Bosamo. You are positively a sorcerer, then, said the baron, more submissively than before. A triumphant smile hovered on the stranger's lips. The horse came on at full speed, reeking with moisture, past the last rows of trees, and, while still in motion, the rider leaped to the ground, and hastened to embrace his father, who only muttered, What the devil! What the devil! It is really I, said Philip, who saw his father's perplexity, it is indeed. Doubtless, I see that plainly enough, but what brought you hither at this time? Father, a great honor awaits our house. The old man looked up inquiringly. Philip went on, in an hour Marie Antoinette Joseph, Archduchess of Austria and Dauphiness of France, will be here. The Baron looked as deeply humbled as he had before looked sarcastic, and turning to Balsamo, said only, Pardon me. Sir, returned Balsamo, I leave you with your son, it is long since you have met, and you must have much to say to each other. Bowing to André, who, full of joy at the arrival of her brother, had hastened down to meet him, he retired, making a sign to Nicole and Labrie, which they doubtless understood, for they disappeared with him among the trees of the avenue. 13. Philip de Taverny Philip de Taverny, Chevalier de Maison Rouge, did not in the least resemble his sister, yet was as fine a specimen of manly beauty as she was of feminine loveliness. His features were noble and regular, his figure and carriage graceful in the extreme, and the expression of his eyes was at the same time mild and haughty. Like all distinguished minds, wearied by the narrow and chilling forms of life, he was disposed to melancholy, without being sad. To this, perhaps, he owed his mildness of temper, for he was naturally proud, imperious, and reserved. The necessity of associating with the poor, his real equals, as with the rich, his equals in rank, had softened a character inclined to be overbearing and scornful. Philip had scarcely embraced his father, when André, roused from her magnetic torpor by his arrival, hastened down to throw herself on his bosom. The sobs which accompanied this action showed how dear he was to the heart of the tender girl. Philip took her hand in his father's, and drew them into the saloon, where being now alone, he sat down between them. 
you are incredulous, my dear father, you are surprised, my dear sister, said he, yet nothing is more true than that in a few minutes the Dauphiness will be in our poor abode. Ventrablin, cried the baron. She must be prevented, whatever it cost. The Dauphin is here. We should be dishonored forever. This would be a specimen of the nobility of France to present her. No, no, it must not be. But tell me, what the deuce put my house in her lead? Oh, it is a complete romance. A romance, said André. Belle ate it, brother, my dear, good brother. My dear, good brother, repeated the baron. She seems quite pleased. Yes, for is not Philip pleased, my dear father? Because Master Philip is an enthusiast, but for me, who look at things in a more serious manner, I see nothing very agreeable in it. You will be of a different opinion when I relate what has occurred. Well, relate it quickly, grumbled the old man. Yes, yes, relate it, exclaimed André, impatiently. Well, I was in garrison at Strasbourg, as you know. Now, you are aware that it was by Strasbourg that the Dauphiness was to enter France. Know it, how should we know anything in this den, asked the baron. Well, at Strasbourg, brother, said André. A.V.L., we were waiting on the glassy from six in the morning, for we did not know positively at what hour Madame la Dauphine would arrive. It rained in torrents, and our clothes were dripping. The major sent me forward to endeavor to discover the cortege. I had galloped about a league, when all at once, at a turn in the road, I found myself close to the advance guard of the escort. I spoke a few words to them, and just then Her Royal Highness put her head out of the carriage window, and asked who I was. It seems I had been called to stop, but I had already set off at a full gallop, all my fatigue was forgotten in an instant. And the Dauphiness? asked André. She is not older than you, and beautiful as an angel. But, Philip, said the baron, rather hesitatingly. Well, father? Does she not resemble someone you have seen? Someone that I have seen? Yes, endeavor to recollect. No, I know no one like Madame la Dauphine. He exclaimed enthusiastically. What? Not Nicole, for instance. Ha! That is most strange. Now you say so. I do think she is like her, but oh, so much inferior in beauty and grace. But how could you know that she was like her? Faith. A sorcerer told me. A sorcerer? Yes, and he predicted her coming and yours, this morning. The stranger, asked André, timidly. Is it he who was beside you, sir, when I arrived, and who retired so discreetly? Yes, the same. But go on, Philip, go on. Perhaps it would be better to make some preparations, said André. No, the more you prepare, the more ridiculous we shall appear. Go on, Philip, I tell you. I returned to Strasbourg, and told the governor, the Count de Stainville, we set out immediately to meet Her Royal Highness, and we were at the coal gate when the procession came in sight. I was close to the governor. Stay, said the baron. I once knew a Count de Stainville, brother-in-law to the Prime Minister, the Duc de Choiseul. It is the same. Go on, then go on. The Dauphiness, who is young, perhaps likes young faces, for she listened very inattentively to the governor, and all the time fixed her eyes on me, although I kept respectfully in the background. Then, pointing to me, she said, Is not that the gentleman who was the first to meet me? Yes, madam, replied the governor. Approach, sir, said she. I approached her. What is your name, asked the Dauphiness, in the sweetest voice I ever heard. The Chevalier de Taverny Maison Bouge, I replied, stammering. Pray take a note of that name on your tablets, my dear friend, said the Dauphiness, turning to an old lady, who I have since learned is the Countess de Langerschausen, her governess. My name was written. Then, turning again to me, she said, Ah, uh, sir, you have sneered very much from your exposure to this frightful weather, I am extremely sorry for having been the cause of it. Oh, 
how good the Dauphinus must be. What kindness and consideration, said André, with delight. Very well, very well, indeed, muttered the Baron, with a smile indicative of a father's partiality, and at the same time of his bad opinion of women and even of queens. But go on, Philip. What did you say, asked André. I said not a word, I bowed to the very ground. She passed on. What, you said nothing, exclaimed the Baron. I had no voice, I assure you, sir. My heart beat so rapidly, I was so much agitated. What the devil! Do you think I had nothing to say when about your age I was presented to the Princess Leksinska? But, sir, you had always a great deal of wit, Philip replied. André pressed his hand. I profited by Her Royal Highness's departure, continued Philip, to hasten to my apartment and change my clothes, for I was wet to the skin, and covered with mud from head to foot. Poor, dear brother, whispered André. When the Dauphiness, Philip continued, reached the town hall, she had to receive the congratulations of the principal inhabitants. That being over, it was announced that dinner was served. A friend of mine, the major of my regiment, since told me that while at the table she looked several times round on the officers who were present, and at last she said, I do not see the young officer who was sent to meet me this morning. Has he not been told that I wish to thank him? The major stepped forward. Madam, said he, Lieutenant de Taverny was obliged to retire and change his dress, that he might present himself in a more suitable manner before you. A moment after I entered the room, and I had not been five minutes in it when the Dauphiness perceived me. She made a sign to me to approach, I obeyed. Sir, said she, should you object to follow me to Paris? Oh, madame, I cried, it would only make me too happy, but I am in garrison at Strasbourg, and I am not my own master. Well, I shall arrange that matter with the governor, and she made a gesture for me to retire. In the evening she said to the governor, Sir, I have a vow to fulfill, and you must assist me in it. I shall consider it a sacred duty, madam, he replied. You must know, she continued, that I made a vow to take into my own service the first Frenchman, whoever he should be, whom I should meet on touching the soil of France, and that I would make him and his family happy, if, indeed, princes can make any one happy. Madam, said the governor, princes are God's representatives on earth, but may I ask, continued he, who was the person who had the good fortune to be the first met by your royal highness? The Chevalier de Taverny Maison Rouge, a young lieutenant. We shall be jealous of the Chevalier de Taverny, madam, replied the governor. But we shall not place any obstacle in the way of his high fortune, the ties which engage him here shall be broken, and he shall depart at the same time as your highness. So the day on which the Dauphiness left Strasbourg I was ordered to accompany her on horseback, and since then have never left the door of her carriage. Oh, said the Baron, with his former singular smile, strange enough, but not impossible. What, father? Oh, never mind. But, brother, said André, I don't see what all this has to do with the Dauphiness coming hither. Wait till you hear. Yesterday morning we arrived at Nancy about eleven o'clock, and were passing through the town by torchlight. The Dauphiness called me to her. I wish, said she, to depart early tomorrow morning. Your Highness is going to make a long march, then? No, but I wish to stop on the road, and you can guess where, she asked, smiling. No, madam. I mean to stop at Taverny, to see your father and sister. My father and sister? What? Your Royal Highness knows, I have made inquiries, and know that they live only two hundred paces from the road which we are travelling. The perspiration broke on my forehead, and, trembling, as you may suppose, I hastened to reply, My father's house, madam, is not worthy to receive so great a princess, we are poor. So much the better, replied she. I shall, therefore, I am certain, be received more cordially and more simply, however poor you may be, there will always be a cup of milk for a friend who wishes to forget for a moment that she is Archduchess of Austria and Dauphiness of France. Oh, madam, said I. This was all, respect forbid me to go further. 
stupid fellow, cried the baron. One might have thought that Her Royal Highness guessed what was passing in my mind, for she added, do not be afraid, I shall not stay long. But since you think that I shall suffer any inconvenience by this visit, it is only fair, for I caused you to suffer on my arrival at Strasbourg. Who could resist such charming words, father? Oh, it would have been impossible, cried André. She is so sweet, so good, she will be satisfied with my flowers and a cup of my milk, as she says. Yes, but she will not be very well satisfied with my chairs, which will dislocate her bones, and my hangings, which will disgust her. Devil take all whims. So. France will be well governed with a woman who takes such caprices. Plague on it. A strange reign it will be, to judge from the commencement, said the baron angrily. Oh, father, how can you say such things of a princess who is honoring us so highly? Who is dishonoring us, rather, cried the old man. Taverny was forgotten, buried under the ruins of Maison Rouge. I intended that if it came to light again it should be in a suitable manner, and now the whims of a girl are going to drag us in today, dusty, shabby, wretched. And the gazettes, on the watch for everything absurd, will amuse their readers with the visit of a great princess to this den of Taverny. Cordu. I have an idea. The young people started at the manner in which he pronounced these words. What do you mean, sir? demanded Philip. The baron muttered to himself, if the Duke of Medina burned his palace that he might embrace a queen, I may well burn my kennel to get rid of the visit of a princess. Let her come. Let her come. Philip and André only heard the last words, and they looked at each other uneasily. It cannot be long before she will be here, sir, said Philip. I took the way through the wood, in order to get some minutes in advance of the cortege. It will soon be here. Then I not must lose time, said the baron, and with the agility of twenty, he left the saloon. He hastened to the kitchen, snatched a flaming piece of wood from the hearth, and proceeded to his barns. But just as he raised his arm to throw it into a heap of straw, he was seized by Bolsamo, who flung to a safe distance the burning brand. What are you about, sir? cried he. The Archduchess of Austria is not a constable de Bourbon, whose presence contaminates, so that we should rather burn our house than permit her to enter it. The old man stopped, pale, trembling, and his habitual smile banished from his lips. He had gathered all his strength to enable him to resolve on making his poverty yet greater by the destruction of his dwelling, rather than be disgraced, according to his ideas, by allowing its mediocrity to be seen. Come, sir, come. Continued Bolsamo, you have only time to throw off your dressing gown and put yourself in better trim. The Baron of Taverny, whom I knew at the siege of Philipsburg, wore the Grand Cross of the Order of St. Louis. Any coat will be rich and elegant when decorated with that. But, sir, shall I show to our Dauphiness that poverty which I wish to hide from you? Be not uneasy. We shall manage to occupy her attention so that she shall not know whether your house be new or old poor or rich. Be hospitable, sir, it is your duty as a gentleman. What will the enemies of the Dauphiness, and she has many, what will they do, if her friends burn their castles rather than receive her under their roof? Let us not thus anticipate that vengeance which is to come, everything in its predestined time. The baron again showed an involuntary submission to Bolsamo, and hurried to his children, who, uneasy at his absence, were seeking him on every side. As to Bolsamo, he retired in silence, like a man intent on some work which he had undertaken, and which he must complete. 14. Marie Antoinette Joseph, Archduchess of Austria. As Bolsamo had said, there was no time to be lost, for now on the road, generally so peaceful, which led to the Baron of Taverny's dwelling, a great sound of carriages, horses, and voices was heard. Three carriages, one of which was covered with gilding and mythological bar-leaves, and which, notwithstanding its magnificence, was not less dusty and bespattered than the others, stopped at the great gate of the avenue. Gilbert held it open, his eyes distended, his whole frame trembling with feverish agitation at the sight of so much magnificence. Twenty gentlemen on horseback, all young and splendidly dressed, 
drew up near the principal carriage, from which a young girl of sixteen, dressed with great simplicity, but with her hair elaborately piled on her forehead, got out. Assisted by a gentleman in black, who wore, salter wise, under his mantle, the ribbon of St. Louis. Marie Antoinette, for it was she, brought with her a reputation for beauty which the princesses destined to share the thrones of the kings of France have not always possessed. It was difficult to say whether her eyes were beautiful or not, yet they were capable of every expression, more particularly of the opposite expressions of mildness and scorn. Her nose was finely formed, her upper lip beautiful, but the lower lip, her aristocratic inheritance from seventeen emperors, was too thick and prominent. Her complexion was lovely. Her neck, shoulders, and bust were of marble whiteness and beautifully formed, her hands truly regal. At times, when roused to energy, her carriage was majestic, firm, and decided. At other times, when not excited, soft, undulating, one might almost say, caressing. No woman ever made a more graceful courtesy, no queen ever bowed with more tact and discrimination. This day the most expressive sweetness shone in her countenance. She had resolved to be only the woman, and to forget the dauphiness. She wore a dress of white silk, and her beautiful bare arms supported a mantle of rich lace. Scarcely had she touched the ground, when she turned to assist one of her ladies of honor whom age had weakened a little, and, refusing the arm of a gentleman in black, she advanced, inhaling the fresh air. And looking around as if determined to enjoy to the utmost the few moments of freedom with which she was indulging herself. Oh, what a beautiful situation, she exclaimed, what magnificent trees! And such a pretty little house! How happy one might be in this healthful air, under those trees which form so sweet a retirement! Dash! At this moment Philip appeared, followed by Andre, on whose arm the baron leaned. She was dressed in a simple gown of grey silk, and the baron in a coat of blue velvet, the remains of some of his old magnificence. He had not forgotten Balsamo's recommendation, and wore his ribbon of St. Louis. On seeing the three approach, the dauphiness stopped. Her escort then grouped itself around her, the officers holding their horses by the bridles, and the courtiers, hat in hand, whispering to one another. Philip drew near, pale with agitation, yet with a noble bearing. With your royal highness's permission, said he, I have the honor of presenting to you the Baron de Taverny Maison Rouge, my father, and Claire André de Taverny, my sister. The Baron bowed profoundly, like a man who knew how to bow to queens. André showed, in her graceful timidity, the most flattering kind of politeness, sincere respect. Marie Antoinette looked at the two young people, and recalling what Philip had said of their poverty, she guessed what they suffered at that moment. Madam, said the Baron, with dignity, your royal highness does too much honor to the Chateau of Taverny, such an humble abode is not worthy to receive so much rank and beauty. I know that it is the abode of an old soldier of France, replied the Dauphiness, and my mother, the Empress Maria Theresa, who was a distinguished warrior, has told me that often in your country those richest in glory are the poorest in meaner treasures. And with ineffable grace, she extended her lovely hand to André, who, kneeling, kissed it. The Baron was, however, still haunted by the idea which had so much tormented him, that the train of the Dauphiness was about to crowd into his little house, in which there could not be found chairs for a fourth of their number. The Dauphiness hastened to relieve him from all embarrassment. Gentlemen, said she, turning to those who formed her escort, I must not impose on you the trouble of following me in all my caprices. You will wait here, if you please. In half an hour I shall return. Come with me, my good Langerschausen, she added, in German, to the lady whom she had assisted out of the carriage, and you, sir, said she to the gentleman in black, have the goodness to follow us. This personage, though dressed thus simply, was remarkable for the elegance of his manners, and was about thirty years of age, and very handsome. He drew to one side to allow the princess to pass. Marie Antoinette took André for her guide, and made a sign to Philip to come near his sister. As to the baron, he was left to the personage of high rank doubtless to whom the Dauphiness had granted the honor of accompanying her. 
So you are a Taverny Maison Rouge, said he. Playing with his splendid ruffles of the most expensive lace, and turning to the baron with truly aristocratic impertinence. Must I reply, sir, or my lord, asked the baron, with equal impertinence. You may say simply prince, or your eminence, which you choose, the other replied. Well, then, your eminence, I am a Taverny Maison Rouge, a real one, said the baron, in that tone of raillery which he so seldom abandoned. His eminence, who had the usual tact of great nobles, felt that he had to do with no country clown, and continued, This is your summer residence. Summer and winter, answered the baron, who wished to put an end to disagreeable queries, but accompanying each reply with a low bow. Philip could not help turning from time to time uneasily toward his father, for the house, as they drew nearer it, wore an aspect threatening and ironical, as if pitilessly determined to show all their poverty. The baron had already resignedly extended his hand to point the way to the door of his house, when the dauphiness, turning to him, said, Excuse me, sir, if I do not enter, these shades are so delightful that I could pass my life in them. I am tired of rooms. For fifteen days I have been received in rooms, I, who love the open air, the shade of trees, and the perfume of flowers. Then, turning to André, you will bring me a cup of milk here, under these beautiful trees, will you not? Your Highness, said the Baron, turning pale, how should we dare to offer you such poor refreshment? I prefer it, sir, to anything else. New laid eggs and milk formed my banquets at Schoenbrunn. All at once La Brie, swelling with pride, in a splendid livery and a napkin on his arm, appeared under an archway of jasmine, the shade of which had attracted the eye of the dauphiness. In a tone in which importance and respect were strangely mixed, he announced, Her Royal Highness is served. Am I in the dwelling of an enchanter, cried the princess, as she ran rather than walked to the perfumed alley. The baron, in his uneasiness, forgot all etiquette, left the gentleman in black, and hurried after the dauphiness. André and Philip looked at each other with mingled astonishment and anxiety, and followed their father. Under the clematis, jasmine, and woodbine was placed an oval table, covered with a damask cloth of dazzling whiteness, on which was arranged, in a brilliant service of plate, a collation the most elegant and rare. There were exotic fruits made into the most delicious confections, biscuits from Aleppo, oranges from Malta, and lemons of extraordinary size, all arranged in beautiful vases. Wines, the richest and most esteemed, sparkled like the ruby in the topaz, in decanters ornamented and cut in Persia, and in the center, in a silver vase, was placed the milk for which the dauphiness had asked. Marie Antoinette looked around. And saw surprise and alarm imprinted on the face of her host and on the countenance of his son and daughter. The gentlemen of her escort were delighted with what they saw, without understanding it, and without endeavoring to understand it. You expected me, then, sir, said she to the baron. I, madam, stammered he. Yes. You could not, in ten minutes, have all this prepared, and I have only been ten minutes here, and she looked at La Brie with an expression which said, above all, when you have only one servant. Madam, answered the baron, your royal highness was expected, or, rather, your coming was foretold to me. Your son wrote to you. No, madam. No one knew that I was coming here, as I did not wish to give you the trouble which I see I have done. It was only late last night that I expressed my intention to your son, and he reached this but half an hour before me. Scarcely a quarter of an hour, madam. Then some fairy must have revealed to you what was to occur. Mademoiselle's godmother, perhaps. Madam, said the baron, offering a chair to the princess, it was not a fairy who announced my good fortune to me. Who, then, asked she, observing that he hesitated. An enchanter, madam. An enchanter, how can that be? I know nothing of the matter, for I do not meddle with magic myself, yet to that, madam, I am indebted for being able to entertain your highness in a tolerable fashion. In that case we must not touch anything, since the collation is the work of sorcery. His eminence, added she, pointing to the gentleman in black, who had fixed his eye on a Strasbourg pie, seems in a hurry to begin, but we shall assuredly not eat of this enchanted collation. 
And you, dear friend, turning to her governess, distrust the cypress wine, and do as I do, and she poured some water from a globe-formed carafe with a narrow neck into a golden goblet. In truth, said André, with alarm, her royal highness is perhaps right. Philip trembled with surprise, and ignorant of what had passed the evening before, looked alternately at his father and his sister for explanation. But I see, continued the Dauphiness, his eminence is determined to sin in spite of all the canons of the church. Madam, replied the prelate, we princes of the church are too worldly to be able to believe that heaven's wrath will fall on us about a little refreshment for the body, and, above all, too humane to feel the least inclination to burn an honest sorcerer for providing us with good things like these. Do not jest, I pray Monseigneur, said the Baron. I swear to you that a sorcerer, a real sorcerer, foretold to me, about an hour ago, the arrival of Her Royal Highness and my son. And has an hour been sufficient for you to prepare this banquet, demanded the Dauphiness. In that case you are a greater sorcerer than your sorcerer. No, madam. It was he who did all this, and brought the table up through the ground, ready served as you see. On your word, sir. On the honor of a gentleman, replied the baron. Ha! said the cardinal, in a serious tone, putting back the plate which he had taken, I thought you were jesting. Then you have in your house a real magician. A real magician. And I should not wonder if he has made all the gold on that table himself. Oh, he must have found out the philosopher's stone, cried the cardinal, his eyes sparkling with covetousness. See how the eyes of his eminence sparkle, he who has been seeking all his life for the philosopher's stone, said the Dauphiness. I confess to your royal highness, replied his very worldly eminence, that nothing interests me more than the supernatural, nothing is so curious, in my estimation, as the impossible. Ah! I have traced the vulnerable part, it seems. Said the Dauphiness, every great man has his mysteries, particularly when he is a diplomatist, and I, I warn your eminence, know a great deal of sorcery. I sometimes find out things, if not impossible, if not supernatural, at least incredible. And the eye of the Dauphiness, before so mild, flashed as from an internal storm, but no thunder followed. His eminence alone, doubtless, understood what this meant, for he looked evidently embarrassed. The Dauphiness went on. To make the thing complete, Monsieur de Taverny, you must show us your magician. Where is he? In what box have you hidden him? Madam, answered the Baron, he is much more able to put me and my house in a box, than I to put him. In truth, you excite my curiosity, said Marie Antoinette. I must positively see him. The tone in which this was uttered, although still retaining the charm which Marie Antoinette knew so well to assume, forbid all idea of refusal to comply with her wish. The Baron understood this perfectly, and made a sign to La Brie, who was contemplating with eager eyes the illustrious guests, the sight of whom seemed to make up to him for his twenty years of unpaid wages. Tell Baron Joseph Balsamo, said his master, that Her Royal Highness the Dauphiness desires to see him. La Brie departed. Joseph Balsamo, said the Dauphiness. What a singular name! Joseph Balsamo, repeated his eminence, as if reflecting. I think I know that name. Five minutes passed in silence, then André felt a thrill run through her frame, she heard, before it was perceptible to other ears. A step advancing under the shade of the trees, the branches were put aside, and Joseph Balsamo stood face to face with Marie Antoinette. 15. Magic Balsamo bowed humbly, but no sooner had he raised his head than he fixed his bright, expressive eyes firmly but respectfully on the face of the Dauphiness, and waited calmly until she should interrogate him. If it is you of whom the Baron de Taverny has been speaking to us, draw near, sir, that we may better see what a magician is. Balsamo advanced another step and bowed. Your profession is to foretell events, sir. Said the Dauphiness, regarding him with more curiosity than she would herself have been willing to acknowledge, and sipping some milk which had been handed her. It is not my profession, but I do foretell events. We have been brought up in an enlightened creed, 
said the Dauphiness, and the only mysteries in which we believe are those of the Catholic faith. They are to be venerated, replied Bolsamo, reverently. But here is Monsignor the Cardinal de Rohan, who will tell your Royal Highness, though he be a prince of the Church, that they are not the only mysteries which deserve to be regarded with respect. The Cardinal started. He had not told his name, it had not been pronounced, yet this stranger knew it. Marie Antoinette did not appear to remark this circumstance, but continued. You will confess, sir, that at least they are the only mysteries which cannot be controverted. Madam, answered Bolsamo, with the same respect, as well as faith there is certainty. You speak rather obscurely, sir. Although thoroughly French in heart, I am but indifferently acquainted with the niceties of the language, and must beg you to be less enigmatical if I am to comprehend you. And I, madam, would entreat that all may remain unexplained. I should deeply regret to unveil to so illustrious a princess a future which might not correspond to her hopes. This becomes serious, said Marie Antoinette. The gentleman wishes to excite my curiosity, that I may command him to tell my fortune. God forbid that your royal highness should force me to do it. Yes, replied the Dauphiness, for you would be rather puzzled to do it, and she laughed. But the Dauphiness's laugh died away without meeting an echo from any of the attendants. Every one present seemed to submit tacitly to the influence of the singular man who was for the moment the center of general attraction. Come, confess it frankly, said the Dauphiness. Bolsamo bowed. Yet it was you who predicted my arrival to the Baron de Taverny, resumed Marie Antoinette, with a slight movement of impatience. Yes, madam, it was I. And how did he do it? She added, turning to the Baron, as if she felt the necessity of a third party taking share in this strange dialogue. Very simple, madam, merely by looking in a glass of water. Was it so? she asked of Bolsamo. Yes, madam, answered he. Then, having read the future for the Baron de Taverny in a glass of water, surely you can read it for me in a decanter. Perfectly well, madam. And why refuse to do so? Because the future is uncertain, and if I saw a cloud on it, he stopped. Well? It would give me pain to sadden your royal highness. Have you known me before, or do you now see me for the first time? I have had the honor of seeing your royal highness when a child, in your native country, with your august mother. You have seen my mother, then? I have had that honor. She is a great and powerful queen. Empress, sir. I use the word queen in reference to the heart and mind, and yet. Reservations concerning my mother, said the Dauphiness, haughtily. The greatest hearts have weaknesses, madam, particularly where they think the happiness of their children is concerned. History, I trust, sir, will not discover one single weak ness in Maria Theresa. Because history will not know what is known only to the Empress Maria Theresa, to your Royal Highness, and to myself. We have a secret, sir, we three, said the Dauphiness, smiling disdainful. We three, madam, replied Bolsamo, solemnly. Come, then, tell this secret, sir. It will then be no longer one. No matter. Tell it. Is it your Royal Highness's will? It is. Bolsamo bowed. There is in the palace of Schönbrunn, said he, a cabinet, called the Dresden Cabinet, on account of the splendid vases of porcelain which it contains. Yes, said the Dauphiness, go on. This cabinet forms a part of the private suite of rooms of the Empress Maria Theresa, in it she writes her letters. Yes. On a certain day, about seven in the morning, when the Empress had not yet risen, your Royal Highness entered this cabinet by a door through which you alone were permitted to pass. For your Highness is the favorite daughter of Her Imperial Majesty. Well, sir. Your Highness approached a writing desk, on which lay open a letter which Her Imperial Majesty had written the night before. Your Royal Highness read that letter, and doubtless some expressions in it must have been displeasing to you, for you took a pen, and with your own hand erased three words. The Dauphiness blushed slightly. What were the words erased? She asked, anxiously. 
They were too condescending, doubtless, and showed too great affection for the person to whom they were addressed. This was a weakness, and to this it was I alluded in speaking of your august mother. Then you remember the words. Assuredly. Repeat them to me. They were, my dear friend. Marie Antoinette bit her lip and turned pale. Shall I tell your royal highness to whom the letter was addressed? No, but you may write the name. Bolsamo drew out a pocketbook with gold clasps, and having written some words on one of the leaves, he tore it out, and, bowing, presented it to the Dauphiness. Marie Antoinette unfolded the leaf, read it, and looked with astonishment at the man who, though he bowed low before her, seemed to have it in his power to direct her fate. The letter was addressed to the mistress of King Louis XV. To the Marchioness de Pompadour. All this is true, sir, said Marie Antoinette, after a pause. And although I am ignorant by what means you have become acquainted with these circumstances, I cannot speak falsely, and I must declare that what you have said is true. Then, said Bolsamo, will your royal highness permit me to retire, satisfied with this harmless proof of my art? No, sir, replied the Dauphiness, the more I know of your powers, the more desirous I become to have my fate foretold. You have spoken only of the past, let me learn what the future will be. The princess spoke these words with a feverish impatience, which he in vain endeavoured to conceal from her auditors. Lamb ready, if your royal highness commands me, to declare it, yet let me supplicate you not to do so. I have never expressed a command twice, and you will recollect, sir, that I have already commanded once. Let me at least consult the oracle whether it may be revealed to your royal highness or not, he said entreatingly. Good or bad, sir, replied Marie Antoinette, I will know it. If good, I shall take it for flattery. If bad, I shall hold it as a warning, and shall be obliged to you for it. Begin. Bolsamo took the round carafe with the narrow neck and placed it on a golden saucer. The rays of the sun striking on this, shone dimly yellow in the water, and seemed to offer something worthy of deep consideration to the attentive soothsayer. Everyone was silent. At length he placed the carafe again on the table, and shook his head. Well, sir, said the Dauphiness. I cannot speak it, replied Bolsamo. You cannot, because you have nothing to tell me, replied Marie Antoinette, a little contemptuously. There are things which must never be said to princes, madam, replied Bolsamo, in a tone which seemed to express his determination to oppose her wishes. Yes, when those things, I repeat, may be expressed by the word nothing. It is not that which prevents me, madam, on the contrary, it is the very reverse. The Dauphiness smiled disdainfully, Bolsamo appeared embarrassed, the cardinal began to laugh outright, and the baron drew near, grumbling. So. My magician has exhausted himself, his powers have not lasted very long. It only remains for us to see all those fine things turned into vine leaves, as we have read in Eastern tales. I should rather have had the simple vine leaves, said Marie Antoinette, than these fine things displayed by the gentleman for the purpose of getting himself presented to me. Deign to remember, madam, replied Bolsamo, who was deathly pale, that I did not solicit this honor. It was not difficult for you to guess, sir, that I should ask to see you. Pardon him, madam, said André, in a low voice. He thought he was doing right. And I tell you he was doing wrong, replied the princess, so as only to be heard by André and Bolsamo. No one can elevate himself by humiliating an old man, and when we have the pewter goblet of a gentleman to drink in, we need not the golden one of a mountebank. Bolsamo started as if a viper had bitten him. Madam, he said, greatly agitated, I am ready to let you know your destiny, since your blindness impels you to desire such knowledge. He pronounced these words in a tone so firm and so threatening, that all present felt the blood chilled in their veins. Gib him icy and guesser, main techier, too said the old lady to Marie Antoinette. Lass sie hoven, sie hat wis and molten, und so soil sie wis and three replied Bolsamo. These words, spoken in German, a language which was understood by only a few present, seemed to render more mysterious what was going on. 
No, said the Dauphiness, resisting the entreaties of her venerable governess, let him say what he desires to say, were I now to permit him to be silent, he would believe me afraid. Bolsamo heard these words, and a dark, furtive smile played for a second on his lips. It is as I said, he muttered to himself, the courage of bravado merely. Speak, said the Dauphiness, speak, sir. Then your royal highness is decided. I never go back from a decision once made. In that case, madam, I would entreat that we may be alone. She made a sign which those around understood, all retired. This is not a bad plan for obtaining a private audience, said the Dauphiness, turning to Bolsamo, is it not, sir? I would beg your royal highness not to irritate me, replied Bolsamo. I am but an instrument of providence to enlighten you on those sorrows which await you. Intuit fortune, if you will, she can revenge herself, but for me, I am but the gloomy herald of the misfortunes she has in store for you. Then it appears that misfortunes await me, said the Dauphiness, mildly, touched by Balsamo's respectful manner. Yes, terrible misfortunes. First, will my family not be happy? That which you have left, or that to which you are going? Oh, my own family, my mother, my brother Joseph, my sister Caroline. Your misfortunes will not reach them. They are mine alone, then. They are yours, and those of your new family. The royal family of France includes three princes, the Duc de Berry, the Count de Provence, and the Count d'Artois, what will be their fate? They will all reign. Then I shall have no children. You will have children. Not sons. Some of them sons. My sorrows, then, will be caused by their death. You will grieve that one is dead, but most will you grieve that the other lives. Will my husband love me? Yes, too well. Shall I not, then, be able to bear my grief, supported by my husband and my family? Neither will support you. The love of my people will still be mine. The people. The ocean in a calm. Have you seen the ocean in a storm, madam? By doing good I shall prevent the storm, or, if it rise, I shall rise above it. The higher the wave, the deeper the abyss. God will defend me. Alas! There are heads which he himself fordooms. What mean you, sir? Shall I not, then, be queen? Yes, madam, but would to heaven that you were not to be. She smiled disdainfully. Did you remark, he continued, the tapestry of the first room in which you slept after having entered France? Yes, sir. What did it represent? The slaughter of the innocents. Have not the grim faces of the murderers haunted your memory? I confess that they have. Had you not a storm on the way hither? Yes. A thunderbolt fell, and nearly on my carriage. Were not those omens? Fatal omens. It would be difficult to interpret them as happy ones. The Dauphiness let her head fall on her bosom, and raising it after a minute's silence, speak, said she, in what manner shall I die? He shook his head. Speak. I dare not. It is my will that you should, she said, imperiously. Have mercy, have mercy on yourself. Speak, sir, or I shall say that all this is but an absurd fable. Take care. The daughter of Maria Teresa is not to be jested with. The woman who holds in her hand the destiny of thirty millions of men is not to be trifled with. He continued silent. You know no more, she said, contemptuously, your imagination is exhausted. My knowledge of the future is not exhausted, madam, and if you will force me. Yes, I will hear all. He seized the carafe on the golden saucer, placed it in a dark hollow, where some rocks formed a sort of grotto. Then he took the hand of the archduchess, and drew her under the vault. Are you ready? he asked the princess, who was alarmed by his rapid movements. Yes. On your knees, then. On your knees. And pray to God to spare you the dreadful end of all your greatness, which you are now to witness. She obeyed mechanically, and fell on both knees. 
he pointed with a wand to the glass globe, in the center of which must have appeared some dark and terrible form, for the dauphiness, in trying to rise, trembled and sunk again to the ground with a shriek of horror, she had fainted. The baron hastened to her assistance, and in a few minutes she came to herself. She put her hand to her forehead, as if to recall her thoughts, then suddenly exclaimed, The carafe! The carafe! The baron presented it to her. The water was perfectly limpid, not a stain mingled with it. Bosamo was gone. 16. The Baron de Taverny thinks he sees at last a small opening into the future. The Baron was the first to perceive that the Dauphiness had fainted. He had kept on the watch, more uneasy than any one else at what might take place between her and the sorcerer. Hearing her cry of terror, and seeing Bosamo spring out of the grotto, he ran to the spot. The Dauphiness's first request was to see the carafe, her second, that no injury should be done the magician, and it was well she made this request, for no sooner had Philip heard her cry than he bounded after him like an angry lion. When her lady of honor came near, and ventured to question her in German. She only drew from her that Bolsamo had in no way been wanting in respect to her, that she thought the storm of the preceding night and her long journey had fatigued her and brought on a nervous attack. Her replies were translated to the Cardinal de Rohan, who stood by, but dared not himself ask for information. In courts, people are obliged to be satisfied with half answers, so what the Dauphiness said satisfied nobody, but every one appeared perfectly satisfied. Philip then drew near and said, I am obliged to obey your Royal Highness's orders, yet it is with regret that I do so, the half hour during which you intended to stay is past, and the horses are ready. Thanks, sir, said she, with a smile full of fascinating languor, but I must alter my determination. I do not feel able to set out just now. If I could sleep for a few hours, I should be quite restored. Your Royal Highness knows what a poor abode ours is, the Baron stammered out. Oh, sir, any place will do, a little rest is all I want. She said this as if again fainting, and her head sunk again on her bosom. Andre disappeared to prepare her room for her, and having in a few minutes returned, she stood beside the Dauphiness, not daring to speak until some indication was given that she might do so. At length Marie Antoinette raised her head, smiled to André, and, with her hand, made a sign to her to draw nearer. The room is ready for your royal highness. We entreat only. But she was not permitted to finish her apology, the Dauphiness interrupted her. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask you to summon the Countess of Langershausen? and to lead us to the apartment. André obeyed. The old lady of honor advanced. Give me your arm, my dear friend, said the Dauphiness to her, in German, for indeed I have scarcely strength enough to walk without support. The Baroness obeyed, André approached to assist her. Turning soon after to André, the Dauphiness asked. Do you understand German, then, mademoiselle? Yes, madam. I even speak it a little, replied André, in German. That is delightful, exclaimed the Dauphiness. That makes my plan still more agreeable. André dared not ask her august guest what her plan was, although she longed to know it. The Dauphiness leaned on the arm of the Countess de Langershausen, and advanced slowly, her limbs trembling under her. As she issued from the trees in front of the grotto, she heard the Cardinal's voice. What? said he, Count de Stainville, do you mean to insist on speaking to Her Royal Highness notwithstanding her orders to the contrary? I must insist on doing so, replied the Governor of Strasbourg, in a firm voice. Her Royal Highness will pardon me, I am certain. And I, sir, on the contrary, insist. Let the Governor come forward, said the Dauphiness, appearing at the opening of the trees, which formed a verdant arch above her head. Come forward, Count de Stainville. Every one bowed at her command, and drew back to allow free passage to the brother-in-law of the then all-powerful minister who governed France. The Count looked around, as if to request a private audience. Marie Antoinette understood that he had something important to say to her, but before she could express a wish to be left alone, all had withdrawn. A dispatch from Versailles, Madame, 
said the Count, in a low voice, and presenting a letter which he had kept concealed under his plumed hat. The Dauphiness took it, and read the address. It is for you, sir, not for me, she said. Open it and read it, if it contains anything that concerns me. The letter is addressed to me, he replied, but in the corner is a mark agreed on between my brother, Madame Choiseul, and myself, indicating that the letter is for your royal highness. True, I did not observe it. She opened the letter, and read the following lines. The presentation of Madame Dubarry is decided on, if she can only procure some noble lady to present her. We still hope she may not find one. But the only sure means to prevent the presentation will be for Her Royal Highness the Dauphiness to make all speed. Her Royal Highness once at Versailles, no one will dare to offer such an insult to the court. Very well, said the Dauphiness, folding up the letter, without the slightest symptom of emotion, or even of interest. Will Your Royal Highness now retire to repose a little, asked André, timidly. No, I thank you, mademoiselle. The air has revived me, I have quite recovered, and abandoning the arm of her lady of honor, she walked forward firmly and rapidly. My horses immediately, said she. The cardinal looked with inquisitive surprise at the count. The dauphin is becoming impatient, whispered the latter, and this falsehood appearing a secret confided to him alone, his eminence was satisfied. As to André, her father had taught her to respect the whims of crowned heads, and she was not at all surprised at the change in Marie Antoinette's intentions. The latter, therefore, turning, and seeing no alteration in the sweet expression of her countenance, said. Thanks, mademoiselle, your hospitable reception has made a deep impression on me. Then, turning to the baron, she continued. Sir, you must know that, on leaving Vienna, I made a vow to advance the fortune of the first Frenchman whom I should meet on the frontiers of France. That Frenchman was your son. But I do not intend to stop there, your daughter shall not be forgotten either. Oh, your highness, murmured André. Yes, I mean to make you one of my maids of honor. You are noble, are you not? she added again, addressing the baron. Oh, your highness, cried the baron, with delight, for all his dreams seemed realized by what he heard, although poor, our descent is unblemished, yet so high in honor. It is only due to you. Your son will defend the king as you have done. Your daughter will serve the Dauphiness, the one you will inspire with every loyal sentiment, the other with every virtuous one. Shall I not be faithfully served, sir? She said, now turning to Philip, who knelt in gratitude at her feet, without words to express his emotion. But, murmured the baron, for his feelings did not prevent him from reflecting. Yes, I understand said the Dauphiness, you have preparations to make, yet they cannot take long. A sad smile passed over the lips of André and Philip, a bitter one over those of the Baron, and Marie Antoinette stopped, for she felt that she might unintentionally have wounded their pride. At least, she resumed, if I may judge by your daughter's desire to please me. Besides I shall leave you one of my carriages, it will bring you after us. I must call the Count de Stainville to my aid. The Count approached. I shall leave one of my carriages for the Baron de Taverny, whom I wish to accompany me to Paris with his daughter. Appoint someone to accompany their carriage, and to cause it to be recognized as belonging to my suite. Come forward, Monsieur de Beausire. This very moment, madam, answered the Count. A young man of about five and twenty years of age, with an easy and graceful carriage, and a lively and intelligent eye, advanced, hat in hand, from the ranks of the escort of the Dauphiness. Let one of the carriages remain behind, said the Count, for the Baron de Taverny, you will accompany the carriage yourself. And, sir, said the Dauphiness, join us again as soon as possible. I authorize you to have double relays of horses, if necessary. The Baron and his children were profuse in their acknowledgments. This sudden departure will not put you to much inconvenience, I hope, sir, said the Dauphiness. We are too happy to obey your royal highness's orders, replied the baron. Adieu. Adieu, said she, with a smile. Gentlemen, conduct me to my carriage. Chevalier de Taverny, to horse. 
Philip kissed his father's hand, embraced his sister, and leaped lightly into his saddle. The glittering train swept on, and in a quarter of an hour had disappeared like an evening vapor. There remained no human being in the avenue of Taverny but a young man, who, sitting on one of the lower pillars of the gate, pale and sorrowful, followed with a longing eye the last cloud of dust which was raised by the horse's feet, and which served to show the road they had taken. This young man was Gilbert. Meanwhile, the saloon of Taverny presented a singular scene. André, with clasped hands, reflected on the unexpected and extraordinary event which had so suddenly interrupted the course of her calm life, and she believed herself in a dream. The baron was pulling some hairs, which were rather too long, out of his grey eyebrows, and settling the bosom of his shirt. Nicole, leaning against the door, looked at her master and mistress, and Labrie with his arms hanging down and his mouth open, looked at Nicole. The baron was the first to rouse himself from his reverie. Scoundrel! cried he to La Brie, are you standing there like a statue, and that gentleman, one of the king's bodyguard, waiting without? La Brie made a bound toward the door, got one leg hooked in the other, staggered to his feet and disappeared. In a short time he returned. What is the gentleman doing? asked the baron. Making his horses eat the pimpernels. Leave him alone, then. And the carriage? It is in the avenue. The horses harnessed? Yes, sir, four horses. Such beautiful animals. They are eating the pomegranates. The king's horses have a right to eat whatever they like. By the by, the sorcerer. He is gone, sir. And has left all the plate on the table. It is not possible. He will return, or will send someone for it. I don't think he will, sir. Gilbert saw him set out with his wagon. Gilbert saw him set out with his wagon, the baron repeated, in a thoughtful tone. Yes, sir. That wretch Gilbert sees everything. Go and pack my trunk. It is packed, sir. What, it is packed? Yes. As soon as I heard what Her Royal Highness the Dauphiness said, I went into your room and packed your clothes and linen. Who told you to do so, you officious rascal? Dame. Sir, I thought I was only anticipating your orders. Fool. Go, then, and help my daughter. Thank you, father, but I have Nicole. The Baron began to reflect again. But, zounds. Scoundrel. It is impossible. What is impossible, sir? What you have not thought of, for you think of nothing. But what is it, sir? That Her Royal Highness would go without leaving something with Monsieur de Beausire, or the sorcerer without leaving a message with Gilbert. At this moment a low whistle was heard from the courtyard. What is that? It is a call for me, sir, replied La Brie. And who calls, pray? The gentleman, sir. The gentleman left by the Dauphiness? Yes, sir. And here is Gilbert coming as if he had got something to say to you. Go, then, stupid animal. Labrie obeyed, with his usual alacrity. Father, said André approaching him, I know what troubles you. Recollect, I have thirty Louis Dior's, and that beautiful watch set with diamonds, which Queen Marie Lazinska gave my mother. Yes, my dear, yes, replied the baron, but keep them, keep them. You must have a handsome dress for your presentation. I may discover some means, hush. Here is La Brie. Sir, cried La Brie, as he came in, holding in one hand a letter, and in the other some money, see what the Dauphiness left for me, ten Louis Dior's, sir, ten Louis Dior's. And that letter, rascal. Oh, the letter is for you, sir, from the sorcerer. From the sorcerer? Who gave it you? Gilbert, sir. I told you so, stupid animal. Give it me, give it me. He snatched the letter, tore it open, and read these words. Sir, since a hand so august has touched the plate I left with you, it belongs to you, keep it as a relic, and remember sometimes your grateful guest. Joseph Balsamo. La Brie. 
cried the baron, after a moment's reflection, is there not a good goldsmith at Barleduc? Oh, yes, sir, the one who soldered Mademoiselle André's silver brooch. Very well. André, lay aside the goblet out of which Her Royal Highness drank, and let the rest of the service be put up in the carriage with us. And you, beast that you are, help the gentleman outside to a glass of what remains of our good wine. One bottle, sir, said La Brie, with deep melancholy. That's enough. Now, André, said the baron, taking both his daughter's hands, courage, my child. We are going to court. There are plenty of titles to be given away there, rich abbeys, regiments without colonels, pensions going to waste. It is a fine country, the court. The sun shines brightly there. Put yourself always in its rays, my child, for you are worthy to be seen. Go, my love, go. André went out, followed by Nicole. Hello. La Brie, you monster, cried the baron, attend to the gentleman, I tell you. Yes, sir, answered La Brie, from a distant part of the cellar. I, continued the baron, going toward his room, must go and arrange my papers. We must be out of this hole in an hour. Do you hear, André? And we are leaving it in good style, too. What a capital fellow that sorcerer is. I am becoming as superstitious as the devil. But make haste, La Brie, you wretch. I was obliged to go feeling about, sir, in the cellar. There is not a candle in the house. It was time to leave it, it appears, said the baron. 17. Nicole's 25 Louis Doors In the meantime, André made active preparations for her departure, and Nicole assisted her with an ardor which quickly dissipated the little cloud that had arisen between them in the morning. She is a good girl, said André to herself, devoted and grateful, she has faults, but what human creature has not? Let me forget them. Nicole was not a girl who was slow to observe the expression of her mistress's face. Fool that I was! Said she to herself, I was nearly quarreling with my young lady, and all about that young good-for-nothing Gilbert and she going to Paris, and will take me with her. One is sure of making one's fortune in Paris. André was the first to speak. H. put my lace in a band box, said she. What band box, mademoiselle? Really, I don't know. Have we one at all? Oh, yes, the one you gave me, it is in my room. And Nicole ran to bring it with an obliging air which disposed André still more in her favor. But this band box is your own, said André, when she reappeared with the article in her hand, and you may want it yourself, my poor Nicole. Oh, you have more need of it, mademoiselle, and, besides, it ought to be yours, you lent it me. When people get married and set up housekeeping, they require many little things, so just now you have most need of the box. Keep it to put your bridal finery in. Oh, mademoiselle, said Nicole, gaily, shaking her head, my finery will not take up much room. But if you marry, Nicole, I should wish you to be happy, and rich. Rich? Yes, rich, according to your rank. Then you have found some fermier general for me, mademoiselle. No, but I have found a dowry. Indeed, mademoiselle. You know what is in my purse. Yes, madam, twenty-five shining Louis Diors. They are yours, Nicole. Twenty-five Louis Diors, cried Nicole, with rapture, it is indeed a fortune. My poor girl, I am glad you think so. And you really give them to me, madam? I wish I could give you more. Nicole felt surprised, moved, the tears came to her eyes, she seized her young lady's hand and kissed it. Do you think your husband will be satisfied? Oh, quite satisfied, said Nicole. At least, I hope so. She reflected that Gilbert had doubtless refused her hand through fear of poverty, and that now, when she was rich, matters would turn out differently. Then she determined immediately to offer him a share of her young lady's generous gift, and to attach him to her by gratitude. Such was Nicole's generous plan. André looked at her as she reflected. Poor girl! 
sighed she, may she be happy in her simple life. Nicole heard the words, and started from her reverie. They opened to her fancy a whole Eldorado of silks, diamonds, lace, and love, things of which André had not thought. But Nicole turned away her eyes from the gold and purple cloud brightening her horizon, and resisted the temptation. After all, madam, said she, I shall be happy here, in an humble way. Reflect seriously on what you are going to do. Yes, mademoiselle, I shall reflect on it. That is right. Make yourself happy in the way you propose, if you can, but do not be foolish. You are very kind, mademoiselle. And let me say now that I was very foolish this morning. But I hope mademoiselle will forgive me. When one is in love. Then you are really in love with Gilbert. Yes, mademoiselle, I, I love him, said Nicole. Is it possible, said André, smiling. What can you see to admire in the young man? The first time I meet him I must take a look at this Monsieur Gilbert, who steals young girls' hearts. Is he not going with us to Paris, mademoiselle? Inquired Nicole, who wished to be fully informed on every point before taking the step she meditated. Of what use would he be there? He is not a domestic, and could not take charge of a horse in Paris. Idle people at Taverny live like the birds. However poor the soil, it feeds them. But in Paris an idle person would cost too much, we could not support him. But if I marry him, stammered Nicole. Well, if you marry him, you shall live here with him at Taverny. You shall take care of this house which my mother was so fond of. André pronounced these words in so firm a voice, that Nicole could no longer doubt. Yet she hesitated before speaking again. André, seeing her hesitation, thought that her mind was wandering from the pleasures of a Parisian life to those of the quiet country, and that she knew not how to decide. So she went on, gently, Nicole, the decision which you are now to make will affect all your future life. Be not hasty, I shall give you one hour. It is little, but you are prompt, and I think it will be sufficient to enable you to choose between continuing to serve me or having a husband, between me and Gilbert. An hour. Oh, yes, mademoiselle, I can decide in an hour. Collect all my clothes, and my mother's, I would not leave behind these relics so dear to me. Then go, and return in an hour fully decided, but whatever your determination be, here are your twenty-five Louis Diors. If you marry, they shall be your dowry, if you continue in my service, your wages for two years. Nicole took the purse from André's hands and kissed it. Then she completed her task, not a great one, certainly, hurried downstairs, and André saw her cross the courtyard and enter the avenue. Not finding Gilbert there, she flew to a window on the ground floor, which was that of his room, and tapped at it. He was bustling about with his back to the window. But hearing her drumming, he turned, and, like a thief caught in the act, he quickly abandoned his occupation. Oh, is it you, Nicole? said he. Yes, it is, she replied, smiling, but with something very decided in her tone. You are welcome. Said he, coming forward and opening the window. Nicole felt that there was kindness in his reception of her, and held out her hand, he took it, pressed it. This is a good beginning, thought she. Farewell, my journey to Paris. And to Nicole's praise it must be said, she did not sigh at this thought. You know, said the young girl, leaning her elbows on the window, you know, Gilbert, that the family are leaving Taverny and going to Paris. Yes, I know. Well, I am to go to Paris, too. I did not know that, but I congratulate you if you are pleased at going. How you say that? I say it plainly, I think, if you are pleased at going. My being pleased depends. Why do you stop? Depends. My being pleased or not depends on you. I don't understand you, said Gilbert, seating himself on the window so that his knees touched Nicole's arm, and they could thus converse unseen and unheard. Nicole looked at him tenderly, he shook his head, insinuating that he understood her look no more than her words. 
Well, said she, since all must be told, listen to what I am going to say. I hear you, replied Gilbert, coldly. In plain words, my young lady offers to take me to Paris with her. Very well, goon. Unless. Unless what? Unless I get married here. Then you still think of getting married, he answered, quite unmoved. Yes. More particularly since I have become rich. Oh, you have become rich? he asked, so phlegmatically that Nicole knew not what to think. Very rich, Gilbert. Indeed? Yes, indeed. And how did that miracle come about? My young lady has given me a marriage portion. You are very fortunate. I congratulate you, Nicole. Look! said she, pouring out of the purse into her hand the twenty-five Louis Diors, and watching Gilbert's eyes to discover some rarity of pleasure or covetousness in them. Gilbert moved not a muscle. On my word, it is a nice little sum, said he. And that is not all, continued Nicole, the baron will be rich once more. The old castle will be rebuilt, and the care of it given. To the fortunate husband of Nicole, said Gilbert, with an irony not so well concealed but that it grated on Nicole's fine ear, yet she restrained her anger. And Nicole's husband, do you not know him? I. No. Have you, then, grown stupid, or do I no longer speak French, cried the young girl, who began to show symptoms of impatience. I understand you perfectly, replied Gilbert. You offer to make me your husband, do you not, Mademoiselle Legay? Yes, Monsieur Gilbert. And it is since you have become rich that you have thought of this, returned Gilbert, hastily. I am truly grateful to you, indeed, I am, indeed. Well, said Nicole, frankly, and holding out her hand, take it. You accept it, do you not? No, I refuse it. Nicole sprung up from her leaning position. Gilbert, said she, you have a bad heart. And, trust me, what you now do will not bring you happiness. If I felt any warmer sentiment in making the offer I have just done, than a sense of duty and honor, trust me, I would now be miserable indeed. But, having become rich, I did not wish it to be said that Nicole would look down on her old friend Gilbert. However, all is now over between us. Gilbert made a gesture of indifference. What I think of your conduct in the matter, you must be well aware. I, whose character you know to be as free and independent as your own, had decided to bury myself here, from an old prepossession for you, when I had it in my power to go to Paris, which may be for me a scene of triumph. I would have borne to see before me, every day of the year, for a whole lifetime, that cold and impenetrable face, the mask of so many wicked thoughts. You have not felt that there was any sacrifice in this. So much the worse for you, Gilbert. I do not say that you will regret me, but remember, you may yet feel remorse for the contempt and scorn you have shown me. Guided by you, I should have been a virtuous, happy, and contented woman. Now, I am abandoned on the ocean of life, without a keeping or protecting hand. Gilbert, if I fall, God will not hold you as the cause of my fall. Farewell. And the proud young girl turned away without anger or impatience, but having shown, as all impassioned natures do in the time of trial, true generosity of soul. Gilbert shut his window quietly and returned to the mysterious occupation in which she had interrupted him. 18. Farewell to Taverny. Nicole, before entering her mistress's apartment, stopped on the staircase to subdue some gathering emotions of resentment rising in her bosom. The baron encountered her as she stood motionless, thoughtful, her brows contracted and leaning on her hand, and, seeing her so pretty, he kissed her, as the Duc de Richelieu would have done at thirty years of age. Roused from her reverie by this piece of gallantry, Nicole hurried up to André's room, and found her just closing her trunk. Well, said Mlee, the taverny, have your reflections ended? Yes, madam, replied Nicole, very decidedly. You will marry? No, madam. What? After all your first love? My love will never do for me what the kindness of Mademoiselle has done for me. 
I belong to you, mademoiselle, and wish always to belong to you. I know the mistress I have. I do not know the master I might have. André was touched with this unlooked-for exhibition of affectionate feeling in the giddy Nicole, and was far from suspecting that this choice had been a forced one. She smiled, pleased to find one human being better than she had expected. You do well, Nicole, she replied, to attach yourself to me. I shall not forget this trust to me, and if any good fortune befall me, you shall share it. Oh, mademoiselle, I have quite decided I will go with you. Without regret? Blindly. I do not like that answer, Nicole. I should not wish you, at some future day, to reproach yourself with having blindly trusted me and followed me. I shall never have to reproach any one but myself, mademoiselle. Then you have had an explanation with your lover. I saw you talking with him. Nicolo blushed, then bit her lip. She forgot that André's window was opposite that at which she had spoken to Gilbert. It is true, mademoiselle, replied Nicole. And you told him all. Nicole thought André had some particular reason for this question, and, all her former suspicions returning, she answered, I told him I would have nothing more to do with him. It was plain that the two women would never understand each other, the one pure as a diamond, the other without any fixed principle of conduct, though having occasional impulses of goodness. In the meantime, the baron had completed all his arrangements. An old sword, which he had won at Fontenoy, some parchments establishing his right to travel in His Majesty's carriages, and a litter of old papers, formed the most bulky part of his baggage. La Brie followed, tottering under the weight of an almost empty trunk. In the avenue they found the gentleman of the king's bodyguard, who, while waiting, had drained to the last drop his bottle of wine. The gallant had remarked the fine waist and pretty ankle of Nicole, who was going back and forward with messages, and he had kept peeping about in the hope of exchanging a word with her. He was roused, however, to more active occupation by the baron's request that he would order the carriage to the door. He started, bowed, and in a sonorous voice summoned the coachman. The carriage drew up. La Brie put the trunk on behind with an indescribable mixture of joy and pride in his looks. I am, really, murmured he, carried away by his enthusiasm, and thinking he was alone, going to get into the king's carriage. Behind it, behind it, my worthy friend, replied Beau Sire, with a patronizing smile. What, sir, are you going to take La Brie with you, said André. Who will take care of Taverny? Why, pardieu. The good-for-nothing philosopher. Gilbert? Yes, has he not a gun? But how will he live? By his gun, to be sure. Don't be uneasy, he will have excellent fare, blackbirds and thrushes are not scarce at Taverny. André looked at Nicole, the latter began to laugh. And is that all the compassion you show for him, ungrateful girl? Oh, mademoiselle, replied Nicole, he is very clever with his gun, he will not die of hunger. But, sir, continued André, we must leave him two or three Louis Diors. To spoil him? Very fine, indeed. He is vicious enough as he is. He must have something to live on, persisted André. The neighbors will help him, if he is in want. Don't be uneasy, madam, said Nicole. He will have no cause to ask their assistance. At all events, replied André, leave him two or three crowns. He would not accept them. He would not accept them. Then he is proud, this Mr. Gilbert of yours. Oh, mademoiselle, he is not mine, heaven be praised. Come, come, said the baron, let Gilbert go to the devil, the carriage is waiting, get in, my love. André did not reply. She cast a farewell look on the old chateau, and then got into the heavy and ponderous carriage. The baron seated himself beside her. La Brie, still wearing his splendid livery, and Nicole, who seemed never to have known such a person as Gilbert, mounted on the box, the coachman rode one of the horses, as postillion. But monsieur! Exempt, where shall he sit? exclaimed the baron. On my horse, sir, on my horse, replied Beau Sire, still eyeing Nicole, 
who colored with delight at having so soon replaced a rude peasant admirer by an elegant gentleman. The carriage, drawn by four strong horses, started into rapid motion. The trees of the avenue glided away on each side, and disappeared one by one, sadly bending before the east wind, as if to bid farewell to their owners who abandoned them. The carriage reached the gate. Gilbert stood there, upright, immovable, his hat in his hand, he did not seem to see André, and yet he watched her least movement. Her eyes were fixed on the dear home she was leaving, so as to keep it in view as long as possible. Stop an instant, cried the baron to the postillion. The carriage stopped. So, Monsieur Good-for-Nothing, you are going to be happy, quite alone, like a real philosopher. Nothing to do, nobody to scold you. Don't let the house take fire, and, hark ye, take care of Mahone. Gilbert bowed, but did not reply. He felt as if Nicole's looks were a weight too great to be borne, he feared to meet her triumphant ironical smile, as he would the touch of red-hot iron. Go on, postillion, cried the baron. Nicole did not smile. It even required more than her habitual power over herself to prevent her expressing aloud her pity for the poor young man thus heartlessly abandoned. She was obliged to keep her eye on him, the beau sire, who looked so well on his prancing horse. Now, as Nicole kept her eyes fixed on him, the beau sire, she did not see that Gilbert was gazing, his soul in his eyes, on André. André saw nothing but the house in which she was born, in which her mother died. The carriage disappeared. Gilbert, a moment before of so little importance in the eyes of the travellers, was now nothing to them. The Baron, André, Nicole, and La Brie having passed through the gates of the avenue, entered a new world. Each had a peculiar subject for reflection. The Baron thought that at Barleduc he could easily raise five or six thousand crowns on Balsamo's plate. André repeated a prayer her mother had taught her, to keep away the demon of pride and ambition. Nicole covered her neck more closely with her handkerchief, to the great chagrin of M. de Beausire. La Brie, with his hand in his pocket, counted over the ten Louis Diors of the Dauphinus and the two of Balsamo. M. de Beausire galloped at the side of the carriage. Gilbert closed the gates of Taverny, whose hinges, as usual, creaked with a melancholy sound. Then he ran to his little room, pulled out his oaken chest of drawers, behind which he found a bundle ready tied up in a napkin, and slung it on his stick. After this, pushing his hands into high hay-stuffed mattress, he drew out something wrapped in a piece of paper, it was a shining crown piece, his savings for three or four years. He opened the paper, looked at his crown to assure himself that it had not been changed, and then put it in his pocket, still wrapped in its paper. Mahone, on seeing Gilbert, began to howl loudly, making furious leaps the whole length of his chain. Seeing one by one his friends leave him, his fine intellect told him that Gilbert was also about to abandon him, and he howled louder and louder. Hush, cried Gilbert, hush, Mahone. Then smiling bitterly at the parallel which occurred to his mind, he muttered, Have they not abandoned me like a dog? Why should not I abandon thee like a man? But after a minute's reflection, he added, they abandoned me free, at least, free to seek for food. Well, then, Mahone, I will do for thee what they did for me, neither more nor less I, and going to the hook to which the dog's chain was fastened, he slipped it off. You are free, said he, provide for yourself as you like. The dog bounded toward the house, but, finding the doors all closed, he sprung toward the ruins and disappeared. And now, said Gilbert, we shall see which has most instinct, the dog or the man. So saying, he went out by the small gate, closed it, double-locked it, and threw the key over the wall. But nature speaks with the same voice in almost all hearts. Gilbert felt something like what André experienced in leaving Taverny, only with her sentiments mingled regret for the quiet past, with his hopes for a more stirring future. Farewell. Said he, turning to look for the last time at the chateau, whose pointed roof appeared peeping over the sycamores and laburnums, farewell. Abode in which I have suffered so much, where every one hated me and threw me food grudgingly, as if I had been a hungry hound. Be cursed. 
My heart bounds with joy at my freedom, for thy walls enclose me no more. Farewell, prison. Hell, den of tyrants. Farewell forever. And after this imprecation, Gilbert sprung forward on the road which the carriage had taken, fancying that he yet heard the roll of its distant wheels. 19. Gilbert's Crown Piece After half an hour's headlong race, Gilbert uttered a wild shriek of joy, he saw the carriage about a quarter of a league before him, slowly ascending a hill. He felt his heart dilate with pride, as he thought that he, with only youth, strength, spirit, was about to do all that wealth, power, and rank could accomplish. Then, indeed, might the baron have called Gilbert a philosopher, had he seen him, his stick on his shoulder, his small bundle slung on it, walking on with rapid strides, leaping down every slope which could shorten his path. And stopping at every ascent, chafing with impatience, as if saying to the horses, you do not go fast enough for me. See, I am obliged to wait for you. Philosopher. Yes, and he deserved the name, if it be philosophy to despise all that contributes to ease and to enjoyment. It was an interesting spectacle, one worthy of the creator of energetic and intelligent creatures, to see the young man bounding forward on his way, all dusty and panting, for an hour or more, until he had overtaken the carriage. And then resting with delight when the horses were compelled to pause for breath. Gilbert that day must have inspired every one with admiration who could have followed him in spirit as we do. And who knows but that even the proud André might have been moved, could she have seen him, and that her contempt for his indolence would have changed to admiration of his energy. The day passed on in this manner. The baron stopped an hour at Barleduc, which gave Gilbert time to get in advance of him. He had heard the order to stop at the goldsmiths. So, having passed the town, by a detour, without entering it, he hid in a thicket until he saw the carriage coming, and when it had passed, followed it as before. Toward evening it came up with the train of the Dauphinus, at the little village of Brillu, the inhabitants of which were crowded on a neighboring hill, and made the air resound with their shouts of welcome. Gilbert had not eaten a morsel during the entire day, except a morsel of bread which he had brought with him from Taverny. But, in return, he had drunk plentifully from a rivulet which crossed the road, and the water of which was so fresh and limpid, that André had requested that the carriage might stop, and alighted herself to fill the chaste cup. The only article of Balsamo's service which the baron could be persuaded to retain. Gilbert saw all this, hidden by some trees on the roadside. Then, when the carriage had passed on, he emerged from his hiding place, and advancing to the stream, at the same spot where Mli, the taverny had stood, he lifted the water in his hand, and drank from the same source. Evening came on, shrouding the landscape in her dusky mantle, until at last he saw nothing but the light from the large lanterns which were fastened on each side of the carriage. This pale gleam, ever hurrying onward in the distance, looked like a phantom impelled forward by some strange destiny. Then night came on. They had traveled twelve leagues, they were at Comless. The equipages stopped, Gilbert was sure that it was for the night, that he should have time to stop for a couple of hours in a barn, and how vigorously should he afterward pursue his way. He approached to listen for André's voice, the carriage still continued stationary. He glided into a deep doorway, he saw André by the glare of the torchlight, and heard her asking what hour it was. A voice replied, Eleven o'clock. At that moment Gilbert no longer felt fatigue and would have rejected with scorn an offer of a seat in a vehicle. Versailles already appeared in view, Versailles, all gilded. Shining, the city of nobles and kings. And beyond appeared Paris, grim, immense, the city of the people. Two things roused him from his ecstasy, the noise of the carriages setting out again, and the complaints of his stomach, which cried, hunger, very distinctly. On went the carriages, Gilbert following, his hunger unappeased. At midnight they stopped at St. Dizier. Pour the night. No, only to change horses, while, in the meantime, the illustrious travellers took a little refreshment by torchlight. Gilbert had need of all his courage, and he sprung to his feet from the bank where he had seated himself, as he heard them depart, with an energy of determination which made him forget that, ten minutes before. 
His wearied legs had bent under him in spite of all his efforts. Well, cried he, go, go. I shall stop also for refreshments at St. Dizier, I shall buy some bread and a slice of bacon, I shall drink a glass of wine, and for five sous I shall be refreshed as well as the masters. Gilbert entered the town. The train having passed, the good folks were closing their doors and shutters. But our philosopher saw a good-looking and not yet shut up, where the large dishes of fowls and other things showed that the attendance of the Dauphiness had only had time to levy a very slight contribution. He entered the kitchen resolutely. The hostess was there, counting what her gains had been. Excuse me, madam, but can I have some bread and ham, said Gilbert. We have no ham, but you can have fowl. No, thank you, I ask for ham, because I wish for ham, I don't like fowl. That is a pity, my little fellow, for we have only fowl, but it shall not be dearer, she added, smiling, than ham. Take half a one, or, indeed, take a whole one for ten pence, and that will be provision for you for tomorrow. We thought Her Royal Highness would have stayed all night, and that we should have sold all these things to the attendants, but as she only just passed through, they will be wasted. One would have thought that the offer being so good, and the hostess so kind, Gilbert would have gladly embraced it, but that would be to have misunderstood his character entirely. No, thank you, replied he. I shall satisfy myself in a more humble manner, I am neither a prince nor a footman. Well, then, said the good woman, I will give you the fowl, my little Artaban. I am not a beggar either, replied he, in a mortified tone. I buy what I wish, and pay for it. And he majestically plunged his hand into his breeches pocket, it went down to the elbow, in vain he fumbled in his vest pocket, turning paler and paler. That paper in which the crown had been he found, but the crown was gone. Tossed about by his rapid movements, it had worn the paper, then the thin lining of his pocket, and had slipped out at his knee. For he had unfastened his garters, to give freer play to his limbs. His paleness and trembling touched the good woman. Many in her place would have rejoiced at his pride being brought down. But she felt for him, seeing suffering so powerfully expressed in the changes of his countenance. Come, my poor boy, said she, you shall sup and sleep here, then, tomorrow, if you must go on, you shall do so. Oh, yes, yes! exclaimed Gilbert, I must go on, not tomorrow, but now, now. And snatching up his bundle, without waiting to hear more, he darted out of the house, to hide his shame and grief in the darkness. He rushed on, alone, truly alone in the world. For no man is more alone than he who has just parted with his last crown, more particularly if it be the only one he ever possessed. To turn back to look for his crown would have been to begin a hopeless task. Besides, it would make it impossible for him ever to come up with the carriages. He resolved to continue his way. After he had gone about a league, hunger, which his mental suffering had made him forget for a time, awoke more keen than ever. Weariness also seized on every limb, on every sinew, yet, by incredible efforts, he had once more come in sight of the carriages. But fate, it would seem, had decided against him. They stopped only to change horses, and so quickly that he had not five minutes to rest himself. Again he set out. The day began to dawn, the sun appeared above a broad circle of dark clouds, foretelling one of those burning days of May which sometimes precedes the heats of summer. How could Gilbert bear the noon of that day? In his pride he thought that horses, men, destinies had united against him, him alone. Like Ajax, he shook his clenched fist at the heavens. And if he did not say, like him, I shall escape in spite of the gods, it was because he knew by heart the social contract better than the Odyssey. At last, however, as Gilbert had dreaded, the moment arrived when he found the utter impossibility of proceeding much further. By a last and almost despairing effort, he summoned up all his remaining force, and once more overtook the carriages, of which he had previously lost sight, and which, under the influence of his heated and feverish imagination, he fancied were surrounded with a strange, fantastic halo. The noise of the wheels sounded like thunder in his ears, and almost maddened his brain. 
He staggered on, his blackened lips wide apart, his eyes fixed and staring, his long hair clinging to his forehead bathed in perspiration, and his movements seeming rather the effect of some clever piece of mechanism than those of a thinking being. Since the evening before he had traveled upward of twenty leagues, and his weary and fainting limbs now refused to carry him further a mist overspread his eyes, strange noises sounded in his ears, the earth seemed to reel under him. He endeavored to utter a cry, and staggered forward, beating the air wildly with his arms. At last his voice returned to utter hoarse cries of rage against his conquerors. Then, tearing his hair with both hands, he reeled forward, and fell heavily to the ground, with the consolation of having, like T, hero of antiquity, fought the battle to the last. Halloo, there! Halloo, madman! cried a hoarse voice, just as he fell, accompanying his shouts with the loud cracking of a whip. Gilbert heard him not, he had fainted. Halloo, I say, halloo! More blue! The fellow will be smashed! And this time his words were accompanied by a vigorous lash, which reached Gilbert's waist, and cut into the flesh. But Gilbert felt nothing. He remained immovable under the feet of the horses of a carriage which was issuing into the high road from a byway between Thebelment and Vauclera. A shrill cry was heard from the carriage, which the horses carried along like a whirlwind. The postillion made an almost superhuman effort, but could not prevent one of the horses, which was placed as a leader, from leaping over Gilbert. The other two, however, he succeeded in pulling up. A lady stretched her body half out of the carriage. Heavens, cried she, you have killed the poor boy. Why, faith, madam, replied the postillion, endeavouring to discover the body amid the cloud of dust which the horse's feet had raised, I am almost afraid we have. Poor creature, poor boy. Bo not move a step further and opening the door of the carriage herself, she sprung out. The postillion had already alighted, and dragging Gilbert's body from between the wheels, he expected to find it bruised and bloody. The lady assisted him with all her force. What an escape, he cried, not a scratch, not a kick. But he has fainted, said the lady. Only from fear. Let us place him against the bank, and since madam is in haste, let us go on. Impossible. I would not leave any creature in such a state. Pooh! It is nothing, madam, he will soon recover. No, no, poor fellow. He is some runaway lad from college, and has undertaken a journey beyond his strength. See how pale he is. He might die. No, I will not leave him. Lift him into the carriage, on the front seat. The postillion obeyed, the lady got in. Gilbert was laid lengthwise on a good cushion, his head supported by the well-stuffed side of the carriage. And now, cried the lady, we have lost ten minutes, a crown if you make up for them. The postillion cracked his whip above his head, the horses knew what this threatened, and set off at a gallop. XX Gilbert recovers the loss of his crown. When Gilbert returned to consciousness, he was in no small degree surprised to find himself placed as he was, with a young lady watching him anxiously. This young lady was about five and twenty, with large grey eyes, a nose slightly retroussé, cheeks embrowned by a southern sun, and a delicately formed, little mouth. Which added to the naturally cheerful and laughing expression of her face something of circumspection and finesse. Her neck and arms, which were beautifully formed, were displayed to advantage by a closely fitting bodice of violet-colored velvet with golden buttons. While the skirt of her dress of grey silk was so enormously wide as to fill almost the entire carriage. Gilbert continued for some time to gaze on this face, which looked on his smilingly and with much interest, and he could scarcely persuade himself that he was not in a dream. Well, my poor fellow, said the lady, are you not better now? Where am I? asked he, languidly. You are in safety now, my little fellow, replied the lady, who spoke with a strong southern accent, but just now you were in great danger of being crushed under the wheels of my carriage. What could have happened to you, to make you fall in that manner, just in the middle of the highway? I was overcome by weakness, madam, from having walked too much. Then you have been some time on the road? 
since yesterday, at four in the afternoon. And how far have you walked? I think about eighteen leagues. What, in fourteen hours? Oh, I ran all the way. Where are you going, then? To Versailles. And you came from? From Taverny. Taverny? Where is that? It is a chateau, situated between Pierre Fit and Barleduc. But you have scarcely had time to eat on the way. I not only had not time, but I had not the means. How so? I lost my money on the way. So that since yesterday you have eaten nothing? Only a few mouthfuls of bread, which I brought with me. Poor fellow! But why did you not beg something? Because I am proud, madam, said he, smiling scornfully. Proud! It is all very fine to be proud, but when one is dying of hunger. Better death than dishonor. The lady looked at the sententious speaker with something like admiration. But who are you, my friend, said she, who speak in this style? I am an orphan. What is your name? Gilbert. Gilbert what? Gilbert nothing. Ha, said the lady, still more surprised. Gilbert saw that he had produced an effect, and felt as if he were another Rousseau. You are very young to wander about in this way, continued the lady. I was left deserted and alone, in an old chateau, which the family had abandoned. I did as they had done, I abandoned it in my turn. Without any object in view. The world is wide, there is room for all. And you lost your purse. Was it well filled? There was only one crown in it, said he, divided between the shame of confessing his poverty and the fear of naming a large sum, which might have excited the suspicion that it had not been fairly obtained. One crown for such a journey. Why, it would scarcely have been sufficient to purchase bread for two days, and the distance. Good heavens! From Barleduc to Paris is nearly sixty-five leagues. I never counted the leagues, madam, only said, I must get to Paris. And, thereupon, you set out, my poor simpleton. Oh, I have good legs. Good as they are, they failed, you see. Oh, it was not my legs, it was hope which failed me. Why, indeed, you looked before you fell as if in great despair. Gilbert smiled bitterly. What was passing in your mind? You struck your forehead with your clenched hand, and tore out your hair by handfuls. Indeed, madam, asked Gilbert, rather embarrassed. Oh, I am certain of it. And it was that which, I think, prevented you hearing or seeing the carriage. Gilbert's instinct told him that he might increase his consequence, and still more awaken the interest of the lady, by telling the whole truth. I was, indeed, in despair, said he. And about what, said the lady? Because I could not keep up with a carriage which I was following. Indeed, said the young lady, smiling, this is quite a romance. Is there love in the case? All Gilbert's resolution could not prevent him from blushing. And what carriage was it, my little Roman? A carriage in the train of the Dauphiness. What do you tell me? Is the Dauphiness before us? She is, indeed. I thought her scarcely yet at Nancy. Are no honors paid her on the way, that she advances so rapidly? Oh, yes, madam, but her royal highness seems to have some reason for being in haste. In haste? Who told you so? I guessed it. On what grounds? Why, she said at first she would stay two or three hours at Taverny, and she only stayed three quarters of an hour. Do you know if she received any letters from Paris? I saw a gentleman in a dress covered with embroidery, who had one in his hand as he entered. Did you hear his name mentioned? No, I merely know that he is the governor of Strasbourg. What? The Count de Stainville, brother-in-law to the Duc de Choiseul. Horrible. Faster, postillion, faster. A vigorous lash was the reply, and Gilbert felt the speed of the carriage increase. But she must stop to breakfast, said the lady, as if speaking to herself, and then we shall pass her. Postilion, 
What is the next town? Vitry, madam. How far are we from it? Three leagues. Where shall we change horses? At Vauclera. Well, drive on, and if you see a train of carriages on the road before us, let me know. While the lady was exchanging these words with the postilion, Gilbert had again nearly fainted. When she once more turned toward him, he was pale, and his eyes were closed. Poor child, said she, he is fainting again. It is my fault, I made him talk when he was dying of hunger, instead of giving him something to eat. She took from the pocket of the carriage a richly carved flask, with a little silver goblet hanging round its neck by a chain, and poured out some of the contents for Gilbert. On this occasion he did not require to be asked twice. Now, said the lady, eat a biscuit, in an hour or so you shall breakfast more solidly. Thank you, madam, said Gilbert, gladly taking the biscuit as he had done the wine. As you have now recovered a little strength, said she, tell me, if you are disposed to make a confidant of me, what induced you to follow a carriage in the train of the Dauphiness? Well, madam, you shall hear the truth. I was living with the Baron de Taverny when her royal highness came. She commanded him to follow her to Paris, he obeyed. I was an orphan, and, consequently, nobody thought of me, they left me there, without food and without money. So I resolved, since everybody was going to Versailles, with the assistance of good horses and fine coaches, I, with the assistance of only my legs, would go to Versailles, and as soon as the horses. But fate was against me, if I had not lost my money, I should have had something to eat last night and if I had eaten last night, I should have overtaken them this morning. Very well. You showed courage, and I like that. But you forgot that at Versailles people cannot live on courage alone. I shall go to Paris. But in that respect Paris resembles Versailles exceedingly. If courage will not support me, labor will. A good answer, my little fellow. But what sort of labor? Your hands do not seem those of a workman or porter. I shall study. I think you seem to know a great deal already. Yes, for I know that I know nothing, replied Gilbert, remembering the aphorism of Socrates. And may I ask, my young friend, what branch of study you would choose? I think, madam, that the best is that which teaches man to be most useful to his fellows. Besides, man is so frail a being, that he should learn the cause of his weakness, in order that he may know his strength. I should like to know some day why my stomach prevented my legs from carrying me any further this morning, and if it was not that weakness of my stomach which summoned up the phantoms which distressed my brain. Really, you would make an excellent physician, and you speak already most learnedly on the science of medicine. In ten years you shall have me for a patient. I shall try to deserve that honor, madam. They had now reached the place where they were to change horses. The young lady asked for information respecting the Dauphiness, and found that she had passed through that place a quarter of an hour before. She intended to stop at Vitry to change horses and to breakfast. A fresh postilion took the place of the former one. The lady allowed him to leave the village at the usual speed. But when they had got a little beyond the last house. Postilion, said she, Will you undertake to come up with the carriages of the Dauphiness? Certainly, madam. Before they reach Vitry. Diable. They are going full trot. Yes. But if you were to go at a gallop. The postilion looked at her. Treble pay, said she. If you had said so at first, replied he, we should have been a quarter of a league further by this time. Well, here is a crown on account make up for lost time. The postilion's arm was stretched back, the ladies forward, and their hands met. The horses received a sharp lash, and the carriage started off like the wind. During the change of horses, Gilbert had alighted and washed his face and hands at a fountain, had smoothed down his hair, which was very thick, and had altogether improved his appearance very much. In truth, said the lady to herself, he is handsome enough for a physician, and she smiled. Having finished her dialogue with the postilion, she turned once more to Gilbert, whose paradoxes and sententious humor amused her exceedingly. From time to time she interrupted herself in a burst of laughter, 
which his philosophizing caused her, to lean out of the carriage and look anxiously before her, they had gone about a league in this way. When she uttered a cry of joy, she had caught a sight of the last wagons of the Dauphiness's train as they were slowly ascending a steep hill, and now there appeared in advance of them about twenty carriages, from which many of the travellers had got out and were walking beside them. Gilbert slipped out his head also, desirous to catch a glimpse of Mademoiselle de Taverny in the midst of the crowd of pygmies, and thought he discovered Nicole by her high cap. And now, madam, said the postillion, what must we do? We must get before them. Get before them. But you know we cannot pass the carriage of the Dauphiness. Why not? Because it is expressly forbidden. Pest. Pass the king's horses. I should be sent to the galleys. Now, listen, my good fellow, manage it as you please, but I must positively get before those carriages. I thought you belonged to the train of Her Royal Highness, said Gilbert, inquiringly. It is very proper to wish for information. Replied she, but we should not ask indiscreet questions. I beg your pardon, madam, said he, reddening. Well, postillion, what are we to do? Why, faith, this, keep behind till we reach Vitry, and then if Her Highness stops, obtain her permission to go on before her. Aye, but then it would be asked who I was, I should have to tell. No, no, that will not do. We must find out some other way. Madam, said Gilbert, if I might give an opinion. Yes, yes, my young friend, if you have any good advice, give it. Could we not take some by-road which would bring us round to Vitry, and so get before the Dauphiness without having been wanting in respect to her? Excellent! The boy is right, cried the young lady. Postilion, is there a by-road? To go where? Where you like, provided you leave the Dauphiness behind. There is, in fact, a by-road leading round Vitry, and joining the high road again at La Chaussee. That is it, that is the very thing, cried the lady. But, madam, if I take that road, you must double the pay. Two Louis Dior's for you, if we get to La Chaussee before the Dauphiness. Madam is not afraid, then, of her carriage being broken. I care for nothing. If it breaks I shall proceed on horseback. And turning to the right, they entered a crossroad, full of deep ruts, bordered by a little river, which falls into the Marne between La Chaussee and Martigny. The postillion kept his word. He did all that human power could do to break the carriage, but, at the same time, to arrive before the Dauphiness. A dozen times Gilbert was thrown into the lady's arm, and a dozen times she into his. Intimacy springs up quickly from jolting on in the loneliness of a carriage. And, after two hours travelling on this by-road, it seemed to Gilbert as if he had known his companion ten years, and she, on her part, would have sworn she had known him since his birth. About eleven o'clock, they came again on the high road between Vitry and Chalens. A courier whom they met told them that the Dauphiness was not only staying to breakfast at Vitry, but that she meant to take two hours' repose. He added that he had been sent forward to desire those who attended to the horses to have them in readiness between three and four o'clock. This news filled the lady with joy. She gave the postillion the two Louis Dior's which she promised him. And, turning to Gilbert, so now, said she, we shall be able to dine at the next stopping place. But fate had decided that Gilbert should not dine there. XXI, in which a new personage makes his appearance. From the top of the hill which the lady's carriage was ascending, the village of Le Chaussee might be seen, it was there she was to change horses and stop to dine. It was a lovely little village, with its thatched cottages scattered here and there at the caprice of the owners. Some in the very middle of the road, some half hidden under the shade of a little grove which bordered the highway, and some following the course of the little river which we have mentioned. Over which the inhabitants had placed temporary and rustic bridges to reach their dwellings. At that moment, however, the most remarkable feature in the village was a man who, looking down the brook, was standing right in the middle of the road, as if he had been ordered to keep watch there. Sometimes he looked up, sometimes down the road. 
Then he turned a longing eye toward a beautiful grey horse with long mane and tail, which was fastened to the window shutter of a cabin, which he shook in his impatient tossing of his head, an impatience which was the more excusable, as. From the fact of his being saddled, it might be presumed he was waiting for his master who was inside. From time to time the stranger ventured to approach the horse to pat his side, or pass his hand down his slender legs. And then when he luckily escaped the kick which was always vouchsafed him at each attempt, he returned to his occupation of watching the road. Wearied at last by this fruitless watching, he knocked on the window shutter. Hello. In there. He shouted. Who is there, replied a man's voice, and the shutter was opened. Sir, said the stranger, if your horse is to be sold, the buyer is here at hand. You can see he has no wisp at his tail, answered the other, who appeared to be a countryman, and he shut the window. This answer did not appear to satisfy the stranger, so he knocked again. He was a tall, stout man, with a ruddy complexion, a black beard, and large, sinewy hands peeping out from fine lace ruffles. He wore a hat edged with gold lace, and set on crosswise like those officers of the provinces who try to look fierce in the eyes of the poor Parisians. He knocked a third time, but no answer. He got impatient. Do you know, my honest fellow, cried he, you are not very polite, and if you don't open your shutter I'll break it in. At this threat the shutter opened and the same face as before appeared. But when you were told the horse is not for sale, replied the peasant, for the second time, what the devil, is not that enough? But when I tell you that I want a fast animal. Well, if you want one, can you not go to the post house? There are sixty of the kings there, you surely can choose from among them. But leave a man who has only one, that one. I tell you this is the very one I want. A nice proposal, indeed. An Arabian. That is the reason I want it. Very possibly, but it is not for sale. Whose is it? You are very curious. And you mighty discreet. Well, it belongs to a person asleep in the house. A man or woman? A woman. Tell the woman, then, that I will give her five hundred pistoles for her horse. Oh, ho, said the peasant, staring, five hundred pistoles. That is a sum. Tell her it is the king who wants her horse. The king? Yes, in person. Oh, come. You are not the king are you? Co, but I represent him. You represent him, said the peasant, taking off his hat. Come, come, make haste. The king is in a hurry. And the burly stranger cast another impatient glance toward the highway. Well, when the lady awakes I will tell her. Yes, but I can't wait till she wakes. What is to be done, then? Parbleu. Awaken her. Awaken her? Certainly not. Well, I shall do it myself. But just as the stranger, who pretended to be the representative of his majesty, advanced to knock at the window of the upper story with the handle of his long whip. He caught a glimpse of a carriage coining along at the utmost speed of the worn-out horses. His quick eye recognized it instantly, and he sprang forward to meet it, it was that in which were Gilbert and his guardian angel. On seeing this man, who made signs for him to stop, the postillion gladly obeyed, for he scarcely knew whether the horses could take him to the post house. Chan! My dear Chan! Is it you at last? It is, Jean, replied the lady addressed by this singular name. And what are you doing here? Pardieu! A pretty question. I am waiting for you. And he leaped on the step of the carriage, and putting in his long arms, seized her, and covered her with kisses. Ha, said he, all at once observing Gilbert, who looked on with surprise at these strange proceedings. What the deuce have you here? Oh, a little philosopher, and very amusing, replied M. L. L. Chan, little caring whether she hurt or flattered the pride of her new acquaintance. And where did you pick him up? On the road. But that is not the question. True, said the person who was called Jean. What about our old Countess de Bern? All settled. 
What, settled? Yes, she will come. But what did you say to her? That I was her lawyer's daughter, that I was passing through Verdun, and that my father desired me to tell her the lawsuit was coming on. I merely added that her presence in Paris had now become indispensable for its success. What did she say to that? She opened her little grey eyes, took a long pinch of snuff, said that Monsieur Flagett was the cleverest man in the world, and gave orders for her departure. Admirable, Chan. I shall make you my ambassador extraordinary. And now, shall we breakfast? With all my heart, for this poor child is dying of hunger. But we must be quick, for she will soon overtake us. Who, the old countess? Nonsense. No, the dauphiness. Bah! The dauphiness is scarcely at Nancy yet. She is at Vitry, three leagues off. Pest! That alters the case. Drive on, drive on, postillion. Where, sir? To the post house. The carriage drove off, with the stranger still standing on the step, and soon drew up before the inn door. Quick, quick, said Chan. Let us have some cutlets, a fowl, some eggs, and a bottle of burgundy. We must set out again instantly. Excuse me, madam, said the innkeeper, stepping forward, but in that case it must be with your own horses. How, said Jean, leaping heavily down from the step of the carriage. With our own horses? Certainly. Or, at least, with those that brought you. Impossible, said the postillion, they have already done a double stage. See what a state they are in. In good earnest, said Chan, it would be utterly impossible to proceed further with them. But what prevents you giving us fresh horses, asked Jean. Merely that I have none. What, the devil? You know the regulations, it is your duty to have horses. By the regulations, sir, I ought to have fifteen horses, now, I have eighteen. Why, all we want is three. Yes, but they are all out. What, all the eighteen? Yes, sir. Damnation, thundered the traveller. Oh, Viscount, Viscount, cried Chan. Yes, yes, Chan, don't be afraid, I will keep calm. And when will your miserable hacks be in, continued the Viscount, turning to the host. Faith, sir, I don't know, it all depends on the postillions. Perhaps in an hour, perhaps in two hours. Now, my good fellow, said Viscount Jean, placing his hat on one side, and setting out his right leg, I wish you just to understand this, I never jest. I am sorry for it, sir. I should like you much better if you did. Now, take my advice. Let the horses be harnessed before I get angry. Go into the stable yourself, sir, and if you find a horse there, you shall have it for nothing. Indeed. And what if I should find sixty? It would be just the same as if there were none. For these sixty horses are the king's. Well, what then? What then? They are not to be hired out. What the devil are they here for, then? For the use of Her Royal Highness, the Dauphiness. Mondain. Sixty horses, and we cannot get one. But you know, sir. I know one thing, and that is that I am in a hurry. It is a pity. And, continued the Viscount, without heeding the postmaster's interruption, as the Dauphiness will not be here before the evening. What do you say? exclaimed the host, all alarmed. I say that the horses will be back before she arrives. Can it be possible you would propose? Parbleu, said the Viscount, going into the stable, I will have three horses. I don't want eight, like royal personages, although I have a right to them, by alliance, at least. But I say you shall not have one, said the host, throwing himself, in desperation, between the stranger and his horses. Scoundrel, cried the Viscount, turning pale with anger, do you know who lamb? Viscount, Viscount. In heaven's name, no broils, cried Chan. You are right, my good little Chan, then, after a moment's thought, 
he turned with his most charming smile to the host, my good fellow, no more words, now for deeds. I shall take the responsibility off your shoulders. How so, asked the host, by no means satisfied even with the stranger's now gracious visage. I shall help myself, these three horses suit me exactly. And you call that freeing me from all responsibility? Certainly, you have not given them to me, it was I who took them. I tell you the thing is impossible. We shall see that. Where is the harness? Let no one stir, at his peril. Cried the host to two or three grooms loitering about. Scoundrels, cried the viscount. Jean, my dear Jean, exclaimed Chan, you will only bring us into some disagreeable situation. When on a mission like this we must endure. Everything except delay, said Jean, with the utmost coolness, and since these rogues won't help me, I shall do the business myself. And Jean coolly took from the wall three sets of harness and fitted them on three of the horses. Jean, Jean, I entreat you, do not be rash, cried Chan, clasping her hands. Do you wish to arrive in Paris, or not? said the Viscount, grinding his teeth. Of course I do. All is lost if we do not hasten on. Well, then, leave me alone. And separating three horses, not the worst, from the others, he led them to the carriage. Take care, sir, take care. Cried the host, it is high treason to steal those horses. I am not going to steal them, you fool, I'm only going to borrow them. Come on, my little pets. The host sprung forward to catch the reins. But before he could touch them, he was rudely repulsed by the stranger. Brother, brother, cried M. L. L. E. Chan. Ah! He is her brother, muttered Gilbert to himself, breathing more freely. At this moment a window was opened on the opposite side of the way, and a lovely female face was seen. She appeared quite alarmed at the noise. Oh, is it you, madam? cried Jean, who immediately perceived her. How, sir, me? She replied, in bad French. Yes, you are awake now. Will you sell your horse? My horse? Yes, the grey Arabian tied to the window shutter there. You know I offered you five hundred crowns. My horse is not for sale, sir, said she, shutting the window. Well, I am not in luck today, people will neither sell nor hire. But, Corblu, I will take the Arabian, if she won't sell it, and I'll drive these hacks to the devil, if they won't hire them. Come, Patrice. The footman on his sister's carriage jumped down. Harness them, said Jean. Help, help! shouted the host. Two grooms ran forward. Jean! Viscount, cried poor Chan, writhing in the carriage, and endeavoring in vain to open the door. You are mad. We shall all be slaughtered. Slaughtered? It is we who shall slaughter them, I hope. We are three against three. Come out, my young philosopher, thundered Jean, addressing Gilbert, who never stirred, so great was his astonishment, come out, and do something, sticks, stones, or fists, anything will do. More blue. You look like a saint carved on stone. Gilbert gave an inquiring and supplicating glance at his protectress, but she held him by the arm. The host, in the meantime, bawled incessantly, dragging the horses to one side, while Jean pulled them to the other. But the struggle could not last forever. Jean, wearied and heated, dealt the defender of the horses such a blow with his clenched fist that the latter fell back into the horse pond, among his frightened ducks and geese, shouting as he plunged in, Help! Murder! Murder! The Viscount, thus rid of his adversary, lost no time in harnessing the horses. Help! in the name of the king. Help, cried the host, rising and endeavoring to rally his frightened grooms. Who calls for help in the name of the king? cried a cavalier, riding at full speed into the yard of the posthouse, and reining up his horse bathed in sweat and foam, in the very midst of the actors in this tumultuous scene. The Chevalier Philip de Taverny. 
muttered Gilbert to himself, sinking down in the carriage to escape observation. Chan, who lost no opportunity of acquiring information, heard the young man's name. XXI Viscount Jean. The young lieutenant of the bodyguard of the Dauphin, for it was he, leaped from his horse at the aspect of this strange scene, which began to collect about the post house all the women and children of the village. On seeing Philip, the postmaster was ready to throw himself on his knees before his protector, whom Providence had sent him so opportunely. Sir, sir, cried he, do you know that this person is about to take by force some of the horses of Her Royal Highness the Dauphiness? Philip drew back, as if he heard what was absolutely incredible. And who has made this attempt, he inquired. I, sir. Mordu. I, myself, said Jean. It cannot be, sir, otherwise you are either mad or not a gentleman. Excuse me, sir. I am in my perfect senses, and have the entree at court. How? You are in your perfect senses, and are received at court, and yet you dare to take the horses of the Dauphiness. In the first place, there are sixty horses, Her Royal Highness can only employ eight, and it would be strange, indeed, if I should unluckily pitch upon the very one she wanted. True, sir. There are sixty horses, replied the young man, and Her Royal Highness will only employ eight, but that does not hinder every horse, from the first to the sixtieth, being for her service, and between these horses no distinction can be made. You are mistaken, sir, it is made, said the Viscount, contemptuously, since I have taken these three for myself. Shall I go on foot, when rascally lackeys are drawn by four horses? More do. Let them be satisfied, as I am, with three, and there will be enough for us all. If the lackeys have four horses, sir, it is by the king's order, and now have the goodness to order your footman to take those horses back to the stable. These words Philip pronounced firmly, but with so much politeness that none but a ruffian would have answered otherwise than respectfully. You may be right, my dear lieutenant, answered Jean, to speak in this manner, if it be a part of your duty to attend to the cattle, but I did not know that the gentleman of the Dauphin's bodyguard had been raised to the rank of grooms. Therefore, take my advice, shut your eyes, tell your people to do the same, and, a good day to you. Sir, whether I have been raised or lowered to the rank of groom is not the question. What I do is my duty, and I am commanded by the Dauphiness herself to attend to the relays. Oh, that alters the case I, but allow me to tell you that you are filling a sorry office, Mr. Lieutenant, and if this is the way the young lady begins to treat the army. Of whom do you speak, sir? interrupted Philip. Why, parbleu. Of the Austrian. The chevalier turned as pale as death. Do you dare, he exclaimed, to speak? I not only dare to speak, interrupted Jean, but I dare to act. Come, Patrice, hasten, we are pressed for time. Philip seized the first horse by the bridle. Sir, said he, in a perfectly calm voice, do me the favor to give your name. Do you wish particularly to know it? Yes. Well, then, I am the Viscount Jean Dubarry. What? You are the brother of her. Who will send you to rot in the Bastille if you say one word more, and Jean jumped into the carriage. Philip approached the door. Viscount Jean Dubarry, said he, you will do me the honor to come out. Yes, ma foi. I have a great deal of time for that, said the Viscount, endeavoring to shut the door. If you hesitate one instant, sir, replied Philip, preventing him with his left hand from closing the carriage door, I give you my word of honor I will run you through the body, and as he spoke he drew his sword. Oh! cried Chan, we shall be murdered. Give up the horses, Jean, give them up. What, you threaten me, shouted Jean, grinding his teeth and snatching up his sword, which he had laid on the seat of the carriage before him. And the threat shall be followed up, do you hear? In a moment, and the young man's sword glanced before Jean's eyes. We shall never get away, whispered Chan, if you do not manage this officer by gentle means. Neither gentleness nor violence shall stop me in the discharge of my duty, said Philip, who had overheard the advice, bowing. 
I recommend you, madam, to advise Monsieur le Viscount to submit in time, or in the name of the king whom I represent, I shall be forced to kill him if he resists, or to arrest him if he does not. And I tell you I shall have the horses in spite of you, shouted Jean, leaping out of the carriage and drawing his sword. That remains to be proved, sir, said Philip, putting himself on his guard. Are you ready? Lieutenant, said the brigadier commanding under Philip, there are six of our men near, shall I? Do not stir, do not stir. This is a personal quarrel. Now, sir, I am at your service. Mli. Chan shrieked, and Gilbert wished the carriage had been as deep as a well, to hide him. Jean began the attack, he was a good swordsman, but anger prevented him from turning his skill to advantage. Philip, on the contrary, was as cool as if he had been playing with a foil in the fencing school. The Viscount advanced, retired, leaped to the right, to the left, shouting and making his passes like the fencing master of a regiment. While the Chevalier, with closed teeth and steady eye, immovable as a statue, watched all his adversary's movements and divined his intentions. Every one in the yard was silent, attentively looking on, even Chan ceased to scream. For some minutes the combat continued without Jean's feints, shouts, and movements producing any effect, but also without his having permitted Philip, who was studying his opponent's play, to touch him once. All at once, however, the Viscount sprung back, uttering a cry of pain, and at the same moment his ruffles were stained with blood, which ran down his fingers in large drops, he was wounded in the arm. You are wounded, sir, said Philip. Sacrebleu. I feel it well enough, said he, turning pale and letting his sword fall. The chevalier took it up and restored it to him. Take it, sir, said he, and never again be guilty of a similar folly. Plague take it. If I have my follies, I pay for them, growled the viscount. Come and dress this scrape, dear Chan, added he to his sister, who sprung from the carriage and hastened to his assistance. You will do me the justice, madam, said Philip, to acknowledge that all this has not been caused by my fault. I deeply regret having been driven to such extremities before a lady, and bowing, he retired. Let those horses be unharnessed and taken back to the stable, he said to the postmaster. Jean shook his fist at him. Oh, cried the host, this is just in the nick of time, three horses coming in that have been out. Corton, Corton. Quick. Put them to the gentleman's carriage. But, master, said the postilion. Come, come. No reply, the gentleman is in a hurry. Don't be uneasy, sir, you shall have the horses. All very fine. But your horses should have been here half an hour ago, growled Dewberry, stamping with his foot, as he looked at his arm, pierced through and through, which Chan was binding up with her handkerchief. Meantime, Philip had mounted his horse again and was giving his orders as if nothing had occurred. Now, brother, now. Let us go, said Chan, leading him toward the carriage. And my Arabian, said he. Ah, uh, ma foi, I let him go to the devil, for I am in for a day of ill luck, and he got into the carriage. Oh, said he, perceiving Gilbert, I cannot stretch my legs with this fellow. Let me out, pray said Gilbert, and I will walk. In the devil's name, go, then, replied Jean. No, no, said Chan, I must keep my little philosopher. Sit opposite me, and you will not annoy him, and she held Gilbert by the arm. Then, bending forward, she whispered to her brother, he knows the man who wounded you. A gleam of joy flashed from the Viscount's eyes. Oh, very well I let him stay. What is the fellow called? The Chevalier Philip de Taverny. Just then the young officer passed the carriage. Oh, you are there, my little gendarme, shouted the Viscount, you look wonderfully fierce just now, but my turn will come some day. I shall be at your service, sir, whenever you please, answered Philip, calmly. Yes, yes, we shall see that, Monsieur Philip de Taverny, said the Viscount, leaning forward to see what effect the mention of his name would have on the young man, when he must be so far from expecting to hear it. 
Philip looked up with surprise, and indeed with a slight feeling of uneasiness, but immediately recovering his self-possession, and taking off his hat, with the utmost grace, a pleasant journey, Viscount Jean Dewberry, said he. The carriage rolled on rapidly. Thousand devils, said the Viscount, making a horrible grimace, do you know, my little Chan, I am suffering dreadful pain. The first place where we change I shall send for a doctor for you, while this poor fellow breakfasts, replied Chan. Ah! True, true, we have not breakfasted, but the pain I suffer, and I am in agony with thirst, takes away all appetite. Will you bring a glass of wine from my flask? Certainly, give it me. Sir, said Gilbert, will you allow me to remark that wine is very bad for you in your present condition? Really, you are quite a physician, my little philosopher. No, sir, but I hope to be so one day. I have read, however, in a treatise written for people in the army, that the first things forbidden the wounded are spirits, wine, and coffee. Ah, you read that? Well, I shall not drink the wine. But if Monsieur le Viscount would permit me to take his handkerchief and dip it in that brook, and then wrap it round his arm. I am sure it would ease his pain. Do, do, said Chan, stop, postillion. Gilbert got out to follow up his proposition. This boy will be a horrid plague to us, said the Viscount. I have a great mind to tell the postillion to drive on, and to leave him there, handkerchief and all. You would be wrong. That boy can be very useful to us. How so? He has already given me some important information about the Dauphinus, and did he not just now tell you the name of your adversary? True, well, let him stay. Gilbert returned, and the application of the wet bandage to the Viscount's arm, as he had foretold, relieved him greatly. Faith, he was right, I feel much better, said he, let us have a little chat. Gilbert opened his ears to their utmost extent. The conversation which ensued, and which was conducted in the lively and brilliant patois of Provence, would have sadly puzzled a Parisian ear, and Gilbert, master of himself as he was, could not avoid a slight movement of impatience which Mli. Chan having perceived, quieted with a gentle smile. This smile reminded the poor boy of the kindness with which he was treated. Circumstances had brought him in contact with a nobleman honored with the royal favor. Ah, thought he, if André saw me in this magnificent carriage, and his heart swelled with pride. New ideas and hopes took possession of him, and Nicole no longer cost him a thought. In the meantime, the brother and sister resumed their conversation, still, however, in the Provençal dialect. Suddenly the Viscount leaned forward. See, there he is, cried he. What? The Arabian which I wished to buy. Oh! exclaimed Chan, what a splendid woman the writer is. Call her, Chan, she will not, perhaps, be so much afraid of you. I would give a thousand crowns for the horse. And how much for the woman, said Chan, laughing. I would give all I have for her, but call her. Madam, cried Chan, Madam. But the stranger appeared not to hear, or not to understand. Wrapped in a long white mantle, and her face shaded by a large beaver hat with drooping feathers, she flew past them like an arrow, crying, Avanti, Jared, Avanti. She is an Italian, said the Viscount. Mordu, what a splendid woman. If it were not for the pain of my arm, I would jump out and run after her. I know her, said Gilbert. Why, the little fellow is a directory for the whole province, he knows every one. Who is she? asked Chan. Her name is Lorenza, and she is the sorcerer's wife. What sorcerer? The Baron Joseph Balsamo. The brother and sister looked at each other with an expression which said, We did well to keep him. Exei, the Countess Dewberry's morning levy. While MLLE Chan and Viscount Jean are traveling post on the Chalins Road, let us introduce the reader to another member of the same family. In the suite of rooms at Versailles which the Princess Adelaide, daughter of Louis XV, had once occupied, His Majesty had installed his mistress, the Countess Dewberry, not without keenly studying beforehand the effect which this piece of policy would produce on his court. 
The favorite, with her merry whims and her careless, joyous humor, had transformed that wing of the palace, formerly so quiet, into a scene of perpetual merriment and tumult. And every hour she issued thence her commands for a banquet or a party of pleasure. But what appeared still more unusual on these magnificent staircases, was the never-ceasing stream of visitors ascending them. And crowding an antechamber filled with curiosities from all parts of the globe, certainly containing nothing so curious as the idol worshipped by this crowd. The day after that on which the scene which we have just described occurred at the little village of La Chasse, about nine in the morning, the countess, lovely as an eastern hurry, was at the important duties of the toilet. No news of Chan? Asked one of her tiring women. No, madam. Nor of the viscount? No, madam. Do you know has Bischi received any? A message was sent to your sisters, madam, this morning, but there were no letters. It is very tiresome waiting in this way, said the countess, pouting her lovely mouth. I am in a wretched humor, I pity all who may come near me today. Will some means never be invented of conversing at a hundred leagues distance? Is my antechamber passably filled this morning? Can madam think it necessary to ask? Dame! But listen! Doré, the dauphiness is coming, I shall be abandoned for that son, I who am only a little twinkling star. But tell me, who is there this morning? The Duc d'Aiguillon, madam, the Prince de Soubise, Monsieur de Sartens, the President Mopia. And the Duc de Richelieu? Not yet, madam. How I neither today nor yesterday. He is afraid of compromising himself. You must send one of my servants to the Hotel du Hanover to inquire if the Duke be ill. Yes, madam, will you receive all who are waiting at once, or do you wish to give anyone a private audience? Monsieur de Sartens first, I must speak to him alone. The order was transmitted by the Countess's woman to a tall footman who waited in the corridor leading from her bedchamber to the anterooms, and the Minister of Police immediately appeared, dressed in black, and endeavouring, by an insinuating smile, to moderate the severe expression of his grey eyes and thin lips. Good morning, my dear enemy, said the Countess, without looking round, but seeing him in the mirror before her. Your enemy, madam? Yes, my world is divided into only two classes, friends and enemies. I admit no neutrals, or class them as enemies. And you are right, madam, but tell me how I, notwithstanding my well-known devotion to your interests, deserve to be included in either one or other of these classes. By allowing to be printed, distributed, sold, and sent to the king, a whole ocean of pamphlets, libels, verses, all against me. It is ill-natured, stupid, odious. But, madam, I am not responsible. Yes, sir, you are. For you know the wretch who wrote them. Madam, if they were all written by one author, we should not have the trouble of sending him to the Bastille, Hercules himself would sink under such a labor. Upon my word, you are highly complimentary to me. If I were your enemy, madam, I should not speak the truth thus. Well, I believe you. We understand each other now. But one thing still gives me some uneasiness. What is that, madam? You are on good terms with the Choiseuls. Madam, Monsieur de Choiseul is Prime Minister, he issues his orders, and I must obey them. So, if Monsieur de Choiseul orders that I am to be vexed, tortured, worried to death, you will allow me to be vexed, tortured, worried? Thank you. Let us discuss matters a little, said Sartens, sitting down without being asked to do so, but without any displeasure being exhibited on the part of the favorite. For much must be pardoned in the man who knew better than any other all that was doing in France. Let us discuss this a little, and, first, what have I done for you these three days past? You informed me that a courier had been sent from Gantelup to hasten the arrival of the Dauphiness. Was that done like an enemy? But about the presentation on which you know my heart is set, what have you been doing for me? Doing all I possibly could. Monsieur de Sartens, you are not candid. Ah, madam. I assure you you are unjust. 
Did I not find and bring you Viscount Jean from the back room of a tavern in less than two hours, when you wanted him in order to send him I don't know where, or, rather, I do know where. I had much rather you had allowed my brother-in-law to stay there, said Madame Dubarry, laughing, a man allied to the royal family of France. Well, but was that not a service to be added to my many other services? Oh, very well. But just tell me what you did for me yesterday. Yesterday, madam. Oh, you may well endeavor to recollect, that was your day for obliging others. I don't understand you, madam. Well, I understand myself. Answer, sir, what were you doing yesterday? Yesterday morning I was occupied, as usual, writing with my secretary. Till what hour? Till ten. What did you do then? I sent to invite a friend of mine from Lyons, who had made a wager he would come to Paris without my knowing, and my footman met him just at the barrier. Well, after dinner. I sent to the Austrian lieutenant of police information of the haunt of a famous robber whom he could not discover. And where is he? At Vienna. So you are not only the minister of police at Paris, but perform the same duties for foreign courts. Yes, madam, in my leisure moments. Well, I shall take a note of that. Then, after having dispatched the courier to Vienna, I went to the opera. To see the little Gamard. Poor Soubies. No, to arrest a famous pickpocket, whom I did not disturb so long as he kept to the fermier's general, but who had the audacity to rob two or three noblemen. You should say the indiscretion. Well, after the opera. After the opera? Yes. That seems to be rather a puzzling question, is it not? No. After the opera? Let me think. So. How much your memory has failed of late? Oh. After the opera, yes, I remember. Well. I went to the house of a certain lady who keeps a gaming table, and I myself conducted her to Fort Levesque. In her carriage? No, in a fiacre. Well. Well, that is all. No, it is not. I got into my fiacre again. And whom did you find in it? He reddened. Oh, cried the countess, clapping her hands, I have really had the honor of making a minister of police blush. Madam, stammered Sartans. No. I shall tell you who was in the fiacre, it was the Duchess de Gramont. The Duchess de Gramont? Yes, the Duchess de Gramont, who came to ask you to contrive to get her admitted to the king's private apartments. Ma foi, madam. Said the minister, shifting uneasily in his chair, I may give up my portfolio to you. It is you who manage the police of Paris, not I. To tell the truth, sir, I have a police of my own. So beware. Oh, the Duchess de Gramont in a fiacre with the Minister of Police at midnight. It was capital. Do you know what I did? No, but I am afraid it was something dreadful, fortunately it was very late. But night is the time for vengeance. And what, then, did you do? As I keep a police of my own, I keep a body of writers also, shocking, ragged, hungry scribblers. Hungry? You must feed them badly. I don't feed them at all. If they became fat, they would be as stupid as the Prince de Soubies, fat, we are told, absorbs the gall. Go on, I shudder at the thought of them. I recollected all the disagreeable things you have allowed the Choiseuls to do against me, and determined to be revenged. I gave my legion of famishing Apollos the following program, first, Monsieur de Sartens, disguised as a lawyer, visiting an innocent young girl who lives in a garret and giving her, on the thirtieth of every month, a wretched pittance of a hundred crowns. Madam, that is a benevolent action which you are endeavoring to misconstrue. It is only such actions which can be misconstrued. My second scene was Monsieur de Sartens, disguised like a reverend missionary, introducing himself into the convent of the Carmelites of the Rue Saint Antoine. I was taking those good nuns some news from the Indies. East or West Indies, which? 
My third scene is Monsieur de Sartens, disguised as lieutenant of the police, driving through the streets at midnight in a fiacre with the Duchess de Gramont. No, madam, exclaimed he. No, you would not bring ridicule on my administration in that manner. Why, do you not bring ridicule on mine, said the countess, laughing. But wait. I set my rogues to work, and they began like boys at college, with exordium, narration, and amplification, and I have received this morning an epigram, a song, and a ballad, of which you are the subject. You are not serious. Perfectly so. And tomorrow you shall receive them, all three. Why not today? I must have some time to distribute them. Is not that the way? Besides, the police ought always to hear last about any new affair. I assure you, you will be very much amused. I laughed three quarters of an hour at them this morning, and the king was nearly dead with laughing, it was that which made him so late. I am ruined, cried Sartans, clasping his hands. Ruined? Nonsense. You are only celebrated in song. Am I ruined by all the verses made on me? No, I only get in a passion at them, and then for revenge I determine to put somebody else in a passion, too. Ah! What delightful verses! I have ordered some wine to my literary scorpions, and I expect by this time their senses are wrapped in happy oblivion. Ah! Countess, Countess! But, pardieu, you must hear the epigram. Oh, France, how wretched is thy fate! When women hold the helm of state. No, no, I am wrong, that is the scandal perpetrated against myself. But there are so many, I confound them. Listen, listen. Here it is. A perfumer once sought of a painter a sign. His skill than his genius was duller. For in a huge bottle, with knavish design. He makes boins, mopia, and terai to shine displayed in their own proper color. But for Sartan still room in the vessel he leaves. And he labels the mixture the essence of thieves. Cruel woman, you will set me mad, cried Sartans. Now, we must look at the poem. You must know it is Madame de Gramont who speaks. Dear minister, you know my skin. Is to the purest snow akin. Then grant to me this single thing. Oh, say so say so to the king. Madam, madam! cried Sartans, more furious than ever. Nonsense, said the countess. You need not be so uneasy about these little poems. I have only had ten thousand copies of them struck off. You have a press, then? Certainly. Has not the Duc de Choiseul one? Let your printer take care. Oh, it is kept in my own name. I am the printer. Shocking, shocking. And the king laughs at these calumnies? Laughs? He sometimes gives me rhymes himself, when my own inspiration fails. You know how I serve you, and you treat me thus. I know that you are betraying me, the Duchess de Gramont wishes to ruin me. Madam, I declare to you she took me quite unawares. You confess, then, that I was informed correctly. I am forced to confess it. Why did you not tell me? I came now for that purpose. I don't believe you. Upon my honor. I bet two to one against that pledge. Behold me at your feet, and he fell on his knees. I beg forgiveness. You are in the position in which you ought to be. Let us make peace, Countess, in heaven's name. So are you afraid of a few bad verses? You, a man, a minister. Yet you never reflect how many wretched hours such things make me spend, I, a poor, weak woman. You are a queen. A queen, not presented at court. I swear to you I have never done anything hurtful to your interests. No, but you have allowed others to do so. The matter however, is now, not the doing nothing against them, but the doing all in your power to forward them. Are you on my side? Yes or no? Certainly, on your side. Will you assist me? Will you allow nothing to interpose to hinder my presentation? 
For myself, I promise everything. No, said the countess, stamping with her foot. Punic faith. I will not accept that. There is a loophole in it to creep out at. You will be supposed to do nothing against me yourself, but the Duc de Choiseul will do all. Give me up the Choiseul party, bound hand and foot, or I will annihilate you, destroy you. Take care, verses are not my only weapons. Do not threaten me, Madame E., said Sartans, thoughtfully. There are difficulties about this presentation which you cannot understand. Obstacles have purposely been thrown in the way of it. You can remove them. It would require a hundred persons to do so. You shall have a million. The king will not give his consent. He shall give it. And, when you have got it, how get a lady to present you? I am seeking for one now. It is quite useless, there is a league against you. At Versailles. Yes. All the ladies have refused, in order to pay their court to the Duc de Choiseul, the Duchess de Gramont, the Dauphiness, and the whole prudish party. Do not fear. I have nearly obtained what I want. Ha! It was for that you sent your sister to Verdun. So you know that, do you? said she, angrily. Oh, I have also my police, you know, said Sartans, laughing. And your spies? And my spies? In my apartments? In your apartments? In my stable, or in my kitchen? In your antechamber, in your saloon, in your bedroom, under your pillow? Now, as the first pledge of our peace, said the Countess, give me the names of those spies. No, Countess. I should not wish to embroil you with your friends. But name only the last who told you a secret. What would you do? I would turn him out. If you begin in that way, you will soon have to live in an empty house. This is frightful. Yet perfectly true. Oh, you know we could not govern without spies. So excellent a politician as you must have discovered that long ago. Madame. Dewberry leaned her elbow on a table, and seemed to reflect for some minutes, then she said, You are right. Let us say no more on the subject. What are to be the conditions of our treaty? Make them yourself. You are the conqueror. I am as magnanimous as Semiramis. Let me hear what you wish. Well, then, you are never to speak to the king about petitions on the subject of wheat, for, traitress. You have promised your support to those petitions. Very well. Take away all the petitions with you, they are in a box there. As a reward, here is a document drawn up by the peers of the kingdom respecting presentations and the right of sitting in the royal presence. A document which you were charged to give His Majesty? Yes. But what will you say to them? That I have given it. You will thus gain time, and you are too clever in your tactics not to take advantage of it. At this moment the folding doors were thrown open, and a negro announced, the king. The two allies hastened to hide their mutual pledge of peace and good understanding, and turned to salute His Majesty, Louis, the fifteenth of that name. Ziv, King Louis the fifteenth. The king entered with head erect, with a firm step, his eye full of life, and a smile on his lips. As the doors were opened, a double file of bowing heads was seen belonging to the courtiers who had been long waiting in the antechamber, and who were now more desirous of admittance than ever. Since they could thus pay their court to two powers at once. But the doors closed on them, for the king made a sign that no one should follow him. He found himself alone, therefore, with the countess and the minister of police, for we need not reckon the waiting maid or the little negro boy. Good morning, countess, said the king, kissing Madame Dewberry's hand. Ha! Fresh as any rose, I see. Good morning, Sardens. Is this your cabinet, where you write your dispatches? Heavens! What heaps of papers! Hide them, hide them! Ha! What a beautiful fountain, Countess! And, with the versatile curiosity of one always in search of something to amuse him, he fixed his eyes on a large china ornament which had been brought in since the evening before and placed in a corner of the Countess's bedroom. 
Sire, replied the Countess, it is a Chinese fountain, by turning this cock, the water comes out, and makes these birds sing and these fishes swim, then the doors of the pagoda open, and there comes out a procession of mandarins. Very pretty. Very pretty, indeed. At this moment the little negro walked across the room, dressed in the fantastic fashion in which, at this period, they dressed their Osmonds and Othellos. He wore a little turban, ornamented with a lofty plume of feathers, on one side of his head, a vest embroidered with gold, which permitted his ebony arms to be seen, and slashed breeches of white brocaded satin. Round his waist was a scarf of various bright colors, which connected the breeches with a richly embroidered jacket, and a dagger, ornamented with precious stones, was stuck in the scarf bound around his waist. Pest! cried the king, how splendid Zamor is today. The negro stopped to admire himself before a mirror. Sire, he has a favor to ask of your majesty. Madam, replied the king, with a courtly smile, I am afraid Zamor is very ambitious. How so, sire? Because he has already been granted the greatest favor he can desire. What is that? The same that has been granted me. I do not understand you, sir. You have made him your slave. Oh, how charming, sire! cried the countess. The minister of police bowed in assent, and bit his lip to prevent himself from smiling. But, asked the king, what can Zamor desire? The reward of his long and numerous services. Yes, he is twelve years old. His long and numerous future services. Oh, very well. Yes, indeed, sire, past services have been rewarded long enough, it is now time to begin and reward future ones. There would not then be so much ingratitude. Ha! Not a bad idea, said the king. What do you think of it, Sartans? That it would benefit all devoted servants of your majesty, sire, therefore, I support it. Well, countess, what does Zamor want? Sire, you know my little country seat of Luciennes. I have merely heard it spoken of. It is your own fault, I have invited you to it a hundred times. You know the etiquette, dear Countess, unless on a journey the king can only sleep in a royal chateau. And for that very reason I wish you to make Luciennes a royal chateau, and Zamor its governor. But, Countess, that would be a burlesque. I love burlesques, sire. The governors of the other castles would all exclaim, and this time with reason. Let them exclaim, they have often done so without reason kneel down, some more. The little fellow knelt. For what is he kneeling, asked the king. For the reward you are going to give him for bearing my train, and putting all the prudes of the court in a rage. He is really a hideous creature, said the king, bursting into a fit of laughter. Rise, Zamor, said the countess, you are appointed governor of Luciennes. But, indeed, madam. I shall send Zamor all the writings necessary for his governorship. And now, sire, you may come to Luciennes, you have one more royal chateau from this day. Is there any way of refusing her anything, Sartans? There may be a way, sire, replied Sartans, but it has not yet been discovered. And if it should be found out, sire, there is one thing certain, it is Monsieur de Sartans who will be the discoverer. How can you think so, madam? Asked Sartans, trembling. Sire, only imagine that I have requested a favor of Monsieur de Sartans for three months past, and it is not. Yet granted. And what is it? Asked the king. Oh, he knows very well. I, I swear to you, madam. Does it fall under the duties of his office? Yes, either in his or those of his successor. Madam, cried Sartans, you really make me uneasy. What is the request, again inquired the king. To find me a sorcerer. Sartans breathed more freely. To burn him, said the king. It is rather too hot, countess, wait till the winter. No, sir, I wish to present him with a golden wand. Then the sorcerer foretold you some misfortune which has not befallen you. On the contrary, sire, 
he predicted a piece of good fortune which has come to pass. Let us hear it, then, Countess, said the king, throwing himself back in an armchair, like one who was not quite sure whether the tale would tire him or amuse him, but who must run the chance. With all my heart. But if I tell the tale, you must contribute the half of the sorcerer's reward. The whole, if you like. Royally said. Now, listen. I am all attention. There was once. It begins like a fairy tale. It is one, sire. Delightful. I love enchanters. There was once a poor young girl, who, at the time my story commences, had neither page, nor carriage, nor negro, nor parrot, nor monkey. Nor king, added Louis. Oh, sire. And what did your poor young girl do? She trotted about through the streets of Paris like any other common mortal, only she always went very quick, for it was said she was pretty, and she was afraid of meeting some rude man. The young girl was a Lucretia, eh? Oh, your majesty knows there have been no Lucretias since the year, I don't know what, of the foundation of Rome. Oh, heavens I countess, are you going to become learned? No, if I were learned, I should have given you a wrong date. Now, I gave you none. True, said the king, go on. The young girl one day was trotting along, as usual, when all at once, while crossing the Tilleries, she discovered that a man was following her. Oh, the deuce! Then she stopped, I presume. Ah, sire, what a bad opinion you have of women. It is easy to see you have only associated with marchionesses and duchesses. And princesses, eh? I am too polite to contradict your majesty. But what frightened the young girl was, that a fog came on which became every moment denser. Sartans, do you know what causes fogs? The minister, thus taken unawares, started. Ma foi. No, sire. Nor I. Well, go on, dear countess. She ran as fast as she could, passed through the gate, and found herself in the square which bears your majesty's name when she found the unknown, from whom she thought she had escaped, face to face with her. She uttered a cry. Was he so very ugly, then? No, sire, he was a handsome young man of six or eight and twenty, of a dark complexion, with large, speaking eyes, and a pleasing voice. And the heroine was afraid? Pest! How easily she was frightened! She was not quite so much so when she looked at him, still, it was not a pleasant situation in that dense fog. So, clasping her hands, she said, I implore you, sir, not to do me any harm. The unknown shook his head, smiled, and replied, Heaven is my witness, I have no evil intentions toward you. What, then, do you want? I asked. To obtain a promise from you. What can I promise you, sir? Promise to grant me the first favor I shall ask when, when, repeated the young girl likewise. When you are queen. And what did the young girl do, said the king? Sire, she thought it would be engaging herself to nothing. So she promised. And what became of the sorcerer? He disappeared. And Sartans refuses to find him. He is wrong. Sire, I do not refuse, but I cannot find him. Oh, sir, said the countess, those words, cannot, should never be in the dictionary of the police. Madam, we are on his track. Yes, what you always say when you are baffled. It is the truth. But consider what trivial directions you have given. How, trivial? Young, handsome, dark complexion, black hair, splendid eyes, a pleasing voice. Oh, the devil! How you speak of him, Countess. Sartans, I forbid you to find that young man, said the king. You are wrong, sire, for I only wish to ask one simple question. Is it about yourself? Yes. Well, what is it? His prediction is accomplished. Do you think so? Yes. You are queen. Very nearly. What has the sorcerer, then, to tell you more? He has to tell me when the queen will be presented. 
that is no concern of his. And the king made a grimace which showed that he thought they were getting on dangerous ground. And whose concern is it? Your own. Mine. Yes, you must find a lady to present you. Oh, very likely, among the prudes of the court. Your majesty knows they are all sold to Choiseul and Praslin. What? Was there not an agreement made between us that the ministers should never be named here? I did not promise, sire. Well, I request you to leave them in their places, and keep your own place. Believe me, the best is yours. Alas I then, for foreign affairs and the navy. Countess, interrupted the king, in heaven's name, no politics. At this moment Doré entered, and whispered a word or two in her mistress's ear. Oh, certainly, certainly, cried she. What is it? asked the king. Chan, sire, who has just returned from a journey, and wishes to pay her respects to your majesty. Let her come in, let her come in. Indeed, for some days past, I felt that I wanted something, without knowing exactly what it was. Thanks, sire, said Chan, as she entered, then, going up to her sister, she whispered, it is all settled. The countess uttered an exclamation of joy. Well, what now? asked the king. Nothing, sire. I am only glad to see her again. I am glad, too. How do you do, little Chan? May I say a word or two, sire, to my sister? Yes, yes, my child, and while you are talking together, I shall ask Sartans where you have been. Sire, said the minister, wishing to avoid being questioned on that point, may I beg your majesty to allow me a few moments on business of the utmost importance. Oh, I have very little time now, Monsieur de Sartans, said the king, beginning to yawn. Only two words, your majesty. About what? About those people with the second sight, these Illuminati, these workers of miracles. Who? Jugglers. Give them permission to exercise their trade, and there will be nothing to fear from them. The matter is more serious than your majesty supposes. Every day we have new Masonic lodges formed. They are now a powerful sect, attracting to them all the enemies of monarchy, the philosophers, the encyclopedists. Voltaire is to be received by them in great state. He. He is dying. He, sire. Oh, no, sire, he is not such a fool. He has confessed. Merely a trick. In the habit of a capuchin. That was an impiety, sire. But with regard to these Freemasons, they are always active, they write, they talk, they form associations, correspond with foreign countries. They intrigue, they threaten, even now they are full of expectation of a great chief or head of the whole body, as I have learned from some words which escaped from one of their number. Well, Sartans, when this chief comes, catch him and put him in the Bastille, and the whole affair is settled. Sire, these persons have great resources. Have they greater than you, sir, who have the whole police of a large kingdom? Your Majesty was induced to expel the Jesuits, it was the philosophers whom you should have expelled. Come, come, no more about those poor quill drivers. Sire, those quills are dangerous which are cut by the penknife of Damien's. Louis the Fifteenth Turned pale. These philosophers, sire, whom you despise. Well, sir. Will destroy the monarchy, sire. How long will they take to do that? Sardin stared at his coolness. How can I tell, sire? Perhaps fifteen, twenty, or thirty years. Well, my dear friend, in fifteen or twenty years I shall be no more so talk of all these things to my successor. And the king turned to Madame. Dewberry, who, seeming to have waited for this movement, said, with a heavy sigh. Oh, heavens! What is it you tell me, Chan? Yes, what is it? asked the king, for you both looked very wretched. Oh, sire, there is good cause for it. Speak. Let me hear what has happened. My poor brother. Poor Jean. Do you think it must be cut off? 
they hope not. Cut off, what, asked the king. His arm, sire. Cut off the viscount's arm. Why, pray? Because he has been seriously wounded. Wounded in the arm. Oh, yes, sire. I, in some drunken squabble, in a filthy tavern. No, sire, on the highway. But how did that happen? It happened because an enemy wished to assassinate him, sire. Ah, the poor viscount, exclaimed the king, who had very little feeling for the sufferings of others, although he could look wonderfully compassionate. But to assassinate him. This is a serious matter, is it not, Sardens? The minister looked much less moved than the king, but was, in reality, a great deal more uneasy on the subject. He drew near the sisters. Can it be possible? Asked he, anxiously, that such a misfortune has occurred. Oh, yes, sir, it is but too possible, said Chan, very mournfully. Assassinated? But how? He was waylaid. Waylaid? Ha! Sartans, this is an affair for you, said the king. Relate all the circumstances, madam, said the minister, and do not, I entreat you, allow your just resentment to exaggerate them. We shall, by being strictly just, be most severe. And, where things are looked at closely and coolly, they are often not so very serious as we at first apprehended. Oh, cried Chan, this is not an affair which has been related to me. I saw the whole. Well, but what did you see, Chan? inquired the king. I saw a man fall on my brother, and, having forced him to draw in self-defense, wound him shockingly. Was the man alone? asked Sartans. No, indeed, he had six others with him. The poor viscount. Said the king, looking at the countess, that he might know exactly what degree of grief to exhibit. Forced to fight. Poor fellow. But, seeing that she did not relish this pleasantry, and he was wounded, he added, in a compassionate voice. But how did the quarrel come about, asked the minister of police, trying, if it were possible, to betray her into telling the truth. Oh, in the most trifling way in the world. All about post-horses which I wanted in order to hasten back to my sister, as I had promised to be with her this morning. Ha! Sartans, this merits punishment, does it not, said the king. It does, sire, and I shall take all the necessary information on the subject. What was the name of the aggressor, madam, his condition, his rank? His rank? He is a military man, an officer in the bodyguard of the Dauphin, I think. As to his name, he is called Baverny, Faverny, Taverny, yes, Taverny, that is it. Madam, tomorrow he shall sleep in the Bastille. Oh, no, said the Countess, who until now had very diplomatically kept silence, oh, no. Why, oh, no? Asked the King, why should not the fellow be imprisoned? You know I detest the military. And I repeat, sire, said the Countess, doggedly, that I am quite sure nothing will be done to the man who assassinated the Viscount. Ha! Countess, this is very curious. Explain it, if you please. That is easily done, he will be protected. And who will protect him? The person at whose instigation he acted. And that person will protect him against us. Oh, that is rather too much, Countess. Madam, stammered the Count de Sartens, for he felt that a blow was coming, and he was not prepared to ward it off. Yes, exclaimed the Countess. He will be protected against you, and there will be nothing said. Do you suppose you are the master, sire? The king felt the blow which the minister had foreseen, and he determined to bear it. I see that you are going to plunge into politics, said he, and find out some reasons of state for a paltry duel. There, now. You abandon me already. The assassination has become nothing but a duel, now that you suspect the quarter whence it comes. So. I am in for it. Said the king, going to the great Chinese fountain, turning the cock, and making the birds sing, the fishes swim, and the mandarins come out. 
and you don't know who aimed this blow? Asked the countess, pulling the ears of Zamor, who was lying at her feet. No, on my word, said the king. Or suspect. I swear I don't. Do you, countess? No, I don't suspect, I know positively. I am going to tell you, and it will be no news to you, I am certain. Countess, countess, do you know that in what you said you gave the lie to your king, and Louis tried to look dignified? Sire, I know I am a little warm, but if you think I shall quietly allow my brother to be killed by the Duc de Choiseau. Yes, there it is, Choiseau again. Exclaimed the king, in a loud voice, as if he had not expected this name, which for the last ten minutes he had been dreading. Well, it is because your majesty is determined not to see that he is my worst enemy. But I see it plainly, for he does not even take the trouble to hide his hatred from me. He is far from hating any one to that degree that he would cause him to be assassinated. There, you see, when Choiseul is mentioned, you are on his side immediately. Now, my dear Countess, politics again. Oh, Monsieur de Sartens, cried she, is it not dreadful to be treated thus? No, no. If it be as you think. I know what I think, she interrupted, passionately, and what I am sure of, the affair will be given up. Now, do not get angry, Countess, said the King, it shall not be given up. You shall be defended, and so well. So well, what? So well that he who attacked poor Jean shall pay dearly for it. Yes, the instrument will be broken, but the hand that directed it will be taken and kindly pressed. Well, but is it not right to punish this Monsieur Taverny, who actually committed the assault? Oh, certainly. But it is not right that what you do for me is no more than would be done to a soldier who should give a blow to a shopkeeper at the theater. I will not be treated like every common person. If you do not do more for those whom you love than for those who are indifferent to you, I had rather remain alone in obscurity like these latter, their relations, at least, are not assassinated. Oh, Countess! said the king, imploringly, I got up for once in such good spirits, disposed to be gay, happy, and pleased with every one, and now you are spoiling my morning completely. Very fine, indeed. It is a delightful morning for me, of course, when my relations are being massacred. The king, in spite of his internal fears of the terrible storm that was gathering, could not help smiling at the word, massacred. The countess started up in a towering passion. Ah, is that the way you pity me, said she. Now, now, do not get angry. Yes, I will get angry. You are very wrong, you look lovely when you smile, but really ugly in a passion. What matters it to me how I look, when my beauty does not prevent me from being sacrificed to state intrigues? Now, my dear Countess. No, no. Choose between me and Choiseau. Dear creature, it is impossible to choose, you are both necessary to me. Well, then, I shall retire and leave the field to my enemies, I shall die of grief, but the Duc de Choiseau will be satisfied, and that will console you. I swear to you, Countess, that he has not any dislike to you, on the contrary, he admires you. He is an excellent man, after all, added the king, in a louder tone, that the minister of police might hear him. An excellent man. Sire, you wish to drive me to desperation. An excellent man, who causes people to be assassinated. Mere suspicion, said the king. And, besides, Sartans ventured to say, a quarrel, a duel between military men is so common, so natural. Ha! Monsieur de Sartans, and are you also against me, cried the countess. The minister of police understood this too quoque, and retreated before her anger. There was a moment of deep and ominous silence. Ah! Chan, said the king, in the midst of the general consternation, you see your handiwork. Your Majesty will pardon me, said she, if the grief of the sister has made me forget for a moment my duty as a subject. Kind creature! murmured the king. Come, Countess, forget and forgive. Yes, sire, I shall forgive, 
only I shall set out for Lucien's, and thence for Boulogne. Boulogne sur mer, asked the king. Yes, sire. I shall quit a kingdom where the king is afraid of his minister. Madam, exclaimed Louis, with an offended air. Sire, that I may not any longer be wanting in respect to you, permit me to retire. And the countess rose, observing with the corner of her eyes what effect her movement had produced. The king gave his usual heavy sigh of weariness, which said plainly, Lamb getting rather tired of this. Chan understood what the sigh meant, and saw that it would be dangerous to push matters to extremity. She caught her sister by the gown, and approaching the king. Sire, said she, my sister's affection for the poor Viscount has carried her too far. It is I who have committed the fault, it is I who must repair it. As the humblest of your majesty's subjects, I beg from your majesty justice for my brother. I accuse nobody, your wisdom will discover the guilty. Why, that is precisely what I wish myself, said the king, that justice should be done. If a man have not committed a certain crime, let him not be reproached with it, but if he have, let him be punished. And Louis looked toward the countess as he spoke, with the hope of once more catching the hopes he had entertained of an amusing morning, a morning which seemed turning out so dismally. The good-natured countess could not help pitying the king, whose want of occupation and emptiness of mind made him feel tired and dispirited except when with her. She turned half round, for she had already made a step toward the door, and said, with the sweetest submission, Do I wish for anything but justice? Only let not my well-grounded suspicions be cruelly repulsed. Your suspicions are sacred to me, Countess, cried the king, and if they be changed into certainty, you shall see. But now I think of it, how easy to know the truth I let the Duc de Choiseul be sent for. Oh, your majesty knows that he never comes into these apartments. He would scorn to do so. His sister, however, is not of his mind, she wishes for nothing better than to be here. The king laughed. The countess, encouraged by this, went on, the Duc de Choiseul apes the Dauphin, he will not compromise his dignity. The Dauphin is religious, countess. And the Duke a hypocrite, sire. I promise you, my dear countess, you shall see him here, for I shall summon him. He must come, as it is on state business, and we shall have all explained in Chan's presence, who saw all, we shall confront them, as the lawyers say. Eh, Sardens. Let someone go for the Duc de Choiseul. And let someone bring me my monkey. Doré, my monkey, cried the countess. These words, which were addressed to the waiting maid, who was arranging a dressing box, could be heard in the anteroom when the door was opened to dispatch the usher for the prime minister, and they were responded to by a broken, lisping voice. The countess's monkey. That must be me. I hasten to present myself. And with these words entered a little hunchback, dressed with the utmost splendor. The Duc de Tresums, said the countess, annoyed by his appearance. I did not summon you, Duke. You asked for your monkey, madam, said the Duke, bowing to the king, the countess, and the minister, and seeing among the courtiers no ape half so ugly as myself, I hastened to obey your call. And the Duke laughed, showing his great teeth so oddly that the countess could not help laughing also. Shall I stay? asked the Duke, as if the whole life could not repay the favor. Ask his majesty, Duke. He is master here. The duke turned to the king, with the air of a suppliant. Yes, stay, duke, stay, said the king, glad to find any additional means of amusement. At this moment the usher threw open the doors. Oh, said the king, with a slight expression of dissatisfaction on his face, is it the duc de Choiseul already? No, sire, replied the usher, it is Monseigneur the Dauphin who desires to speak to you. The countess almost started from her chair with joy, for she imagined the dauphin was going to become her friend, but Chan, who was more clear-sighted, frowned. Well, where is the dauphin? asked the king, impatiently. In your majesty's apartments, his royal highness awaits your return. It is fated I shall never have a minute's repose, grumbled the king. Then, all at once remembering that the audience demanded by the dauphin might spare him the scene with them. 
De Choiseau, he thought better of it. I am coming, said he, I am coming. Goodbye, Countess. See how I am dragged in all directions. But will your majesty go just when the Duc de Choiseau is coming? What can I do? The first slave is the king. Oh, if those rogues of philosophers knew what it is to be a king. But, above all, a king of trance. But, sire, you can stay. Oh, I must not keep the dauphin waiting. People say already that I have no affection except for my daughters. But what shall I say to the duke? Oh, tell him to come to my apartments, countess. And, to put an end to any further remonstrance, he kissed her hand and disappeared, running, as was his habit whenever he feared to lose a victory gained by his temporizing policy and his petty cunning. The countess trembled with passion, and clasping her hands, she exclaimed, So, he has escaped once more. But the king did not hear those words. The door was already closed behind him, and he passed through the anteroom, saying to the courtiers, Go in, gentlemen, go in, the countess will see you. But you will find her very dull on account of the accident which has befallen poor Viscount Jean. The courtiers looked at one another in amazement, for they had not heard of the accident. Many hoped that the Viscount was dead, but all put on countenances suitable to the occasion. Those who were best pleased looked the most sympathetic, and they entered. XXV The Saloon of Timepieces In that large hall of the Palace of Versailles which was called the Saloon of Timepieces, a young man walked slowly up and down with his arms hanging and his head bent forward. He appeared to be about seventeen years of age, was of a fair complexion, and his eyes were mild in their expression, but it must be acknowledged that there was a slight degree of vulgarity in his demeanor. On his breast sparkled a diamond star, rendered more brilliant by the dark, violet-colored velvet of his coat, and his white satin waistcoat, embroidered with silver, was crossed by the blue ribbon supporting the cross of St. Louis. None could mistake in this young man the profile so expressive of dignity and kindliness which formed the characteristic type of the elder branch of the House of Bourbon, of which he was at once the most striking and most exaggerated image. In fact, Louis Augustus, Duc de Berry, Dauphin of France, afterward Louis XVI, had the Bourbon nose even longer and more aquiline than in his predecessors. His forehead was lower and more retreating than Louis XV's, and the double chin of his grandfather was so remarkable in him, that, although he was at the time we speak of young and thin, his chin formed nearly one-third of the length of his face. Although well made, there was something embarrassed in the movement of his legs and shoulders, and his walk was slow and rather awkward. Suppleness, activity, and strength seemed centered only in his arms, and more particularly in his fingers, which displayed, as it were, that character which in other persons is expressed on the forehead, in the mouth, and in the eyes. The dauphin continued to pace in silence the saloon of timepieces, the same in which, eight years before, Louis XV. had given to Madame de Pompadour the decree of the Parliament exiling the Jesuits from the kingdom, and as he walked he seemed plunged in reverie. At last, however, he seemed to become impatient of waiting there alone, and to amuse himself he began to look at the timepieces, remarking, as Charles V had done, the differences which are found in the most regular clocks. These differences are a singular but decided manifestation of the inequality existing in all material things, whether regulated or not regulated by the hand of man. He stopped before the large clock at the lower end of the saloon, the same place it occupies at present, which, by a clever arrangement of machinery, marks the days, the months, the years, the phases of the moon. The course of the planets, in short, exhibiting, to the still more curious machine called man, all that is most interesting in his progressive movement through life to death. The prince examined this clock with the eye of an amateur, and leaned now to the right, now to the left, to examine the movement of such or such a wheel. Then he returned to his place in front, watching how the second hand glided rapidly on, like those flies which, with their long, slender legs, skim over the surface of a pond, without disturbing the liquid crystal of its waters. This contemplation naturally led him to think that a very great number of seconds had passed since he had been waiting there. It is true, also, 
that many had passed before he had ventured to send to inform the king that he was waiting for him. All at once the hand on which the young prince's eyes were fixed, stopped as if by enchantment, the wheels ceased their measured rotation, the springs became still, and deep silence took possession of the machine. But a moment before so full of noise and motion. No more ticking, no more oscillations, no more movement of the wheels or of the hands. The timepiece had died. Had some grain of sand, some atom, penetrated into one of the wheels and stopped its movements? Or was the genius of the machine resting, wearied with its eternal agitation? Surprised by this sudden death, this stroke of apoplexy occurring before his eyes, the dauphin forgot why he had come thither, and how long he had waited. Above all, he forgot that hours are not counted in eternity by the beating of metal upon metal, nor arrested even for a moment in their course by the hindrance of any wheel, but that they are recorded on the dial of eternity. Established even before the birth of worlds, by the unchangeable hand of the Almighty. He therefore opened the glass door of the crystal pagoda, the genius of which had ceased to act, and put his head inside to examine the timepiece more closely. But the large pendulum was in his way. He slipped in his supple fingers and took it off. This was not enough. The dauphin still found the cause of the lethargy of the machine hidden from him. He then supposed that the person who had the care of the clocks of the palace had forgotten to wind up this timepiece, and he took down the key from a hook and began to wind it up, like a man quite accustomed to the business. But he could only turn it three times, a proof that something was astray in the mechanism. He drew from his pocket a little file, and with the end of it pushed one of the wheels, they all creaked for half a second, then stopped again. The malady of the clock was becoming serious. The dauphin, therefore, began carefully to unscrew several parts of it, laying them all in order on a console beside him. Then, drawn on by his ardor, he began to take to pieces still more and more of the complicated machine, and to search minutely into its hidden and mysterious recesses. Suddenly he uttered a cry of joy, he discovered that a screw which acted on one of the springs had become loose, and had thus impeded the movement of the motive wheel. He immediately began to screw it. And then, with a wheel in his left hand, and his little file in his right, he plunged his head again into the interior of the clock. He was busy at his work, absorbed in contemplation of the mechanism of the timepiece, when a door opened, and a voice announced, The King. But the dauphin heard nothing but the melodious sound of that ticking, which his hand had again awakened, as if it were the beating of a heart which a clever physician had restored to life. The king looked around on all sides, and it was some minutes before he discovered the dauphin, whose head was hidden in the opening, and whose legs alone were visible. He approached, smiling, and tapped his grandson on the shoulder. What the devil are you doing there, said he. The dauphin drew out his head quickly, but at the same time with all the care necessary to avoid doing any harm to the beautiful object which he had undertaken to mend. Sire, your majesty sees, replied the young man, blushing at being surprised in the midst of his occupation, I was amusing myself until you came. Yes, in destroying my clock, a very pretty amusement. Oh, no, sire, I was mending it. The principal wheel would not move, it was prevented by this screw. I have tightened the screw, and now it goes. But you will blind yourself with looking into that thing. I would not put my head into such a trap for all the gold in the world. Oh, it will do me no harm, sire, I understand all about it. I always take to pieces, clean, and put together again that beautiful watch which your majesty gave me on my fourteenth birthday. Very well. But stop now, if you please, and leave your mechanics. You wish to speak to me? I, sire, said the young man, coloring again. Of course, since you sent to say you were waiting for me. It is true, sire, replied the dauphin, with downcast eyes. Well, what is it? Answer me, if it is of no importance, I must go, for I am just setting off for Marley. Louis the Fifteenth, as was his custom, already sought to escape. The dauphin placed his wheel and his file on the chair, which indicated that he had really something important to say, since he interrupted his important work for it. Do you want money? asked the king, sharply, if so, 
I shall send you some. And he made a step toward the door. Oh, no, sire, I have still a thousand crowns remaining of the sum I received last month. What economy, said the king, and how well Monsieur de la Vaudue has educated him. I think he has precisely all the virtues I have not. The young prince made a violent effort over himself. Sire, said he, is the Dauphiness yet very far distant? Do you not know as well as I how far off she is, replied the king. I stammered out the Dauphin. Of course, you heard the account of her journey yesterday. Last Monday she was at Nancy, and she ought to be now about forty-five leagues from Paris. Sire, does not your majesty think her royal highness travels rather slowly? By no means, replied the king, I think she travels very fast for a woman, and then you know there are receptions and rejoicings on the road. She travels at least ten leagues every two days, one with another. I think very little, sir, said the Dauphin, timidly. Louis the Fifteenth was more and more astonished at the appearance of impatience which he had been far from suspecting. Come, come. Said he, smiling slyly, don't be impatient, your Dauphiness will arrive soon. Sire, might not these ceremonies on the road be shortened, continued the Dauphin. Impossible. She has already passed through two or three towns where she should have made a stay, without stopping. But these delays will be eternal, and then, sire, I think, besides, said the Dauphin, still more timidly. Well, what do you think? Let me hear it, speak. I think that the service is badly performed. How? What service? The service for the journey. Nonsense. I sent thirty thousand horses to be ready on the road, thirty carriages, sixty wagons, I don't know how many carts. If carts, carriages, and horses were put in file, they would reach from this to Strasbourg. How can you say, then, there is bad attendance on the road? Well, sire, in spite of all your majesty's goodness, I am almost certain that what I say is true. But perhaps I have used an improper term, and instead of badly performed I should have said badly arranged. The king raised his head and fixed his eyes on the dauphin. He began to comprehend that more was meant than met the ear, in the few words which his royal highness had ventured to utter. Thirty thousand horses, he repeated, thirty carriages, sixty wagons, two regiments. I ask you, Mr. Philosopher, have you ever heard of a Dauphiness entering France with such an attendance as that before? I confess, sire, that things have been royally done, and as your majesty alone knows how to do them. But has your majesty specially recommended that these horses and carriages should be employed solely for her royal highness and her train? The king looked at his grandson for the third time. A vague suspicion began to sting him, a slight remembrance to illuminate his mind, and a sort of confused analogy between what the dauphin was saying and a disagreeable circumstance of late occurrence began to suggest itself to him. A fine question, said he, certainly everything has been ordered for her royal highness, and for her alone, and there, I repeat, she cannot fail to arrive very soon. But why do you look at me in that way? Added he, in a decided tone, which to the dauphin seemed even threatening. Are you amusing yourself in studying my features as you study the springs of your mechanical works? The dauphin had opened his mouth to speak, but became silent at this address. Very well, said the king, sharply, it appears you have no more to say. Hey! Are you satisfied now? Your dauphiness will arrive soon. All is arranged delightfully for her on the road. You are as rich as Croesus with your own private purse, and now, since your mind is at ease, be good enough to put my clock in order again. The dauphin did not stir. Do you know, said the king, laughing, I have a great mind to make you the principal watchmaker for the palace, with a good salary. The dauphin looked down, and, intimidated by the king's look, took up the wheel and file which he had laid on the chair. The king, in the meantime, had quietly gained the door. What the devil, said he, looking at him, did he mean with his badly arranged service? Well, well. I have escaped another scene, 
for he is certainly dissatisfied about something. In fact, the dauphin, generally so patient, had stamped with his foot as the king turned away from him. He is commencing again, murmured the king, laughing, dash, decidedly I have nothing for it but to fly. But just as he opened the door, he saw, on the threshold, the Duc de Choiseul, who bowed profoundly. XX via the court of King Patod. The king made a step backward at the sight of this new actor in the scene, come, no doubt, to prevent him from escaping as he had hoped. Ha, thought he, I had forgotten him. But he is welcome, and I will make him pay for what the others have made me suffer. Ha! You are there, cried he, I sent for you, did you know that? Yes, sire, replied the minister, coldly. I was dressing to wait on your majesty when your orders reached me. I wish to speak to you on serious matters, said the king, frowning in order, if possible, to intimidate his minister. Unfortunately for the king, M. De Choiseul was one of the men least likely to be daunted in his dominions. And I, also, if it please your majesty, said he, bowing, I have serious matters to speak of. At the same time he exchanged a look with the dauphin, who was still half hidden by the clock. The king stopped short. Ha, thought he, now I am caught between two fires, there is no escape. You know, I presume, said the king, hastily, in order to have the first word, that poor Viscount Jean has had a narrow escape from assassination, that is to say, that he has received a wound in his arm. I came to speak of that affair to your majesty. I understand, you wish to prevent unpleasant reports. I wished, sire, to anticipate all remarks. Then you know the whole particulars, sir, inquired the king, in a significant manner. Perfectly. Ha, huh, said the king, I was told so in a place likely to be well informed. The Duke of Choiseul seemed quite unmoved. The dauphin continued turning the screw in the clock, his head bent down, but he lost not a syllable of the conversation. I shall now tell you how the affair happened, said the king. Does your majesty think that you have been well informed? Asked them, the Choiseul. Oh, as to that. We are all attention. Sire. We, repeated the king. Yes, His Royal Highness the Dauphin and I. His Royal Highness the Dauphin. Repeated the king, turning his eyes from the respectful Choiseul to the attentive Louis Augustus, and pray in what does this squabble concern His Royal Highness. It concerns His Royal Highness, said the Duke, bowing to the young prince, because Her Royal Highness the Dauphiness was the cause of it. The Dauphiness the cause, said the king, starting. Certainly. If you are ignorant of that, sir, your majesty has been very badly informed. The Dauphiness and Jean Dewberry, said the king, this is likely to be a curious tale. Come, explain this, Monsieur de Choiseul. Conceal nothing, even though it were the Dauphiness herself who pierced Dewberry's arm. Sire, it was not the Dauphiness, replied Choiseul, still calm and unmoved, it was one of the gentlemen of her escort. Ali, said the king, again becoming grave, an officer whom you know. No, sire, but an officer whom your majesty ought to know, if you remember all who have served you well, an officer whose father's name was honored at Philipsburg, at Fontenoy, at Mahone, a taverny maison rouge. The dauphin seemed to draw a deeper breath, as if to inhale this name, and thus preserve it in his memory. A Maison Rouge, said the king, certainly I know the name. And why did he attack Jean, whom I like so much? Perhaps because I like him. Such absurd jealousies. Such discontents are almost seditious. Sire, will your majesty deign to listen to me, said M. de Choiseul. The king saw there was no other way for him to escape from this troublesome business but by getting in a passion, and he exclaimed, I tell you, sir, that I see the beginning of a conspiracy against my peace, an organized persecution of my family. Ah, sire, said M. de Choiseul, is it for defending I the Dauphiness, your majesty's daughter-in-law, that these reproaches are cast on a brave young man? The Dauphin raised his head and folded his arms. 
For my part, said he, I cannot but feel grateful to the man who exposed his life for a princess who in a fortnight will be my wife. Exposed his life. Exposed his life, stammered the king. What about? Let me know that, what about? About the horses of Her Royal Highness the Dauphiness, replied the Duke. Viscount Jean Dubarry, who was already travelling very fast, took upon him to insist on having sent of those horses which were appropriated to the use of Her Royal Highness, no doubt that he might get on still faster. The king bit his lip and changed colour, the threatening phantom from which he had so lately hoped to escape now reappeared in all its horrors. It is not possible, murmured he, to gain time. I know the whole affair. You have been misinformed, Duke. No, sire, I have not been misinformed, what I have the honour to tell your majesty is the simple truth. Viscount Jean Dubarry offered an insult to the Dauphiness by insisting on taking for his use horses appointed for her service. After having ill-treated the master of the posthouse, he was going to take them by force, when the Chevalier Philip de Taverny arrived, sent forward by Her Royal Highness to have horses in readiness for her. And after he had several times summoned him in a friendly and conciliating manner. Oh, oh! grumbled the king. I repeat, sir, after he had several times, in a friendly and conciliating manner, summoned the Viscount to desist, he was at length obliged to draw his sword. Yes, said the Dauphin, I pledge myself for the truth of what the Duke asserts. Then you also know of this affair, said the king, exceedingly surprised. I know all the circumstances perfectly, sire, replied the Dauphin. The minister bowed, delighted at having such a supporter. Will your royal highness deign to proceed, said he. His majesty will doubtless have more confidence in the assertions of his august son than in mine. Yes, sire, continued the Dauphin, without testifying for the Duc de Choiseul's zeal in his cause all that gratitude which might have been expected. Yes, sire, know the circumstances, and I had come to tell your majesty that Viscount Dubarry has not only insulted the Dauphiness in interfering with the arrangements made for her journey, but he has also insulted me in opposing a gentleman of my regiment, who was doing his duty. The king shook his head. We must inquire, said he, we must inquire. I have already inquired, sir, said the Dauphin, gently, and have no doubt in the matter, the Viscount drew his sword on my officer. Did he draw first? Asked the king, happy to seize any chance of putting his adversary in fault. The Dauphin coloured, and looked to the minister for assistance. Sire, said the latter, swords were crossed by two men, one of whom was insulting, the other defending, the Dauphiness, that is all. Yes, but which was the aggressor, asked the king. I know poor Jean, he is as gentle as a lamb. The aggressor, in my opinion, sire, said the Dauphin, with his usual mildness, is he who is in the wrong. It is a delicate matter to decide, replied the king, the aggressor he who in is the wrong. In the wrong? But if the officer was insolent? Insolent, cried the Duc de Choiseul, insolent toward a man who wanted to take by force horses sent there for the use of the Dauphiness. Is it possible you can think so, sire? The Dauphin turned pale, but said nothing. The king saw that he was between two fires. I should say warm, perhaps, not insolent, said he. But your majesty knows, said the minister, taking advantage of the king's having yielded a step to make a step forward, your majesty knows that a zealous servant never can be in the wrong. Oh, perhaps. But how did you become acquainted with this event, sir, said he, turning sharply to the Dauphin, without ceasing, however, to observe the Duke, who endeavoured vainly to hide the embarrassment which this sudden question caused him. By a letter, sire, replied the Dauphin. A letter from whom? A letter from a person concerned for Her Royal Highness the Dauphiness, and who thinks it singular that any one should dare to affront her. Ha! cried the king, more mysteries, secret correspondences, plots. Every one is beginning again to plan annoyances for me, as in the time of the Marchioness de Pompadour. No, sire, said the minister. This affair is no plot, and can be settled very simply. 
it is the crime of treason in the second degree. Let the guilty person be punished, and all will be settled. At this word, punished, Louis XV. Saw in fancy the Countess furious, and Chan in a rage, he saw peace flying from his dwelling, peace which he had been seeking all his life, but had never been able to find. An intestine war with crooked nails and eyes red with tears entering in her stead. Punished, cried he, without the accused having been heard. Without knowing which side is in the right. You make a very extraordinary proposal to me, Duke, you wish to draw odium on me. But, sire, who will henceforward respect Her Royal Highness the Dauphiness if a severe example is not made of the person who first insulted her? Certainly, sire, added the Dauphin, it would be a scandal. An example? A scandal? cried the king. Mordu. If I make an example of all the scandalous things that go on around me, I may pass my life in signing arrests for the Bastille. I have signed enough of them as it is, heaven knows. In this case it is necessary, sire, said the duke. Sire, I entreat your majesty, said the dauphin. What, do you not think him punished already, by the wound he has received? No, sire, for he might have wounded the Chevalier de Taverny. And in such a case, what would you have done? I should have demanded his head. But that was only what was done in the case of Monsieur de Montgomery, for killing King Henry II, said the king. He killed the king by accident, sire. Viscount Dubarry insulted the Dauphiness intentionally. And you, sir, said the king, turning to the Dauphin, do you wish to have Jean's head? No, sir, I am not in favor of the punishment of death, as your majesty knows. I shall merely demand from you the Viscount's banishment. The king started up. Banishment for a tavern quarrel. Louis, you are severe, notwithstanding your philanthropical notions. It is true that before becoming philanthropist you were a mathematician, and. Will your majesty deign to proceed? A mathematician would sacrifice the universe to his problem. Sire, said the Dauphin, I have no ill will toward Viscount Dubarry, personally. With whom, then, are you angry? With the insuder of Her Royal Highness the Dauphiness. What a model for husbands, cried the king, ironically. But I am not so easy of belief. I see very well who is attacked under all this, I see to what people would lead me with their exaggerations. Sire, said M. de Choiseul, do not be misled, nothing has been exaggerated. The public are indignant at the insolence which has been shown in this affair. The public? There is another monster with which you frighten yourself, or, rather, with which you would frighten me. Shall I listen to this public, which by the thousand mouths of libelists, and pamphleteers, and balladmongers, tell me that I am robbed, tossed in a blanket, betrayed on all hands? No, no, I let the public talk, and I laugh. Do as I do. Pardieu. Close your ears, and when your great public is tired of bawling, it will stop. There you are again, making your discontented bow, and Louis is putting on a sulky face. Heavens! Is it not singular that what is done for the lowest individual cannot be done for me? I cannot be allowed to live quietly in my own fashion. Everybody hates what I love, and eternally loves what I hate. Am I in my sense or am I a fool? Am I the master, or am I not? The dauphin took up his file, and returned to his work in the clock. The Duc de Choiseau bowed exactly as before. There, now, no answer. Answer something, will you? Mordu. You will kill me with vexation, first at your talk, then at your silence, with your petty hatred and your petty fears. I do not hate the Viscount Dubarry, said the Dauphin, smiling. And I do not fear him, sir, said the minister, haughtily. You are both very ill-natured, cried the king, pretending to be in a great passion when he was in reality only out of temper. You wish to make me the laughingstock of all Europe, to give my cousin of Prussia something to make jests on, to make me realize the court of King Patad, which that rascal, Voltaire, has described, but I will not be what you wish, no. You shall not have that satisfaction. 
I know what concerns my own honor, and I shall attend to it in my own way, and only as I choose myself. Sire, said the Dauphin, with that immovable mildness which characterized him, but at the same time with that constant perseverance of his. This is not a matter which concerns your honor, it is the dignity of the Dauphiness which has been attacked. His Royal Highness is right, sire, said the Duke, let but your Majesty speak the word, and no one will again dare to insult her. And who would insult her? No one intended to insult her. Jean is a stupid fellow, but he is not malignant. Well, then, sir, continued the minister, let it be placed to the account of stupidity, and let him ask pardon of the Chevalier de Taverny for his mistake. I said before, cried the king, that I have nothing to do in the affair. Let Jean ask pardon, he is at liberty to do so, or let him decline, he is at liberty also. The affair given up in that way, sire, I must take the liberty to inform your majesty, will be talked about. So much the better, exclaimed the king. Let it be talked about until I am deafened with it, provided I don't hear all this nonsense of yours. Then, replied the minister, with his imperturbable coolness, I am authorized by your majesty to say that Viscount Dubarry did right? Authorized by me, authorized by me? And in an affair of which I understand nothing. You mean, I see, to drive me to extremities, but take care, Duke. Take care, and, Louis, I advise you to be more cautious how you conduct yourself toward me. I shall leave you to think of what I have said, for I am tired out, I cannot bear this any longer. Goodbye, gentlemen. I am going to see my daughters, and then I shall take refuge at Marley, where I may hope for some tranquility, if you do not follow me. At this moment, and as the king was going toward the door, it was opened, and an usher appeared. Sire, said he, Her Royal Highness the Princess Louise is awaiting your majesty in the gallery to bid you farewell. To bid me farewell, exclaimed the king, in alarm, where is she going? Her Royal Highness says that she has had your majesty's permission to leave the palace. Ha! Another scene. This is my bigot daughter going to show off some of her follies. In truth, I am the most wretched of men. And he left the apartment, running. His Majesty has given us no answer, said the Duc de Choiseul, what has your Royal Highness decided on? Ah! There it strikes! said the young prince, listening with either a real or a pretended joy to the clock which he had made to go once more. The minister frowned and retired backward from the saloon of timepieces, leaving the dauphin alone. XXV to Madame Louise of France. The king's eldest daughter awaited him in the great gallery of Lebrun, the same in which Louis XIV, in 1683, had received the Doge Imperiali and the four Genoese senators sent to implore pardon for the Republic. At the further end of the gallery, opposite the door by which the king must enter, were three or four ladies of honor, who seemed in the utmost consternation. Louis arrived just at the moment when groups began to form in the vestibule, for the resolution which the princess had taken only that morning was now spreading on all sides through the palace. The princess Louise possessed a majestic figure, and a truly regal style of beauty, yet a secret sadness had left its lines on her fair forehead. Her austere practice of every virtue, and her respect for the great powers of the state, powers which for the last fifty years had only obtained a semblance of respect from interest or from fear, had caused her to be regarded with veneration by the court. We must add that she was loved even by the people, although a feeling of disaffection toward their masters was now general. The word tyrants had not yet been heard. She was loved because her virtue was not stern. She was not loudly talked of, but all knew that she had a heart. She manifested this every day by works of charity, while others only showed it by shameless self-indulgence. Louis XV. Feared this daughter for the simple reason that he esteemed her. There were even times when he went so far as to be proud of her, and she was the only one of his children whom he spared in his sharp raillery or his silly familiarities. He called her Madame, while the princesses Adelaide, Victoire, and Sophie he named Locke, Chiff, and Grail. For since the period when Marshal Saxe carried with him to the tomb the soul of the Turins and the Condes, 
and with the Queen Maria Lazinska passed away the governing mind of a Maria Theresa, all became mean and worthless around the throne of France. The Princess Louise, whose character was truly regal, and, compared with those around her, seemed even heroic, alone remained to adorn the crown, like a pearl of price amid false stones and tinsel. We should be wrong in concluding from this that Louis XV. loved his daughter. Louis, it is well known, loved no one but himself, we only affirm that he preferred her to all his other children. When he entered, he found the princess in the center of the gallery, leaning on a table inlaid with crimson jasper and lapis lazuli. She was dressed entirely in black, and her beautiful hair, which was without powder, was covered by a double roll of lace. A deeper shade of sadness than usual rested on her brow. She looked at no one in the apartment, but from time to time her melancholy gaze wandered over the portraits of the kings of Europe, which ornamented the gallery, at the head of whom were those of her ancestors, the kings of France. The black dress which she wore was the usual traveling costume of princesses. It concealed large pockets, still worn as in the times of the good housewife-like queens, and the princess Louise, imitating them in that, also, had the numerous keys of her chests and wardrobes suspended at her waist by a gold chain. The king's face assumed a serious expression when he saw how silent all in the gallery were, and how attentively they awaited the result of the interview between him and his daughter. But the gallery was so long that the spectators at either end might see but they could not hear what passed, they had a right to see, it was their duty not to hear. The princess advanced a few steps to meet the king, and taking his hand, she kissed it respectfully. They tell me you are setting out on a journey, madam, said he, are you going into Picardy? No, sire, she replied. Then, I presume, said he, in a louder voice, that you are about to make a pilgrimage to Normutiers? No, sire. I am going to retire to the convent of the Carmelites at St. Denis, of which you know I have the right to be abbess. The king started, but he preserved his countenance unmoved, although in reality his heart was troubled. Oh, no, no, my daughter, he said, you will not leave me. It is impossible you can leave me. My dear father, it is long since I decided on abandoning the world. Your majesty permitted me to make that decision, do not now, I entreat you, my dear father, oppose my wishes. Yes, certainly, you wrung from me the permission of which you speak. I gave it, but still hoped that when the moment of departure came, your heart would fail you. You ought not to bury yourself in a cloister. By acting so, you forget what is due to your rank. It is grief or want of fortune which makes the convent besought as a refuge. The daughter of the King of France is certainly not poor, and, if she be unhappy, the world ought not to know it. The king's thoughts, and even his language, seemed to become more elevated as he entered more and more into the part he was called on to play, that of a king and a father. This is, indeed, a part never played ill, when pride and regret inspire the actor. Sire, replied the princess, perceiving her father's emotion, and fearful that it might affect her more deeply than she desired at that moment, Sire, do not, by your tenderness for me, weaken my resolution. My grief is no vulgar grief, therefore, my resolution to retire from the world is not in accordance with the usual customs of our day. Less than. Your grief, exclaimed the king, as if from a real impulse of feeling. Have you, then, sorrows, my poor child? Heavy, heavy sorrows, sire. Why did you not confide them to me, my dearest daughter? Because they are sorrows not to be assuaged by any mortal hand. Not by that of a king. Ah, uh, no, sire. Not by a father's hand. No, sire, no. But you are religious, Louise, does not religion give you strength? Not sufficient strength yet, sire, therefore I retire to a cloister in order to obtain more. In silence God speaks to the heart of man, in solitude man communes with God. But, in acting thus you are making a sacrifice for which nothing can compensate. The throne of France casts a majestic shadow over the children of his kings. Ought not this reflected greatness to be sufficient for you? The shadow of the cell is better, sire, 
it refreshes the weary spirit, it soothes the strong as well as the weak, the humble as well as the proud, the high as well as the low. Do you fear any danger by remaining? In that case, Louise, cannot the king defend you? Sire, may God, in the first place, defend the king. I repeat, Louise, that mistaken zeal leads you astray. It is good to pray, but not to pray always, and you so good, so pious I can you require such constant prayers. Oh, my father I never can I offer up prayers enough to avert from us the woes which threaten us. If God has given me a portion of goodness, if for twenty years my only effort has been to purify my soul, I fear, alas! that I am yet far from having attained the goodness and the purity necessary for an expiatory sacrifice. The king started back and gazed at the princess with surprise. Never have I heard you speak thus before, my dear child, said he, your ascetic life is making your reason wander. Oh, sire, do not speak thus of a devotion the truest that ever subject offered to a king, or daughter to a father, in a time of need. Sire, that throne, of which you but now so proudly spoke as lending a protecting shade to your children, that throne totters. You feel not the blows which are dealt at its foundations, but I have seen them. Silently a deep abyss is preparing, which will engulf the monarchy. Sire, has any one ever told you the truth? The princess looked around to discover whether the attendants were far enough to be out of hearing of her words, then she resumed. Well, sir, I know the truth. Too often have I heard the groans which the wretched send forth, when, as a sister of mercy, I visited the dark, narrow streets, the filthy lanes, the dismal garrets of the poor. In those streets, those lanes, those garrets, I have seen human beings dying of cold and hunger in winter, of heat and thirst in summer. You see not, sire, what the country is, you go merely from Versailles to Marley, and from Marley to Versailles. But in the country there is not grain, I do not say to feed the people, but even to sow for a new harvest, for the land, cursed by some adverse power, has received, but has given nothing back. The people wanting bread, are filled with discontent. The air is filled in the twilight and at night with voices telling them of weapons, of chains, of prisons, of tyranny, and at these voices they awake, cease to complain, and commence to threaten. The parliaments demand the right of remonstrance, that is, the right to say to you openly what they whisper in private, King, you are running the kingdom, save it, or we shall save it ourselves. The soldiers with their idle swords furrow the land in which the philosophers have scattered the seeds of liberty. Men now see things which they formerly saw not, for our writers have laid all open to them. They know all that we do, and frown whenever their masters pass by. Your Majesty's successor is soon to be married. When and of Austria's son was married, the city of Paris made presents to the new queen. Now it is not only silent, and offers nothing, but you have been obliged to use force to collect the taxes, to pay the expense of bringing the daughter of Caesar to the palace of the son of St. Louis. The clergy have long ceased to pray to God. But, seeing the lands given away, privileges exhausted, coffers empty, they have begun again to pray for what they call the happiness of the people. And then, sire, must I tell you what you know so well, what you have seen with so much bitterness, although you have spoken of it to none? The kings, your brothers, who formerly envied us, now turn away from us. Your four daughters, sire, the princesses of France, have not found husbands, and there are twenty princes in Germany, three in England, sixteen in the states of the north, without naming our relations, the Bourbons of Spain and Naples. Who forget us, or turn away from us like the others? Perhaps the Turk would have taken us had we not been daughters of his most Christian majesty. Not for myself, my father, do I care for this, or complain of it. Mine is a happy state, since it leaves me free, since I am not necessary to any one of my family, and may retire from the world, in meditation and in poverty pray to God to avert from your head, and from my nephews. The awful storm I see gathering on the horizon of the future. My child, my daughter. It is your fears which make the future appear so dreadful. Sire, sire, remember that princess of antiquity, that royal prophetess. 
she foretold to her father and to her brothers war, destruction, conflagration, and her predictions were laughed at, they called her mad. Do not treat me as she was treated. Take care, O, oh, my father. Reflect, my king. Louis XV. Folded his arms, and his head sunk on his bosom. My daughter, said he, you speak very severely. Are those woes which you announce caused by me? God forbid that I should think so. They are the fruit of the times in which we live. You are whirled on in the career of events as we are all. Only listen, sire, to the applause in the theatre which follows any illusion against royalty. See, in the evenings, what joyous crowds descend the narrow stairs of the galleries, while the grand marble staircase is deserted. Sire, both the people and the courtiers have made for themselves pleasures quite apart from our pleasures. They amuse themselves without us, or, rather, when we appear in the midst of their pleasures, they become dull. Alas, continued the princess, her eyes swimming with tears, alas! Poor young men, affectionate young women! Love, sing, forget, be happy! Here, when I went among you, I only disturbed your happiness. Yonder, in my cloister, I shall serve you. Here, you hid your glad smiles in my presence, for fear of displeasing me. There, I shall pray, O, oh, God! With all my soul, for my king, for my sisters, for my nephews, for the people of France, for all whom I love with the energy of a heart which no earthly passion has exhausted. My daughter, said the king, after a melancholy silence, I entreat you not to leave me, not at this moment, at least, you will break my heart. The princess seized his hand, and fixing her eyes, full of love, on his noble features, no, said she, no, my father, not another hour in this palace. No, it is time for me to pray. I feel in myself strength to redeem, by my tears, those pleasures for which you sigh, you, who are yet young. You are the kindest of fathers, you are ever ready to pardon. Stay with us, Louise, stay with us. Said the king, pressing her to his heart. The princess shook her head. My kingdom is not of this world, said she, disengaging herself from her father's embrace. Farewell, my father. I have told you today what for ten years has lain heavy on my heart. The burden became too great. Farewell. I am satisfied, see, I can smile, I am now, at length, happy, I regret nothing. Not even me, my daughter. Ah, I should regret you, were I never to see you again, but you will sometimes come to St. Denis. You will not quite forget your child. Oh, never, never. Do not, my clear father, allow yourself to be affected. Let it not appear that this separation is to be a lasting one. My sisters, I believe, know nothing of it yet, my women alone have been my confidants. For eight days I have been making all my preparations. And I wish the report of my departure should only be spread when the great doors of St. Denis shall have closed on me, their heavy sound will prevent me from hearing any other. The king read in his daughter's eyes that her resolution was irrevocable. He wished, therefore, that she should go without disturbance. If she feared that sobs might shake her resolution, he feared them still more for his nerves. Besides, he wished to go to Marley that day, and too much grief at Versailles might have obliged him to put off his journey. He reflected, also, that, when issuing from some orgies unfit both for a king and a father, he should never more meet that grave, sad face, which seemed always to reproach him for the careless, worthless existence which he led. And this thought was not disagreeable to him. Be it then, as you wish, my child, said he, but at least receive, before you go, the blessing of a father whom you have always made perfectly happy. Give me your hand only, sire, and let me kiss it. Bestow your precious blessing on me in thought. To those who knew the decision of the princess, it was a solemn spectacle to see her at every step she made advancing, yet in life, to the tombs of her ancestors, those ancestors who, from their golden frames, seemed to thank her that she hastened to rejoin them. At the door of the gallery the king bowed, 
and returned without uttering a word. The court, according to etiquette, followed him. Atenei, Locke, Chiff, and Grail. The king passed on to what was called the cabinet of the equipages. It was there that he was accustomed, before going to hunt or to drive out, to pass a few minutes in giving particular orders concerning the vehicles and attendants he should require during the rest of the day. At the door of the gallery he bowed to the courtiers, and, by a wave of his hand, indicated that he wished to be alone. When they had left him, he passed through the cabinet to a corridor which led to the apartments of the princesses. Having reached the door, before which hung a curtain, he stopped for a moment, shook his head, and muttered between his teeth. There was but one of them good, and she is gone. This very flattering speech, for those who remained, was answered by a shrill chorus of voices, the curtain was raised, and the furious trio saluted their father with cries of. Thank you, father, thank you. Ha, Locke! Said he, addressing the eldest of them, the Princess Adelaide, you heard what I said, so much the worse for you. Be angry or not, just as you like, I only spoke the truth. Yes, said the Princess Victoire, you tell us nothing new, sire. We always knew that you preferred Louise to us. In faith, quite true, Chiff. And why do you prefer Louise, asked the Princess Sophie, in a sharp voice. Because Louise never gave me any trouble, replied the king, showing that good-humoured frankness of which, when he was perfectly pleased, Louis XV. was so complete a type. Oh, but she will give you trouble yet, rest assured, replied the Princess Sophie, with such a peculiar emphasis that it drew the attention of the king more particularly to her. I should be rather surprised if she did not, for she is not very fond of you. And pray, what do you know about her, Grail, said he. Did Louise, before going away, make you her confidant? I can say most truly, answered the princess, that I return her affection with interest. Oh, very well. Hate one another, detest one another as much as you choose, I am perfectly content. Only do not summon me to restore order in the kingdom of the Amazons. However, I should like to know how poor Louise is to give me trouble. Poor Louise, repeated the three princesses, making different grimaces at the words. You wish to know how she will give you trouble. Well, I shall tell you, said the princess Sophie. The king stretched himself in a large easy chair, placed near the door so that he could at any moment make his escape. Louise is retiring to a convent because she wishes to carry on some experiments which she cannot make so well in the palace. Come, come, said the king, no insinuations against the virtue of your sister. No one beyond these walls has ever dared to sully that, though many things are said of you for which it were well there were no grounds. Do not you begin this subject? I. Yes, you. Oh, I was not going to attack Louise's virtue, said the Princess Sophie, very much hurt by the peculiar accent her father had given to the you, and by the marked repetition of it, I only said she was going to make experiments. Well, and if she does make experiments in chemistry, if she does make firearms, and wheels for chairs, if she does play on the flute, the drum, or the harpsichord, or even the violin, what harm would there be in it? The experiments to which I alluded were experiments in politics. The king started. The princess on. She is going to study philosophy and theology. She will continue the commentaries on the bull, Unigenitus, indeed, we must seem very useless beings when compared with her, a lady who writes theories concerning governments, systems of metaphysics, and theology. And if these pursuits lead your sister to heaven, what harm can you see in them? Said the king, struck, however, with the connection there was between what the Princess Sophie was saying and the manner of the Princess Louise's departure, accompanied as it had been by a political exhortation. If you envy her happiness, you are very bad Christians. No, on my honor, said the Princess Victoire, she has my full permission to go, but I shall take care not to follow her. Nor I, responded the Princess Adelaide. Nor I, said the Princess Sophie. Besides, she always detested us, said the first. You all, the king asked. Yes, detested us all, they replied. 
Oh, then, I see, he said, poor Louise has chosen to go to heaven that she may not meet any of her family again. This sarcasm made the three sisters laugh, but rather constrainedly, and Adelaide, the eldest, brought all her wit into play in order to deal her father a more weighty blow than he had given them. Ladies, said she, with the sneering tone which was peculiar to her when roused from that habitual indolence which had procured for her the name of Locke, you have either not found out, or you do not dare to tell the king. The real cause of Louise's departure. Come, Locke, come. You have got some wicked tale to tell, I see. Let us hear it. Sire, I fear it might vex you a little. No, no, say you hope it will vex me, that would be nearer the truth. Madam Adelaide bit her lips. Then I shall tell you the truth, sire. Very fine. If you ever do tell the truth cure yourself of the habit. The truth? Dole ever tell it? And yet you see I am not the worse for it, heaven be praised, and he shrugged his shoulders. Speak, sister, speak, said the other two sisters, impatient to hear anything that might wound their father. Sweet little creatures, growled the king, see how they love their father. But he consoled himself by thinking that he returned their love in kind. Well, continued the princess Adelaide, what Louise dreaded most, for she was very precise on the score of etiquette, was. Was what? exclaimed the king. Come, finish, since you have gone so far. It was, sire, then, the intrusion of new faces at court. Do you say intrusion? asked he, by no means pleased with this beginning, for he saw to what it tended. Intrusion? Are there intruders, then, in my palace? Am I forced to receive persons against my will? By this adroit turn he hoped to change the course of the conversation. But the Princess Adelaide felt herself on the right scent, and she was too cunning and too malicious to lose it, when she had so good an end in view as the annoyance of her father. Perhaps I was not quite correct, perhaps I used the wrong word. Instead of intrusion, I should have said introduction. Oh, ah, said the king, that is an improvement. The other word was a disagreeable one, I confess, I like introduction better. And yet, continued the princess, that is not the right word either. What is it then? It is presentation. Yes, cried the other sisters, yes, you have found the right word now. The king bit his lip. Oh, do you think so, said he. Yes, replied the princess Adelaide, my sister was very much afraid of new presentations. Well, said the king, feeling what must come, and thinking it best to have done with it as speedily as possible, well, go on. Well, sire, she was consequently afraid of seeing the Countess Dewberry presented at court. Ha! cried the king, with a burst of passion which he could not repress, so you have been all this time getting this out. More do. Madam tell truth, how you beat about the bush. Sire, replied the princess, if I have so long delayed in telling your majesty this, it is because respect closed my lips, and I should not have opened them but by your own command. Yes, yes, you would never have opened them, I suppose, to yawn, or to speak, or to bite. I am quite certain, however, sire, that I have discovered the real motive which has made my sister retire into a convent. Well, you are wrong. Oh, sire, they all three repeated, shaking their heads. Oh, sire, we are quite certain of what we say. Shaw. You are all of a tale, I see. There is a conspiracy in my family. This is the reason the presentation cannot take place, this the reason the princesses can never be seen when persons wish to visit them, that they give no answers to petitions or requests for an audience. What petitions? What requests for an audience? asked the Princess Adelaide. Oh, you know, replied the Princess Sophie, the petition of Mademoiselle Jean Beaubernier. This was the Countess Dewberry's name in the days of her poverty. Yes, added the Princess Victoire, the requests for an audience of Mademoiselle Lang. Another name which she had borne. The king started up, furious with passion. His eye, generally calm and mild, now flashed in a manner rather alarming for the three sisters, 
and as none of this royal trio of heroines seemed courageous enough to bear the paternal wrath, they bent their heads before the storm. And now, cried he, was I wrong when I said the best had left me? Sire, said the Princess Adelaide, you treat us very ill, worse than you treat your dogs. And justly, too. My dogs, when I go near them, receive me kindly, caress me. They are real friends. So adieu, ladies. I shall go to Charlotte, Bellafil, and Gretinette. Poor animals. Yes, I love them. And I love them more particularly because they do not bark out the truth. The king left the apartment in a rage. But had not taken three steps in the anteroom, when he heard his daughters singing in chorus the first verse of a ballad ridiculing the Countess Dubarry, which was then sung through the streets of Paris. He was about to return, and perhaps the princesses would not have fared well had he done so, but he restrained himself, and went on, calling loudly that he might not hear them, Ola. The Captain of the Greyhounds. The Captain of the Greyhounds. The officer who bore this singular title hurried forward. Let the dogs be loosed. Oh, sire, cried the officer, placing himself in the king's way, do not advance another step. What now? What now? said the king, stopping before a door, from under which was heard the snuffing of dogs, aware that their master was near. Sire, said the officer, pardon me, but I cannot permit your majesty to enter here. Oh, I understand, the kennel is out of order. Well, then, let Gretinette be brought out. Sire, continued the officer, with alarm depicted on his face, Gretinette has neither eaten nor drunk for two days, and it is feared he is mad. Oh, cried the king, I am really the most wretched of men. Gretinette mad? This alone was wanting to complete my vexation. The officer of the greyhounds thought it his duty to shed a tear, to make it seem more perfect. The king turned on his heel, and retired to his private cabinet, where his valet was waiting. He, seeing the king's face so disturbed, hid himself in the recess of a window, and the king, looking upon him rather as a piece of furniture than a man, strode up and down his room talking to himself. Yes, I see it, I see it plainly, said he. The Duc de Choiseul laughs at me, the Dauphin looks upon himself as already half-master, and thinks he will be wholly so when he has his little Austrian beside him on the throne. Louise loves me, but so sternly, that she preaches me a sermon and leaves me. My three other daughters sing songs, in which I am ridiculed under the name of Blaise. My grandson, the Count de Provence, translates Lucretius. And his brother, the Count d'Artois, is a dissipated scapegrace. My dogs go mad, and would bite me. Decidedly, there is only the poor countess who loves me. To the devil, then, with those who would annoy her. Then, with a sort of settled despair, he seated himself at that table on which Louis the Fifteenth wrote his proudest letters and signed his latest treaties. I know now, continued he, why every one wishes to hasten the arrival of the Dauphiness. They think when she shows herself, I shall become her slave, and be governed by her family. In faith, I shall see her soon enough, that dear daughter-in-law of mine, particularly if her arrival is to be the signal for new troubles. Let me be quiet as long as I can, and for that purpose the longer she is delayed on the road the better. She was to have passed through Reims and Noyou without stopping, and to come immediately to Compiègne. I shall insist on the first arrangement. Three days at Reims, and one, no, faith. Two. Bah. Three days at Noyou. That would be six days I should gain, yes, six good days. He took a pen, and wrote in person an order to the Count de Stainville, to stop three days at Reims and three days at Noyon. Then, sending for a courier, don't draw a bridle, said he, until you have delivered this according to its address. Then, with the same pen, he wrote. Dear Countess, today we install Zamor in his government. I am just setting out for Marley. This evening, at Lucien's, I shall tell you all I now think. France. Here, La Belle, said he to the valet, take this letter to the Countess, and keep on good terms with her, I advise you. 
The valet bowed and left the room. Zix, the Countess de Bern. The principal object of all the fury of the court, and their stumbling block on this dreaded occasion, the Countess de Bern, was, as Chan said, traveling rapidly to Paris. Her journey thither was the result of one of those bright ideas which sometimes came to Viscount Jean's assistance in his times of trouble. Not being able to find among the ladies of the court one who would present the Countess Dewberry, and since she could not be presented without a lady to introduce her, he cast his eye on the provinces. He examined country seats, searched carefully in the towns, and at last found what he wanted on the banks of the Mens in an old, gothic-looking country seat, but one kept in good order. Now, what he wanted was an old lady fond of law, and having a lawsuit on hand. The old lady with the lawsuit was the Countess de Bern. The lawsuit was an affair on which all her fortune depended, and which was to be heard before M. De Mopia, who had lately taken up the cause of the Countess Dewberry, having discovered what had remained hidden, until then, that he was related to her, and now called her cousin. Looking forward to the appointment of Lord Chancellor through her interest, he showed the king's favorite all the warmth of a friendship naturally arising from such a substantial basis. This friendship and this interest had procured for him from the king the office of vice-chancellor, and from the world in general the pithy denomination of, the vice. The Countess de Bern was a thin, angular, agile little woman, always on the alert, always rolling her eyes like those of a frightened cat, from under her grey eyebrows. She still wore the dress which had been fashionable in her youth, and as the capricious goddess of fashion has sensible fits now and then, it so happened that the costume of the young girl of 1740 should be precisely that of the old woman or 1770. Broad gouet pure, pointed mantelet, an enormous coif, an immense bag, and a neck handkerchief of flowered silk, such was the costume in which Chan, the well-beloved sister and confidant of the Countess Dewberry, found the Countess de Bern arrayed when she presented herself before her as Mli. Flagit, the daughter of the lawyer in Paris who had the management of her suit. The old countess wore the costume of her early days as much from taste as from economy. She was not one of those persons who blush for their poverty, because her poverty had not been caused by her own fault. She regretted, indeed, not being rich for her son's sake, to whom she would have wished to leave a fortune worthy of his name. The young man was thoroughly countrybred, timid to a fault, caring much more for what belonged to the substantial things of life than to the honours of renown. The Countess's sole consolation was in calling the lands that were contested with the Salus family, my estate. But as she was a woman of sense, she felt that if she wanted to borrow money on that estate, not a usurer in France, and there were some bold enough in running risks at that period, would lend it her. Not an attorney, and there were some not very scrupulous then, as there have been at all times, would procure her the smallest sum on such a guarantee. Forced, then, to live on the annual rents of those lands that were not disputed, the Countess de Bern, having only one thousand crowns a year, kept very far from court. For there she must have spent nearly twelve livres a day in the hire of a carriage to take her to her lawyers and to the judges. She was still more determined in keeping aloof, since she had despaired of her cause being heard for four or five years at least. Lawsuits, even in the present day, are, in truth, tedious affairs. But still, without living to the age of the patriarchs, a person who commences one has some hope of seeing it to an end. But, formerly, a suit extended through two or three generations, and was like those fabulous plants of the Arabian tales, which blossomed only at the end of two or three centuries. The Countess de Bern, therefore, did not wish to lose the remains of her patrimony in recovering the ten twelfths of it which were disputed. She was, what is always called, a woman of the old school, sagacious prudent, firm, avaricious. She could certainly have managed her suit much better herself than any advocate, lawyer, or attorney, but she was called Bern, and that name prevented her from doing many things which economy might have prompted. Like the divine Achilles in his tent, suffering a thousand deaths when he heard the trumpet, although feigning to be deaf to it, she, in her retirement, was devoured by regret and anguish. She passed her days in deciphering old parchments, her spectacles on her nose. And at night, on her pillow, she pleaded with such eloquence the cause of the estate claimed by the Seleucids that she was always successful, 
a termination of the affair which she could but wish her advocate to arrive at. It may readily be imagined that in such a temper of mind the arrival of Chan, and the news she brought, were very agreeable to Madame de Bern. The young count was with his regiment. We always believe what we wish to believe, so Madame. De Bern was very easily caught by the young lady's tale. There was, however, a shadow of suspicion in the countess's mind. She had known Master Flagget twenty years and had visited him two hundred times in his narrow, dark street. But she had never seen a child playing on the square bit of carpet which looked so little on the floor of his large office, and had there been children there, they would surely have found their way into it to get a toy or a cake from the clients. But what was the use of thinking about the lawyer in his office and his carpet? What was the use of trying to remember anything about it? Flagget's daughter was Flagget's daughter, and there she was. Moreover, she was married, and, what banished the last shadow of suspicion, she had not come on purpose to Verdun, she was going to join her husband at Strasbourg. Perhaps the countess ought to have asked Mlee. Flagget for a letter from her father, to assure herself of her identity, but if a father could not send his own child without a letter, to whom could he entrust a confidential mission? Then why such fears? What could cause such suspicions? Why should any one travel sixty leagues to tell her a tale without any foundation on fact? If she had been rich, a banker's or a financier's wife, taking with her carriages, plate, and diamonds, she might have thought it was a plot got up by robbers. But she laughed to herself when she thought what a disappointment any robbers would experience who should be so ill-advised as to attack her. So Chan having disappeared with her plain dark dress, and her shabby little one-horse chaise which she had taken at the last post leaving her carriage behind her, the countess, convinced that the time was come for her to make a sacrifice, got into her old coach, and urged on the postillion so well that she passed through Le Chaussee an hour before the Dauphiness, and reached the gate of Esti. Dennis five or six hours after Chan herself. As she had little luggage, and as the most important thing for her was to receive information from her lawyer, she ordered her coach to drive to the Rue de Petit Lion and stop before Master Flagget's door. The vehicle, we may be assured, did not stop there without attracting a great number of curious spectators, and the Parisians are all curious, who stared at the venerable machine which seemed to have issued from the coach house of Henry IV. So antique was it in its solidity, its monumental form, awed its scalloped leather curtains which ran with a disagreeable creaking on a copper rod covered with verdigris. The Rue de Petit Lion was not wide, and the Countess's equipage filled it up very majestically. Having alighted and paid the postillions she ordered them to take it to the inn where she usually stopped, Le Coq Chantan, in the Rue St. Germain de Presse. She ascended M. Flagget's dark stairs, holding by the greasy cord, which served instead of a handrail. The staircase was cool, and it refreshed the old lady, who was tired by her long and rapid journey. When Margaret, his servant, announced the Countess de Bern, Master Flagget pulled up his stockings, which he had allowed to fall nearly to his ankles on account of the heat, with one hand, fixed on his wig with the other. And then hastily threw on a dimity dressing gown, and so adorned, advanced smiling to the door. In this smile, however, there was such an expression of surprise, that the Countess could not help saying, Well, well, my dear sir, it is I. Yes, indeed, replied he, I see plainly enough, madam, that it is you. Then, modestly wrapping his dressing gown round him, he led the countess to a large leather armchair, in the lightest corner of the apartment, carefully putting aside the papers which covered his desk. For he knew the Ola lady to be curious in the extreme. And now, madam, said Master Flagget, gallantly, permit me to express my pleasure at this agreeable surprise. The countess had leaned back in her chair, and raised her feet from the floor to allow Margaret to slip between it and her brocaded satin shoes a leather cushion, but at this phrase as he started up hastily. How? exclaimed she, drawing her spectacles from their case, and putting them on, so that she might see his face the better, surprise? Most assuredly. I thought you at your estates, madam, replied the lawyer, 
adroitly flattering the old lady by bestowing this title on the countess's three acres of kitchen garden. Well, I was there, but on the first intimation from you, I left them. Intimation from me, said the astonished advocate. Yes, at your first word of counsel, or advice, or whatever you please to call it. Flagget's eyes looked as large as the countess's glasses. I have been very expeditious, continued she, and I hope you are satisfied. I am delighted to see you, madam, as I always am, but allow me to say that I do not see how I have been the cause of your visit. Not the cause. Most certainly you have been the entire cause of it. I. Yes, you, undoubtedly. Well, have you no news to tell me? Oh, yes, madam, it is said the king is meditating some great stroke of policy with regard to the parliament. But may I offer you some refreshment? But what does it matter to me about the king and his strokes of policy? About what, then, did you inquire, madam? About my suit, of course. Is there anything new about it? Oh, as to that, said Flagget, shaking his head sorrowfully, nothing, absolutely nothing. That is to say, nothing. No, nothing, madam. You mean nothing since your daughter spoke to me about it. But as that was only the day before yesterday, I can readily understand that there may not be much new since then. My daughter, madam. Yes. Did you say my daughter? Yes, your daughter whom you sent to me. Pardon me, madam. But it is quite impossible that I could send my daughter to you. Impossible? Yes, for a very simple reason, I have no daughter. Are you sure? asked the countess. Madam, replied Flagget, I have the honor to be a bachelor. Come, come, said the countess, as if she supposed him jesting. M. Flagget became uneasy, he called Margaret to bring in some refreshment, but, more particularly, that she might watch the countess. Poor woman, said he too. To himself, her head is turned. What, said she, returning to the charge, you have not a daughter. No, madam. Not one married at Strasbourg. No, madam, by no means. And did you not send that daughter, pursued the countess, on her way thither to tell me that my suit was called on? Nothing of the kind, madam. The countess started from her chair, and clasped her hands. Drink a little of something, madam, it will do you good, said him, Flagget, and at the same time he made a sign to Margaret to bring a tray, on which were two glasses of beer. But the old lady was not thinking of her thirst, and she pushed away the tray so rudely that Dame Margaret, who appeared to be a privileged sort of person, was affronted. But let us understand each other, said the countess, eyeing Master Flagget over her spectacles, explain all this, if you please. Certainly, madam. Margaret, you need not go, the countess will perhaps drink something presently. Let us explain. Yes, let N.S. explain, for, upon my honor, my dear sir, you are quite incomprehensible today. I begin to think the hot weather has turned your brain. Do not be angry, dear madam, said Flagget, maneuvering with the hind feet of his chair, so that he got by degrees further from the countess. Do not get angry, and let us talk over the matter quietly. Yes, yes, certainly. You say you have not a daughter. No, madam, I have not one, and I regret it deeply, since it appears you would be pleased that I had, although. Although what? repeated the countess. Although, for my own part, I should prefer a son. Boys succeed better in the world, or, rather, don't turn out so ill as girls in the present day. The countess looked more and more alarmed. What? said she, have you not sent for me to Paris, by a sister, a niece, a cousin, by some person, in short? I never thought of such a thing, madam, knowing how expensive it is staying in Paris. But my suit? I should always have taken care to let you know in time before the pleading came on. Before it came on? Yes. Has it not come on, then? Not that I know of, madam. It has not been called. No. And it is not likely to come on soon. Oh, no, madam, certainly not. 
Then, cried the old lady, rising, I have been tricked. I have been most basely deceived. Flagget pushed back his wig, muttering, I fear it indeed, madam. Master Flagget, cried the countess. The lawyer started on his seat, and made a sign to Margaret to keep near, in order to defend him. Master Flagget, continued the countess, I will not submit to such an indignity as this. I will address the minister of police, to discover the impudent creature who insulted me thus. Oh, said Flagget, it is a very doubtful affair. And when she is found, continued the countess, almost speechless with anger, I shall bring an action against her. Another lawsuit, said the lawyer, sorrowfully. These words made the poor lady fall from the height of her passion, and a heavy fall it was. Alas, said she, I came here so happy. But what did that woman say to you, madam? First, that she was sent by you. Shocking intriguer. That you desired her to say that the trial was coming on, was very clear, that I could scarcely be in time with all the speed I could make. Alas! Madam, repeated Flagget, in his turn, the trial is very far from coming on. Yes. So far from it, I suppose, that it is quite forgotten. Forgotten. Sunk, buried, madam, and unless a miracle were to happen, and you know miracles are very rare nowadays. Oh, yes, murmured the countess, with a sigh. M. Flagget replied by another sigh, a faithful echo of the countess. Well, sir, one thing is certain, added she. What is it, madam? I shall not survive this. Oh, don't say so, you would be quite wrong. Oh, heaven! Oh, heaven! exclaimed the poor countess, my strength is completely exhausted. Courage, madam, courage, said Flagget. But have you no advice to give me? none. Oh, yes. My advice is to return to your estates, and after this never believe anybody who does not bring you a letter from me, in my own hand. I must return, indeed. It will be the wisest plan. Well, sir, said the countess, with a groan, believe me, we shall never meet again, at least not in this world. What an infamous affair! I must have some very cruel enemies. It has been a trick of the opposite party, I would swear. It is a very mean trick, I must say. A mean, sorry trick, indeed. Justice. Justice, cried the countess, my dear sir, she is the cave of Cacus. And why is it, he replied. Because justice is not what it was, because the parliament is opposed, because Monsieur de Maupia must be chancellor, forsooth, instead of remaining what he ought to be. President. Monsieur Flagget, I think I could drink something now. Margaret, cried the lawyer, for Margaret had left the room, seeing the peaceable turn affairs were taking. She now entered with the tray and the two glasses which she had carried away. The countess drank her glass of beer very slowly, after having touched the lawyer's glass with hers, then she gained the anteroom after a sad and solemn courtesy and a still more sorrowful leave taking. The lawyer followed her, his wig in his hand. She was in the lobby, and was reaching out her hand for the cord to aid her in her descent, when a hand was laid on hers and a head gave her a thump on the chest. The head and the hand were those of a clerk, who was mounting the stairs four steps at a time. The old lady, muttering and grumbling, arranged her petticoats and continued on her way, while the clerk, having reached the lobby, pushed open the lawyer's door, and with the open and joyous voice for which the clerks of the parliament were noted. Cried out, Here, Master Flagget. Here. It is about the Bairn business, and he held out a paper. To rush up the stairs at that name, pushed by the clerk, to throw herself on Flagget, to snatch the paper from him, to shut herself up with him in his office, all this. Was effected by the countess before the clerk had recovered from two boxes on the ear which Margaret bestowed, or seemed to bestow, on him, in return for two kisses. Well, cried the old lady, what is it? Master Flagget, what is it? Faith, I can't tell, madam, but if you will give me back the paper I shall let you know. True, true, my good Master Flagget. 
Read it, read it. He looked at the signature. It is from Gildan, our attorney, said he. Good heavens! He desires me, continued Flagit, with surprise amounting almost to bewilderment, he desires me to be ready to plead on Tuesday, for your affair is to come on. To come on, cried the countess. Take care, Master Flagit, take care. No more tricks. I should never recover from another. Madam, replied Flagit, still bewildered at the intelligence, if there be any trick, any jest in this, Gildan is the author of it. And it is certainly the first time in his life that he has jested. But are you certain the letter is from him? It is signed Gildan, see? I see it is. To be called this morning and pleaded on Tuesday. Well, then, you see, my dear sir, the lady who came to me was not a cheat. It appears not. Then, since she was not sent by you, but are you sure she was not? Pardieu I am I sure of it. By whom was she sent, then? Yes, by whom? For she must have been sent by someone. It is a complete riddle to me. And to me also. Let me read the paper again. Yes, my dear Flagit, the pleading is to come on five it is written so, and before the president, Mopia. The devil. Is that there? Yes, certainly. That is vexatious. How so? Because Monsieur Mopia is a great friend of your opponents. You know that? He is always with them. Ha! I am truly unfortunate. Now we are more embarrassed than ever. But for all that, said the lawyer, you must wait on him. He will receive me very badly. That is probable. Oh, Master Flagit, what do you tell me? The truth, madam. What? You not only lose courage yourself, but you try to deprive me of mine. With the Chancellor Mopia you must not hope for anything favorable. You, so timid, you, a Cicero. Cicero would have lost the cause of Ligarius had he pleaded before Verres instead of Caesar, replied Master Flagit, finding nothing more humble to say in return for the high compliment of his client. Then you advise me not to wait on him. Heaven forbid, madam, I should advise anything so irregular, but I pity you sincerely for having to undergo such an interview. You really speak like a soldier who meant to desert his post. One would think you feared to undertake the business. Madam, replied the lawyer, I have lost causes which seemed much more likely to be gained by me than this of yours does. The countess sighed, but summoning all her energy, she said with a kind of dignity which made a complete contrast to all that had been comic in the scene, I shall carry the matter through. It shall not be said that, having right on my side, I gave way before a cabal. I shall lose my cause, but I shall at least act as a woman of rank and character, such as there are few at court in the present day. You will accompany me, will you not, Monsieur Flagit, in my visit to the vice-chancellor? Madam, replied the lawyer, also calling up all his dignity to his aid. We opposition members of the Parliament of Paris have sworn to have no intercourse beyond necessary audiences with those who betrayed the Parliament in the affair of Monsieur de Guillon. Union is strength and as the Vice-Chancellor tacked about perpetually in that business, we have determined to keep aloof until he shows his true colors. My suit is doomed, I see, sighed the Countess. The lawyers quarrel with the judges, the judges with the clients. No matter, I shall persevere to the end. May heaven assist you, madam, said Flagit, flinging his dressing gown over his left arm as a Roman senator might have done his toga. This is but a poor sort of an advocate, murmured she to herself. I am afraid I shall have less chance with him before the parliament than I had at home on my pillow then, aloud, with a smile under which she strove to hide her uneasiness. Adieu. Monsieur Flagit, adieu, study the case thoroughly, I entreat you, we know not how things may turn out. Oh, madam, said Master Flagit, do not fear as to the pleading. I shall do you justice, I shall make some terrible allusions. Allusions to what, sir? To the corruption of Jerusalem, madam, which I shall compare to the accursed cities on which the fire of heaven descended. You understand, no one can mistake, 
by Jerusalem I mean Versailles. Monsieur Flagit, exclaimed the old lady, do not compromise yourself, or, rather, do not compromise my cause. Oh, madam, with Monsieur de Mopia for judge, your cause is lost. But then let the world hear of us. Since we cannot obtain justice, let us at least strike terror to the wicked. Sir, sir. Let us be philosophic, let us thunder. Deuce take you, with your thunder, muttered the countess. Fool of a lawyer. You are thinking only of making a figure with your fag ends of philosophy. Come, I will go to the vice-chancellor, he at least is no philosopher. I may do better with him than with you, after all. And the old countess left M. Flagit, having, poor old lady, in two days, mounted all the degrees of the scale of hope, and descended all those in that of disappointment. Triple X, the vice. The old countess trembled in every limb as she proceeded toward M. de Mopia's residence. However, one thought had quieted her a little on the road, it was so late that in all probability she would not be admitted, and she should merely have to tell the porter when she should come again. In fact, it was about seven in the evening, and although it was still light, the habit of dining at four, which the nobility had adopted, had caused all business to be suspended from dinner until the next day. Although Madame de Bern anxiously longed to see the Chancellor, she was, nevertheless, consoled by the thought that she should not see him. This is one of the frequent contradictions of the human mind which we can always understand but never explain. The countess presented herself, therefore, quite certain that the porter would refuse her admittance, and had even prepared a crown to offer the Cerberus to induce him to put her name on the list of those who requested an audience. On reaching the house, she found an usher talking to the porter, as if giving him an order. She waited discreetly that she might not interrupt these two personages, but on perceiving her in her hackney coach, the usher withdrew. The porter approached and demanded her name. Oh, I know, said she, that it is not probable I shall have the honor of seeing His Excellency. No matter, madam, replied the porter, have the goodness to tell me your name. The Countess de Bern, she replied. My lord is at home, answered he. What did you say, asked the Countess, almost dumb with astonishment. I say that my lord is at home, repeated he. But of course he will not receive visitors. He will receive you, madam. Madame de Bern got out of the coach, hardly knowing whether she was asleep or awake. The porter pulled a cord, a bell rang twice. The usher appeared at the top of the steps, and the porter made a sign to the countess to enter. You wish to speak to my lord, asked the usher. I wish for that honor, but I scarcely hope to attain it. Have the goodness to follow me, madam. And yet people speak so ill of this chancellor, said the countess to herself, as she went along, following the usher, yet he has certainly one good quality, he admits persons on business at all hours. A chancellor, it is strange. Yet still she shuddered at the idea that she should find him so much the more stern, so much the more ungracious, because he was assiduous at his duties. M. Demopia, buried under a great wig, and dressed in a suit of black velvet, was waiting in his cabinet, with the doors open. The countess, on entering, cast a rapid glance around. She saw with surprise that he was alone, that the mirrors reflected no other face than her own and that of the meagre, yellow, busy chancellor. The usher announced, Madame the Countess de Bern. The chancellor rose up stiffly, as if he had no joints, and, by the same movement, leaned his back against the chimney piece. The countess made the necessary three courtesies. Her short, complimentary speech which followed the courtesies was rather embarrassed, she did not expect the honor, she did not think that a minister who had so much to do would deprive himself of the hours necessary for recreation, etc., etc. The chancellor replied that time was no doubt, as precious to his majesty's subjects as to his majesty's ministers, that, nevertheless, he admitted there were distinctions to be made as to the importance of the affairs brought before him. Consequently, he always gave the greater part of his time to those whose business was most urgent. Fresh courtesies on the part of the countess, then an embarrassed silence, for compliments were ended, and her request must now be made. 
the Chancellor waited, stroking his chin. My lord, said she, I have presented myself before you to explain to you an affair on which my whole fortune depends. The Chancellor bowed, as if to intimate that she should go on. My lord, she continued, you must know that all my property, or, rather, my sons, is at stake in a suit now pending between us and the family of the Seleucids. The Vice-Chancellor continued to stroke his chin. But your equity is so well known to me, my lord, that, although I am aware of your interest in, indeed I may say your friendship for, the adverse party, I have not hesitated an instant in coming to entreat you to hear me. The Chancellor could not help smiling on hearing himself praised for his equity, a quality for which he was about as famous as Du Bois was for the apostolical virtues on which he had been complimented fifty years before. You are right, madam, said he, saying that I am afraid of your opponents, but you are also right in thinking that, when I accepted the seals, I laid aside all friendship. I shall reply to you, then, without any bias, as becomes the supreme head of justice. Heaven bless you, my lord, cried the old countess. I shall examine your affair as a simple jurisconsult, continued the Chancellor. I thank your lordship. Your skill in these matters is well known. Your cause comes on soon, I think. Next week, my lord. In the meantime, what are your wishes respecting it? That your lordship would look into the documents. I have already done so. Well, ask the old countess, trembling, and what do you think of it, Ray Lord? I think that there is not a doubt on the subject. Not a doubt of Ray gaining. No, of your losing. Then, you think, my lord, I shall lose. Undoubtedly, I shall, therefore, give you one piece of advice. What is it? asked the countess, with the last ray of hope. It is, if you have any payments to make, the cause being tried, and sentence pronounced, to have your funds ready. Oh, my lord, we shall be ruined then. Surely you know, madam, that justice never takes into account anything respecting the consequences of her decrees. But, my lord, there should be mercy as well as justice. And, for fear of justice being influenced by mercy, she is made blind, madam. But your lordship will not refuse me your advice. Certainly not, ask it, madam. I am ready. Is there no means of entering into an arrangement by which the sentence might not be so harsh? Do you know any of your judges? Not one of them, my lord. That is unfortunate. Messrs de Seleucus, your opponents, are connected with three-fourths of the parliament. The countess shuddered. But observe, continued the chancellor, that that does not alter the main grounds of the question, for a judge does not permit himself to be influenced by private feelings. This was about as true as that he possessed the virtue of equity, or Du Bois the apostolic virtues, but it made the poor countess nearly faint. But, after all, continued the Chancellor, the judge having done all that integrity demands, of course leans more to a friend than to a person about whom he is indifferent, that is only just. When it is just, and as it will be just that you should lose your cause, they may, in their sentence, make the consequence of that loss very unpleasant to you. But all that your lordship says is very alarming. As far as I am concerned, I shall refrain from saying anything that might have an influence on the minds of others, but, as I am not a judge myself, I may speak to you of the state of affairs. Alas! My lord, I suspected one thing. The vice-chancellor fixed on her his little grey eyes. I suspected that the adverse party, living in Paris, they might become connected with the judges, and thus be all-powerful. Because, in the first place, they have justice on their side. How painful it is, my lord, to hear such words from the lips of a man infallible as you are. I merely say all this to you, because it is the truth, and yet, continued M. Demopia, with an affected frankness, I should like, upon my word, to serve you. The countess started. She thought that she saw some hidden meaning, if not in the chancellor's words, at least in his thoughts, which concealed behind it something favorable to her. Besides, he proceeded, the name you bear is one of the noblest in France, and that is, in itself, a powerful recommendation to me. 
Ah, my lord, it will not prevent me from losing my suit. As to that, I have no power either one way or the other. Oh, my lord! My lord, cried the countess, shaking her head, how things go on in this world now. You seem to infer, madam, that in the good old times they went better. Alas! My lord, I cannot but think so. I recall with pleasure the time when you were merely a king's advocate in the parliament, and when you made those beautiful speeches which I, then a young woman, went to listen to, and which I applauded with such enthusiasm. What fire! What eloquence! What virtue! Ah, my lord, in those times there were no plots, no cabals, no favoritism. I should have gained my suit then. Yet we had Madame de Phalaris then, who tried to resign occasionally when the regent shut his eyes. And we had, too, La Suris, who went about picking up what crumbs she could manage to gather. Oh, my lord, but Madame de Phalaris was really a lady of rank, and La Suris was such a good-natured girl. Yes, so nothing was refused them. Or, rather, they could refuse no one. Come, madam, said the chancellor, laughing in a manner that astonished the old lady more and more, it was so open and natural, come, do not make me speak ill of my own administration, through affection for my youthful days. But, my lord, when I think of those days, I must lament my lost fortune, my ruined family. You see, countess, what it is not to go with the times, not to sacrifice to the idols of the day. Alas! My lord, those idols care not for worshippers who come with empty hands. What can you know about them? I. Yes, you have never tried them, I think. My lord, you speak to me really like a friend. Well, are we not about the same age, countess? Oh. Why am I not twenty, and you, my lord, a simple advocate again? You would plead for me, and I should gain my cause. Unhappily, we are not twenty, countess, said the vice-chancellor, with a gallant sigh, we must only, therefore, beg those who are twenty to assist us, since you confess that that is the age to have influence. What, do you know no one at court? Some old noblemen who have left it now, I once knew, but they would blush for their old friend in her poverty. Stay, my lord, I have still the privilege of being received at court. I might go to Versailles, yet of what use would it be? Oh, had I again only my two hundred thousand crowns of income, people would come to visit me, perform that miracle for me, my lord. The Chancellor pretended not to hear this last phrase. In your place, said he, I should forget the old, as they have forgotten me. I should apply to the young, and beat up for recruits among them. Do you happen to know the princesses at all? They must have forgotten me. And, besides, they have no influence. Do you know the Dauphin? No. And, after all, he is so busy about his Archduchess, who is about to arrive, that he can think of nothing else. Let me see, among the favorites, is there any one? I don't even know their names. Monsieur de Guillon. A coxcomb of whom such shameful things are said, that he hid in a wall while others were fighting. F.Y. F.Y. Pooh. We must not believe the half of what we hear. But stay, let me think. Do, do, my lord, think of some one. Yes, why not? Yes, ha. Yes. Who, my lord, who? Why not apply to the countess herself? To the countess Dewberry? Said the old lady, spreading out her fan. Yes, she is really a kind creature. Indeed. And anxious to be useful. I am of too ancient a family to please her, my lord. You are mistaken, countess, she tries to attach high families to her. Do you think so? asked the old countess, already beginning to waver in her opposition. Do you know her? said the chancellor. Oh, good heavens! No. Ah, there is the mischief. She is the person who has real influence. Yes, yes, she has influence, but I never saw her. Nor her sister Chan. No. Nor her sister Bischi. 
No. Nor her brother Jean. No. Nor her negro Zamor. What, her negro, my lord? Yes. Her negro is one of the governing powers. What, that little fright whose picture is sold in the streets, which looks like that of a dressed up pug dog? Yes, the same. I know that African, cried the countess, with offended dignity. How should I know him, my lord? Well, well. I see you do not wish to keep your estates, countess. How is that? Because you speak contemptuously of Zamor. But what has Zamor to do in the matter? He might have gained your suit for you, that is all. He. That Moor, that Hottentot. How could he gain it for me? By saying to his mistress that he wished you to gain it. You know what influence is. He makes his mistress do what he chooses, and she makes the king do what she chooses. Then Zamor governs France, my lord. Hum, replied the chancellor, nodding his head. He has a great deal of influence. And I had rather quarrel with, with the Dauphiness, for instance, than with Zamor. Great heaven, exclaimed the countess, if it were not a grave person like your lordship who told me such things, I could not believe them. Oh, I am not the only one who will tell them you. Everybody can tell them. Ask any of the dukes and peers if they ever forget, when going to Marley or Lucien's, to take comfits for Zamor to put in his mouth, or pearls for him to hang in his ears. I, who speak to you, am I not the Chancellor of France, or something very near it? Well, what was I doing when you came in? I was drawing up a governor's commission for Zamor. A governor's commission? Yes. Monsieur Zamor is appointed governor of the castle of Luciennes. The very same title with which they rewarded the Count de Bern, after twenty years' service. Yes, he was made governor of the castle of Blois. I remember that. But what a degradation! Good heavens! The monarchy is dead. It is very ill, at least, and you know, Countess, when an invalid draws near his end, people try to get all they can from him. No doubt, no doubt. But the question is, how to get near this invalid? Do you know what you must do to be well received by the Countess Dubarry? What? You must get admitted by being the bearer of this commission for her Negro. I. It will be an excellent beginning. Do you think so, my lord, said the poor Countess, all alarmed. I am sure of it, but. But what? Do you know anyone acquainted with her? No one but yourself, my lord. Oh, as for me, it would be difficult for me to introduce you. Assuredly, said the poor old lady, tossed to and fro by alternate hopes and fears, assuredly, fortune is hostile to me. Your lordship has received me in a manner quite unexpected, for indeed I did not expect to be admitted to an audience, then, you have inclined me to pay my court to Madame Dubarry, I, a bairn. And I am ready to undertake the hateful task of delivering the commission for her wretch of a negro, and now I cannot even get an introduction to her. The Chancellor began again to stroke his chin, and appeared very thoughtful, when suddenly the usher announced, Monsieur le Viscount Jean Dubarry. At this name the Chancellor made a gesture of amazement, and the Countess sank back breathless in her chair. Now, say that fortune has abandoned you. Ah, Countess, Countess, heaven is working in your favor. Then, turning to the usher, without giving the old lady time to recover, he desired that the Viscount should be admitted instantly. The usher withdrew, and in a moment after our old acquaintance, Jean Dubarry, entered, with his arm in a sling. After the usual number of bows were made on both sides, and as the Countess, trembling and undecided, was trying to rise in order to take leave, for the Chancellor, by a slight movement of the head, had indicated to her that her audience was ended, pardon me, my lord, said the Viscount, pardon me, madam, I interrupted you, I fear. But I beg of you not to go away, I have only two words to say to his lordship. The countess sat down again without requiring to be pressed, her heart full of joy and expectation. But, perhaps, sir, I shall be in your way. She stammered. Oh, madam, not at all, 
not at all. I merely wish to lodge a short complaint with his lordship. A complaint? Against whom? exclaimed the Chancellor. An attack upon me, my lord. An assassination. One cannot pass over such things as that. Let them abuse us, make ballads about us, blacken us, we can survive all that, but when it comes to cutting our throats, mordu. We die. Explain the affair, I beg, said the Chancellor, pretending to be very much horrified. It is easily done. But I fear I am interrupting this lady's audience. The Countess de Bern, said the Chancellor, introducing the old lady to the Viscount Jean Dubarry. Dubarry retreated gracefully to make his bow, the Countess to make her courtesy. And both saluted as ceremoniously as if they had been at court. After you, sir, said she. Madam, I would not be guilty of such treason against gallantry for the world. Oh, sir, my business only concerns money, in yours honor is concerned. Yours is, therefore, more urgent. Then, madam, said the viscount, since it is your wish, I shall take advantage of your obliging permission. And he related his tale to the chancellor, who listened very gravely. You will require witnesses, said M. de Mopia, after a moment's reflection. Ah, cried Dewberry, how easily one discovers even in those worlds the upright judge who can only be influenced by irrefutable truth. Well, I can procure witnesses. My lord, said the countess, the viscount has found one already. What witness? They both asked. I, myself, the countess replied. You! exclaimed the chancellor. Sir, said she, addressing the viscount, did not this affair happen at the village of La Chasse? Yes, madam. At the post house? Yes. Well, I shall be your witness. I passed through the place where the attack was made on you, two hours after it happened. Really, madam? said the Chancellor. Yes, continued the Countess, and everybody was talking of what had just taken place. Take care. said the Viscount, take care, madam, if you consent to aid me in this matter, very likely the Choiseuls will find some means of making you repent of it. Ah, said the Chancellor and the more easily that the Countess de Bern is engaged in a lawsuit, her chance of gaining which is very doubtful, I am afraid. Oh, my lord, cried the old lady, putting her hand to her head, I sink from one difficulty to another. Lean upon the Viscount, said the Chancellor, in a half-whisper, he has a powerful arm to assist you. Only one at present, said Dewberry, with a simper. But I know a certain person who has two good arms, they can reach far, and I offer you their aid. Oh, Monsieur le Viscount, are you serious in making me such an offer? It is only service for service, madam. I accept your aid, you accept mine. Is it agreed? Do I accept yours? Oh, sir, you do me too much honor. Then, madam, will you take a seat in my carriage? I am just going to pay a visit to my sister. Without any reason, without any preparations? Oh, sir, I dare not. You have a reason, madam, said the Chancellor, slipping into her hand Zamor's commission. My lord, you are my tutelary genius, cried the old lady, taking the document. Monsieur le Viscount, you are the flower of the French nobility. At your service, said the Viscount, pointing the way to the Countess, who was as quick as a bird to take it. Thanks for my sister, whispered Jean in the Chancellor's ear, thank you, cousin. But did I play my part well, eh? Admirably, said Mopia, but pray make the Countess laugh by telling her how I played mine. But take care. The old lady is as sharp as a needle. At that moment the Countess turned, the two gentlemen bowed formally to each other, as if taking a ceremonious adieu. A splendid carriage, with attendants in the royal livery, waited at the door. The old lady took her place in it quite elated, Jean seated himself beside her, and they departed. After the king left Madame. Dewberry, as we have formerly related, after a very cold and constrained reception, the countess was left alone with Chan and her brother, who had not appeared at first, for fear of his wound being examined, 
it being, in reality, very trifling. The result of this family council was, that the countess, instead of going to Lucien's, as she had told the king, set off for Paris. She had there, in the Rue de Valois, a snug little house which served as a place of rendezvous for all her family, every member of which was constantly running backward and forward, hither and thither, as business or pleasure led them. The countess being installed in this domicile of hers, took a book and waited. Meantime, the viscount prepared his battery. It might be about half-past seven by the large dial of the church of Esti. Eustache, when the Countess de Bern and Viscount Dubarry passed by on their way to his sister's. The conversation on her side expressed great reluctance to avail herself of the good fortune which had fallen in her way. On his, there was the assumption of a sort of dignity in being her patron, with repeated exclamations at the happy chance which enabled him to introduce her to the Countess Dubarry. In return, the old lady never ceased praising the politeness and affability of the Chancellor. All these fits on both sides, however, did not prevent the horses from going as fast as they could, and they reached their place of destination a little before eight. Permit me, madam, said the viscount, leaving the old lady in an anteroom, to inform the Countess Dubarry of the honour you have done her. Oh, sir, said the Countess, do not, I entreat you, allow my unseasonable visit to disturb her. Jean approached Zamor, who was watching for his return out of one of the windows, and whispered something in his ear. What a dear little negro, cried the countess. Is he your sister's, sir? Yes, he is one of her favorites, madam. I congratulate her on having such a one. At this moment a footman opened the folding doors of the saloon where Madame Dubarry usually granted audiences, and requested the countess to walk in there. While the old lady was sighing over the luxurious furniture of the apartment, Jean was with his sister, announcing his prize. Is it really she? asked Madame Dubarry. Flesh and blood. Does she suspect anything? Nothing in the world. And how did the vice behave? Admirably, everything conspired to favor us. Do not let us leave her too long alone, lest she should suspect something. You are right, for I assure you, she seems to me cunning enough. Where is Chan? At Versailles, you know. Well, she must not, by any means, let herself be seen. Oh, I warned her. Now, princess, enter. Madame Dubarry gently pushed open the door of her boudoir and entered the saloon. All the ceremonials necessary to the etiquette of those days was scrupulously gone through by the two actresses mutually desirous of pleasing. Madame Dubarry was the first to speak. I have already thanked my brother, Madam, for having procured me the honor of this visit, allow me now to thank you also for having consented to his wish. I know not, Madam, replied the old lady, in what terms to thank you for this gracious reception of me. Madam, said the Countess, in her turn, with a courtesy of profound respect, it is only due to a lady of your rank to place myself at your disposal, if I can be of service to you in any way. And three more courtesies having been made on each side, the Countess invited Madame de Bern to be seated. XXXI, Zamor's Commission. Madame, said the favorite, pray let me hear your wishes, I am all attention. Permit me, sister, said Jean, who continued standing, to disabuse your mind of the idea that the Countess de Bern comes with a petition, not at all, the Chancellor has simply asked her to perform a little office for him. The old lady turned a grateful look on the viscount, and held out to the countess the patent signed by the vice-chancellor declaring Lucien's a royal castle, and Zamor its governor. Then it is I who am the person obliged, said the countess, glancing at the document. If I could only be so fortunate, madam, as to be of any service to you in return. Oh, that you can readily be! exclaimed the old lady, with a frankness which enchanted the brother and sister. Pray let me know how, madam. You were kind enough to say that my name is not quite unknown to you, madam. Unknown. A bairn? Then you have perhaps heard of a lawsuit which threatens my whole property. Oh, yes, a snit between you and the family of the Seleuces? Alas, madam, yes. I know all about it, madam. 
I heard His Majesty the other evening speak of it to my cousin, the Chancellor. His Majesty speak of my lawsuit. Yes, madam. And in what terms, pray? Alas! My dear madam, and madam Dewberry shook her head. As lost, as lost, was it not, exclaimed the old lady, with anguish. If I must speak the truth, madam, it was. His Majesty said so. His Majesty had too much prudence and delicacy to pronounce sentence decidedly, but he seemed to look upon the adverse party as already in possession of the estate. Oh, heavens! Madam, if His Majesty were but rightly informed on the subject, if he knew that all this was about a bond really discharged, yes, madam, the two hundred thousand francs have been paid. I have not a receipt for the money, certainly. But I have a moral certainty that it was paid. I could, if I was allowed to plead in person before the Parliament, demonstrate it by inference. By inference, exclaimed Madame. Dewberry, who did not understand one word of what she said, but who appeared to pay the most serious attention. Yes, madam, by inference. The proof by inference is admissible, said Jean. Do you think so, sir? asked the old lady. Yes, I think it is, replied the viscount, with profound gravity. Well, then, by inference I could prove that the bond for two hundred thousand francs, with the interest accumulated, amounting to a total of about one million, I could prove that this bond, bearing date 1406, was discharged by Guy Gaston. The fourth Count of Bern, on his deathbed, in 1417. For there it is written by his own hand in his will, being on my deathbed, and owing nothing to any man, and ready to appear before God. Well, said Madame Dewberry. Well, Madame, if he owed nothing to any man, he owed nothing to the family of the Seleucus, otherwise he would have said, owing two hundred thousand francs instead of saying owing nothing to any man. Most undoubtedly he would have said so. Exclaimed Jean. But you have no other proof, asked the favorite. Then his word, none, madam, but he was called Gaston the Irreproachable. And your opponents have the bond? Yes. They have, and that is just what makes the affair more intricate. She should have said, that is just what clears up the matter but she looked at things from her own point of view. So your conviction is, madam, that the bond was discharged? said Jean. Yes, sir, that is my decided conviction, exclaimed Madame de Bern, warmly. Do you know, said the Countess, turning to her brother, as if deeply penetrated by that conviction, the proof by inference, as the Countess de Bern calls it, changes the face of things wonderfully? Oh, wonderfully, returned Jean. And very unpleasantly for my opponents, continued the Countess, the terms of Gaston IV's will are most positive, owing nothing to any man. It is not only clear, it is logical, said Jean. He owed nothing to any man, therefore of course he had paid what he owed. Therefore he had paid what he owed, repeated the Countess Dewberry. Oh, madam, why are you not my judge, ejaculated the old lady. Formerly, said the Viscount, we should not have had recourse to the tribunals to settle an affair of that kind, the judgment of heaven would have been enough. For my part, I am so convinced of the goodness of your cause that, did the old custom still exist, I should willingly offer myself for your champion. Oh, sir! Yes, I should act as did my grandfather, Dewberry Moore, who had the honor of being connected with the royal family of the Stuarts, when he fought in the lists for the beautiful Edith of Scarborough, and made his adversary confess that he lied in his throat. But unhappily, continued the Viscount, with a sigh of disdain for the degeneracy of the age, we live not in those glorious times. And gentlemen, when they claim their rights, must submit their causes to the judgment of a set of pettifoggers, who have not the sense to understand a phrase so clear as, owing nothing to any man. But, brother, said the Countess, it is three hundred years since those words were written, so you must allow that the gentlemen of the long robe may well pause a little before deciding on them. Oh, no matter, no matter, I am certain that if His Majesty heard the Countess de Bern state her case herself as she has done to us. I should convince His Majesty, should I not, sir? I am certain of it. Yes. 
But how am I to obtain an audience of His Majesty? You must come and visit me at Lucien's. And as His Majesty does me the honor of coming sometimes to see me there. My dear, interrupted the Viscount, that is all very well, but it depends on chance. Viscount, replied the favorite, with a sweet smile, you know that I depend a good deal on chance, and I have no reason to complain. Yes, but the Countess de Bern might go to Lucien's for a week or a fortnight, and yet not meet his majesty. That is true. In the meantime, her cause is to come on Monday or Tuesday. On Tuesday, sir. And this is Friday evening. Ah, then, said Madame Dubarry, with a countenance all disappointment, we must not reckon upon that. What shall we do, said the Viscount, as if in deep thought. What a devil of a business! I might have an audience at Versailles, suggested the old lady timidly. Oh, you will not obtain it. But through your influence, madam. Oh, my influence would be of no avail. His Majesty detests business matters, and, besides, his mind is now full of one thing only. The Parliament? asked Madame de Bern. No, my presentation. Ah, said the old lady. For you know, madam, in spite of the opposition of Monsieur de Choiseul and Madame de Grammont, the king has decided that I shall be presented. I was not aware, madam. It is a settled affair, said Jean. And when will the presentation take place, madam? Oh. Very soon. You see, the king wishes it to be before the arrival of the Dauphiness, that he may invite my sister to share the festivities at Compiègne. Ah. Uh, I understand. Then you have all the arrangements made for your presentation, said the old countess, sighing. Oh, yes, replied the viscount, the Baroness Dialogni, do you know the Baroness Dialogni? No, sir. Alas! I scarcely know anyone now. It is twenty years since I was at court. Well, it is the Baroness Dialogni who is to present my sister. The king loads her with favors her husband is Chamberlain, he is to be raised from a baron to a count, the son is to go into the guards, her orders on the king's privy purse are to be made payable by the city of Paris. And the day of the presentation she is to receive twenty thousand crowns paid down. So she is eager for it, you may be sure. Yes, I can readily understand that, said the old lady, smiling. Oh, but now I think of it, cried Jean. Of what? asked the Countess Dewberry. What a misfortune, what a misfortune! Continued he, that I did not meet Madame a week sooner at our cousin the Vice-Chancellor's. Why, pray? Why, he had no positive engagement then with the Baroness Dialogni. Dear brother, you speak like a sphinx, I do not understand you. You do not understand? No. I will wager something the Countess de Bern understands. No, sir, I do not, indeed. Last week you had not decided who should present you. Undoubtedly. Well, the Countess de Bern, but perhaps, madam, I am taking too great a liberty. No, sir, no. Then madam could have presented you, and the king would have done for her what he is going to do for the Baroness Dialogni. Alas! said the old lady, opening her eyes to their utmost extent. Oh, if you knew, continued Jean, all the favors his majesty heaped on the family of the baroness, as soon as he knew she had offered to introduce Jean. There was only one thing in the affair that vexed him. Ah, uh, one thing vexed him. Yes, one single thing, one thing vexes me, said he. The lady who presents the Countess Dewberry I should wish to bear a historical name, and as he said that he looked at the picture of Charles I, by Van Dyck. Yes, I understand, said the old lady, his majesty turned to that picture on account of the alliance between the Dewberry Moors and the Stuarts, of which you spoke just now. Precisely. The fact is, said the old lady, with a slight air of hauteur, I never heard of the family of Delogny. A good family, however, said the countess, they have brought forward all the necessary proofs, or nearly all. Pardieu! cried Jean, suddenly starting in his chair. Well, what is the matter, said Madame Dewberry, 
scarcely able to refrain from laughing outright at the contortions of her brother-in-law. Monsieur has hurt himself, perhaps. Asked the old lady, anxiously. No, said Jean, sinking slowly back again into his chair, it was an idea which just then occurred to me. What idea, said the countess, laughing, it almost overturned you. It must certainly have been a good one, said Madame de Bern. Excellent. Well, we are all anxiety to hear it. It has only one fault. Well. It is impossible. No matter, let us hear it. Suppose we were to tell the Baroness Dialogni the king's remark when he looked at Charles I's portrait. Oh, brother, that would not be politics, we cannot think of it. The old lady sighed. It is vexatious, too, continued the Viscount, as if speaking to himself, the affair could have been so easily arranged. The Countess de Bern, who not only bears such an ancient name, but is besides a woman of distinguished talent, would offer herself in the place of the Baroness Dialogni, she would have gained her lawsuit. Her son would have got a commission as lieutenant in the guards, and as Madame must, of course, have been put to considerable expense in her frequent visits to Paris, there would have been an adequate compensation allowed. Such an opportunity does not occur twice in a lifetime. Alas, no! I exclaimed the old lady, quite overcome by this unforeseen blow. The fact is, that any one in the position of the old litigant would have felt inclined to echo her exclamation, and like her would have sunk back overwhelmed in her easy chair. Now, brother, said the countess, in a tone of great compassion, you see you are giving pain to Madame de Bern, was it not enough that I was forced to tell her I could do nothing for her with the king before my presentation? Oh, if I could delay my suit, sighed the countess. For only eight days, said Dubarry. Yes, in eight days, resumed Madame de Bern, in eight days Madame will be presented. Yes. But the king will be at Compiègne in eight days, he will be in the midst of festivities, the Dauphiness will have arrived. Stop. I have another idea. No, yes, no, yes, yes, I have hit it. What is it, sir, said Madame. De Bern, whose whole soul seemed to hang upon the Viscount's lips, and who repeated mechanically the monosyllables he uttered. Your presentation is still a secret, no one knows that you have got a lady to present you. No. For the king wishes it to fall like a thunderbolt on the court. Well, the Countess de Bern will demand an audience, as she is not supposed to know any more about your presentation than others, for the purpose of offering to present you. The king, at such an offer from a lady of her rank, will be delighted, he will receive her, thank her, will ask her what he can do for her. She will introduce the subject of her lawsuit, and explain her views respecting it, his majesty will give them a favorable consideration, and the suit which she thought lost, is gained. The favorite fixed her eager gaze on the old lady, who probably began to suspect that there was some snare laid for her. I'm a poor unknown creature, said she. His Majesty would not, perhaps. Enough. I merely wish to give you a friendly advice on the matter, said Jean. Oh, sir, I am only too sensible, said the Countess, hesitating. It is not a bad idea, replied Madame Dubarry, smiling. But perhaps Madame would not like to descend to anything like a trick, even to gain her lawsuit. Quite true, Madame, said the old lady, hoping to get off by this means. I had much rather do you some real service to obtain your friendship. Indeed, nothing could be more condescending, said the favorite, with a slight shade of irony which did not escape the penetration of Madame de Bern. Well, I have still another means, said Jean. The old lady listened anxiously. Really, brother, your imagination is as fertile in resources as that of Monsieur de Beaumarchais. Let us hear this last idea. It is that the Countess de Bern shall render you the real service which she wishes to do. Can you not persuade the Baroness Dialogni to yield her rights to the Countess? You need not tell her plumply the King's observation, but you could with your tact make her understand that he preferred the Countess's ancient name. This time the attack was direct, he thought there could be no evasive answer, but the Countess found one. I should not like to interfere with that lady's arrangements, said she, 
among persons of quality a certain attention to these engagements must be observed. Madame. Dewberry made a gesture of anger and disappointment, but the Viscount, by a look, restrained her. Observe, madam, said he, I insist on nothing. Like many in the world, you have a lawsuit, which very naturally you wish to gain. It appears, however, that on the contrary you are likely to lose it, you are in despair, just at that moment I arrive, I feel for you, I take an interest in the affair which does not in the remotest degree concern me. I endeavor to make it turn out favorably for you. I am wrong, let us say no more about it, and Jean rose from his seat. Oh, sir, exclaimed the old lady in despair, for she now saw that the Dewberries, who had been till then indifferent, were going to use their influence against her, oh, sir, believe me, I am truly grateful to you. I feel how benevolent have been your intentions. As for myself, replied Jean, playing to the life the part of a person perfectly unconcerned, it matters not whether my sister be presented by the Baroness Dialogni, the Countess de Palastrin, or the Countess de Bern. Oh, certainly, sir. Only I confess I felt annoyed that the royal favor should be bestowed on some mean spirit actuated by sordid interest, a spirit yielding to our power, because it is impossible to undermine it. Oh, that is what will most probably happen, said the favorite. While, continued Jean, the Countess de Bern, almost an entire stranger to us, and coming forward with dash about any solicitation on our part, and prompted solely by her kindness and good nature to offer her services appears to me worthy of all the advantages which thereby accrue to her. The old lady was probably about to disclaim that goodwill which the Viscount did her the honor to attribute to her, but Madame Dewberry did not give her time. The fact is, said she, the king would not refuse anything to a lady who would act as you describe. What? The king would not refuse anything, do you say? Even more, he would say with his own lips to the vice-chancellor, Monsieur de Maupia, I wish that everything should be settled about the lawsuit as the Countess de Bern wishes but it seems, however, as if you saw some difficulty in the matter. Very good. But you will at least do me the justice, I hope, to believe that I was actuated by a sincere wish to serve you, madam and the Viscount bowed. Indeed, sir, my heart is filled with gratitude to you. Pray do not speak of it, said the gallant Viscount. But the Baroness Dialogni would not yield up her right, resumed the old lady, after a short pause. Still, Her Majesty would not be the less grateful to you for your offer. But supposing, persisted the old lady, who was determined to view the matter in the worst light, in order to see to the bottom of the affair, supposing the Baroness would yield her privilege to me. She would not so readily give up the accompanying advantages. The King's kindness is inexhaustible, madam said the favorite. If I offered my services, madam, replied the old lady, drawn on more and more both by her interest and by the clever manner in which they played their parts, I should leave out of view the gaining of my cause, for, to say the truth, a suit which every one thinks lost today will not be easily gained tomorrow. Oh, but if the king were favorable, exclaimed Jean, eager to combat her new doubts. Well, said the favorite, I confess I am of the Countess's opinion, Viscount. You are, said he, staring at her with open eyes. Yes, I think it would be more honorable for a lady of her ancient name to allow her suit to go as it may. Then there would be nothing binding on the king, nothing to impede his munificence to her. And if he did not wish, in the present state of the Parliament, to interfere with the course of justice, he might offer her compensation for the loss of the suit. Ah, sighed the old lady, how could he offer anything to compensate for the loss of two hundred thousand francs? Why, in the first place, replied Madame Dewberry, there might, for instance, be a royal gift of one hundred thousand francs. The partners in this scheme looked at their victim with eager eyes. I have a son, said she. So much the better. One more loyal servant of the state. But do you think, madam, there would be anything done for my son. I can answer for it, said Jean, that the least he might expect would be a lieutenancy in the guards. Have you any other relations? inquired the Countess Dewberry. I have a nephew. Well, we should find out something for your nephew, said the Viscount. 
I think we may leave that in your hands, Viscount, said the favorite, laughing, as you have just given us proofs of so brilliant an imagination. Well, continued the Viscount, apparently determined to bring matters to an issue, if His Majesty did all these things for you, would you think it tolerably well? I should think him extremely generous, and should offer you, madam, all my thanks, convinced that it is to you alone I should be indebted for his generosity. Then, asked the favorite, you really take our proposal seriously into consideration? Yes, madam, most seriously, replied the old lady, turning pale at the very thought of the obligation to which she pledged herself. And you permit me to mention you to his majesty? Pray do me that honor, replied she, with a deep sigh. Madam, I shall do so with the least possible delay, indeed, this every evening, said the favorite, rising to terminate the interview. And in the meantime, I trust that I have secured your friendship. I feel so highly honored by yours, madam, said the old lady, beginning her courtesies again, that I almost feel as if all this were a dream. Let us see, once more, said Jean, wishing to fix the matter so firmly in the old countess's mind, that it might be secure from all change. One hundred thousand francs first, to make up for the loss of the suit, a lieutenancy for the young count, and something for a nephew. Something. I shall find out something good, that is my affair. And when shall I have the honor of seeing you again, madam, asked the old lady. Tomorrow morning my carriage shall be at your door to take you to Lucien's, the king will be there. Tomorrow, at ten o'clock, I shall have fulfilled my promise, his majesty will be informed, and will expect you. Allow me to accompany you, madam, said Jean, offering his arm. By no means, sir. Well, then, to the top of the stairs. Since you insist on it, and she took the viscount's arm. Zamor, cried the countess. Zamor appeared. Light this lady downstairs, and order my brother's carriage forward to the door. The two ladies exchanged a last courtesy. At the top of the staircase Jean bid the old countess adieu, and returned to his sister, while Madame de Berne majestically descended the grand staircase. Zamor marched first, then came two footmen with lights, and then the old lady, her train, rather a short one, borne by a third footman. The brother and sister watched at the window, following with their eyes to the very carriage the precious chaperone sought with so much care and found with so much difficulty. Just as she reached the door a chaise entered the courtyard, and a young lady sprang out. Ah, Mistress Chan, cried Zamor, opening his enormous mouth to its widest extent with delight. How do you do this evening, Mistress Chan? The Countess de Berne stood petrified. In the new arrival she recognized her visitor, the false daughter of Master Flagget. Dewberry hurriedly opened a window, and made frantic signs to his sister, but she did not see them. Has that little fool, Gilbert, been here, inquired Chan of a lackey, without perceiving the countess. No, madam, replied one of the footmen, we have not seen him. It was just then that, looking up, she saw her brother, and following the direction of his hand, discovered Madame de Bairn. Chan recognized her, hastily pulled down her hood, and rushed into the vestibule. The old lady, without appearing to have remarked anything, got into the carriage, and gave her address to the coachman. XXXII, the king gets tired. The king, who had gone to Marley, as he had said he would, ordered his carriage at three o'clock in the afternoon, and drove from that to Lucien's. He supposed that Madame Dewberry, on receiving his note, would immediately leave Versailles, and hasten there to wait for him. He was rather surprised, therefore, on entering the chateau, to find Zamor, looking very little like a governor, occupied in plucking out the feathers of a parrot, which, in return, was endeavouring to bite him. The two favourites were rivals, like the Duc de Choiseul and the Countess Dewberry. The king installed himself in the small saloon, and dismissed his attendants. Although the most inquisitive gentleman in his kingdom, he was not in the habit of questioning servants or lackeys, but Zamor was neither a servant nor lackey, he occupied a middle place between the monkey and the parrot. The king therefore questioned Zamor. Is the countess in the garden? No, master. This word the favorite, 
in one of her whims, had ordered to take the place of majesty at Lucien's. Is she at the lake, feeding the carp? This lake had been dug at a vast expense out of the side of the hill. It was fed with water from the aqueduct, and filled with great numbers of the finest carp, brought from Versailles. No, master, again answered Zamor. Where is she, then? In Paris, master. What? Did the countess not come to Lucien's? No, master, but she sent some more. What to do? To wait for the king. Ah, uh, ha! So you are delegated to receive me? Very agreeable indeed. Thank you, countess. Thank you. I am to have the society of Zamor. And he rose from his chair rather piqued. Oh, no, the king is not to have the society of Zamor, said the negro. Why not? Because Zamor is going away. Where are you going? To Paris. Then I am to be left alone. Better and better. But why go to Paris? To find Mistress Dewberry and tell her the king is at Lucien's. Oh, the countess desired you to tell me that, then? Yes, master. And did she tell you what I was to do till she came? She said you were to sleep. Ah, said the king to himself, she will not be long, and she has some surprise for me, then he added, aloud, go, then, and bring back the countess. But how will you travel? On the great white horse with the scarlet housings. And how long does it take for the great white horse to go to Paris? I do not know, said the negro boy, but he goes fast, fast, fast. Zamor likes to go fast. Indeed. I am extremely fortunate to find that Zamor likes to go fast. And he stationed himself at the window to see Zamor depart. A tall footman lifted him on the horse, and, with the happy ignorance of childhood, the little negro set off at a gallop on his gigantic steed. The king, being left alone, asked the footman at last if there were anything new at Lucien's. The servant replied that there was only Monsieur Boucher, who was painting the countess's boudoir. Oh, Boucher, poor Boucher, is he here, said the king, with a slight appearance of satisfaction, and where is he? In the summer house. Shall I show your majesty the way to it? No, no, I should rather go and see the carps. Give me a knife. A knife? Sire. Yes, and a large loaf. The valet returned carrying a large loaf, with a long knife stuck in it, on a china plate. The king made a sign to the valet to accompany him, and with a pleased air led the way to the pond. The feeding of carps was a traditional occupation in the Bourbon family, the Grand Monarch never missing it for a single day. Louis XV. Seated himself on a mossy bank, from which the view before him was charming. There lay the little lake, with its velvet slopes of turf, beyond it a village nestled between two hills. Further off the towers of Saint Germain with their wooded terraces, and further still the blue declivities of Saunois and Cormels, while above all this the grey and rose-tinged sky hung like a magnificent cupola. The weather had been stormy, and the foliage of the trees looked dark and heavy against the pale green of the meadows. The waters of the lake, glassy and immovable as a vast surface of oil, were disturbed from time to time by some silvery dashing fish springing up to seize the unwary fly, and checkering it with widespreading circles of alternate black and white. At the margin might be perceived the enormous snouts of a number of fish, which, fearless of hook or net, sucked the leaves of pendant plants, and with their huge fixed eyes, which seemed incapable of sight stared at the grey lizard and green frogs sporting among the bulrushes. When the king, like a man profoundly skilled in the art of killing time, had looked at the landscape on all sides, when he had counted the houses in the village, and the villages in the distance, he took the plate with the loaf, placed it beside him, and began to cut off large pieces of the bread. The carps heard the sound of the knife in the crust, and accustomed to that noise, which announced their dinner hour, they immediately flocked as close as possible to the bank, to show themselves to his majesty and solicit their daily meal. They would have done the same for any footman in his service, but the king naturally thought that all this trouble was for him alone. 
He threw in one after another the pieces of bread, which first disappearing for an instant and then returning to the surface, were contented for some time, then gradually crumbling away by the action of the water, were seized and seen no more. It was, indeed, a curious and amusing enough sight to see all these crusts pushed hither and thither by the invisible snouts, and tossed on the surface of the water until the moment when they were swallowed. At the end of about half an hour, His Majesty having in that time patiently cut one hundred bits of crust, had the satisfaction of seeing that not one remained floating. He began now, however, to feel rather tired of the sport, and he remembered that M. Boucher might amuse him a little, he would certainly be as good a resource as the carps, but in the country we must take what we can get. Louis therefore turned toward the summer house. Boucher had heard that he was at Lucien's, and though he went on painting, or seeming to paint, he followed the king with his eyes, saw him turn in the direction of the summer house, and radiant with joy. He adjusted his ruffles and mounted on his ladder, for he had been warned not to appear to know that the king was there. He heard a step on the floor of the room, and began to daub a fat cupid stealing a rose from a shepherdess in a blue satin gown and straw hat. His hand trembled, his heart beat. The king stopped on the threshold. Ah, Boucher, cried he, how you smell of turpentine, and he walked on. Poor Boucher, although he knew the king had no taste for the fine arts, did expect some other kind of compliment, and was nearly falling from his ladder. He came down and went away with the tears in his eyes, without scraping his palate or washing his brushes, which in general he was so careful to do. His majesty pulled out his watch, it was seven o'clock. Louis returned to the house, teased the monkey, made the parrot speak, pulled out the drawers of the cabinets, one after the other, and ransacked their contents. Evening drew on. The king was not fond of darkness, and the apartments were lighted up. But he did not like solitude either. My horse is in a quarter of an hour, said he. Ma foi, added he, I shall just give her one quarter of an hour, not a minute longer. As he said this, he stretched himself on a sofa opposite the fireplace, to watch the course of the fifteen minutes, that is, of nine hundred seconds. At the four hundredth beat of the timepiece, which represented a blue elephant carrying a pink sultana, he was asleep. As may be supposed, the footman who came to announce His Majesty's carriage, took care not to awake him. The result of this attention of his august slumber was, that when he awoke of his own accord, he found himself face to face with the Countess Dewberry, who was looking at him with her eyes wide open. Zamor stood in a corner, waiting for orders. Ah! You are here at last, Countess, said the king, sitting up on the sofa. Yes, sire, here I am, said the countess, and here I have been a pretty long time. Oh, a pretty long time. An hour and a half at least. But how your majesty does sleep. Faith, countess, you were not here, and I was getting shockingly tired, and then I sleep so badly at night. Do you know I was on the point of going away? Yes, I saw your majesty's carriage at the door. The king looked at his watch. Half past ten, then I have slept nearly three hours. After that, sire, say that you cannot sleep well at Lucien's. Oh, faith, very well, but what the devil do I see there, said he, looking at some more. You see the governor of Lucien's, sire. Not yet, not yet, said the king, laughing. The little wretch has put on his uniform before having been appointed, he reckons on my word, then. Sire, your word is sacred, and he is right in reckoning on it. But Samor has something more than your word, or rather something less, he has his commission, the vice-chancellor sent it to me. The oath is now the only formality which is wanting, make him swear quickly, and then betake himself to his post. Approach, governor, said the king. Samor came forward. He was dressed in a uniform, with an embroidered collar and a captain's epaulets, with short breeches, silk stockings, and a sword like a spit. He walked with a stiff, measured step, an enormous three-cornered hat under his arm. Can he swear? Ask the king. Oh, yes, sire, try him. Advance, cried he, looking curiously at the black puppet. On your knees, said the countess. 
swear, said the king. The child placed one hand on his heart, the other in the king's hand, and said, I swear fealty and homage to my master and mistress, I swear to defend to the death the castle in my keeping, and to eat the last pot of sweetmeats. Rather than surrender, should I be attacked? The king laughed, as much at the form of the oath as at the gravity with which Samor pronounced it. In return for this oath, he replied, with suitable gravity, I confer on you the sovereign rights of justice on high and low, on all inhabiting air, earth, fire and water, in this castle. Thank you, master, said Zamor, rising. And now, said the king, go and show off your fine clothes in the kitchen, and leave us alone, go. As Zamor went out at one door, Chan entered by another. Ah, and you there, too, my little Chan. Come, I shall hear the truth from you. Take care, sire, that you are not disappointed in your expectations, said Chan, the truth is, it would be for the first time in my life. If you wish to learn the truth, apply to my sister, she is incapable of speaking falsely. Is that true, Countess? Sire, Cho has too flattering an opinion of me, bad example has ruined me, and from this evening forth I am determined to lie like a real Countess, if the truth will not serve me. Oh, he, said the king. I suspect Chan has something to conceal from me. I must get from the police a report of what has occurred today. From the police, sire, Sartans or mine? Oh, from Sartans. What will you pay him for it? If he tell me anything worth hearing, I shall not be niggardly. Well, then, give my police the preference, and take my report. I shall serve you royally. You will even sell your own secrets. Why not, if I am well paid? Come, then, let me hear the report, but no fibs, remember. Sire, you insult me. I mean no equivocations. Well, sire, get your funds ready, I am about to begin my report. They are ready, said the king, jingling some money in his pocket. In the first place, the Countess Dubarry was seen in Paris, in the Rue de Valois, about two o'clock in the afternoon. Well, I know that, go on. About six o'clock some more proceeded to join her there. Very possibly, but what did Madame Dubarry go to Paris for? Sire, to meet the lady who is to present her. Pooh, said the king, with a grimace which he could not altogether conceal, she is very well as she is, without being presented. You know the proverb, sire, nothing is so dear to us as that which we have not. So she is absolutely determined to find this lady to present her. We have found her, sire. The king started, and shrugged his shoulders. I like that movement, sire. It shows that your majesty would be annoyed at the defeat of the Gramonts, the Gemonies, and all the hypocrites of the court, said the countess. I beg your pardon, did you speak? Yes, I am sure you are in league with those persons. In league? Countess, learn one thing, that the king only leagues with kings. True, but all your kings are friends of the Duc de Choiseul. Let us return to your chaperone, Countess. With all my heart, sire. You have succeeded in manufacturing a lady, then? I found one ready-made, and very well made, a Countess de Bern, a family who have numbered princes among their ranks. She will not dishonor the relative of the relatives of the Stuarts, I hope. The Countess de Bern, exclaimed the king, with surprise. I know only of one, who lives somewhere near Verdun. It is the very same, she has come to Paris on purpose to present me. Ha! And when is the affair to take place? Tomorrow, at eleven o'clock in the morning, I am to give her a private audience, and at the same time, if it be not too presumptuous, she will request the king to name a day, and you will name the earliest, will you not, dear France? The king burst into a forced laugh. Certainly, certainly, said he, kissing the countess's hand. Then all at once, tomorrow, at eleven, added he. Yes, at breakfast. Impossible, my dear countess. Impossible. Why? I shall not breakfast here, I must return this evening. What, 
said the countess, who felt an icy pang shoot through her heart at these words, you are going to leave us, sire. I am forced to do so, dear countess, I have to meet Sartans on very important business. As you please, sire, but you will at least sup here, I hope. Oh, yes, I shall sup, I think, yes, I am rather hungry, I shall sup. Order supper, Chan, said the countess, making at the same time a private signal to her, which no doubt referred to some previous arrangements. Chan left the room. The king had seen the signal in a mirror, and although he could not comprehend its meaning, he suspected some snare. Ah, said he, on second thoughts, I think it will be impossible to stay even for supper. I must not lose a moment. I have some papers to sign, today is Saturday. As you please, sire, shall I order the horses? Yes, fairest. Chan. Chan reappeared. His Majesty's horses, said the Countess. Very well, said Chan with a smile, and she left the room again. A moment afterward her voice was heard in the anteroom ordering the king's carriage. 33. The king is amused. The king, delighted at this exercise of his authority, which punished the countess for leaving him alone so jong, at the same time that it freed him from the trouble of settling the affair of her presentation, walked toward the door of the saloon. Chan entered. Well, are my attendants there? No, sire. There is not one of them in the anteroom. The king advanced into the anteroom himself. My attendants, cried he. No one answered. There seemed not to be even an echo in the silent chateau. Who the deuce would believe, said the king, returning to the saloon, that I am the grandson of the man who once said, I was very nearly having to wait. And he went to the window, opened it, and looked out. The space in front of the chateau was as deserted as the anterooms, no horses, no attendants, no guards. Night alone displayed to the eyes and to the soul all its calmness and all its majesty. The lovely moon shone brightly on the woods of Chatu, whose lofty summits rustled gently, like the waves of the sea rippled by the breeze. The Seine, on whose bosom glittered a long line of light, looked like a gigantic serpent trailing its slow length along its windings being visible from Bujival to Maisons, that is, for four or five leagues. And then, in the midst of this heavenly scene, a nightingale burst forth with such a sweet and varied song d as she only gives in the month of May. As if she felt that nature was worthy of her music in the early days of spring alone, days which are scarcely come ere they are gone. All this beauty and harmony were lost on Louis the Fifteenth. A king not much of a dreamer, a poet, or an artist, but, on the contrary, a good deal of a sensualist. Come, Countess, said he, considerably annoyed, give the necessary order, I entreat, what the deuce. This jest must have an end. Sire, replied the Countess, with that charming pouting air which became her so well, I do not command here. Nor do I, replied the King, for you see how I am obeyed. It is neither you nor I who command. Who is it, then? Is it you, Chan? I. Said the young lady, who was seated on a couch on the other side of the apartment exactly opposite the countess, who occupied a similar one on the near side, I find the task of obeying so difficult. That I have no inclination for that of commanding. But who is the master, then? The governor, sire, certainly. Monsieur Zamor. Yes. Ah, very true. Well, let some one ring for him. The countess stretched out her arm with a most graceful air of nonchalance to a silken cord ending in a tassel of beads. A footman, who had no doubt received his lesson beforehand, was ready in the anteroom and appeared. The governor, said the king. The governor, replied the valet, respectfully, is on guard, watching over His Majesty's precious life. Where is he? Going his rounds, sir. Going his rounds, repeated the king. Yes, with four officers, sire. The king could not help smiling. That is droll enough, said he, but it need not prevent my horses from being harnessed immediately. 
Sire, the governor ordered the stables to be closed, lest some marauder might enter them. And where are my grooms? Gone to bed, sire. Gone to bed, by whose orders? The governor's, sire. And the gates of the castle? Are locked, sire. Very well, then you must get the keys. The governor has them at his belt, sire. A well-guarded castle, indeed. Pest. What order is kept? The footman, seeing that the king ceased to question him, retired. The countess, reclining gracefully on a couch, continued to bite off the leaves of a beautiful rose, beside which her lips seemed like coral. Come, sire, said she at length, with a fascinating smile, I must take compassion on your majesty, give me your arm and let us set out in search of someone to help you, Chan, light the way. Chan went before, ready to apprise them of any danger which they might encounter. At the very first turn in the corridor the king's nose was saluted by an odor quite sufficient to awaken the appetite of the most fastidious epicure. Ha! Ha! What is that, countess, said he stopping. Oh, only supper, sire. I thought your majesty intended doing me the honor of supping at Lucien's, and I made arrangements accordingly. The king inhaled the gastronomic perfume two or three times, while he called to mind that his stomach had already given him certain tokens of its existence. Then he thought what a fuss there must be before his grooms could be awakened, that would take half an hour at least, a quarter more to harness the horses, ten minutes to reach Marley, and when at Marley, where he was not expected. He could get only a put-off of a supper. All these things passed through his mind, as he stood at the dining-room door, inhaling the seductive steam of the viands. Two covers were placed on the table, which was splendidly lighted and sumptuously laid out. Pest! Said Louis, you have a good cook, Countess. Oh, sire, this is merely his first effort, the poor devil has been doing wonders to deserve your majesty's approbation. Indeed, he is so sensitive, that he might perhaps, in his disappointment, cut his throat, as poor Vattel did. Really, do you think so? There was to be an omelette of pheasant's eggs on which he especially prided himself. An omelette of pheasant's eggs, I adore omelettes of pheasant's eggs. What a pity you must go. Well, Countess, we must not vex your cook, said the king, laughing, and, perhaps, while we are supping, Master Zamor may return from his rounds. Ah! Sire, a capital idea, said the Countess, unable to conceal her delight at having gained this first step. Come, sire, come. But who will wait on us, said the king, looking round in vain for an attendant. Ah! Sire, said madame. Dewberry, is your coffee less grateful when presented to you by me? No, countess, and still more when you make it for me. Well, come, then, sire. Two covers only. Has Chan supped, then? Sire, I did not venture without your majesty's express command. Come, come, said the king, taking a plate and cover from a sideboard himself, come, my little Chan, sit there opposite us. Oh, sire, said Chan. Yes, yes. Play the very humble and very obedient subject, you little hypocrite. Sit here, countess, near me, beside me. What a beautiful profile you have. Is this the first time you have observed it, dear France? How should I observe it when I am so happy in looking at your full countenance? Decidedly, Countess, your cook is first-rate. What soup? Then I was right in sending away the other. Quite right, quite right. Sire, follow my example, you see it will be to your advantage. I do not understand you. I have turned off my choiseau, turn off yours. Countess, no politics. Give me some Madeira. The king held out his glass. The countess took up a decanter to help him, and as she raised it up, her white fingers and rosy nails were seen to advantage. Pour gently and slowly, said the king. Not to shake the wine, sire. No, to give me more time to admire your hand. Assuredly, sire, 
said the Countess, laughing, Your Majesty is in the vein of making discoveries. Faith, yes, said the King, now in perfect good humor again, and think I am in the fair way of discovering. A new world? No. I am not so ambitious, besides, I find a kingdom as much as I can manage. No, only an isle, a little nook, an enchanted mountain, a palace of which a certain fair lady will be the Armida, and the entrance to which will be defended by all kinds of monsters. Sire, said the Countess, presenting the king with a glass of iced champagne, a luxury quite new at that period, here is some water just drawn from the river Lethe. The river Lethe, Countess, are you sure? Yes, sire. It was poor Jean who brought it from the shades below, from which you know he has just narrowly escaped. Countess, I drink to his happy resurrection. But no politics, I beg. Then I don't know what to talk about, sire. If you would relate something, you who have such a happy gift of telling a story. No, but I shall repeat you some verses. Verses? Yes, verses. Is there anything surprising in that word? I thought your majesty detested them. Parbleu. Out of each hundred thousand manufactured, ninety thousand are against myself. And these which your majesty is going to give me, belong to the ten thousand which cannot even make you look favorably on the ninety thousand. No, Countess, these are addressed to you. To me? By whom? By Monsieur de Voltaire. He charged your majesty to deliver them. Not at all, he sent them direct to your highness. How? Without a cover? No. Enclosed in a charming letter. Ah, I understand, your majesty has been at work this morning with the postmaster. But read the verses, sire, read Monsieur de Voltaire's verses. Louis the Fifteenth. Opened the paper, and read. Goddess of pleasure, soft queen of the graces. Why blend with the fates which make pathos to ring? Foul threatening suspicions and hideous disgraces. The fate of a hero, oh! Why shouldst thou bring? Still our dear Ulysses his country shall hold. The state's mighty bulwark, the monarch's delight. None wiser in council, in battle more bold. And Ilion can tell how restless his might. Fair Venus, thy throne all the gods shall surround. Thy beauty celestial all tongues shall declare. The roses of joy in thy path shall abound. Then calm the rough waters and smile on our prayer. Ah! Why should thy anger burn fiercely and high? Gainst the hero whom foemen still tremble to meet. For how can he draw from such beauty a sigh? Save in breathing his vows as he kneels at her feet? Decidedly, sire, said the countess, more piqued than gratified by this poetical offering. Monsieur de Voltaire wishes to recommend himself to your favor. He loses his pains, then, said the king. He is a firebrand who would burn Paris if he returned to it. Let him stay with his friend, my cousin, Frederick II, we can do very well with Monsieur Rousseau. But take the verses, Countess, and study them. She took the paper, made a match of it, and laid it beside her. Some toque, sire, said Chan. From the vaults which supply his majesty, the Emperor of Austria, said the countess. From the emperor's vaults, said the king. Pardieu. No one is supplied from them but myself. Very true, sire, said the countess, so I had it from your butler. Ah, said the king, and you have seduced. Co, sire, I have ordered. Well answered, countess, I was a fool. Will the king take coffee? asked Chan. Oh, certainly. And will his majesty burn it, as usual, asked the countess. If the lady of the castle permit. The countess rose. But what are you doing? I am going to wait on you myself. Well, said the king, leaning back in his chair like a man who had made an excellent supper, and whose humors were, therefore, in a happy state of equilibrium, well, I see that my best plan is to let you do as you like, countess. The countess brought a silver stand, with a little coffee pot containing the boiling mocha. 
She then placed before the king a plate on which was a silver cup and a carafe of bohemian glass, and beside the plate she laid the match which she had just folded. The king, with that profound attention which he always bestowed on this operation, calculated his sugar, measured his coffee, and, having gently poured on it the brandy, so that it swam on the surface, he took the little roll of paper, lighted it at a candle, and communicated the flame to the liquor. Five minutes afterward he enjoyed his coffee with all the delight of a finished epicure. The countess looked on till he had finished the last drop, then she exclaimed. Oh, sire, you have burned your coffee with Monsieur de Voltaire's verses. That is a bad omen for the Choiseuls. I was wrong, said he, laughing, you are not a fairy, you are a demon. The countess rose. Does your majesty wish to know whether the governor has returned? Some more. Bah! For what purpose? To allow you to go to Marley, sire. True, said the king, making a great effort to rouse himself from that state of comfort in which he found himself. Well, countess, let us see, let us see. The countess made a sign to Chan, who vanished. The king began his search for Zamor again, but, it must be confessed, with very different feelings from those which had before influenced him. Philosophers say that we behold things either dark or bright, according to the state of our stomachs, and, as kings have stomachs like other men, in general, indeed, not so good as other men. But still communicating the sensation of comfort or discomfort to the rest of the body in the same manner, our king appeared in the most charming humor which it was possible for a king to be in. And his search ended without his discovering Zamor, and without his being displeased at his want of success. XXXIV de Voltaire and Rousseau At ten o'clock the next morning, the king, though he had supped so well, began to think of breakfast, but, going to a window, he saw his carriage and all his attendants ready for his departure. Zamor, with folded arms, was giving, or pretending to give, orders. What is this, countess, said he, are we not to breakfast? One would think you were going to send me away fasting. Heaven forbid, sire. But I thought your majesty had to meet Monsieur de Sartens at Marley. Pardieu, said the king, could not Sartens be told to come here? It is so near. Your majesty will do me the honor to believe that that idea occurred to me before your majesty. And, besides, the morning is too fine for work, let us breakfast. Your Majesty must give me a few signatures for myself. For the Countess de Bern. Yes, and then name the day and the hour. What day and hour? The day and hour for my presentation. Ma foi, said the King, it must be so, I suppose, fix the day yourself. Sire, the sooner the better. Is all ready? Yes. You have learned to make your three courtesies. I have practiced them for more than a year. You have your dress. In twenty-four hours it will be ready. And you have your chaperone. In an hour she will be here. And now, Countess, for a bargain. What is it? That you will never again speak of that affair of the Viscount Jean with the Baron de Taverny. Must I sacrifice the poor Viscount? Yes, faith. Well, sire. I shall speak no more of it. The day, the day after tomorrow. The hour. Half past ten at night, as usual. It is settled. It is settled. On your royal word. On the word of a gentleman. Give me your hand on it, France, and Madame Dewberry held out her pretty little hand, in which the king placed his own. This morning all Luciennes felt the gaiety of its master. He had yielded on one point on which he had long before determined to yield, but then he had gained another. This was certainly a decided advantage. He would give one hundred thousand crowns to Jean on condition that he went to drink the waters of the Pyrenees, in Auvergne, that would pass for banishment in the eyes of the Choiseul party. There were Louis Dior's that morning for the poor, cakes for the carps, and praises for Boucher's paintings. Eleven o'clock struck. The Countess, although attending assiduously to the king, at his breakfast, could not help looking, from time to time at the clock, which moved too slowly for her wishes. 
His Majesty had taken the trouble to say, that when the Countess de Bern arrived, she was to be shown into the breakfast room. The coffee was served, tasted, drunk, still she came not. Suddenly the tramping of a horse's feet was heard. The Countess ran to a window. It was a messenger from the Viscount, who leaped from his horse reeking with foam. At sight of him she felt a chill run through her veins, for she knew all could not be right. But it was necessary to hide her uneasiness in order to keep the king in good humor. She returned to his side and sat down. A moment afterward, Chan entered with a note in her hands. There was no means of escape, it must be read before the king. What is that, sweet Chan, said the king, a love letter? Oh, certainly, sire. From whom? From the poor Viscount. Are you quite certain? Look at it, sire. The king recognized the writing, and thinking the note might contain something about the Le Chaussy affair, very well, said he, pushing it aside, very well, that is enough. The countess was on thorns. Is the note for me? she asked. Yes, countess. Will your majesty permit me? Oh, yes, read it, read it, and in the meantime, Chan will repeat, Maitre Corbeau, to me. So saying, he pulled her on his knee, and began to sing. Sadly out of tune, indeed, for Rousseau has recorded that Louis had the worst ear in his kingdom. The countess retired into the recess of a window, and read the following epistle. Do not expect the old wretch. She pretends that she scalded her foot yesterday, and is obliged to keep her room. You may thank Chan's most opportune arrival yesterday for this. The old wretch recognized her immediately, and so put an end to our little comedy. It was fortunate that that little wretch, Gilbert, who is the cause of this misfortune, was lost. I would have wrung his neck about. However, he may be assured it is in store for him, if ever he cross my path. But to return to the point, come to Paris at once, or we are lost. Jean. What is the matter? inquired the king, surprised at the sudden paleness which overspread the countess's face. Nothing, sire. It is only a bulletin of Jean's health. Does not the dear Viscount get better, then? Oh, yes, thank you, sire, much better, said the countess. But I hear a carriage enter the courtyard. Oh, our old countess, I suppose. No, sire. It is Monsieur de Sardin's. Well, what then? exclaimed the king, seeing that Madame Dubarry was moving toward the door. Well, sire, I shall leave you with him, and go to dress. And what about the Countess de Bern? When she comes, sire, I shall let your majesty know, replied the countess, crumpling the viscount's note in the pocket of her dressing gown. Then you abandon me, said the king, with a melancholy air. Sire, remember this is Sunday. You have papers to sign. So saying, she presented her fresh and rosy cheeks to the king, who kissed them, and she left the room. Devil take all signatures, said the king, and those who bring them. Who was it that invented ministers and portfolios? He had scarcely finished this malediction, when the minister and the portfolio entered by a door opposite that by which the countess had departed. The king sighed again more deeply than before. Ah! Are you there, Sartans? said he. How very punctual you are! This was said in a tone which left it very doubtful whether the words were intended as a eulogium or a reproach. The minister opened his portfolio, and busied himself in taking out and arranging his papers. Just then the sound of the wheels of a carriage was heard grating on the sand of the avenue. Wait a little, Sartans, said the king, and he ran to the window. What, said he. The countess is driving off. It is she indeed, sire, said the minister. But is she not going to wait for the countess de Bern? Sire, I am inclined to think she is tired of waiting, and goes to find her. Yet the old lady had decided on coming this morning. Sire, I am almost certain that she will not come. Then you know something about the matter, Sartines. Sire, I am obliged to know a little about everything, otherwise your majesty would be dissatisfied with me. Well, what has happened? 
Tell me, Sardans. To the old countess, sire. Yes. A very common case, sire, difficulties have arisen. Then the Countess de Bern really will not come. Hum. There was rather more certainty of it yesterday evening than there is this morning. Poor Countess. Said the King, unable, in spite of himself, to conceal a gleam of satisfaction which sparkled in his eyes. Ah, sire, the quadruple alliance and the family compact were trifles, in comparison with this presentation. Poor Countess. Repeated the King, shaking his head, she will never accomplish her purpose. I fear it, sire, unless your majesty concerns yourself about it. She was so certain that now all was in the right train. And what makes the matter worse for the countess, said M. de Sardens, is, that if she be not presented before the arrival of the Dauphiness, it is probable she never will be presented at all. More than probable. Sardens, you are right. They say that my daughter-in-law is very strict, very devout, very prudish. Poor Countess! It will certainly annoy her very much, sire, if she be not presented, but, on the other hand, it will relieve your majesty from many annoyances. Do you think so, Sardens? Oh, yes, sire! The envious, the libelers, the balladmongers, the flatterers, the journalists, will not have so much to say. If she was presented, sire, it would cost us at least one hundred thousand francs additional for the police. Indeed, poor countess. And yet she wishes so much to be presented. Your majesty knows you have only to command, and her wishes will be gratified. What do you mean, Sardens? Do you imagine that I could meddle in such an affair? Can I by signing an order make people polite to Madame Dubarry? Is it you, Sardens, a man of sense, who advise such an innovation to satisfy the whims of the countess? Oh, by no means, sire. I merely say as your majesty says, poor countess. Besides, said the king, her position is not so desperate, after all. You always look at things on the dark side, Sartans. Who can tell whether the countess de Bern may not change her mind? Who can be certain that the Dauphiness will arrive so soon? It will take four days yet before she can reach Compiègne, and in four days much may be done. Let me see. Have you anything for me to do this morning, Sardens? Oh, your majesty, only three papers to sign, and the minister of police drew out the first from his portfolio. Oh, said the king, a lady read a cachet. Yes, sire. And against whom? Your majesty may see. Oh. Against the Sieur Rousseau. What Rousseau is that, Sardens, and what has he done? Done, sire. Written, Le Contrat Social. Oh, then, it is Jean Jacques whom you wish to shut up in the Bastille. Sire, he disturbs the public peace. And what the deuce did you expect he would do? Besides, I don't propose to shut him up. Of what use is this letter, then? Sire, merely to have a weapon ready. Not that I am at all fond of your philosophers, Marquis. Your Majesty has good cause not to love them. But people will exclaim against us. Besides, I think we authorized him to come to Paris. No, sire, we said we should tolerate him on condition that he did not appear in public. And does he appear in public? He is always to be seen. In his Armenian dress? Oh, no, sire. We ordered him to lay it aside. And he obeyed? Yes, but complaining loudly all the time of our persecution. And how does he dress now? Oh, like other people, sire. Then he cannot be so much remarked. What, sire? A man who has been forbidden to appear in public not remarked. And then, only guess where he goes every day. To the Marshal de Luxembourg's, to Monsieur d'Alembert's, to Madame d'Epinay's? To the Café de la Regence, sire. He plays chess there every evening. He must be mad upon that point, for he always loses. And it requires every evening a company of soldiers to keep order among the crowds around the house. Well, said the king, 
the Parisians are even greater fools than I thought them. Let them go on amusing themselves in that way, Sartans. While they do so they will not shout starvation. But, sire, if some fine day he should take it into his head to make a speech as he did in London? Oh! In that case, as there would be criminality and public infringement of the laws, you would not require a lettre de cachet, Sartans. The minister saw that the king did not wish the arrest of Rousseau to rest on the royal responsibility, so he did not press the matter further. But, sire, said he, there is another philosopher. Another, replied the king, languidly. Shall we never have done with them? Ah, sire, it is they who have never done with us. And who is this one? Monsieur de Voltaire. Has he also returned to France? No, sire. It would be much better, perhaps, that he had, for then we could watch him. What has he been doing? It is not he who has been doing anything, it is his partisans, they are actually going to have a statue erected in his honor. Equestrian, I suppose. No, sire, and yet I assure you he is a famous captor of towns. The king shrugged his shoulders. Sire, there has not been seen such a one since Poliorcetes, continued Sartans. He obtains information from all quarters, his writings reach all quarters, the highest persons in your kingdom turn smugglers for the sake of his books. I seized, the other day, eight boxes full of them, two were addressed to the Duc de Choiseul. It is very amusing. Sire, only reflect that they are now doing for him what is only done for kings, they are decreeing him a statue. Sartans, statues are not decreed by others for kings, they decree them to themselves. And who is to make this fine work of art? The sculptor Pigale. He has set out for Ferny to execute the model. In the meantime, subscriptions are pouring in, and observe, sire, it is only authors who are permitted to subscribe. All come with their offerings, they make quite a procession every day. Even Rousseau brought his two lonest Dior's. Well, said the king, what can I do in the matter? I am not an author, it does not concern me. Sire, I thought of proposing to your majesty to put an end, by royal command, to this demonstration. I shall take good care not to do any such thing, Sartines. Instead of decreeing him a bronze statue, they would then decree him one of gold. Let them alone. Mondain. He will look even uglier in bronze than in flesh and blood. Then your majesty desires that the matter should take its own course. Let us understand each other, Sartans. Desire is not the word. I should be very glad to put an end to these things, certainly, but how can I? It is impossible. The time is past when royalty could say to the spirit of philosophy, as God says to the ocean, Thus far shalt thou go, and no further. To blame loudly but uselessly, to aim a blow, but strike short of our aim, that would only serve to show our own weakness. Let us turn away our eyes, Sartans, and pretend not to see. The minister sighed. At least, sire, said he, if we do not punish the men, let us suppress their works. Here is a list of books, which, in my opinion, should instantly be proscribed, some attack the throne, some the altar, some teach rebellion, others sacrilege. The king took the list, and read in a languid voice. The Sacred Contagion, or, the natural history of superstition. The system of nature, or, laws of the physical and moral world. Instructions of the Capuchin at Ragusa, to Brother Pediculoso, on his setting out for the Holy Land. He had not read one-fourth of the list, when he let it fall, while an expression of sadness and dejection overspread his usually unmoved countenance. He remained thoughtful, and for some minutes seemed quite overcome. Sartans, said he at last, one might as well undertake to move the world. Let others try it. The minister looked at him with that perfect understanding of his wishes, which the king loved in those who approached him, as it saved him the trouble of thinking and acting. A tranquil life, sire, said he, a tranquil life, is not that what your majesty wishes? The king nodded. Oh, yes, said he. I ask for nothing else from your philosophers, encyclopedists, thaumaturgy, 
Illuminati, poets, economists, journalists, tribes that come one knows not whence, that are always bustling, writing, croaking, calumniating, calculating, preaching, complaining. Let them be crowned, let statues be raised to them, let temples be built to them, but let them leave me in peace. Sartans arose, bowed, and left the apartment, muttering as he went, it is fortunate we have on our money, Domini salvam fac regem. Then the king, now left to himself, took a pen. And wrote to the dauphin the following lines. You have requested me to hasten the arrival of Her Royal Highness the Dauphiness, and I wish to gratify you. I have ordered that there shall be no stay made at Noyu, consequently, on Tuesday morning she will be at Compiègne. I shall be there myself precisely at ten o'clock, that is to say, a quarter of an hour before her. Thus, said he to himself, I shall get rid of that foolish affair of the presentation, which annoys me more than Voltaire and Rousseau, and all the philosophers, past, present, and to come. The affair will then be between the poor countess, the dauphin, and the dauphiness. Ma foi. It is only fair that young maids, with strength for it, should contend with these vexations, hatreds, and revenges. Children should early learn to suffer, it is an excellent part of education. Delighted at having thus got rid of the difficulty, and certain that he would not be reproached with either favoring or hindering this presentation, about which all Paris was occupied, the king entered his carriage and drove off to Marley, where the court was waiting for him. XXXV, chaperone and debutante. The poor countess. Let us continue to apply the epithet which the king had given her, for at this moment she truly deserved it, the poor countess hurried, like one in despair, to Paris. Chan, terrified by Jean's paragraph concerning Gilbert, shut herself up in the boudoir at Lucien's to hide her grief and anxiety, lamenting the fatal whim which induced her to pick up Gilbert on the highroad. Having reached the outskirts of Paris, the countess found a coach awaiting her. In the coach were Viscount Jean and a lawyer, with whom he seemed to be arguing in the most energetic manner. The moment he perceived the countess he leaped out, and made a sign to his sister's coachman to stop. Quick, countess, said he. Quick, get into my carriage, and drive to the Rue saint germain de Presse. Is the old lady going to give us the slip, said Madame Dubarry, changing carriages, while the lawyer, on a sign from the viscount, followed her example. I fear it, countess, replied Jean, I fear she is giving us a Roland for our Oliver. But what has happened? You shall hear. I stayed in Paris because, I am always suspicious, and in this case I was not wrong, as you will see. At nine last night I went prowling about the inn of the Coke Chanton. All quiet, no movement, no visitors, all looked well. Consequently, I thought I might go home to bed, and to bed I went. This morning I awoke at break of day. I roused Patrice, and ordered him to go and keep watch at the corner of the street. Well, at nine, observe, that was an hour sooner than I had appointed, I drove up to the hotel. Patrice had seen nothing to cause the least anxiety, so I boldly walked upstairs. At the door of the countess's room a maid servant stopped me, and told me that the countess could not leave the house today, and perhaps it would be eight days before she could move from her apartment. I confess that, although prepared for some rebuff, I was not for that. What, cried I, she cannot go out. What is the matter? She is ill. Ill? Impossible. Yesterday she was perfectly well. Yes, sir, but Madame likes to make her own chocolate, and this morning, when it was boiling, she spilled it over her foot, and she is scalded. On hearing the countess's cries I hastened in, and I found her nearly, fainting. I carried her to bed, and I think she is at present asleep. I was as white as your lace, countess, and could not help crying out, it is a lie. No, my dear Viscount Dubery replied a sharp voice, which seemed to pierce the very wall, it is not a lie. I am in horrible pain. I sprung to the side whence the voice came, and burst through a glass door which I could not open, the old countess was really in bed. Ah, madam! I exclaimed, but it was all I could utter, I was in such a rage. 
I could have strangled her with pleasure. Look there, said she, pointing to an old kettle which was lying on the floor, there is the coffee pot that did all the mischief. I flew to the coffee pot, and stamped on it with both feet. It will make no more chocolate, I can answer for it. What a misfortune, cried the old lady, piteously, it must be the Baroness Dialogni who will present your sister. But what can we do? It was so written, as the Eastern say. Heavens! Jean, you drive me to despair, exclaimed the Countess. Oh! I do not despair yet, if you go to her, it was for that that I sent for you. But why do you not despair? Why? Because you are a woman, and can do what I cannot. You can make the dressing be taken off. And, if you discover that it is an imposture, you can tell her that her son shall never be anything but a clown, that she shall never touch a farthing from the estate of the Seleucus, in short. You can play off the imprecations of Camilla on her much better than I the fury of Orestes. Is this all a jest? cried the Countess. No, I assure you. And where does our Sibyl lodge? At the Coke Chantan, Rue Saint Germain de Presse, a great black house, with a monstrous cock painted on an iron plate. When the iron creaks, the cock crows. I shall have a dreadful scene with her. No doubt of it, but you must take your chance. Shall I go with you? No, you would spoil all. Just what our lawyer said. I was consulting him on that point when you drove up. Nor your information, I may tell you, that he says to beat a person in his own house renders you liable to fine and imprisonment, while to beat him out of it. Is nothing said the countess. You know that better than anyone else. Jean grinned an ugly smile. Debts, said he, that are long in being paid, are paid with interest. And if ever I meet my man again, I would much rather, at present, speak of my woman. I have nothing more to tell you, so be off. But where will you wait for me? In the inn itself. I shall ask for a bottle of wine, and be there, in case you want a helping hand. Drive on, coachman, cried the countess. Rue Saint Germain de Presse, at the sign of the Coke Chantan, added the Viscount. In a quarter of an hour they were in the street honored by possessing the Coke Chantan. At some distance from the inn Madame Dubarry left her carriage and proceeded on foot. She feared that the noise of the wheels might put the old lady on the alert, that she might suspect what visitor was coming, and might have time to hide. Alone, then, she entered the gaping porch of the inn. No one saw her until she was at the foot of the staircase, there she encountered the hostess. The Countess de Bern, said she. She is very ill, madam, and cannot see any one. Yes, I am aware, and I came to know exactly how she is. And light as a bird, she was at the top of the stairs in a moment. Madam, madam, cried the hostess, a lady is going to force her way into your room. Who is she? asked the old lady, from a distant part of the room. I, said the favorite, appearing on the threshold with a face perfectly suited to the occasion, for she first smiled out of compliment, and then looked sad, by way of condolence. You hear, madam, exclaimed the old lady, turning pale. Yes, dear madam, I came to express my sympathy for your misfortune, of which I have just heard. Pray, tell me how this accident happened. But, madam, I dare not ask you to sit down in such a miserable place as this. I know, madam, that you have a castle in Turenne, and can excuse your being obliged to receive your friends here in an inn. And she sat down so determinately that the old lady saw she must allow her to have her way. You seem in great pain, madam, said the favorite. Oh, in dreadful pain. The right leg? But, good heavens, how did you manage to scald it? Nothing more simple, I held the chocolate kettle in my hand, the handle gave way, and I received the boiling water on my ankle. How shocking! The old lady sighed. Yes, shocking, indeed, said she. But this is always the case, misfortunes never come singly. You are aware that the king expected you this morning? Oh! Madam, that intelligence makes my sufferings infinitely greater. 
His Majesty is far from satisfied, Madam, that you did not pay your visit. But the pain I am in will he a sufficient apology, and I trust yet to be able to offer to His Majesty my very humble excuses. I do not tell you that to cause you any vexation, said the Countess, seeing that the old lady was assuming a little formality, but merely to let you know that His Majesty felt grateful for the offer that you made me. You see, madam, that it is now impossible for me to fulfill it. Certainly, but may I ask you a question? I shall be delighted to hear it. Does not your present state arise from your having experienced some sudden agitation? Very possibly, said the old lady, bowing slightly, I must acknowledge that I was deeply moved by your gracious reception of me. Yes, but there was another thing besides. Another thing? Nothing that I know of, madam. Ollie, yes, an unexpected meeting with a person on leaving my house. I did not meet anyone, I was in your brother's carriage. Before getting into the carriage? The old lady seemed to be tasking her memory. Just as you were going down the stairs to the vestibule. The old lady seemed more intent in trying to recall the events of yesterday. Yes, said the favorite, rather impatiently, someone entered the court as you left my house. I am so unfortunate, madam, as not to be able to recollect any one entering. A lady, now do you remember? I am so short-sighted, that at two paces from me, madam, I cannot distinguish any one. Oh, ho, oh, said the favorite to herself. She is too cunning for me. I shall never succeed by these means. Come, to the point at once. Then, since you did not see the lady, she continued, aloud, I must tell you that is my sister-in-law, Mademoiselle Dubarry. Oh, very well, madam. But as I have never had the pleasure of seeing her. Yes, interrupted the other, you have seen her, only when you saw her it was under the name of Flagget. So, cried the old lady, with a bitterness which she could not dissemble. So, that pretended Mademoiselle Flagget, who caused me to undertake the journey to Paris, is your sister-in-law. She is, madam. And who sent her to me? I did. To mystify me? No. To serve you, while at the same time you should serve me. The old lady bent her thick grey eyebrows. I do not think, said she, her visit will turn out very profitable to me. Did the vice-chancellor receive you ill, then, madam? Empty promises. But it seems to me that I offered you something more tangible than promises. Madam, God disposes though man proposes. Come, madam, let us view the matter seriously. You have scalded your foot. Scalded it very badly. Could you not, in spite of this accident, painful, no doubt, but, after all, nothing dangerous, make an effort to bear the journey to Lucien's in my carriage and stand before His Majesty for one minute? It is quite impossible, madam. Is the injury so very serious? Serious, indeed. And pray, who dresses it for you, and nurses you? Like all housekeepers, I have excellent recipes for burns, and I dress it myself. Might I take the liberty of requesting to see your specific? Oh, yes, it is in that vial on the table. Hypocrite, though the countess, to carry dissimulation to such a point. She is as cunning as a fox, but I shall match her. Madam, she added, aloud, I also have an excellent oil for accidents of this kind, but before applying it it is necessary to know what kind of scald it is, whether it is inflamed, or blistered, or the skin broken. Madam, the skin is broken, said the old lady. Oh, heavens! How you must suffer! Shall I apply my oil to it? With all my heart, madam. Have you brought it? No, but I shall send for it. In the meantime, I must see the state of your leg. Oh, madam, exclaimed the old lady, I could not think of permitting you to see such a spectacle. I know too well what is due to good manners. Delightful, thought madam Dewberry, she is now fairly caught. Then she added, where we can serve our fellow beings, madam, we must not stand upon etiquette, and she stretched out her hand toward the old lady's leg, which was extended on the sofa. Madame de Bern uttered a scream of pain. Very well acted, 
said Madame Dewberry to herself, watching her every feature distorted with anguish. How you frightened me, madam, said the old lady, it is almost death to me to touch it. And, with pale cheeks and half-closed eyes, she leaned back as if nearly fainting. Do you allow me to look at it? If you choose, madam, said the old lady, in a weak and suffering voice. Madame Dewberry did not lose an instant. She took out the pins in the bandages, and rapidly unrolled them. To her great surprise, she was permitted to go on. When it comes to the last covering, thought she, she will scream, and try to prevent me from seeing it. But, though she killed herself calling on me to stop, I will see the leg, and she proceeded in her task. Madame de Bern groaned, but offered no resistance. At last the bandages were untied, the last covering was removed, and a real wound caused by a scald lay before Madame Dewberry's eyes. Here ended the old lady's diplomacy. Livid and inflamed, the wound spoke for itself. The Countess de Bern might have seen and recognized Chan, but if so, her courage and determination raised her far above Portia and Mutia Sevilla. Madame Dewberry gazed at her in silent admiration. The old lady, now somewhat recovered, enjoyed her victory to the utmost, her inflamed eye brooded with satisfaction on the countess kneeling at her feet. Madame. Dewberry replaced the bandages with that delicate care which women exercise toward the suffering, placed the limb once more on its cushion, and took her seat beside the couch. Come, madam, said she, I see of what you are capable and I beg your pardon for not having begun this subject in the way in which I ought with such a woman as you. Make your own conditions. The eyes of the old lady sparkled, but it was only for a moment. In the first place, said Sue, state what your wishes are, and then I shall see if I can be of any service to you. Madam, I wish to be presented at Versailles by you, though it cost you another hour of the horrible suffering which you have endured this morning. The Countess de Bern listened unflinchingly. Anything else, madam, said she. That is all. Now for your turn. I must have, replied madame de Bern, with a decision which showed clearly that she treated with the Countess as one power with another, I must have the two hundred thousand francs of my lawsuit secured to me. But if you gain your cause, you will then have four hundred thousand. No for I look on the disputed two hundred thousand as mine already, and the other two hundred thousand I shall reckon as merely an additional piece of good fortune to that of possessing the honour of your acquaintance. You shall have them, madam. Well? I have a son, whom I love tenderly, madam. Our house has already been distinguished by military genius, but, born to command, we make but indifferent subalterns. My son must have a company immediately, and next year a colonel's commission. Who will pay all the necessary expenses, madam? The king. You perceive that if I expended on my son the sum which I am to receive from you, I should be as poor tomorrow as I am today. At the lowest, I may reckon that at six hundred thousand francs. Four hundred thousand, supposing the commission worth two hundred thousand, which is a high estimate. This shall be granted you also. I have now to request from the king payment for a vineyard in Turenne, containing four acres, which the engineers deprived me of eleven years ago in making a canal. But they paid you then? Yes, they paid me according to the valuator's estimate, but I value it at just double the sum. Well, you shall be paid a second time. Is that all? Excuse me. I am out of cash, as you may suppose, madam, and I owe Master Flagget something about nine thousand francs. Nine thousand francs? Yes, it is absolutely necessary to pay him, he is an excellent lawyer. I have not the least doubt of it, madam. Well, I shall pay these nine thousand francs out of my own private purse. I hope you will acknowledge that I am accommodating. Perfectly accommodating. But I think I have also proved that I wish to serve you. I have only to regret that you scalded yourself, replied the favorite, with a smile. I do not regret it, madam, since in spite of the accident, my devotion to your interests will, I trust, give me strength to be useful to you. Let us sum up, said Madame Dewberry. Pardon me one moment. I had forgotten one thing. 
Alas, it is so long since I have been at court that I have no dress fit for it. I foresaw that, madam, and yesterday, after your departure, I ordered a dress for you. Tomorrow, at noon, it will be ready. I have no diamonds. Beamer and Basange will give you tomorrow, on my order, a set of ornaments worth 210,000 livres, which, the following day, they will take back at 200,000. Thus your indemnity will be paid. Very well, madam. I have nothing more to wish. I am delighted to hear it. However, about my son's commission. His majesty will give it to you himself. And for the attendant expenses? The order will be given with the commission. Quite right. There now only remains about the vineyard, four acres. How much were they worth? Six thousand livres an acre, it was excellent land. I will not subscribe an obligation to pay you twenty-four thousand livres, which will be about the whole. There is the writing desk, madam. I shall do myself the honor to hand the desk to you. To me? Yes. That you may write a little letter to His Majesty, which I shall dictate, a fair return, you know. Very true, replied the old lady, and arranging her paper, and taking a pen, she waited. Madame. Dewberry dictated. Sire, the happiness which I feel on learning that your majesty has accepted my offer to present my dear friend, the Countess Dewberry. The old lady made a grimace, and her pen began to spit. You have a bad pen, said the favorite, you must change it. It is unnecessary, madam, I shall get accustomed to it. Do you think so? Yes. Madame. Dewberry continued. Emboldens me to solicit your majesty to look on me with a favorable eye, when I shall appear at Versailles tomorrow, as you have designed to permit me to do. I venture to hope, sire, that I merit your majesty's favor, inasmuch as I am allied to a house, every chief of which has shed his blood for the princess of your august race. Now sign, if you please, said the favorite. And the countess signed. Anastasi Euphemie Rodolphe. Countess de Bern. The old lady wrote with a firm hand, in great letters half an inch long, and sprinkled her letter with a sufficient quantity of aristocratic mistakes in orthography. When she had signed, still holding the letter fast with one hand, she passed with the other the paper, pen, and ink to Madame Dewberry, who, in a little, straight, sharp hand signed the obligation to pay the sums above stated. Then she wrote a letter to Beamer and Besange the crown jewellers, requesting them to give the bearer the set of diamond and emerald ornaments called Louise, because they had belonged to the Princess Louise, and to the Dauphin, who sold them to obtain funds for her charities. That done, the ladies exchanged their papers. Now, said Madame Dewberry, give me a proof of your friendship, my dear Countess. With all my heart, Madam. I am sure that if you come to me, Tronchin will cure you in less than three days. Come, then, and you can at the same time try my oil, which is really excellent. Well, but do not let me detain you, madam, said the prudent old lady, I have some matters to settle here before I can set out. Then you refuse me? On the contrary, madam, I accept your invitation, but not at this moment. It is just now striking one o'clock by the abbey clock, give me until three, and at five precisely I shall be at Lucien's. Permit my brother then to return with the carriage at three. Certainly. In the meantime take care of yourself. Fear nothing. You have my word, and though my death should be the consequence, I shall present you tomorrow at Versailles. Goodbye, then, my dear madam. Goodbye, my charming friend. And so saying, they parted, the old lady, with her foot still on the cushion, and her hand on her papers. The countess in better spirits than on her arrival, but certainly rather vexed that she had not been able to make better terms with an old woman from the country, she, who could outweat the king of France when she chose. Passing by the door of the principal saloon, she saw Jean, who, doubtless merely to prevent anyone harboring suspicions as to the cause of his long stay, was taking a second bottle of wine. Perceiving his sister, he jumped from his chair and ran after her. Well, cried he. Well, I may say, 
as Marshal Saxe once said to his majesty in the battlefield of Fontenoy, Sire, learn from this spectacle how dearly a victory may be purchased. Then we have conquered. Yes, only it costs us about a million. Jean made a frightful grimace. Why, I had no choice, I must either take her at that or give her up. But it is abominable. It is as I tell you, and perhaps if you make her angry, she will make us pay double. Pardieu. What a woman. She is a Roman. She is a Greek. Never mind. Greek or Roman, be ready to bring her to Lucien's at three o'clock. I shall never be easy until I have her under lock and key. I shall not stir from this, said Jean. And I, on my side, shall hasten to prepare everything, said the Countess. She sprang into her carriage. To Lucien's, said she. Tomorrow I shall say, to Marley. Jean followed the carriage with his eyes. We cost France a pretty little sum, said he. No matter, it is very flattering for the Dewberries. XXXV Marshal Richelieu's Fifth Conspiracy The king returned to hold his court at Marley, as usual. Less the slave of etiquette than Louis XIV, who sought, even in the evening parties of his courtiers, means of exhibiting his power, Louis XV. Sought in them only news, of which he was inordinately fond, and, above all, a variety of faces around him, a gratification which he preferred to all others, particularly if they were smiling ones. In the evening of the day on which the interview just related took place, and two hours after the Countess de Bern, who this time kept her promise faithfully, was comfortably installed in Madame. Dewberry's cabinet, the king was playing cards at Marley, in the drawing room. On his left sat the Duchess d'Ion, on his right the Princess de Gemini. His Majesty appeared very absent, losing, in consequence of inattention to his game, eight hundred Louis Dior's. Rather sobered by his loss, for, like a true descendant of Henry IV. Louis loved to win, the king left his cards, and retired into the recess of a window to talk to M. de Malherbe, son of the ex-chancellor, while M. de Mopia, who was conversing with the Duc de Choiseul in an opposite window, watched the interview with an anxious eye. In the meantime, after the king left the card table, a circle was formed near the fireplace. The princesses Adelaide, Sophie, and Victoire, attended by their ladies of honor and their equerries, had placed themselves there on their return from a walk in the gardens. Around the king, who must certainly have been talking of some matter of importance, as the gravity of M. De Malherbe was well known, were grouped, but at a respectful distance, generals, admirals, great dignitaries of the state, noblemen, and judges. The little court at the fireplace, therefore, was left a good deal to itself, and seemed bent on more lively conversation, if one might judge by the skirmishing with which they began. The principal bodies of the group, beside the three princesses, were the Duchess de Gramont, the Princess de Gemini, the Duchess de Choiseul, the Marchioness de Mirepoix, and the Duchess de Pilastron. At the moment when we approached this group, the Princess Adelaide had just ended an anecdote of a bishop banished from his diocese by the Grand Penitentiary. It was tolerably scandalous, and it is as well unrelated here. Well, said the Princess Victoire, it is only a month since that bishop was sitting here among us. Oh, we shall have worse than he sitting among us, said the Duchess de Gramont, if His Majesty receive those who, not having been yet received, are now determined to be, received. Every one understood, from the tone in which these words were uttered, who was meant, and at once felt what turn the conversation was taking. Fortunately, wishing to be received, and being received, are two different things, Duchess. Said a little, elderly man, joining in the conversation. He was seventy-four years of age, but looked only fifty, so elegant was his shape, his voice so unbroken, his legs so well shaped, his eyes so lively, his skin so fair, and his hands so beautiful. Ah, here is Monsieur de Richelieu, said the Duchess, advancing his scaling ladders, and going to take our conversation by assault, as he did Mahon. Still something of the soldier, my dear Marshal. Still something of the soldier. Ah, Duchess, you are very severe. Well. But did I not speak the truth? 
The truth. When? Just now when I said that a certain person wished to force the king's doors. Oh, you know, Countess, I am always of your opinion, even when you speak ill of all my friends. Some laughed, although it had already been whispered that the marshal's wit was on the wane. If you say such things, continued the Duchess, I shall not go on with my history, and you will lose a great deal, I assure you. Heaven forbid that I should interrupt it. I am all attention. The circle drew closer around the Duchess. She cast a glance toward the window to be certain that the king was still there. He was still in the same position, but, although he continued to converse with M. De Malherbe, he kept a watchful eye on the group at the fireplace, and just at that moment his eye met that of Madame de Gramont. The Duchess felt somewhat intimidated by its expression, but she had made a beginning, and would not be stopped. You must know, she continued, addressing herself particularly to the three princesses, that a certain lady, her name is of no consequence, is it? Has lately taken it into her head that she will see us, the privileged of the land, sitting in our glory. See us, where? asked the marshal. Oh, at Versailles, at Marley, at Fontainebleau. Very well, very well. The poor creature knows nothing of our meetings, except from having seen, with the rest of the mob, the king at dinner with his guests. How disagreeable, with a barrier between them and the great, and an usher with his rod driving them before him. The marshal took snuff noisily out of his box of Sevres porcelain. But, said he, in order to join our circle at Versailles, at Marley, at Fontainebleau, one must be presented. Precisely, the lady in question has requested to be presented. Then I'll wager the king has consented, he is so kind. Unfortunately, something more is necessary than the king's permission, there must be a chaperone to present the lad. Yes, but chaperones are rather scarce, said the Marchioness de Mirepoix. Witness the fair Bourbonnais, who has sought but has not found one. Pardon me, replied the Duchess, she has sought so well that she has found what she wants. But what a chaperone! A frank, sincere, real country dame. She was brought away from her dovecot, petted, and caressed, and dressed. It is perfectly shocking, interrupted the Princess de Gemini. But just when the dear dame had been sufficiently petted, and caressed, and dressed, she fell downstairs, from the top to the bottom, and broke her leg. So there can be no presentation, exclaimed the Princess de Gemini. Not a shadow, said the Duchess. See how gracious Providence is, said the Marshal, raising his hands and eyes to heaven. Gracious, said the Princess Victoire, not to the poor country dame, I really pity her. On the contrary, your Royal Highness may congratulate her, said the Duchess, of two evils she has chosen the lesser. She stopped short, for again her eyes met the king's. If the ladies who have been presented, said the Princess de Gemini, were courageous and faithful to the sentiments of honor of the ancient nobility of France. They would go in a body to return thanks to the lady from the country who showed so much sublimity of mind as to break her leg. Yes, faith, said the marshal, that is a great idea. But what is the name of the excellent lady who has saved us in this great danger? We have nothing now to fear, have we, Duchess? Oh, nothing. She is in her bed, her leg bound up, and unable to move a step. But if the lady should find another chaperone, said the princess, she is so indefatigable. Oh, do not be afraid, it is not so easy to find chaperones. At this moment the throng of courtiers separated, and the king approached, the group became silent. A moment afterward his clear and well-known voice was heard, Adieu, ladies. Good night, gentlemen. Everyone rose. The king advanced toward the door, then turning before leaving the room, he said, By the by, there will be a presentation tomorrow at Versailles. These words fell like a thunderbolt on the assembly. The king glanced round the group of ladies, who looked at one another and turned pale, then he left the apartment without adding another word. Scarcely had he crossed the threshold with the long train of gentlemen who attended him, when there was a general explosion among the princesses and the ladies around them. A presentation, stammered the Duchess de Gramont, her lips quite livid. 
what does his majesty mean? Ah! Duchess, said the marshal, with one of those smiles which even his best friends could not pardon, can this be the presentation you have just been speaking of? The princesses bit their lips with vexation. Oh, it is impossible, murmured the duchess. Ah, duchess, said the marshal, they do set legs so well nowadays. The Duc de Choiseul approached his sister, the Duchess de Gramont, and pressed her arm as a warning not to go too far. But she was too deeply wounded to attend to him. It would be an insult to us all, she exclaimed. Yes, an insult indeed, repeated the Princess de Gemini. M. de Choiseul saw he could do nothing more, and walked a short distance off. Oh, your royal highnesses, cried the duchess, addressing the king's three daughters, there is no resource for us now but in you. You, the highest ladies in the kingdom, will you endure it? Must we be exposed, in the only asylum remaining for ladies of rank, to meet a person with whom we should not allow our chambermaids to associate? The princesses, instead of replying, hung down their heads. Oh, your royal highnesses, in heaven's name, exclaimed she, save us. The king is master in this as in everything else, said the princess Adelaide, sighing. That is true, said the Duke de Richelieu. But the entire court of France will be compromised in the affair, cried the duchess. Gentlemen, have you then no regard for the honor of your families? Ladies, said the Duke de Choiseau, trying to laugh, as this seems bordering on a conspiracy, you must allow me to retire, and to take with me Monsieur de Sartens. Will you come, Marshal? I. Faith, I adore conspiracies. I shall certainly stay, replied Marshal Richelieu. The two ministers departed. There now remained around the princesses eight or ten of the ladies who had espoused most warmly the league against the presentation. Richelieu was the only gentleman. The ladies looked at him suspiciously, as if he had been a Trojan in the Grecian camp. I represent my daughter, the Countess Diegmont, said he, go on, ladies, go on. Your Royal Highnesses, the Duchess de Gramont began, there is a means by which we can show our sense of the infamous nature of the proceedings, and for my part one shall make use of the means. What is it? all exclaimed. We have been told that the King is master, she continued. And I reply it is just and right that he should be, said the marshal. He is master in his own palace, but we are mistresses in our own houses. Now, what is to prevent me from giving my coachman directions to drive to Chanteloup tonight, instead of to Versailles? Or what is to prevent others from imitating you, said the Princess de Gemini. Why should we not all imitate the Duchess, asked the Marchioness de Mirepoix. Oh, your royal highnesses, exclaimed the duchess, again addressing the princesses, what a noble example it would be for you to give the court. The king would be very angry with us, said the princess Sophie. No, your royal highness, I am certain he would not. On the contrary, it would make him reflect. And he has such exquisite sense, such perfect tact, that he will afterward acknowledge you to be in the right, and he will be grateful to you. It is true, said the Princess Victoire, encouraged by the general spirit of rebellion. The king said nothing when we refused to admit the visits of the countess, but on a public occasion like this he might not be disposed to forgive us. No, certainly. Replied the Duchess, if you were the only ladies who absented yourselves, but when he sees that we have all left the court. All, exclaimed the party. Yes, all, repeated the old marshal. Then you are of the plot. Said the Princess Adelaide. Certainly, I am, and therefore I wish to speak. Speak, Marshal, speak, said Madame de Gramont. We must proceed methodically, said he. It is not enough all to shout in chorus this or that. I have known people say, this is what I shall do, but at the moment of action they have done the very contrary. Now, as I have the honor to make one in this conspiracy, I do not wish to be left by myself, as I always was when I took part in the conspiracies under the late king and under the regency. Upon my word, Marshal, you forget yourself. Among the Amazons you take upon you the airs of a leader, said the Duchess. Madam, I beg you to consider that I may have some right to that position. 
You hate Madame Dewberry, there, I have let the name slip out, but nobody heard it, you hate her more than I, but I am more compromised than you. How is that? I have not been at Lucienne's for eight days, nor at her apartments at Versailles for four. The affair has gone so far that a footman was sent to ask if I was ill, so I am already looked upon with suspicion. However, I am not ambitious, I yield the leadership to you, you have set the affair on foot, you have stirred us all, you revolutionize our consciences, yours must be the baton of command. No. I must follow their royal highnesses, said the Duchess, respectfully. Oh, pray let us remain passive, said the Princess Adelaide, we are going to St. Denis to see our sister Louise. She will keep us there, and of course there can be nothing said. Nothing, nothing at all, unless by some very ill-disposed person, said the marshal. As for me, said the Duchess de Gramont, I have to go to Chanteloup, because it is haymaking season. Bravo, cried the Duke, an excellent reason. I must stay at home, one of my children is ill, and I have to nurse him, said the Princess de Gemini. I, said the Duchess de Palastrin, have felt a giddiness all this evening, I am sure I shall be dangerously ill if Tronchin does not bleed me tomorrow. And I, said the Marchioness de Mirepoix, majestically, I shall not go to Versailles because, I shall not, that is my reason. Excellent. Excellent, said the Marshal, all this is quite logical, but we must swear. What? We must swear. Yes, conspirators always swear, from the plot of Catalan down to that of Selimare, in which I had the honor of participating. We always swore, it is true, the thing did not succeed at all the better for it, still, let us respect old customs. Let us swear, then, you shall see how solemn it is. He extended his hand in the midst of the group of ladies, and said, with proper dignity, I swear. All the ladies repeated the oath, with the exception of the princesses, who slipped away. Now that all is over, said the marshal, when once people have sworn in conspiracies, they never do anything more. Oh, what a fury she will be in, said the Duchess de Gramont, when she finds herself all alone in the Grand Saloon. Hum! said the marshal, the king will most probably banish us for a little time. Ah, cried the princess de Gemini, what kind of court would it be if we were banished? The king of Denmark is expected, who will be presented to him? The Dauphiness is expected, to whom will she be presented? Besides, a whole court is never exiled, a selection is made. I know that very well, and I fear I run a great risk of being chosen for the distinction of banishment, said the marshal. I have always been distinguished in that way. For times have I been selected for it, at the lowest reckoning, this is my fifth conspiracy, ladies. Do not be afraid, Marshal, said the Duchess de Gramont. If any one be marked out for banishment, I shall be the person. Or your brother, the Duc de Choiseul. Take care, Duchess, replied the Marshal. My brother is of my mind, he could submit to misfortune, not to an insult. It will be neither you, Marshal, nor you, Duchess, who will be banished, said the Marchioness de Mirepoix, I shall be the victim. The king will never pardon me for being less condescending to the countess than I was to the Marchioness. That is true, said the marshal, you were always called the favorite of the favorite. I am sorry for you now, we shall be banished together. Let him banish us all, said the princess de Guinea, rising. For I trust none of us will draw back from the resolution which we have taken. We cannot draw back after our oath, said the marshal. Besides, said the Duchess de Gramont, I have still other resources. You? Yes. She cannot be presented tomorrow evening without three things. What three? A hairdresser, a dress, and a carriage. Certainly. Well, she shall not be at Versailles at ten o'clock, the king will become impatient, he will dismiss the court, and the presentation will be postponed until the Greek calends, on account of the arrival of the Dauphiness. A burst of delight followed this new episode in the conspiracy, but while applauding even more loudly than the others. The Duc de Richelieu and the Marchioness de Mirepoix exchanged glances, the same idea had occurred simultaneously to the two old courtiers. 
At eleven o'clock all the conspirators, lighted by a lovely moon, were speeding along the roads to Versailles and Saint Germain. Marshal Richelieu, however, mounted his groom's horse, and while his carriage, with the blinds drawn closely down, bore him ostensibly to Versailles, he reached Paris by a crossroad. XVI, no hairdresser, no dress, no carriage. It would have been in bad taste for the Countess Dewberry to have gone merely from her apartment in the Palace of Versailles to the Grand Saloon where the presentation took place. Besides, at Versailles there were not the necessary appliances and means for such an important day. But a better reason than any of these was, that it was not the custom. The highly favored being, who was to be presented, always arrived with the noise and state of a foreign ambassador, whether it was from her house in the town of Versailles, or in Paris. Madame Dubarry chose to arrive from the latter place. At eleven o'clock in the morning, therefore, she was at her house in the Rue de Valois, with the Countess de Berne, whom she kept under lock and key when she did not keep her under her smiles. And whose burn was attended to most carefully, every secret of medicine and chemistry being exhausted on it. From the preceding evening Jean, Chan, and Doré had been at work, and any one who could have seen them at work, would have formed an exalted idea of the power of gold or the greatness of human intellect. The one made sure of the hairdresser, the other harassed the seamstress. Jean took the department of the carriage to himself, but also cast o eye occasionally on the hairdresser and the dressmakers. The countess, occupied with flowers, diamonds, and lace, was buried in boxes, cases, and caskets, and gave audiences every hour to couriers from Versailles, who informed her how matters were going on. Orders had been given for lighting the Queen's drawing room, and no change had taken place in the King's intentions. About four the Viscount came in, pale, agitated, but joyful. Well, asked the Countess. Well, all will be ready. The hairdresser. I went to him myself, Doré was with him, but, to make sure of him, I slipped fifty Louis Dior's into his hand. He will dine here at six o'clock precisely, so you may be quite easy on that score. My dress. It will be a perfect wonder. Chan is superintending it, there are six and twenty workwomen at it, sewing on the pearls, the ribbons, and the trimmings. They go on breadth by breadth at the work, and it would certainly require eight days for any other persons than ourselves to have it finished. It is a prodigious undertaking. But did you say they are doing it breadth by breadth? Yes, my dear, there are thirteen breadths of the stuff, two workwomen at each breadth, one works at the right, and the other at the left, putting on the jewels and trimmings, then at the last they will all be joined together. It will take them two hours yet, at six you will have it. Are you quite sure, Jean? Yesterday I made a calculation with an engineer about it. There are ten thousand stitches in each breadth, that is, five thousand for each workwoman. In such thick stuff, a woman can only make one stitch in five seconds, that is, twelve in one minute, seven hundred and twenty in one hour, and seven thousand two hundred in ten hours. I leave out two thousand two hundred for needle threading and slipped stitches, and this leaves four good hours of work. And what about the carriage? Oh, I'll answer for it. The varnish is now getting dry in a large store heated to fifty degrees. It is an elegant vis a vis, compared with which the carriages sent for the Dauphiness are a mere trifle. Besides the coats of arms on the four panels, there is the war cry of the Dewberries, Bons and Avant, on each side. Besides that, I made them paint on one place two doves billing and cooing, and in another a heart pierced with a dart, the whole surrounded by bows and arrows, quivers and torches. There is such a crowd of people at Franchin's to see it. It will be here exactly at eight. At this moment Chan and Doré came in, and confirmed all that Jean had said. Thank you, my brave aides de camp, said the countess. My sweet sister, said the viscount, your eyes look a little dim, had you not better sleep for an hour? It would quite revive you. Sleep? No. I shall sleep tonight, and that is more than some will do. While these preparations were going on, the report of the intended presentation had spread through all Paris. Idle and careless as they appear, no people love news more than the Parisians. 
None knew better all the courtiers and all the intriguers of Versailles than the Parisian cockney of the eighteenth century, though debarred from the festivities of the palace. And seeing only the hieroglyphics on the carriages and the curious liveries of the footmen. At that period such or such a nobleman was known to the whole city. The reason was simple. The court at that period formed the principal attraction in the theatres and in the gardens. Marshal Richelieu in his place at the Italian opera, Madame. Dubarry in a coach rivaling that of royalty itself, were constantly before the public, like some favorite comedian or admired actress of the present day. People are much more interested in faces that are well known to them. Everyone in Paris knew Madame Dubarry's face, constantly shown where a rich and pretty woman likes to be seen, in the theaters, in the public walks, in the shops. Besides, she was easily recognized by means of portraits, caricatures, and by her Negro page some more. The affair of the presentation, therefore, occupied the city nearly as much as the court. This day there was a crowd near the Palais Royal. But, poor philosophy. It was not to see Rousseau playing chess at the Café de la Regence, it was to see the favorite in her fine coach and her handsome dress, of which they had heard so much. There was something deep in Jean Dubarry's expression, we cost a pretty little sum to France. And it was natural that France, represented by Paris, should wish to enjoy the sight for which it had paid so dearly. Madame. Dubarry knew her people well, for they were much more her people than they had been Queen Maria Lazinska's. She knew that they loved to be dazzled by magnificence. And, as she was good-natured, she labored to make the spectacle correspond to the expense to which she put them. Instead of sleeping, as her brother advised her, she took a bath about five o'clock. Then, about six o'clock, she began to expect her hairdresser, and, while she waits, we shall explain, if we can, what hairdressing then was. It was building a complete edifice. This was the commencement of the castles which the ladies of the court of the young king, Louis XVI, erected with towers and bastions on their heads. May we not, even in this frivolity of fashion, discover something presaging that a mine was dug beneath the feet of all who were, or all who pretended to be, great. Or that by some mysterious divination, the women of the aristocracy had learned they should have a short time to enjoy their titles, that they, therefore, made the most of them, bearing them aloft on their heads. And as if, fatal omen, not having long to keep their heads, they must decorate those heads to the utmost point which extravagance can attain, and raise them as high as possible above the vulgar. To plate the hair. To elevate it on a silken cushion, to roll it about a hoop of whalebone, to adorn it with diamonds, pearls, and flowers, to sprinkle it with powder, which made the eyes brilliant and the complexion fresh. To blend into harmony with the complexion, pearl, ruby, opal, diamond, flowers of all hues and of all forms, to do all this, a man must be not only a great artist, but the most patient of his race. As a proof that such a man was esteemed great, the hairdresser was the only, tradesman allowed to wear a sword. This explanation may account for the fifty lonest diors given by Jean Dubarry to the hairdresser of the court. It may account, also, for some fears lest the great Lubin, the court hairdresser of that day was called Lubin, some fears, we say, lest the great Lubin might not be so punctual or skillful on the occasion as was desirable. The fears about his punctuality were, alas, too well founded. Six o'clock struck, and the hairdresser did not appear, then half past six came, then a quarter to seven. One thought inspired some hope in the anxious hearts of all. It was, that a man of M. Lubin's importance would naturally make people wait a little. But seven struck. The Viscount feared that the dinner prepared for the hairdresser might be cold when he came, and the great artist might be dissatisfied. He sent a servant to say that dinner waited. The servant returned in a quarter of an hour. Those only who have waited under similar circumstances can tell how many seconds there are in such a quarter of an hour. The servant had spoken to Madame. Lubin herself, who assured him that M. Lubin had set out for the Countess's, that if he were not then there, he must be on the way. Perhaps, said Jean, he has been delayed in consequence of not getting a carriage. We will wait a little. 
Besides, said the countess, there will be no time lost, my hair can be attended to when I am half dressed the presentation does not take place until ten, we have still three hours, it will only take one to go to Versailles. In the meantime, to employ me, Chan, show me my dress. Where is Chan? Chan. Chan. My dress, my dress I, your dress has not come yet, madam, said Doré, and your sister went ten minutes ago to see about it herself. Oh, exclaimed the Viscount, I hear a noise of wheels. It is the carriage brought home, no doubt. The Viscount was mistaken, it was Chan, who had come back at full speed. My dress! cried the Countess, while Chan was still in the vestibule, my dress. Has it not come? asked Chan, terror-struck. No. Oh, well, it can't be long. When I got to the dressmaker's she had just set out in a fiacre with two of her women, bringing the dress to fit it on. It is a good way from her house to this, and as you drove very fast no doubt you have passed her, said Jean. Yes, yes. Certainly, replied Chan, yet she could not suppress a vague feeling of apprehension. Viscount, said the Countess, you had better send about the carriage, that there may be no disappointment on that side at least. You are right, Jean, and Dewberry opened the door. Let some of you, cried he, take the new horses to Franchin's for the carriage, so that they may be already harnessed when it arrives. The coachman and the horses set off. As the sound of their trampling died away, Zamor entered with a letter. A letter for Mistress Dewberry, said he. Who brought it? A man. A man. What sort of a man? A man on horseback. And why did he give it to you? Because Samor was at the door. But read it. Read it rather than question him, cried Jean. You are right, Viscount. I, provided there be nothing annoying in the letter, he muttered. Oh, no. It is some petition for His Majesty. It is not folded like a petition. Really, Viscount, you are full of fears, said the Countess, smiling, and she broke the seal. At the first line she shrieked, and fell back in her chair, half dead. No hairdresser, no dress, no carriage. She cried. Chan sprung toward her. Jean seized the letter. It was evidently the writing of a woman, and ran thus. Madam, be not too confident. This evening you shall have no hairdresser, no dress, no carriage. I hope this information will reach you in time to be useful to you. As I do not desire your gratitude, I do not give you my name. Guess who I am, and you will have discovered. A sincere friend. Oh, shouted Dewberry, all is over. Sang Blue. I must kill somebody. By all the devils. Phil run Lubin through the body. It is half past seven, and he not here. Confound him. Damn him. And as Dewberry was not to be presented that evening, he did not care about his hair, but tore it out unmercifully, in handfuls. But the dress. Good heavens. The dress, cried Chan, a hairdresser could easily be found. Oh, I defy you to find one. What sort of wretch would he be? A murderer. A slaughterer. Oh, death and damnation. The Countess said nothing, but sighs burst from her bosom, which might have softened the Choiseuls themselves could they but have heard them. Let us think, let us think, said Chan, a little calmness only. Let us find out another hairdresser, and send to the dressmaker to ask what has become of the dress. No hairdresser, murmured the almost fainting countess, no dress, no carriage. Yes, no carriage, cried Jean, it does not come either. It is a plot, countess, it is a plot. Cannot Sartines find out the authors of it? Cannot Mopia hang them? Can they not, with their accomplices, be burned in the marketplace? I will have the hairdresser broken on the wheel. The dressmaker torn to pieces with pincers. The coachmaker flayed alive. At length the countess recovered a little from her stage of stupefaction, but it was only to feel more poignantly all the horror of her situation. 
all is lost. She exclaimed. Those who have bought over Lubin are rich enough to remove all the good hairdressers from Paris. None are left me but wretches who would destroy my hair, and my dress. My poor dress. And my new carriage. I thought the sight of it would have made them burst with envy. Dewberry did not answer, but, rolling his eyes fearfully, strode up and down the room, striking himself against the angles of the apartment. And as often as he encountered any ornament or small article of furniture, abandoning his hair, he dashed them into the smallest morsels possible, and then stamped on them with his feet. In the midst of this scene of horror, which, spreading from the boudoir to the anterooms, and from the anterooms to the court, caused all the domestics to run hither and thither with twenty different contradictory orders. A young man in a light green coat, a satin waistcoat, lilac breeches and white silk stockings got out of a cabriolet, crossed the court, stepping from stone to stone on the tips of his toes, entered the open door abandoned by all the servants. Mounted the stairs, and tapped at the countess's dressing room door. Jean was just stamping on a tray with a set of Sevres porcelain, which he had pulled down with the tail of his coat while he was dealing a blow with his fist to a great Chinese mandarin. When the noise of these feats had subsided a little, three gentle, discreet, modest taps were heard. Then followed profound silence, all were in such a state of expectation, that no one could ask who was there. Excuse me, said an unknown voice, but I wish to speak to the Countess Dewberry. Sir, people do not enter here in that way, cried a servant, who had discovered the stranger, and had run after him to prevent his further advance. Never mind. Never mind, cried Jean, flinging open the door with a hand which might have driven in the gates of Gaza. Worse cannot happen to us now. What do you want with the Countess? The stranger avoided the shock of this sudden meeting by springing backward, and falling into the third position. Sir, said he, I came to offer my services to the Countess Dewberry. What services, sir? My professional services, sir. What is your profession? I am a hairdresser, and the stranger bowed a second time. Oh, cried Jean, falling on his neck, a hairdresser. Come in. Come in. Come in. Come in, my dear sir. Cried Chan, almost taking the astonished young man in her arms. A hairdresser, cried Madame Dewberry, raising her hands to heaven. A hairdresser? An angel. Were you sent by Monsieur Lubin, sir? I was not sent by any one. I read in the Gazette that the Countess Dewberry was to be presented this evening, then, said I to myself, suppose that the Countess Dewberry had no hairdresser. It is not probable, but it is possible, so I think I shall try. What is your name, sir? asked the Countess, a little cooled by this account. Leonard, madam. Leonard? You are not known to anyone. If you accept my services, madam, tomorrow everyone will know me. Hum. Said Jean, there are two kinds of hairdressing. If madam distrusts my skill, I shall retire. We have no time to try you, said Chan. Why make any trial, cried the young man, walking round the countess in a fit of enthusiasm. I know, madam, that all eyes must be drawn to you by the style of your hair, and already, in contemplating you, I have invented a head which will have a most powerful effect. And the young man made a gesture with his hand so full of confidence in himself, that the countess's resolution was a little shaken, and hope sprung up in the hearts of Chan and Jean. Have you, really? said she, quite astonished at the young man's ease, for he was now leaning back, hand on hip, as the great Lubin himself would have done. Yes, but, madam, I must see your dress, that I may make the ornaments harmonize with it. Oh, my dress! My dress, cried the countess, recalled by his words to the terrible reality. Jean struck his forehead fiercely. Oh, imagine, sir, cried he, imagine what a horrid trick. They have carried off dress, dressmaker, all. Chan, Chan, clear Chan. And Dewberry, tired of tearing out his hair, gave way to a downright fit of sobbing. Suppose you were to go back to the dressmakers, Chan, said the countess. 
For what purpose? You know she had set out to come hither. Alas! Alas! murmured the countess, falling back in her chair, of what use is a hairdresser when I have no dress? At this moment the doorbell rung. All the doors had been carefully shut, and even bolted, by the porter, lest any other should slip in as the hairdresser had done. Some one rings, said the countess. Chan sprung to a window. A bandbox, cried she. A bandbox? cried the countess. Coming in, cried Jean. Yes, no, yes. It is given to the porter, run, Jean, run. He dashed down the stairs, got before all the footmen, and snatched the bandbox from the porter. Chan looked through the window. He pulled off the lid, plunged his hand into the depths of the bandbox, and uttered a yell of joy. It contained a beautiful dress of Chinese satin, with flowers put on, and a complete trimming of lace of immense value. A dress! A dress! shouted Chan, clapping her hands. A dress, repeated the countess, almost sinking under her joy, as she had before under her grief. Who gave it you, rogue, asked the viscount of the porter. A woman, sir, whom I don't know. Where is she? Sir, she laid it on the step of the door, cried, for the countess, and disappeared. Well, we have got a dress, that is the main thing. Come up, Jean, come up, called Chan, my sister is dying with impatience. Look! said Jean, returning to the room, look! Admire! See what fate sends you! But it will not go on, it will not fit, it was not made for me. Mon Dain! Mon Dieu! What a misfortune, for it is beautiful! Chan quickly measured it. The same length, the same width in the waist, she exclaimed. What admirable stuff, said Jean. It is miraculous, said Chan. It is terrible, said the countess. Not at all, replied the viscount, for it proves that although you have great enemies, you have also devoted friends. It cannot be sent by a friend, said Chan, for how should a friend know of the plot formed against us? It must be sent by a sylph. Let it be sent by his satanic majesty, exclaimed the countess, I care not, provided it assists me to oppose the Schwazols. Whoever sent it, he cannot be so much of a demon as they. And now, said Jean, I am sure that you may confidently submit your head to this gentleman. Why do you think so? Because he has been sent by the same person who sent the dress. I, said Leonard, with the most innocent surprise. Come, come, my dear sir. Acknowledge that it was all a tale about the Gazette. The simple truth, sir. Here is the paper, I kept it for curl papers, and he drew out the gazette in which the presentation was announced. Now, said Chan, let him set to work, it is eight o'clock. Oh, we have time enough, said the hairdresser, it will only take an hour to go to Versailles. Yes, if we have a carriage, said the countess. Oh, Mordu. That is true. exclaimed Jean. That wretch, Frankian, does not come. You know we have been warned, no hairdresser, no dress, no carriage, repeated the countess. Now, if the coachmaker should not keep his word, said Chan. No, here he is, here he is. Cried Jean. And the carriage, the carriage, exclaimed the countess. It is at the door, no doubt. But what is the matter with the coachmaker? At that moment Frankian rushed in, all in alarm. Oh, Viscount! cried he, the carriage was on its way hither, when, at the corner of a street, it was seized by four men, they knocked down my young man, who was bringing it, seized up the reins, and set off with it at a gallop. I told you so. I told you so. said Dewberry, sitting down resignedly in his chair. But, brother, exclaimed Chan, exert yourself. Do something. What for? To get a carriage, the horses here are done out, and the carriage is dirty. Jean cannot go in any of them. Bah! The little birds find food when they don't expect it, 
and we got a hairdresser and a dress in our need. Yes, our unknown friend will not forget a carriage. Hush, cried Chan, surely I heard carriage wheels. Yes, it is stopping, he replied. Then springing to a window, which he opened, he shouted to the servants, Run, rascals, run quick, quick. Find out our benefactor. A carriage, lined with white satin, and drawn by two splendid bay horses, stood before the door. But neither coachman nor footman was to be seen, a common street porter held the horses by the head. A crown had been given to him by a person unknown to him at the end of the street, with orders to lead the carriage to the countess's door. They looked at the panels, the arms were replaced by a simple rose. The whole of this counterplay against the miseries with which the evening had commenced lasted about an hour. Jean had the carriage taken into the yard, and the gates locked on it, he carried up the key with him. On returning to the dressing room, he found the hairdresser about to give the countess the first proof of his profound knowledge of his art. Sir, cried the viscount, seizing him by the arm, if you do not declare who is our protecting genius, that we may make known our eternal gratitude to him, I swear. Allow me, said the young man, interrupting him very phlegmatically. Allow me to say, sir, that you are doing me the honor of squeezing my arms so tight, that I fear my hand will be quite stiff when I shall have to dress the countess's hair, and it is now eight o'clock. Leave him alone, Jean, leave him alone, cried the countess. Jean sank down in his chair. A miracle, exclaimed Chan, it is a perfect fit, only an inch too long in front but ten minutes will alter that. And what is the carriage like? Asked the countess. It is in the best style, replied Jean, I got into it, it is lined with white satin, and perfumed with essence of roses. All is right, all is right, cried the countess, clapping her little hands with delight. Now, Monsieur Leonard, if you succeed on this occasion, your fortune is made. Leonard took possession of her head, and the very first touch of the comb revealed a skillful hand. Rapidity, taste, marvelous precision, a complete knowledge of the relation between the moral and the physical, all these he displayed in the accomplishment of his important duty. When he had, at the end of three quarters of an hour, given the finishing touch to the splendid edifice which he had reared on the countess's head, he would have modestly retired. After having washed his hands in a basin which Chan presented to him, as if he had been a king. Now, sir, said Dewberry, you must know that I am as ardent in my loves as in my hatreds, as you have gained my esteem, pray tell me who you are. You know already, sir, who I am, my name is Leonard, I am only a beginner. A beginner? Sang Blue. You are a thorough master of your profession. You shall be my hairdresser, Monsieur Leonard, said the Countess, looking at herself in a little glass which she had in her hand. And I shall pay you on each occasion like this fifty Louis Dior's. Chan, count now one hundred for this time, he shall have fifty of earnest money. I told you, madam, that you would make my reputation. But you must dress no one's hair but mine. Keep your hundred Louis Dior's, then, madam, I prefer my liberty, to it I owe the honor of having this evening dressed your hair. Liberty is the first of human blessings. A philosophical hairdresser, exclaimed Dewberry, raising his hands to heaven, to what shall we come at last? Well, my dear Monsieur Leonard, I shall not quarrel with you, take your hundred Louis Dior's and keep your secret and your liberty. Now, Countess, to your carriage. These last words were addressed to the Countess de Berne, who entered, stiff and stately, and dressed like an image in a shrine. She was brought out of her room just when she was to be made use of. Now, cried Jean to the servants, let four of you take her and carry her downstairs, and if you hurt her, so as to make her heave one sigh, Phil flay you alive. While he was superintending this delicate and important operation, assisted by Chan, the Countess turned to seek for M. Leonard, he had disappeared. But how did he go, murmured Madame. Dewberry, who had not yet quite recovered from the influence of the many surprises of the evening. How did he go? Why, through the floor, or up through the ceiling, of course, as all genii do. Take care, Countess, that your headdress does not turn into a heap of mud, 
your dress into a spider's web, and your coach into a pumpkin drawn by two rats. Having given utterance to this last fear, Jean took his place beside the Countess de Bern and her fortunate goddaughter. 